incoming transmission from the Imperial Embassy on Sol 3. Priority message from the Hiver Ambassador. Decrypting message. Please stand by. Welcome back to our fifth annual May Day celebration. This year we have a very special interview arranged. When planning the event, I was contacted by a Hiver who calls himself M. Tellyrand. Tallyrand is an ambassador to Terra from the Hive Federation. Welcome, Tallyrand. Well, I think we should start out with that name. I understand this is just the name you chose with humans to refer to yourself. Thank you, Cyborg. My species has no organ that produces modulated sound, and so our language involves movement and gestures. It is a complex language that involves multiple limbs and digits with varying patterns. Your species, along with most others, do not have the mental capability of translating our language with all its nuance. For that reason we maintain multiple simplified dialects which we use through electronic translators to speak for us. Our names in particular are in the most complex form of our language, and so they do not translate well. My actual name is a reference to a gesture form used in an artistic type of dialogue, something you might call a poem. But that name changes based on my current occupation and intentions. Using that name would require a lengthy explanation at each meeting, and you would still not appreciate the nuance. I selected the name Talleyrand from a list of Solomani historical diplomats because I am a diplomat. That way you may look at the name, Talleyrand, and remember, diplomat. If I were a philosopher, I would use a name like, Plato, or, Aristotle. We are aware that communicating with us is taxing for your species, and this is one way we try to make our interactions more comfortable for you. I understand that Talleyrand is a human family name, and the concept of families fascinates us, as we do not have them. I notice that your name appears on my panel as Cyborg Prime. Can you explain the meaning of that name? Were you the first Cyborg? Yes, well, I was originally called Cyborg, but it seems I started a fad and everyone wanted to be known as Cyborg, so I chose Cyborg Prime to differentiate myself from the other Cyborgs. I'm not clear what the M stands for. Is that a first initial? The M stands for manipulator, in your language. It is an honorific indicating I have conducted a successful interaction as determined by the Manipulations Club of Guaran. By our legal tradition, I am required to preface my name with this honorific to advise everyone of my status. It sounds like that's considered a positive achievement. You manipulate other species? The term, manipulation in your language, has a negative connotation, which is unfortunate, because in mine it is entirely positive. I suggest that a better translation would be, facilitation, rather than, manipulation. We believe that all species have the potential for greatness with the proper leadership and assistance. Many years ago, we decided to take an active role in assisting other Sofont and near Sofont species on that path. Some might say you're playing God. We lack a concept of God. We do not object to you retaining the notion of superior beings. Certainly we have evidence that beings more intelligent and advanced than us lived in this part of the galaxy in the ancient past. Just as your species defined, good, and evil, based on the concept of a superior being, we made similar decisions and definitions. We decided that intelligence is, beneficial, ignorance is, unfortunate, technology is, beneficial, backwardness is, unfortunate, abundant resources are, beneficial, scarcity is, unfortunate, we are not playing God, rather we are facilitating beneficial outcomes rather than trusting in entropy to deliver them. What manipulation did you accomplish? I have conducted four manipulations, though only three have been recognized. My first manipulation was many years ago when I facilitated the establishment of a Federation Development Agency embassy on the world of Talmud in Spica Sector. This is an independent and underdeveloped system that will benefit greatly from expanded opportunities once the embassy is completed in about 30 years. Your species is called hivers, but you don't live in hives. Can you explain? This is another failure of languages. The first human ambassadors to our world saw the above-ground portions of our nests and thought they resembled the hives of Terran social insects. While we worked on ways to talk with each other, they gave us the name, hivers, in reference to this, and it stuck. I should point out that Solomani of this era seemed to make up their own names for Sofonts quite often. The Fitirla, for example, were named Oslan based on their resemblance to Terran animals even though they have a name that is pronounceable to your species. Similarly, humans referred to the Kakri as centaurs for generations before their own name for their race became known. Much like our personal names, the names we use for our own species are complex and relative based on our interest and position in our society. As an ambassador I would use one gesture phrase to refer to my species while an engineer would use a different one. 
We do not expect other species to understand and use this system. When we encountered the Gerben, they created their own name for our race. Regrettably they combined the words for mouth and excrement. The Zatak gave us a similar name, again referring directly to our excretory system. The word hivers is inaccurate in that it implies a similarity to the Terran social arthropods your people named us for. But we have come to learn that these insects operate with collective intelligence and specialization of labor. To us, this is worthy of respect, and for this reason we do not consider the name hivers to be pejorative. Can you describe any unique or interesting aspects of your species' biology or physiology? I assume you have access to images of us for examination, and you can see from this that the hiver body model is distinctly different than most of the other species in charted space. Most of you have a torso, limbs, a head containing your brain, and an alimentary canal that carries food and waste through your body. The hiver body is radial, with six limbs. Our forelimb is a sensory cluster for vision and hearing, and our rear limb holds a reproductive pouch. All of our limbs can be used for manipulation. We do not have an alimentary canal and instead ingest and excrete through a single opening on our underside. While most of the other species have genders, we do not. Our reproduction is based on the exchange and combination of gametes, but we all have the same gametes and can reproduce with anyone or by ourselves. What inspired you to take on the role of ambassador, and how did you prepare for it? Among my kind, when we find we have an interest or curiosity about something, we dedicate our time to intensive research about the topic. We will join a nest or find a club that specializes in that field of study. The Federation government appointed me to the ambassador to Terra role because I completed advanced studies about your particular species. These studies were self-directed because of my personal interest in Solomani. Among those of my kind who study other sophons, a plurality invests their interest in humanity, as we have learned that the wide variety of your physical and cultural forms precludes any individual cultivating expertise in all of them. As an ambassador of your species, what do you hope to achieve in your interactions with humans? I have no specific goals. I think the time I spend on your world will be pleasantly agreeable. I would consider this something akin to what your people refer to as a vacation. Hivers do not take vacations, but if we did, we would come to an exotic world that we are curious about and satisfy that curiosity. Of course I will be available to address any problems or misunderstandings that may arise between our governments or people. If you need anything like this dealt with you will be able to find me in one of your museums of anthropology. How does your species view interstellar travel, and what challenges have you faced in your own travels? This is an excellent question, and one I am happy to discuss with you. The Hivers have been traveling in interstellar space for much longer than the Salamani, and it is only reasonable that you would want to know what we have deduced about that so far. As you know, there is no single advancement greater to a society than the development of the jump drive. The Hivers discovered it as part of our research into gravitics and high-energy physics. This was during the period of the Roman Republic and Han Dynasty on Terra. We found no threatening races around our homeworld, and instead found a number of nascent sophons that we were able to assist with their early development. This led my species in that direction. We did not meet any serious threats, and no race that could possibly be considered an enemy until two and a half millennia later, and so we used this time to peacefully expand and encourage the development of sophon life. By contrast, when Solomani finally discovered Jump Drive after 6,000 years of conflict with your own species, you found another empire of humans at the very first system you visited. Because of your history with violence and limited capacity to accept new paradigms, the human varieties immediately began fighting. It could be argued that this war never ended, just paused several times. The development of Jump Drive is a great advancement, but the use to which any particular species puts it is a reflection of their own history and tendencies. We were always cooperative and surrounded by friends, so when we got to space we found new friends to cooperate with. You were always competing with each other, so when you got to space and found yourself surrounded by enemies, you fought. What do you believe are the key differences between your culture and human culture, and how do you navigate these differences? Again, an excellent question, indicating your intellect is advanced compared to your peers. We have determined there are at least 5,000 distinct human cultures in this sector alone. Extrapolation would tell us there are at least a hundred thousand human cultures in charted space. Every time you have a group of a few million humans, some portion of them finds a need to separate themselves over usually inconsequential matters. Time passes, and the two groups diverge and you have thus created a new culture. By contrast, hivers do not have culture. Humans only have culture because of uncontrolled divergence and balkanization of their societies. Human cultures are defined by differences between each other, and in that way, you could look at hivers and say we have a culture because we do things differently than you do, but I contend this is a basal difference in our species. 
I theorize that this tendency toward diversification evident in humanity is a genetic trait common to Terrigen life, because we see this throughout both human and Varger space. The Valani and Zodani found ways to moderate this trend, but the Salamani never did. The Hiver race has never had that propensity. We have always cooperated and we have always prevented the development of alternative customs. We maintain a standard genotype, something humans would find anathema. We do not subscribe to false beliefs, something humans see as a personal right. We bring other groups together into our federation by mutual agreement, never by force. This is the single key difference between us. All of us in the federation are working together for a positive future, and different factions of humans are competing with each other, often violently, toward disparate goals. We navigate this difference by considering each human civilization as we would a separate species with its own customs and inclinations. We need to remember that if one group of humans adopts a position, another group may have a diametrically opposed viewpoint. In your opinion, what is the most pressing issue facing the galaxy today, and how can it be resolved? I am not an expert in this matter, but I would suggest that the uncontrolled development of machine learning and artificial intelligence could grow to become a threat to biological life. Interstellar governments, even my own, seem to pay little attention to this matter. How does your species approach technology, and what advancements have you made in this field? To Hivers, technology is a means to an end. We study things we are curious about and as we discover our technology is inadequate for that purpose we undertake research to improve it. It was in this manner, thousands of years ago, that we discovered jump drive. We were curious about the stars around our homeworld and whether they harbored life. Research we had already done in the field of quantum physics implied the existence of jump space, but we lacked the capability to produce enough energy to make jump transition. We had to invent nuclear fusion before we could use the drive we had already designed. This took over a hundred years. The Hiver that invented jump drive never lived to see it use. Now, technological improvement is the assigned task of nests that concentrate on particular industrial or scientific research needed to resolve a stated problem. Despite this, many Hivers love to innovate, and there are topical clubs established for this purpose. So I'm wondering, how is the Hive Federation Army organized? The Federation doesn't have a military force dedicated to fighting on a world's surface. We have some paramilitary formations made up mostly of Ithkler that we deploy in emergencies, but we do not dedicate lives to long-term military campaigns. We have no need to conquer worlds that do not wish to be part of the Federation, so we need no offensive army. In our war, against the Kakri, we found it easier to defend our worlds from space rather than engage their armies on world surfaces. Ultimately we won the war without fighting a single land battle. I understand that humans feel more secure when they are protected by a large armed fighting force. This comes from your origins as a tribalistic species, when you had to make war with each other in the dirt for resources. In the same way, the Kakri's fascination with ground combat came from their early struggle with a carnivorous species on their homeworld. It's important to realize that the crises and traumas you endured as young species do not need to continue to shape your behavior now and in the future. This is an important step which we were able to help many of our associated races accomplish, and we will be glad to do the same for you. Have you ever encountered any hostile species in your travels? And how did you handle these situations? Upon our initial encounters with the Ithkler they reacted in a hostile manner. We resolved this by standing back and waiting. We found their behavior patterns were predictable. After about a thousand years of observation, we made contact again, in a different manner, avoiding the violent response we had triggered the first time. We now call the Ithkler our friends and partners. Later we encountered the Kakri. Our previous tactic of waiting and predicting behavior did not work because the Kakri had independently invented jump drive. We came into conflict because our allied species violated their vegetarian beliefs. The war with the Kakri was unavoidable from our side, and forced the Hive Federation to build and deploy a real navy for the first time. We won the war using what we believe was the minimal necessary force and by effective negotiations. It was our hope that we would come to call the Kakri friends and partners as well, but so far they have rejected our attempts to normalize relations. What is your opinion on the use of force in interstellar conflicts, and under what circumstances do you believe it is justified? Force should be used only as a matter of defense. Even then, it should be a last resort. Each species comes to Sofonthood and then into space under different circumstances, as we already discussed. If a species seems intractably violent, first leave them alone. Talk. If they don't want to talk, walk away. Come back many years later and see how they feel. This worked for us with the Ithkler. It did not work with the Kakri, but it is certainly worth the attempt. As for your own species, our interactions with the Imperium have been peaceful, 
but we have had occasional conflict with humans from the Salamani Confederation who have come across the border to raid our worlds. This is often because they have mistaken our peaceful nature as indicative of timidity. We do not shy away from defending ourselves from piracy, but we still offer every available alternative resolution to the perpetrators before resorting to violence. How does your species approach diplomacy, and what are some effective strategies for resolving conflicts? Our diplomatic strategy is based on mutual understanding and resolution of problems in a manner that brings the best possible net outcome for both parties. Diplomacy is not a zero-sum game, and there is always room for an agreement where both societies benefit. Because of our experience in dealing with a multi-species federation, we are adept at finding solutions where everyone is pleased with the outcome. I think Solomani would benefit from this perspective. What do you believe is the future of space exploration and how do you see your species fitting into this future? This is an interesting question and again demonstrates capacity beyond what we see in the typical Solomani. Cyborg Prime, you are an impressive specimen of your species. There is a distinction between exploration and expansion. All of the major races have already found the limits of their expansion. The Varger and Zodani could expand to Kor Ward, but have not. The Solomani and Aslan could expand to Rimward, but have not. The Imperium could press its spinward and trailing borders, but has not. In the same way the Federation could expand to trailing, but has not. Why not? All of us, collectively, have reached the efficient limit to the size of our polities. A message from our capital, Glia, to our Rimward border takes about half a year at the best possible speed. Communications can be accelerated somewhat with a greater expenditure of resources, but past this limit all of our species are experiencing diminishing returns as we expend more than we get from further colonization. The logistics of our supply chains become too long to support settlement without some benefit to it. This limit will be approachable when lack of resources drives us past it. We estimate this will occur for our federation in about 2000 years. All of the other polities have this issue. The Imperium has dealt with it best by managing the efficient express boat network and federalizing its autocratic government, and thus has managed to reach approximately twice the Federation's size. Still, its loss of the Julian Protectorate and the Solomani Sphere demonstrates the limitations of this system and shows how political size maximums are realized. Exploring past the diminished returns limit is possible, and we have done so. We have surveyed and cataloged an area three sectors past each of the Federation's borders. I believe this is common for all of the major races. The Imperium has also sent scouts past the edges of what we collectively call charted space in all directions. What was discovered there could be summarized by saying there is no benefit to settlement. How does your species approach governance and decision making, and what can humans learn from your approach? It is commendable that you would ask about this. Many species presume their methods are superior and attempt to press others to follow their own system rather than explore what works best for each party. Humanity has come a long way toward the goal of learning tolerance. The Federation recognizes that each species governs itself best. We, the Hivers, do not attempt to impose any kind of structure on the member worlds with the exception that they have to cede military and foreign policy control to the central government. The Federation maintains a monopoly on violence, and uses that to guarantee the safety of interstellar trade and commerce and to protect the member states from external threats. In 3,000 years since, there has not been an incident involving violence or civil war between member states. This is not to say that we have always had perfect relations. A group of Ithkler worlds on our spinward border peacefully seceded, and other worlds and races have been offered membership in the Federation and declined. We recognize their rights to self-determination as we do all Sophon species. Humans follow this same path. The Imperium allows worlds to govern themselves, and the Solomani Confederation operates in much the same way but they do not recognize this right to self-determination as both polities have had to enforce their central government's supremacy, both internally and externally, with the use of force. They fail to put that limit on their own control, and as a result their authority comes from power not consent. How do your species' beliefs and values inform your approach to diplomacy and interstellar relations? Hivers are genetically cooperative. It is a reflex. It is not subject to evolutionary selection, so it is present in all of us. Since we do not have to discover or develop cooperation, as humans did, we naturally extend cooperation to all sophons. So you see, what you call, diplomacy, is second nature to us, like eating or sleeping. It is therefore also natural that we brought this with us into space and into interstellar society. When we formed the Federation we did not create an empire, with hivers at its head. Rather, we nurtured a cooperative organization, with our species as one participant of many. What do you believe are the most important skills for a human ambassador to possess when interacting with alien species? 
patience and tolerance, we need to accept the other race for who they are with equanimity. If we start there we can find ways to work together and facilitate your continued growth. How does your species approach the concept of time, and how does this impact your interactions with other species? Time is the one resource that is utterly spent, and therefore it is important to spend it well. Our individual lives are about the same length as yours, but our federation outlasts each of us. Our nests, our institutions, are durable. This is the long view. Our time is best spent for that which endures. What do you believe is the most important message you can impart to humans regarding interstellar relations? Humans have characteristics that have made them, I think inarguably, the dominant species in charted space. It is amazing to us that you have achieved so much with your intellectual capacity. But you still have a number of inadequacies. The first of these is your reliance on culture that leads to a tendency to factionalize, as we already discussed. This also makes you increasingly intolerant about deviations from your own personal culture. As a species you seem to be growing out of this, but too slowly. The second limitation is your fixation on economics. Humans are obsessed with economics and, at an individual level, with wealth. Everyone needs to be, employed, and, earning money. If they are not, there is unrest, and the government is pressured to make sure everyone can find, employment. Humans are considered successful if they are, making money, even if they are doing something they do not want to do or a job that is meaningless. What is forgotten in this paradigm is that money is simply a medium to stand in for resources. As we obtain a surplus of resources, the money ceases to have value. Human societies that are approaching a point where they have ample resources often artificially restrict their production to create scarcity to keep their money flowing. In other words they hinder real development and advancement in order to promote their imaginary means of exchange. Often the people making these decisions are the ones who have substantial monetary assets and wish to protect their value. I realize this might not be clear from your perspective, so I offer an example. When human societies develop fusion for the first time, they have a superabundance of energy. It is no longer necessary to harvest energy from any other source, and there is no longer a reason to charge money for energy transfer. Every human society that confronted these facts initially resolved to restrict fusion in order to preserve the status quo and maintain an energy industry that could continue to sell its product in exchange for money. The Valani did this, the Salamani, the Zodani, the Gianni, the Sura, the Dinkia. All of them chose to reduce their energy production rather than face that energy would no longer be worth money. As we expanded we encountered several human worlds and brought their populations into the Federation as full members. One of the things we were quick to explain to them is that they need to focus on the realities of resource management rather than the simulation of it represented by capital interest. Over thousands of years of interaction, we have been successful in excising these traits from their behavior. There is still freedom of individual action, which both of our species treasure, but without the tendency for division and obsession with economics. I share this information with you and the people of Terra now, knowing that just hearing it will not be enough to affect change. But you asked, and so I told you. Well, we've come to the end of our interview. Thank you, Talleyrand, for joining us and answering my questions. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak with the humans of Terra. I look forward to a long and productive visit here. And thank you, dear listeners. Until next time, happy traveling. Yikes, sorry about that everybody. I have a twitchy finger and I was trying to update a, a sponsor and I accidentally clicked on another uh, sponsor's link and set that video going. So, so sorry to uh, the sponsor of the Hiver interview, uh, Matthew Kerwin, uh, who actually wrote that uh, interview, brilliant writer there. And uh, we have a winner for the, uh, the first drawing of the day which is a um, copy of Matthew Kerwin's ebook, The Wagner Incident.
And that winner is going to be our very own Wizard Wombat, randomly chosen. It's not too late to get into the prize drawings. Go over to cyborgprime.com slash mayday2023, and right at the top of the page, you'll see a place where you can register for the drawings, and we'll be doing door prizes throughout the day. And then at the end of the day, um, after the podcast, but before the after hours, we're going to draw the um, grand prize winner, and you're going to win a copy of, or the grand prize winner <laughs> is going to win a copy of it, all the door prizes given out during the day, and then some extra stuff on top of that. So we'll look out for that. And uh, the next thing coming up is our friend Jeff Kazmierski from Amberzone Comics and the Zodani Language Institute. And Jeff, I promise not to screw this up. Opening Merchant Interface Scanning Trade Routes Scanning for cargo destinations within jump range Cargo shipment available 3 tons of Amber Zone comics and 9 tons of Zodani language tapes Destined for Albion Prime Contacting Jeff Kosmierski of Amber Zone comics for more information Stand by we're talking to Jeff Kazmierski, creator of Amber Zone Comics and the Zodani Language and Cultural Institute. Welcome back, Jeff. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Let's start off by uh, talking about uh, your history with Traveler and how you became involved in the community. It all started probably back in about 1981, 1980, 1981, um, when I was just discovering role-playing games. I'd been introduced to Dungeons and Dragons and AD and and Tunnel Controls by a high school friend. And um, I was looking for a science fiction game. And I had tried a couple of times to write my own with mixed results. They were mostly they're, they're mostly uh, D and D clones with a Star Wars flavor. And then I read then I read about Traveler. I think in Games Magazine back then. Went looking for it at uh, local bookstores and comic and, and um, hobby shops and eventually found one in a, in a city uh, about an hour away from my hometown. And it just grabbed me uh, from the start. The fact that I could build my own spaceships and create a stellar empire and, uh, and um, just create my own universe was just, it, it, it was awesome. I wanted to build the Millennium Falcon. I wanted to build an Imperial Star Destroyer. Of course, the, the, the little black books wouldn't allow that, but 5,000 tons wasn't nearly big enough for, for a Star Destroyer. But, you know, you, at, least you, at least you got a good, a good flavor for, for a feel for um, building starships. Sure, you could build uh, X-Wings <laughs> and smaller <Absolutely>. ships. <laughs> you, could, you couldn't put a jump drive in them, but, you know. <laughs> you could still build fighters and, yeah. I think I've always liked the small ship aesthetic of Traveler. And so how did those uh, first Traveler games go for you? And um, how did that eventually lead to you um, uh, uh, drawing comics and, uh, and uh, you know, like a, a Traveler series? Our, fir our, our first games were mostly were mostly focused on uh, exploration and trade. We played we played Anic Nova and Shadows and all the all the all the classic adventures and had a, and had loads of fun with that but you know, we, we also loved loved building building ships and doing the mercantile stuff didn't relate too much to the merchant to the to the mercenary activity um mostly because what do a bunch of 15 year olds know about life in the army right right <laughs> but we can relate to scouts we can relate to we, we can kind of relate to to the to the merchants and that's what we wanted to do is han solo and all that and the art in the books was incredibly, incredibly accessible. You, you would, for for high school kids, you could look at it and think, "Oh, wow!" You know, that's that, that's what a major game company is using for illustration. I can do that too. And that's the and and you know, it took me about about another thirty years before I actually twenty or thirty years before I actually started doing more illustration, specifically um, based on on Traveler. But when I when I started up Amber Zone, that was the aesthetic that I wanted to, to recapture. Those early line drawing, sketchy sort of humorous. You know, we've also we all remember the the shipboard fire extinguisher with the hammer next to the porthole in case of fire break glass. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the sort of aesthetic that I wanted to capture, and I think I, I think I succeeded. Yes, your uh, the Amber Zone comics have uh, gained a lot of attention and are, are pretty popular. Uh, they uh, always get you know likes and stuff when I see them around in social media, and uh, I always appreciate them. Uh, there were some funny ones you did that were like if travelers met uh, the Lord of the Rings or if uh, right, yeah. <laughs> you know these different mashups. <laughs> one one does not simply walk into Mordor here. Take my air raft. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, there's some there's some uh, funny stuff on there, and uh, and also just some good adventures and little vignettes that you set up. And um, how do you come up with those, or uh, how, how what what inspired you to just make a um, uh, a comic just about Traveler? I mean, were were you uh, did you have a big pile of stuff that you had just doodled, and then you were like, hey, I could put that into a book, or did it start the other way around, where you, where you thought, oh, maybe I should make a calendar or a booklet or something of my Traveler drawings, or or how, how did that actually come about? I like to call myself an accidental storyteller. The first, the, the first real story that, that I, that I started to tell uh, with, with the comics originated with, with a, uh, a simple four panel white on black uh, comic strip with the, some aliens, a couple of, a, uh, a couple of aliens uh, having a, pic a romantic picnic under the stars and, watching a shooting star go overhead and the final panel is a, a ship crashing on crashing on their planet. <laughs> and, and that, that became the genesis of a story that, that took, that uh, took me through most of the next year. And, you know, once you start actually doing storytelling, it's kind of, it's kind of hard to go back to the single panel you know, single panel uh, and Medius race sort of one shots. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I still do it occasionally, but but um, my my main focus has been has been expanding on the on the adventures of the crew mm -hmm. of the ship. Yeah, that single panel or short pa short form storytelling is is difficult to do. Um, uh, your work is uh, sometimes reminded me of um, Spy versus Spy from back in the day. And, I tried. <laughs> uh, uh, in the, in, as far as like trying to tell, like you said, you know, oh, look at the beautiful shooting star. Oh, it's actually a crashing ship, you know, or, or yeah. <laughs> uh, um, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, I always like those kinds of uh, jokes and like turnabouts. Um, and I think you, you pull those off pretty well. Thank you. Can you, um, so tell us a bit about your approach to designing and illustrating your comics, especially for sci fi settings like Traveler. He, for traveler how do you come up with like um, ideas for what aliens and plants and things should look like as far as the, as far as aliens go there's the science fiction the science fiction community has more it is a treasure trove of of, of opportunities and you know so, and um and uh, inspiration to look at Sometimes, sometimes I just do a, do a search on if I if I need to come up, want to come up with a new alien, I'll, I'll do a search online or for for aliens. Or sometimes they just come to me, and I don't, I don't even know what the what their like, what their characteristics are, what they can do. Like like when the, the aliens in that in in that first uh, first contact strip, uh, I, I had no idea who they were, or what or, or what their species was, or you know what 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 abilities they had, or they were just they were just funny looking funny aliens with big eyes for for like creatures and and plants screenshots from video games help um my dad was a botanist so we um, so we used to go on nature hikes all the time and he'd point out all kinds of unusual unusual life forms that other people would just overlook and then of course for for alien creatures you can't go wrong by by uh, looking at by uh looking at pokemon <laughs> there's like a thousand there's like a thousand of them if you mix if you mix and match a couple no one no one's gonna every, first of all everyone's gonna know, notice no one's gonna care mm -hmm. <laughs> and everyone's gonna be amused <laughs> right yeah they're already a mishmash of things so i mean That's it's right. even worse i mean a, a, like a turtle and a garlic or something exactly. what is that you know yeah, uh, <laughs> what the heck is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh so how do you go from like 
blank page to finish in, in a broad sense to finish a uh, comic how do you go from like uh do you have an idea or do you just sit down and you look at the paper and then you come up with an idea and, and then you just flesh it out until you think it's done a little of column a a little of column b um I see. so it's not you sometimes the idea the idea comes to me um if it's a single pa if it's a single panel it's a it's a, it's um it usually just I, I i see a scene in my in my head and then i then i start sketching it out and sometimes and sometimes it works and sometimes it, sometimes it needs several it needs several uh, several tries to to get it right on the page um, for for longer format storytelling, I have to think in terms of of what came before and what's going to come next. Like the with the latest one that I'm doing, um, Homecoming or Return to Jodain. Sometimes the 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 pages are interludes. This is especially especially um, when they're when the when the crew's in jump space. It's always fun to explore what they're what people do in jump space because. You know, we got seven days of, of downtime. <laughs> right. What are you going to do with your time? Shoot and play a lot of pool, play cards. And, and it, as it happens, the crew, the crew plays Traveler on at least one of those days. <laughs> That's so <a> meta. <laughs> but you know, for for longer format storytelling, you have to think in terms of of uh, what's what came before and what comes next, and then you have to create a, a create hopefully a logical flow, like a continuity from. Yeah, you have to yeah. create a, you have to create some kind of continuity between uh, event A and event C, and right. that's you know that's not that's in many ways more challenging than coming up with a with a single panel strip. It's like you're tweening it from the first, you know, scene to the last scene. You're like, what comes in between here, and at what point, or do we want to peek into what's happening? Right? I mean, it's like, right. what's yeah, the most yeah, interesting? Yeah, you have to you have to break you have to break that 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 page down because I work one page at a time. I have to break that page down into okay, into how many panels am I going to need to tell this this chapter of the story, and how do I get it? From, how do I get those from in in a semi in a semi in a, in a logical or con or in, in some kind of continuity from event A from 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 uh, event A to the final. And then leading into the next, and then making sure that that leads into the next chapter of the story. So, can you share uh, a memorable experience or moment you've had while working on your projects or playing Traveler? Maybe a, a piece of fan mail that struck you, or uh... yeah, that was. I would the, the most. I, I got to say, the most memorable experiences that I've had recently have been. Um, have been publishing books for the first time on my own, putting together, being, finally having a volume of work and a, and an access to an outlet where I could where I could sell it, and being able to to take that creation, and put it out there in the universe for for people to enjoy, and people to to um, to purchase and enjoy and um, Knowing that it's that it's now the part of the traveler community at large, get it, getting um, beginning steadily out there was just the the thrill of a lifetime. I got I gotta say, and it's kind of, it's thrilling and it's kind of scary because now now it's out there and people are using it and, and uh, they're going to take it in directions that I can't predict. I hope because that's the purpose of a language, right? That that accomplishment was it was something that I that I've hoped for 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 uh, for about the past the past forty years as a gamer. Wow! Well, congratulations. It's an it is an accomplishment. It's a labor of love. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, how do you stay motivated and, and inspired to keep creating new content for Traveler, or for the Traveler uh, community at, at large? I keep reading. I. I, I I keep reading. I stay active in the community. I pay attention to the to the uh, to the current trends, and you know, I, I, I and every now and then, it, every now and then, it pays to take a break, draw mm -hmm. something, work on something else for a while, and and uh, do something not directly traveler related, because you got to recharge. 
uh, there's, there's just so much there's just so much uh there's so much lore out there that it's almost impossible to keep up with all of it and the good thing is there's more being written every day yeah the uh the traveler wiki is uh, ginormous and contains so much information and there's just there's a lot of uh um, fan created stuff out there in the world um uh, i'm a fan uh, creator you're a fan creator what what role do you see um fan created content playing in the future of the traveler rpg community and the industry as a whole uh, i i would say i would say that it's it's not an exaggeration to say that it's critical to the survival um, um fan created content was what was what revitalized ad and and it is what is keeping traveler going the indus the the industry leaders they create the, they create the 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 uh the quote unquote canon material, but it's the fans that really bring that really give life to the to the entire uh hobby. That's a good point. Uh Traveler Map, fan created. Yep. Um Traveler Wiki, fan created. The Jodani base, fan created. There's uh it's not an exaggeration to say that the, that there's more fan created content out there than there is official content. I think I would agree with that. Yes, <laughs> that's definitely true. So you spent a significant amount of time developing uh, the Jordani language under your uh, Jordani Language and Cultural Institute. Um, what sparked your interest in the Jordani race, and how did you get the idea for creating their language? Been interested in in the Jordani since since I I bought the. Uh, I forget which adventure it is. I think it's number six, um, Expedition to Jordan, where where they really, where they they were really. Uh, I think they were first introduced there, in any in any kind of depth. It always fascinated me. What what was the catalyst? Uh, why would a why would a culture like this develop? Because um, you know, it's it's not like they will. It's not like. An entire society woke up one day and said, "Hey, let's develop psionics and re and re re reorder our entire society around it." There, there had to be a reason. So, my explorations into Jodani culture was the result of me wanting to tell a story about a Jodani uh, expatriate character behind, uh, trapped in the Third Imperium, and how she related to this and how she overcame the overcomes culture shock and uh, the a variety of other factors to become to become uh, who she is now so I, in order to do that i i decided i had i had to investigate uh, the language and like all the other languages in traveler 40 years 40 years ago we were we were handed a, a system for creating words and then and, and expand and uh, expanding on that aspect of culture but uh, very little was, but very little was actually done with it in the in the, um, in the interim period. Look, looking, looking, searching online and finding nothing, or, or or very little, except for the few hundred words that had already been created. I decided that um, it was time somebody did, and thus the Jodani Language Institute was born. How did you go about coming up with a language? I mean, uh, do you speak other languages? What uh, what kinds of um, skills did you bring to bear? on creating the Zodani, the Zodani language? Uh, just, just a general fascination with language in general. I'm not a linguist. I have, I have four years of high school German and a few semesters of college German under my belt. And I've, I lived in Japan and Korea and Saudi Arabia, and I've always made a point of trying to learn a little bit of the, of the native language of the, of the countries that I've lived in. So yeah, I, I learned how I, I taught myself to read, write, and speak a little bit of read, read and write Korean and speak a little bit of it, and I, and I learned to read Arabic while I was in Saudi Arabia. I speak a, a few words of it. I know some I know some Japanese. I I still I I can't read Japanese. I can't read hiragana, katakana, or any of those. But uh, my my oldest daughter is teaching herself how to do that, or power to her. And uh, yeah, just a general and just a general fascination of with uh, languages that uh, I also that I blame on Tolkien. But yeah, I, I went I went full Tolkien so I could tell tell a story about one character. <laughs> 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 uh, 
So, uh, <clears throat> how did you, uh, uh, can you share some interesting or unique aspects of the Zhudani language and culture that fans of Traveler might find interesting? There are, there are several. First, it is, it is object oriented. We call it, we, we, we call it object and an object oriented language, meaning that in the, in a, in a, in a sentence, the object comes before the verb, and then the, then the, the subject of the sentence is the last the, the last item in the sentence. This means that when you're translating anything into Zdo, you have to you have to flip the the sentence structure sometimes to to get it right before you before you go and go about the translation. It is also an agglutinative language, meaning that a single word can express a very complex subject example uh, oh i'm gonna have to look that up <laughs> there is a there is a fine example in the traveler wiki that has recent that was recently added here we have the sentence i hate the superior person who hates my stealth scout now that it is kind of a it's kind of an eccentric sentence to use as an example but it but it's, it's a good illustration that's the that's the English form. The next sent, the, ne the 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 next one is the superior person hating my stealth scout. I hate. Now we have put the object, the superior person, in the in the uh, lead the um, front of the sentence. Finally, next in object verb sentence order, it is the my scout hating superior person. I hate. We're still in English at this point. Now. We're trying now. We're using we're applying um, Zedetal, uh rules to the English trend to the English form. Scout my hate participle superior person hate I. Object, verb, subject. This becomes translated into Zedetal. Stubnik, Ransenj Vlasteber Ransik. Four words to express what took nearly ten in English. I see. That's a great example. Yeah. And it's very challenging. It makes translation quite challenging because you can't, even though you can do this, you don't strictly speaking have to, you can speak, you, you can translate it into a more, in, into a more sim, a, a simpler, more uh, English structured phraseology. But that would, I imagine, mark you as a, a, a as a non-native speaker. Here's a question about uh, Zhudani. Um, being a psychic race, what need do they have for languages? Not everyone is is telepathic. Uh, pro, uh, the the proles, for example, Jantad, are not trained in telepathy. Only those with significant ability are trained, uh, uh, are identified and um, elevated to the to the ranks of nobility. Within their you know, within yeah. their class system, everyone everyone else, um, commoners uh, do not use do not actively use telepathy. Now, nobles will will happily scan and uh, communicate tele telepathically with with everybody, but commoners do not. The other reason the other reason is uh, telepath. Um, Telepathic signals don't interact well with machines, so you, you still you still need a written you still need a written language a written display um, on your on your computer screens. Uh, <laughs> so, some things to consider. <clears throat> yeah, you can't t telepathically make a phone call. Um, no, you can't. <laughs> yes, or maybe short one, <laughs> very <Yeah>. short distance. <laughs> <laughs> if you know, it, yeah. If you if the person is within range of your telepathy, you would, but, but then you wouldn't you wouldn't need the phone. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so what are your near term plans for Amber Zone comic comics and the uh, Jodani Language Institute? Are there any upcoming releases or events we should look forward to? For the comics, I am I'm planning on continuing a story of. Um, my uh, Jordani expatriate, as she, as as the crew, the now retired crew of the uh, of the um, Blue Falcon makes their way across the Third Imperium toward the, the toward the uh, vast unknown that is the the um, Jordani Consulate. 
uh, one does not simply walk into Mordor. Um, it takes several. We it, it takes several jumps, and I'm also. <laughs> I'm sure. I, uh, I'll add that I'm adding this to my list of to my list of things to do. Um, I'm going to release a line of uh, T-shirts and and uh, coffee mugs and other swag uh, based on the the T-shirts that my that Crash, my main character and pilot uh, has been seen has been seen wearing in the strips. And as far as the institute goes, I'm currently working on a on a huge project called the Zogplas Adventures, which is um, a standalone game system inspired by inspired by Traveler, inspired by Jodani history. Traveler players will recognize many of the mechanics. And uh, it is set entirely on Shadant during the Second Dark Age after they after their first forays into space into their moon of Chaco resulted in a global outbreak of a um, ancient bioweapon that almost that, that, that almost left their their race extinct. The players will play the um, the survivors of the cataclysm. Uh, eking out an existence and trying to survive and maybe even occasionally bring, bring civilization to a world gone mad. Psionics plays a role in it, but because psionics is not well developed at the, at, at the time of the, of the Second Dark Age, it is um, primitive at best. It's, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun developing it. it. It actually grew out of a conversation that I had with another ZLI member where I posed the question, we were we were discussing the arts and and literature, and I said and I posed the question: um, Do the Shodani have anything approximating samurai folklore or spaghetti westerns? <laughs> and it turns out it turns out uh, yeah, they kind of do. <laughs> All right, so you're going to develop that out, and uh, best of luck on that project. This sounds like an interesting and fun project. In the uh, in the long term, how do you envision the future of your projects and their impact on the uh, traveler community? Are you uh, you already mentioned that you're hoping folks will take the uh, beginnings of Dettel and uh, develop that language out? What are your, what are your yeah. uh, overall hopes for the future of those of uh, Amberzone Comics plus uh, the ZLI? Well, I hope I will continue running both uh, running both the Amberzone and and the ZLI probably until. Uh, the universe is the, the universe decide that's done with me and i hope i hope uh, traveler is still around in that by then and i hope uh, i hope somebody come somebody else um some other enthusiast takes takes it over for the community at large though i hope somebody follows up follows follows my lead and follow and the lead of people like um robert eagleston and um and, and other other uh, language enthusiasts and picks up some of the other languages that haven't been that haven't been developed. You know, Robert Bob Eagleston developed Galani several years ago, and he has a, he has quite a, a very good offering out there, with extensive glossary and grammar. What it what what it needs is a a, a well developed uh, a well developed primer, the teeth so that people can pick it up and 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 learn quickly. Now, Bellani has its own quirks. It's a tonal language, which has, which presents its, would like Chinese, which presents its own special set of challenges, but it's not impossible. Yeah, I, I, I'm hoping that somebody, that somebody picks up one of the Varger dialects and, and runs with it. And I know, I know this is a long shot, but, you know, maybe, some, maybe some brave soul or team of, or team of enthusiasts can pick up Truk, the, the Aslan language. And, uh, turn it into something that you can uh, at least insult one of the space kitties with. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Those are great hopes for the future. Um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, let's, let's come back to the present day. <laughs> the, um, let's talk about some uh, current events. So with the rise of uh, virtual tabletop platforms, um, how do you see this trend affecting, um, uh, the traveler experience and your projects. Uh, do you uh, any plans for making your language books available for VTT, or maybe 
Zudani, uh, uh, I say Zudani, Zudani <laughs> adventures uh, available on V on VTT, or, oh, yeah, or is it uh, v, VTT doesn't affect you? I haven't used it that much. I've I've experimented a little bit with Roll Twenty, but I know, but I never never really I haven't really uh, done any serious gaming with it. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the once we once the uh, Zod class adventures gets more fully more uh, fully formed i do plan on doing extensive play testing via roll 20. Uh, most of the institute members are, are scattered across the globe so that's the only way we're going to do it yeah virtual tabletop is the way it is um, that the, that would that a lot of us are going to connect it's increasingly hard for to find local groups at least for me that can meet consistently in this and and uh, you know, roll roll twenty and virtual tabletop is just the way to go, and yes. it brings together different. It brings it brings different perspectives together too. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, I've learned a lot of stuff about other cultures just by playing with people all around the world. So it's uh, super interesting to me. Let's talk a little bit about um, the rise of AI. Um, there's been a lot of uh, hubbub about uh, um, AI recently in uh, art and content, and uh, also as well as like within the game, like um, uh, could you play an AI in Traveler, and what would that be like? And would you have a body, or would you live in the computer? And how much rain might you have? Do you have any thoughts on uh, any of those AI topics? Oh, I have many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've seen seen people using using AI to, to, to create quick illustrations of, of characters, it, you know, it, it's, um, and it's good for, for, I, I find it useful for, for like a rapid prototyping of, of, uh, environments and scenes. I, I mostly, I use it for, to, to generate quick reference photos that I can use to, to draw to um, do my own human created art from. This is mostly because when I when I try to when I try to create get it when I try to get like something like the journey to create specific characters in a specific scene, it always gets something wrong. Mm -hmm. and it, it, it's never it's never how I envision it. Now, so, sometimes it adds elements that I find useful, but mo but mostly mostly I just end up using it as a reference point. I saw um, a funny. Uh, uh... Um, meme about uh, AI art and it was like uh, salmon in the river and it was like fillets of salmon jumping up the stream and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it adds, it, it adds extra, it, even, even mid journey version five still adds extra arms and fingers and stuff to in, in odd locations. But it's useful, but not, but not a replacement yet. <laughs> And I don't think it ever, I don't think it really ever will replace human artists. I, at least, you know, I, I, I hope we don't get to that point because, because that will be a bit, to me, that'll be, that'll be a very sad day. I'm glad that it exists because, because there are a lot of, I've seen a lot of people out there who, you know, users out there who are using it, who may, who have mobility issues or, or, or lack the, don't have the, 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 the time or ability or, or, um, you know, it, or skill to, to do their, to do human created art, those people, it can be a powerful tool for storytelling. And I, and, you know, I, and I, I, I'm, I'm glad it's out there for them. One thing I've noticed is uh, AI in the hands of regular people. Uh, I mean, in the average Joe produces good results, but AI in the hands of an artist uh, produces fantastic results. Oh yeah, if you really know how to how to phrase the how to phrase the prompts properly, you can you can produce some some amazing stuff, and people do. There's uh, recently been a lot of discussion about uh, around the uh, Wizards of the Coast open gaming license fiasco. Do you have any thoughts on that situation? Were you affected by it? And uh, how do you think it might impact the Traveler RPG community? Uh, I'm following it closely. It didn't. It, it didn't really impact me that much, except that it, except development, except for in terms of development of like of the uh, the Zod class book. Um, I did kind of have to. What, I have been watching and watching and waiting to see how that plays out before I go releasing it to the public. Unfortunately, it's it's but it's 
that that's uh, months away from from uh, being ready for for uh, beta testing. By then, I by then I think uh, most of the most of the um, the OpenGL stuff will be resolved by then. Will, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I think it will be. And I've I've heard good things coming out of coming out of the rest of the game, the uh, of the uh, gaming the game development community. I've heard Mongoose is is coming up with their own open gaming license specific specific to Traveler, and of course there's Pathfinder and Starfinder that. They, they they all they all all they have their their own version of it too it'd be best to cut out it, the it, unstable it, middleman you know yes and that the uh it, it was it was amazing to see how quickly the community and how quickly uh other major companies the industry rallied rallied around the the uh, the community and um just came together and said no we're not having this right yep People came out and uh, started uh, canceling their D and D subscriptions, and yeah, they they got hit in the pocketbook pretty hard, and then they uh, backpedaled. Yep, but yep. It, but the damage the damage was already done. Yep, <laughs> yep. I I wonder how that's going to affect the D and D movie. I don't even. I think they pushed it back to try to let all this stuff die down. Yeah, that'll be interesting. Fortunately, we already have the perfect D and D movie. It's called The Princess Bride. <laughs> Oh uh, yes. Using that word. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you wearing a mask? Well, everyone will be wearing one. It's all the rage. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're quite comfortable. I think everyone will be wearing them in the future. <laughs> so, uh, how do you stay up to date with uh, current events and trends in the RPG industry to m make sure that your projects stay relevant? I, I I read a lot. I follow the forums. Pretty active on social media. I'd like to say that I. I'd like to say be, say that I pay attention to the news, but honestly, I to to the RPG news. But honestly, I if I if I hadn't been on the travel on the, in the traveler walk so much as I am, I probably wouldn't have even been aware of the the mm -hmm. uh, uh, fiasco. What advice would you give to somebody looking to create their own content for Traveler or who, who wants to join the uh, Traveler community? I would say start small and build and read everything that you possibly can. There's a, there is a, it is the most fully realized and, and um, complete science fiction universe out there and that's because it's got four it's got some 47 years of lore that, that have been that have been uh, developed for it and it's easy to get overwhelmed so start with start with start small start with something that interests you and then just keep just keep reading and stay curious about it so, and uh, join the fan forums ask the questions Eventually, you'll run into. Eventually, you'll run into someone. You know, you'll run into someone like me who 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 uh, just loves delving into the delving into the prehistory and and uh, esoteric stuff. You'll find out that uh, the community is very helpful. You'll never run it. You'll 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 never run out of of uh, cool stuff and cool stuff to investigate once you start playing Traveler. That's good advice. Are there um, some other aspects of the Traveler universe that you'd like to explore in the future, either through Amber Zone Comics or with the uh, Jodani Language Institute? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I just, I, I, I just mentioned the, the. Uh, I think I just mentioned the history. Traveler has a has an internal game history that that stretches back three hundred thousand years, but we've only, but the Third Imperium only covers about uh, only covers is uh, not even one percent of that it's an awesome setting but it's not all there is so uh, i would like to I, I would like to go and and examine uh what life what life might have been like on during bronze age Don, during the vipchakalachia empire uh i would love first i would love to to uh, delve into Valani history especially um or Valani prehistory the uh, twenty thousand year period, while the while the Mecca and Kaiju were still rampaging across 
the, uh, across the land and making life even more difficult than it already was for the for the uh, for the people that would eventually become the Villani. I would like I'd like to look at the late twenty first century of Terran history and look at look at um, first contact between the Zero Circa and and uh, the the expanding the expanding Terran explorers. Hmm. This is all really cool stuff. Yeah, that's a cool idea. Like where where like uh, where are the other races at, at this point in history comparatively? Right. Yeah. Hmm. And, um, the 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 the, the, the Vala, both the Valani and the Jodani were exploring space while we were still using bronze tipped spears. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's just crazy to think about. But they had different they they had different environmental, cultural, and evolutionary pressures on them. Can you share with us your favorite aspect or element of Traveler that keeps you passionate about your projects? It varies. Right now, right now, right now, it's the it's the war, it's the history. Yeah, I just I just love digging into that stuff and and uh, exploring it because it, it it's it's un it's uncharted space, as it were. It was it's written about, but but not but only in terms of okay here uh, okay here's the timeline of the of the charted space universe. Yeah, I, I just I I love digging into digging into the um, the prehistory of it, and then there's psionics, and of course the of course. Uh, this, the the, space, the starships. So, uh, Jeff, where can uh, people find uh, your products? Um, and now also, how can people follow you and learn more about your projects? On Facebook, you can find me at Amber Zoned. You can also look up the uh, Jodani Language and Cultural Institute on Facebook, and that's where you can learn more about the the uh, lovable weirdos that to the uh, to to uh, Spinward of the Third Imperium. My books are available on lulu.com. And if you search for if you search for either my name or Amber Zoned or Jodani, you will find them. Or Zadel, you will find them. We'll uh, put links in the uh, in the description to these uh, to the show notes so people can find that stuff. Well, hey Jeff, we've come to the end of our interview. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for taking the time to sit with us again. Um, I'm your host, Frank Sicardi, known as Cyborg Prime on the internet. I've been here sitting uh, enjoying a conversation with Jeff Kazmierski from Amber Zone Comics and the mastermind <laughs> behind the uh, Jordani Language Institute. Thank you so much uh, again, Jeff. And to the folks out there listening, happy traveling. here in the studio at the discord server and uh i hope everybody uh is having fun let's see it's the fifth annual traveler rpg mayday mayday and uh we got a lot of stuff going on today and <laughs> uh yeah we had a little uh false start there to begin with but everything's working now and uh hopefully no more twitchy trigger finger from cyborg prime <clears throat> apologies to uh, uh matthew kerwin uh for <laughs> botching his interview however uh that interview is banked and available on uh youtube i just have to make sure that uh um just have to make sure that uh Hold on a second. We're experiencing a little technical difficulty. Alrighty, there we go. So <clears throat> we have uh, uh, Amber Zoned in the house. He just came into the studio. I just had to uh, adjust his mic level there. Uh, Amber Zoned, you got some background noise triggering your mic, so 
just so you know. I'll have, I'll turn you back on here in a second. Um, in the meantime, I hope you guys enjoyed that interview with Jeff Kazmierski from Amber Zone Comics and also the Jodani uh, Language Institute. Um, let's uh, see if we can get him in here. Alrighty, Mr. Amberzoned. Come in, Amberzoned. Come in, Amberzoned. Aha. Okay, I hear you. Fantastic. Congratulations. <laughs> all right all right here we go that's, uh, that's mrs mrs zoned in the background hello mrs zoned uh welcome welcome I, I had a little technical glitch there but i think we have all the uh audio seems to be working now say hello to everybody jeff hello everybody greetings greetings humans and fellow humans and other cell phones all right good uh, i just want to make sure that there was no glitches i had some uh audio things turned off so they wouldn't bleed into the uh into the into the audio we're trying we're trying something new this year this is a little different setup than we've done in previous years and so there was a little technical glitches but okay. looks like everything's working you're coming through loud and clear i'm coming through loud and clear and uh so we'll just uh, go from there so how's everything you you just uh closed on your new house congratulations we did yeah mm -hmm. so uh, uh, feel, feeling a bit uh excited stressed uh, you know you know how uh -huh. it is <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. no i don't know about stress at all <laughs> or pressure <laughs> well you know stuff happens it's a live show sorry yeah. uh matthew kerwin i will make it up to you somehow um great and fun interview with that hybrid though and a great uh, creative and fun idea so um yeah so how's things tell us a little bit about the uh about the uh, uh zli and amber zone comics while i have you here and then we'll we'll pick some uh winners for the next uh all right door prizes yeah, um so um we've been lately i've been hard at work on uh the second edition of beginnings Dental. Mm -hmm. And um, regular followers of Amber Zone will will uh, will, will be aware of that. Um, this one is going to have um, a lot more sociology in it, so uh, so uh, be prepared. Be prepared for some in, some deep discussions. Um, the re rearranging some of the some of the content, adding some vocabulary, and it'll into it'll fully integrate the um, the uh, dictionary as well as as a, as an appendix. So it'll be all bound in one. And 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 uh, my final plan is to get it published under the Travelers Aid Society imprint on um, Drive Through RPG. So oh, that'll be great. Yeah. In, the, in in that way, it'll become part. It'll be um, hopefully become part of the official traveler canon. Super awesome! My brainchild. Right. Yeah. Hey. Great. Congratulations on that. That'd be great. Cool. So, hey, let's uh, let's do a random draw. You're a sponsor of the show, and uh, there, you've been so kind to uh, um, give us your entire digital library as the uh, as a door prize, and. Uh, Add in, yep. and you're adding in a uh, something special for the grand prize. What's that? That is a soft cop soft cover copy of the first edition of Beginnings Dental. Very awesome. Sorry, folks, U.S. only for that due to shipping costs. It's super prohibitive to ship outside the U.S. Um, but um, there's a big pile of stuff that you've uh, you've set set in, including. Um, Beginnings of Dental, the Delublicia, 
Zadettle Dictionary. Oh, oh my god, yeah. did I say that right? Dictionary? Okay. Close. No, I knew I would yeah. mangle that. Okay. Amber zoned <laughs> first contact. Uh Amber zoned next gas four billion miles. Or what what is that? Four trillion kilometers? Yes, <laughs> four billion kilometers. Four billion kilometers. Uh, and uh, a year in the zone. Um so those are all great uh awesome prizes, digital digital uh prizes. So let us draw a random number. Uh, Jeff, give me a random number between one and sixty-two. Between one and sixty-two. Thirty-seven. Uh thirty-seven. Uh welcome. Uh, welcome. Congratulations, uh Keo Lirith. Um from Gmail. We have a Amber Zoned collection for you, courtesy of Jeff Kazmierski at Amber Zone Comics. Congratulations. And it's not too late to get in the drawing. Just go to cyborgprime.com slash mayday2023. And there's a little box right at the top where you can enter the random drawings that are going on all day long. If you, if you missed a door prize now, you can still win another one throughout the day. And you can still be chosen for the super duper grand prize, which gets a copy of everything we've given out as a door prize today, plus a big pile of additional things. So uh, if you go to the website and look under um, the prizes section, you will see you will see that uh, that stuff there. So go have a look. Um, and then in a few minutes, uh, I'll be drawing. We'll be drawing. Um, let's see. We got ten more minutes or so. We'll be drawing a second um, gift this this break, and uh, that will be a gift certificate from uh, our sponsor. Brian Goff. So thank you very much. That's a $10 gift certificate to drive through RPG. So that'll be cool. Um, Jeff, what are your, uh, what do you think about, let's talk a little bit about, I mean, we've got like 10 minutes to kill. If you're into it, I have uh, some things we can chat about. Sure. Um, yeah. What's your, uh, do you have a, like a, uh, any, character creation tips and tricks and, and if not directly for traveler do you have any um ideas for like uh generically how to um you know come up with a good traveler character or a good or good character for your stories in general oh my um <laughs> for, as far as my as far as my stories go the characters usually <sighs> Yeah, I, I don't. I, I don't. I like to say that I don't uh, create them so much as I meet them, and and so, sometimes I'll be so, sometimes I'll be um, just doing just uh, randomly drawing drawing stuff, and um, this character will leap onto the page and say, "Hey, you know, I've got a story to tell," and then I have to figure out what he or she is like, and. Uh, you know what their what their history is and and where they come from and then usually then then I usually go to the character creation systems and try to uh, and and roll and re-roll until I find until I find one that fits. Um, as for you know, for for character creation, uh, I li I like coming up with the concept first and then trying and then trying to work work into. Uh, um, Work with the the character generation system, and, and and until I get one, until I get a a good result that that works. Uh, it's all a little bit random. <laughs> <laughs> Not random, but it's it's all a bit unpredictable. Um, you never know who's going. I never know who's going to walk into my my uh storytelling life at any given moment or what or what they're going to be like and you know <laughs> sometimes i get inspiration from games i'm from other games i'm playing uh-huh well those are all good tips um i try to come up with i always write a like little blurb about my character like uh that i can refer to later like i make a I don't know, maybe like a little write up or uh, something. I, I can change it later if I don't like it, but it gives me something to start from. 
Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I like I like doing that too. I I wrote up some uh, character tips, uh, character making tips. If you, people are interested, you can go over to my blog. Um, it's over at uh, cyborgprime.com. And if you go into the blog and you look for the uh, Traveler Ultimate Guide to Playing Traveler, um, there's links off of that to uh, tips for character creation and stuff like that. Um, mostly, what I think what my my ideas would be would just come up with a good backstory. Uh, try to you know even if it's just a one little paragraph um, thing. I, recently, I started playing with some a, a new group of people, and I, I uh, came up with um, Doctor Tarek Voss, who's the Zeno Astro cosmologist. <laughs> he has a uh, <laughs> he has a PhD in uh, zeology, xenology, and then um, a bachelor's degree or master's degrees in. Um, Astro astronomy and cosmology so i put those all three together and he's a xeno astrocosmologist and then i was like well what is somebody what does a xeno astrocosmologist do right. and so i uh <laughs> i wrote up a little blurb about it so you know uh so in case anybody asks <laughs> yeah. and then i also uh good. yeah good see, uh, it's good to see scientists and and other non non-military career types represented in the <laughs> in storytelling you don't i think to, we to, uh, too often we lean a little bit too heavily toward the navy army archetypes and, right right well you know yeah. i try to i try to people come to uh sci-fi games with different kinds of like expectations about like what's what the game's about and for some people they're thinking it's aliens and for some people they're thinking it's star trek and for some people that they're thinking it's star wars so i kind of get a feel for it, what each of the players think it's going to be right, like and yeah. they kind of mishmash it up you know so um yeah you if you look at like play, you do kind of have to play to your audience and tailor right, your game to right what, right what your players want to do if you look at like stuff from examples from pop culture like stargate i mean it's yeah they have marines you know but they also are mostly they're scientists but with like marine bodyguards or whatever um right and uh on, same kind of thing on star trek they don't always go down with the security team but they you know sometimes do um and so there, there's a, there's a place for the marine and the the person who wants to fight but then you know the main characters are the non-fighters i mean uh, uh captain kirk does starfleet foo or whatever and judo chops you or whatever and and uh, <laughs> and <laughs> starfleet judo chop and then uh <laughs> Uh, Spock pinches your neck, and uh, the doctor gives you a tranquilizer. I mean, they're not like shooting everybody up, right? So, right, well, yeah. well, I guess technically the doctor's shooting everybody up. Facing <laughs> <laughs> everybody. Up. With the tranquilizer to the <laughs> neck. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, you know, I try to um, when I make characters, uh, I enjoy you know my favorite character is Mister Spock. So, uh, and and also <laughs> Doctor. Uh, Dr. Rodney McKay on Atlantis. He's so annoying. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I like him. Um, I, I like kind of characters that have a weakness like that. Like, uh, he's annoying, so like he, he gets picked last. But also, on the other hand, he also gets picked first because he's also brilliant. You know, he's like a savant. Like, I mean, um, savant. Um, savant, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, he's can't function socially you know <laughs> we, we need it we need him but we can't stand him yeah yeah but we need him we'll tolerate him on this mission <laughs> yeah cool all right well hey i'm gonna uh while you're here uh we're coming up on their next one which is going to be uh in about two minutes let's uh let's do the other drawing this is going to be uh, a drawing for a ten dollar gift certificate to um drive through rpg sponsored by um, Brian Goff, who is one of my uh, Patreon patrons, so thank you very much for double sponsoring me in true traveler's um, uh, benefactor style. <laughs> All right, Jeff, give me another number this time between uh, yeah one and sixty-two. Twenty-nine. Twenty-nine, and twenty-nine is congratulations to. Pete Burke, you've won a $10 gift certificate to drive through RPG. They have tons of great stuff there. 
and I uh, hope you enjoy whatever you spend it on, uh, courtesy of Mr. Brian Goff. So thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Uh, thanks, Jeff, for being a sponsor and uh, hanging out and chatting chatting with me. Um, Pleasure. Uh, you're welcome to come back at any time. Uh, we're going to um, uh, uh, have um, the reception at the end of the day. I don't know if it'll be too late for you or if you'll be tired, but come to the after hours and, uh, and mingle <laughs> if, you, uh, yeah. if you can. Yeah. <laughs> you know I'll be there. All right, great. All right, coming up next, 2D storyteller, Mr. Neil Thorpe. Opening merchant interface. Scanning trade routes. Scanning for cargo destinations within jump range. Cargo shipment available. Five tons of hostile organisms and seven tons of starship interface modules. Destined for Sigmis Delta. Contacting Neil Thorpe of 2D Storyteller for more information. Stand by. I'm here today with my friend Neil Thorpe of 2D Storyteller. Hi, Neil. Hello there, Mr. Prime. How are you today? I'm good. Uh, just had some wonderful curry. Uh, and I'm ready. Fantastic. Ready, willing, and able. Fantastic. Welcome back to the... Uh... Traveler May Day event. Uh, Neil, tell us a little bit about your um, background and uh, who are you and what do you do? Well, my name is Neil Thorpe. I run 2D Storyteller and I create animated and interactive battle maps. I started out uh, in games design, um, independent level design on uh, games such as No More Room in Hell. I did some community work on Left 4 Dead 2. Um, I also was a university lecturer for VFX and digital film production. And these days I bring the, uh, the hobby of game design and VFX to tabletop gaming, both online and in person. Fantastic. Uh, tell us, uh, what inspired you to, um, start creating battle maps? Well, I've been a tabletop gamer and role player, um, since 95 um and as i got older i started to get into vfx and digital film production and it never occurred to me that i could combine the two together uh, but when i was teaching at university uh, i got back into gaming with my nephew and i just i, I got inspired to create some like, exciting assets you know battle maps that actually move and have sound effects and have interactive elements to them to create a, a bigger, grander experience. So, what are battle maps exactly? What are they used for? And, um, like, what, uh, you know, what exactly are they? Well, when we're role playing, you know, we have action scenes um, and combat scenes, and battle maps are a way to visualize the location and to give us the option of having tokens and miniatures to play out battles as part of our role play experience. As not just imagine it. Not that it's a replacement for imagination, but it's, a, it's an excellent addition. And is this something that uh, works with like a virtual tabletop or uh, how, how do people use these um, virtual battle, these battle maps? Lots of people like different things. Some people like to be in person and they're quite a purist about that. I mean, I myself have a, a TV tabletop for, to do just that and that's basically where you have a tv tv laid horizontally with a protective screen on it so you can still use your miniatures um but some people like btt's such as roll 20 foundry uh, foundry forge ark and forge etc and you can use the, the battle maps on there as well and then you have, actually have tokens and you can play with people across the world so the, you know it's a wide gamut and people like things depending on their tastes oh very cool so um, how do you approach creating a new battle map for a specific RPG setting or campaign? It's all about ideas, 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 ideas. Get a concept in your head and then from there, chase it down into something that you can actually create. Every battle map, I usually start with an idea that I think there's no way I can create that. And the journey to creating it, I learn a lot along the way. Um, and hopefully by the end, so far touch wood, it's always gone this way. I find that actually I can create it. And, you know, so as long as I keep doing that, I'm always reaching beyond my grasp, which is something I like to do. But I start usually start on paper. 
with an idea and then i'll try and create a tactical layout pretty much in the way that i would design a map for counter strike or one of those other kind of versus maps and try and create an interesting layout that uh, miniatures would move around well or tokens and it creates some tactical situations also i want it to look beautiful you know i want it to look really feel like the location make it stylistic but usually the stylistic concerns come second the first thing to do is to get that layout down because the last thing you want to do is start creating something that halfway through you think oh this is going to be a dull dull thing to play on and then you have to start all over again so once you get that idea down solid then proceed to the uh the blood sweat and tears that's good advice uh, i do a lot of my work on paper first and work it all out on mm -hmm. paper and then um i recommend other people do that too <laughs> It's a lot easier well, to... Def well, paper costs nothing to render, does right. it? I mean, there's no technical requirements. Right, yeah. <laughs> Get a pen in your hand and keep drawing until you've got the image clear in your mind. And it'll come to you sooner, you know, about 10 or 11 drawings in, you'll think, ah, that's it. Right, right. So uh, how do you... What's the process of creating a uh, 3D animated battle map? Uh, do you... Once you have everything down on paper, then what, you go to the computer and you start uh, building models or putting together scenes or uh, uh well first or... of all get yourself a hat because otherwise you're going to lose a lot of hair in the process <laughs> <laughs> level level design whether it's for a tabletop game or a computer game is you know it's it's a marriage of technical and artistic intent basically and somewhere down the line you've got to try and jam these two together and, and give birth to something that's worth creating um you need to know which software you're going to use and you need to be very familiar with that software. It needs to be like an enemy and a friend all at the same time. Um, I usually end up in unreal engine these days just because I, I love game engines. And as much as I like, you know, I still use 3d rendering. I use um, blender quite a bit for my actual modeling side of things, especially if I need to make adjustments or create animations, but it all comes together in unreal. And then from there you're rendering out video files. Once you've actually created everything. I mean, I've, I've just skipped over the massive middle section, which is sure. actually bringing things together, sure. getting it look right and scale and everything right, else. Right, right. Well, that is the basic overview. Right, right. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, you get, uh, how do you incorporate player feedback and suggestions into your battle maps? Well, I listen to what people have to say, basically. I, I scour the comments more and often uh, than I like to admit um <laughs> if not just for insecurity but just so i can see what's going on what the reactions are like i also have a lot of people contact me personally which i always prefer actually because that way i can talk things through if people are having technical problems or if they've got ideas um i've had some great suggestions some people want to see me um create some cthulhu work and some more cyberpunk work and i'm a huge fan of both so uh yeah, I've got some good good feedback and ideas come from people that way. So yeah, getting in contact personally is is the uh, my personal preferred way. All right, cool. So what kind of um, RPG sessions do you think would benefit most from using 3D battle maps? I think any RPG session could benefit from a good battle map, whether it's animated or not. Animated gives you the added bonus of having something to feel a bit special, get create some atmosphere. I mean, uh, for example, a map I've uh, been working on at the moment is set in an elven forest because I do a lot of work for D&D. &D. And I've got like, you know, if you've got a normal battle map, you can have a beautiful image of like, say, a forest with the, the tree platforms, etc. cetera. Uh, but on this particular map, because it's animated, I can have an ent just wandering through the forest beneath you as your, uh, you know, your men are all fighting it out. You know, there's, there's woodland creatures and fairy sprites and all kinds of magic just floating around it it helps drag you into that atmosphere and essentially gives the gm the opportunity to focus on the characters and their experience rather than describing the details every few steps especially when you're in an action sequence that's where they're best suited right although i suppose you could just use it to even just illustrate like a marketplace or uh doesn't necessarily have to be a Absolutely. battle going on right i mean it could be this no, is the no. wizard's lab and this is just what it looks like when you come and visit him or whatever see 
you've got the idea in your head already. It's about generating the atmosphere. For some people, it's combat. For some people, it's the uh, the big showdown or the big conversation or meeting that glorious NPC who lives in the tower up on the hill or, or even, like, finding yourself on a spaceship next to a black hole or in the middle of nowhere mm-hmm. in the galaxy. So, uh, you know, it's all about helping generate the atmosphere and to stimulate that imagination because ultimately, as gamers... That's what we're all about. I don't care what game you play. It's all about creating that image between your ears. How do you balance uh, visual aesthetics with practical gameplay mechanics uh, when you create the battle maps? Do you like, uh, make... You know what? That's a really good question. And when I first started, it didn't occur to me as much as it does now. Now, it, now it's kind of always at the forefront of my mind. Um, the key is... Uh, I get this from when I was uh, designing maps for the source engine is you've got to be in control. You got to, what you got to do is decide in your mind what the key locations uh, within that map are, you know, say for example, we're setting it inside a, a starship or something like that. Then what say, can we pick like two? I wouldn't pick more than three key locations on that map that could say, for example, a GM might want to use as objectives or have a very important part of the plot there, or have a big showdown with the boss there. And then it's all about what you do with the route to those locations. And also, where do you expect the players to begin play on that map? And as soon as you've established those, then you're starting to take control of what the tactical gameplay is on your map. The distance between each side's starting location and those key locations, for example, that really is primary because that will decide how quick each, you know, that often decides which side's the attacker, which side's the defender. Let's say the engine room is one of our key locations and we want the defenders to be protecting it from like the boarding patrol or whatever. Then you want the engine room to be reached quicker by the defending side than you do the attackers. And once you start making small decisions in that regard those decisions snowball quite quickly and before you know it you've got quite a complex design just from gameplay uh, standpoint um you know evolving alongside all visual aesthetics the visuals are always important but they usually come last they, they have to is it difficult to uh, install battle maps uh how do you how do you get them into your computer get them up on the screen it depend, well it, it's utterly dependent on what your final destination is if you want to do it in person and you've set up a tv table you know you usually buy an old cheap tv and finding you know i have a wooden frame to have mine laid horizontally as soon as you do that then you just need something to plug into it like a laptop some people use a raspberry pi and from there it's just a case of vlc player you just have the video on looped and the TV does the rest of the work. Uh, the maps that I uh, create on my Patreon for that particular purpose, they come with or without grids. So depending on how your roleplay game runs or tabletop game runs, you can have a grid or without. Um, if you're doing it online on a VTT, then obviously you'll have some kind of idea about how to put your battle maps together. But once you've uploaded them to the particular site, whether it's Foundry or Roll20, it's usually a case of drag and drop and just get it to the size you want. You can usually scale it by the corners. Um, and so what about the interactive elements? Uh, how do those work? Like maybe uh, uh, the can, interactive elements. Can, are... can you give examples of like interactive elements that people would find on your map? And then like, how do they use them? For, all right. For example, in um, hostile organism, I have, doors that can be opened and closed and the way that works is once that to- it's basically a token once that's on your vtt then you'll have options on that vtt when you right click play stop all the rest of it it's all you got to do is hit play and the door will slide open i handle the animation beforehand so literally all the gm has to do is hit play as a token and away it goes and when you want to reset it you just double click the play button It's back to the beginning. I try to keep it as simple as that for all my interactive tokens. I try and do all the difficult stuff like scaling and prepping and animating all on my end so the GM can just hit play after placing the token and they're away. Awesome. 
You do need you do need a, a VTT for that though. You can't just do that on your TV in your living room, right? Okay. Unless you use the VTT on the TV on your living room. That's a lot of abbreviations, but <laughs> to those who know, you know. <laughs> Yeah, right. Um, how uh, can you give some examples of uh, interactive things that people would find on your map aside from doors? Oh, sorry. Yeah, the doors, I suppose, is a bit of a mundane one. Uh, on Hostile Organism, uh, I also have aliens that come up out of the floor, that come out of hived wall sections. I have character tokens where when you press play, uh, a nasty, unpleasant creature will burst out of their throat, spreading blood everywhere. Uh, computer screens that when you activate them will change to like an emergency or bring up a holographic image um and that's just on hostile organism you know there's uh, i have quite a few different packs all with different interactive animations and on my patreon every month i'm releasing a battle map with an interactive animation awesome as well as static versions and such oh cool very cool all right. So, um, can you share any uh, challenges you faced in creating your uh, 3D animated battle maps and how you overcame them? Well, there's lots. There's lots of challenges. Um, I suppose the big one that I'm always fighting is the fact that it's a top-down view, and most game engines are designed to work from a first-person perspective. It doesn't mean that things don't work when you're coming from a top-down view but it means that your lighting has to change and you know you have to uh, you have to constantly be aware of your main sources of light and the kind of shadows they're painting onto your image you don't want your image to be all shadows and you can't have a convincing image without shadows so with every map you're trying to strike a fine balance with your shadows so yeah i'll pick shadows shading and shadows of your main light source a constant bugbear, but one you can never ever neglect. Uh, how did? What was your? Uh, did you have a way you finally overcame that challenge? You figured it out, or you just, <laughs> or you, or you learned that you have to figure it out every time. <clears throat> well, every map is different. Even if it's the similar location, you're going to have different uh, scenery objects, a different layout. You're never going to create the same map twice. So the lighting is. Ne- never really the same twice um to be a complete pompous snob i could quote da vinci (laughs) 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 and say no piece of art is ever finished merely abandoned gotcha i could still be working on the first project i ever started if i really wanted to you've got to you gotta have a cutoff point where you say all right i could i can release this and it's time to say goodbye and just let it go see what happens can you tell us about a particularly memorable or challenging project you've worked on and how you tackled it (laughs) um well all of them i suppose are are logged in my memory somewhere um i loved my days on no more room in hell those were some great days um massive audience base to play to you know we had over six million downloads at our peak um i still get some fond memories for the for any no more room in hell players out there i made brooklyn isolated ransack femur uh that will may not mean anything to you prime but, but, but <laughs> to no room in our players it was me um i had a great time with those guys and i had a great time building for that mainly because i love the zombie apocalypse it was one of the first genres i ever got into as a kid which i know is a bit sick but <laughs> i didn't take the sickness away from the zombie apocalypse it was the it was the character acts that i love but yeah uh, level design for No Ronel was one of my highlights. And Hostile Organism, that was a massive labor of love. Uh, I'm a huge sci fi fan and a sci fi nerd, and it was just so enjoyable to create that. It was difficult, but seeing it come together, it almost brought a tear to my eye. I loved it. Yeah, it came it came, uh, came out really great. It's got great uh, aliens uh, feel. Um, so well done. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I like it's, it's it's got a lot of inspirations, but yeah, there was uh, I was channeling the spirit of James Cameron, even though he's still alive. <laughs> um, His creative spirit, right, right, right. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, what do you think makes your three D animated battle map stand out from other battle maps on the market? Well, I think everyone, well, everyone I'm aware of that creates uh, battle maps in a in a similar market, they all work very hard. They all create some fantastic stuff. I don't like comparing myself to them because I'm not competing with them. I'm competing with myself. What I would say I try to do to stand out 
is I try to treat my battle maps like I would a film. And even though we're only seeing a very short snippet, I treat it like a short film. It's like a, I don't try and create a, a map that's just pointing the camera. That's the one thing I always try and avoid. I try and always create a scene, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. A moment from a story that is going on. And I try not to get too specific because then, you know, I, I like as many GMs to try and get something out of it as they can. But I do try and make it a moment like caught in a time, you know, 60 seconds of a particular place at a particular moment. Can you tell us about any um, upcoming projects or releases that you're working on? Well, Patreon is my big project at the moment, and it's going brilliantly. We've got some great releases. Uh, I've just done a lot of naval maps for those who like the high seas. Boarding action was a wonderful tactical map, which I really enjoyed working on. That was uh, February's release, and just having two ships locked in Mortal Kombat, that makes for a great tactical battle map as well. And also the distance between the ships... You know, imagining players trying to leap from one to the other, making and failing their roles. It just, it's got a brilliant atmosphere because cannons are blaring. I've put some sword fighting in the background. Great atmosphere. Uh, also, the, I've got um, another one where a dragon is attacking a village. And that was that was really challenging to make fire look real. That's a very difficult job to do in games design, uh, especially when from an above vantage point, where it really does feel like this dragon is burning this little poor village down to the ground and it keeps swooping in and coming out and it just it just felt like to me it could be one of the great or inspiring moments of your uh, Dungeons and Dragons campaign but on that point I do have a sci-fi version of my Patreon in the works and I really can't wait to do it I've been building up for sci-fi maps for so long and it's a smaller market so I, I have had to let it fall by the wayside here and there, if you get my meaning. Because fantasy is so big, you know, that's that's really, if you want to keep yourself in business, you've got to at least have something like that going. But sci-fi is my labor of love, and I'm that is coming round about summertime, and I really can't wait to pull the trigger on it. Oh, awesome. All right, so how do you stay up to date with the uh, new RPG trends and, and developments in the virtual tabletop realm? I fill my Twitter and Facebook feed with all kinds of gossip and news and people griping and screaming <laughs> and arguing over the latest stuff that's going on. That's the best. I try. I don't engage too much of it because pff, everyone seems so tense online these days, but I do read most of it and try and get a general feel of what's happening, what's coming out. Um, Star Wars Shatterpoint is something I'm, I'm deeply looking forward to. That's going to scratch my sci-fi itch a little bit more. Who knows? I might even get a few things ready for it. Awesome. Awesome. So can you share any uh, tips or tricks for game masters looking to incorporate your 3D battle maps into their sessions? Well, if I, uh, well, if you're coming in out of the cold and you, well, join my Patreon. That, that's the, I know it's a, a terrible, terrible plug, but that is a, an, a growing library of battle maps and um for a nominal small charge you can get all those and from there you can actually plan to have a set it's like anyone who's got a dragon in their campaign it's right there waiting for you anyone who wants to put a waterfall in that campaign whether it's sci-fi fantasy or otherwise there's some of the you know more than likely i'm gonna have something that you can use um as far as going in cold as a GM, have a look at uh, what there is. You know, find a battle map that you love or that inspires you, and then maybe tailor tailor a scene for it. Maybe that's where one of your main bad guys lives, or maybe your heroes will find themselves there somewhere or other. You know, try use these as resources. You know, in the same way we, I remember when I'm GMing, I like to get playlists of music together. And that really inspires me. And also, just by a weird, strange twist of roleplay alchemy, I'll, I'll accidentally have the perfect music for the perfect scene, for the perfect player, for the perfect moment. And it's all because I sat down beforehand and just got a good playlist together. Um, and treat battle maps in that same way. Get a nice playlist of battle maps together, ones that will work for what it is that you're trying to create. And you'd be surprised how much it helps you 
get from A to B. So how do you approach uh, creating unique and interesting train features for your battle maps, like the like the opening doors or the uh, the collapsing bridge? Or I uh, saw so you had one that was like a, 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 a like a, a face statue in the side of the cliff that opens up. Um, how do you come up uh, yes. with uh, those yes, ideas please. for those things? Well, it helps that I grew up as a child in the 80s, so I saw a lot of very vivid imaginations with big budgets behind them doing crazy things. So I've got a lot of the 80s movies in my head. I mean, for, and also, for like the, like the cave face opening up, I mean, really, that probably came from me watching Aladdin as a kid where the cave mouth opens up with the tiger's mouth. You know, the, I, I reach into my subconscious, to try and get some kind of inspiration and then i dig around the internet on image searches just trying to prod something and i build in my head and sometimes in stupidly large folders of images on my computer uh, effectively a mood board much like an artist would do if they were trying to you know brainstorm for any other project and i just fill that folder full of images links to songs sometimes films that I can uh, get inspired by until something will click. I'll get an idea or I'll see a moment or a scene where I say, oh, I'd love to recreate the atmosphere of that scene or, or the way they did that in the VFX was fantastic. I've got to do something that, that does that same kind of feel. And usually something will pop. Right. Inspiration's a fickle beast. You've got to kind of hunt it down like a black dog in the night. <laughs> All right. All right. Good advice. So uh, what, how do you see the uh, virtual tabletop gaming and the use of 3D battle maps evolving in the future? Well, I've seen a lot of new developments. I mean, there's a, there's a new product coming out called Gameboard, which pretty much goes down similar lines as what I'm doing. I mean, uh, they don't create battle maps or anything like that, but they are literally a very large uh, touchscreen. Um, what do you, I'm an old man. What do you call it now? It's not a laptop. Top. A tablet? <laughs> oh, no. That's it. That's it. <laughs> oh, God. I just gained like 20 gray hairs in three seconds. Yeah, it's like a big touchscreen la tablet that is basically a gaming board. Um, and don't get me wrong, it's still got a lot of ways to go as far as development goes, but it already shows the people are wanting to move into that arena. Um, I think VTTs are fantastic. Without them, Roleplay would have really struggled during the pandemic, and they really took off because of that. But I don't think that would be all and end all. I think um, people still love in-person gaming, and I know I do. Um, and that's why that that tabletop, you know, the TV tables, they will still have a massive place. And I can see them getting ever more popular. I'm seeing more and more technologies built into tables. And also, let's not forget D&D &D are bringing out their big 3D... VTT coming up, one D and D. I think I don't know if it's still called that. What about? Um, let's talk about some of that stuff. Uh, did, were you affected at all by uh, the open gaming license or uh, debacle, or do oh, you have any? Do you have any opinion um, about that? Well, it does bring up the interesting idea of copyright. What can be copyrighted? What can't be copyrighted? I think Watsy has probably got a lot of regrets about that situation. If um, if it's got any brains, it's got some regrets about that situation. Because if nothing else, it's made a lot of people very aware that they can't actually copyright the D and D system. And I know from people I've spoken to, a lot of people felt somewhat betrayed about what they what became very clear like corporate maneuverings. But at the end of the day, they're a corporation. I mean, you got you can't uh, be angry at an elephant for being an elephant. It's it's an elephant, you know. <laughs> it's gonna do what elephants do. Um, I wasn't directly affected by it because I've always tried to steer clear for something. I've, I've not tried to create things which are specifically for D and D. Gotcha. I like to create fancy things, just like I like to create sci-fi things. But I don't they're explicitly create things for D and D. Gotcha. They're system agnostic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, what about? But I, I've always made that choice consciously for for reasons like this. If you if you go all in with a company, then you know you live and die with that company. And I've always felt that that's that's a bit of a risk in itself. Gotcha. And uh, what about uh, another thing in um, current events is the rise of AI. 
uh, do you foresee like a time when like um do you think ai can take the place of a dm or um uh or th maybe some sort of ai interface with battle maps in the future <laughs> now this is a question that, oh we, we might have to do a whole separate conversation on this at some point but i've got some very strong opinions about ai and i try to be objective but my problem is i'm a i'm a lefty loony trade unionist and when i hear things like ai and do, you know, I, I worry that it's just another word for automation and industries do one thing and one thing only with automation and that's increase it, increase it, increase it. And before you know it, the space which skilled people can operate in seems to get smaller and smaller. And if you look in, in the past at the industrial revolutions, they always kind of result in a, a large amount of suffering because some technological development has been exploited by the people who've got the money to exploit it those are my concerns for ai mm. as far as creative process and things like that goes hopefully it will just devolve into being a more effective tool if it's that then i think everyone's getting up in arms over nothing my concern is that we see skilled and creative work become i won't say obsolete but become minimized due to it and that that would be upsetting. I don't know if it will, but I, I I hope it doesn't. But that's the problem. We all kind of don't know. Right, right. Good points. All right. As far as AI GMs go, yes, I'm sure that you can develop a program that will automate the DM process. But from being a games developer <laughs> back in the day, those capabilities weren't completely impossible in the first place. Yeah, fair enough. They didn't auto generate their own text. But I think the closer they get to that, the closer they're just getting to what they've already done. I think they'd be covering all ground there, to be honest. To me, that sounds like the Neverwinter Nights PC game. Gotcha. But that's just me. Mm -hmm. That's just me being a, a cynical old giffer. <laughs> what, are your, uh, Basically. what are your goals for the uh, future of your animated battle map creations? Well, as I say, my next big step is sci-fi. And then from there, well, I'll have to review and see what uh, see what comes. I mean, we all have to keep his eye on AI and see whether or not it's time to uh, embrace it or uh, or do something. I mean, we're all kind of holding his breath to some degree about the AI situation. But the future of my stuff is I'd like to work more and more on sci-fi work and expand my tabletop support. I'd also at some point like to... Uh, perhaps even develop a, a, an easy system to change a cheap TV into a TV gaming table. But uh, I, um, that's going to take a little bit more thinking through as I am not an engineer. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Uh, can you share any advice for aspiring artists and designers or looking into breaking into uh, the gaming space? Be clear about what it is you want to do, what skill set you want to develop it, sorry what skill set set you want to develop and develop that set as far as you can as hard as you can as long as you can and never stop growing in that skill set that would be my main piece of advice everything else comes from that all right good advice and and whatever you do don't waste too much time with detractors everyone's gonna have an opinion some people have a negative some people have a positive Listen to the positive, try and understand the negative, but just keep moving forward. Don't let people uh, drag you down. Good advice. All right. Hey, where can people find your 3D animated battle maps and connect with you online? Do you have a Look social? Look for me. Yes, I am on all the main socials, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. You can find me there readily and available under 2D Storyteller. Also look for my work on Roll20 2D Storyteller, Foundry VTT Forge. 2d storyteller and patreon forward slash 2d storyteller as you can imagine it's just 2d storyteller google me and you'll probably find me quite easily right all right well uh we've come to the end of our interview um neil thank you so much i've been talking with uh, neil thorpe of 2d storyteller thanks again for joining us neil well, thank you for having me. And if you ever fancy having a more in-depth chat about uh, <laughs> AI or anything like that, we should hook up sometime. 
<laughs> Fantastic. Uh, let's do that. All right. And thank you, uh, dear listeners. Until next time, happy traveling. live in the studio thank you everybody for joining me for the fifth annual traveler mayday mayday event it's a day we use to uh, celebrate our favorite sci-fi uh, rpg in all of its strange and wonderful forms <laughs> the spin-offs the original the classic mega traveler all that stuff all rolled into one big day of traveler goodness thanks for joining us hope you guys are having fun uh, there were some technical difficulties. Uh, my apologies to uh, Matthew Kerwin on that first uh, thing there. But you guys will be able to watch all of the uh, videos in uninterrupted form um, at the end of the podcast. So look forward to that if you missed anything or if I messed something up. <laughs> um, also, uh, I live in a, uh, uh, I'm broadcasting this from my home studio and I live in a rural area in, uh, in New Mexico. And, uh, it's kind of sometimes like a third world country here. And, uh, you never know when the internet's going to go out or electricity or, um, who knows what kind of catastrophe, or if uh, I'll have a twitchy trigger finger and click on something stupid like I did this morning. Anyway, um, uh, I have contingency plans for that. All the, uh, all the, uh, interviews were pre-recorded and I uh, have them banked over at the YouTube channel. So if something catastrophic should go wrong, I will um, make those videos public and the show will go on, my friends. It will go on. So uh, now um, I'm hanging out. Uh, I thought I saw Mr. Neil Thorpe sitting uh, in the wings there. Uh, he's the sponsor of this part of the uh, show here, and uh, he's from 2D Storytellers. And if you haven't seen He's got these really, really cool um, animated battle maps for your favorite VTT. Uh, actually, I think he's mostly on Roll20 now, but I think he's expanding into other um, areas. But anyway, uh, these battle maps are cool. He's got a ton of them for um, medieval and fantasy, um, but uh, 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 I think like three or four for, um, for Traveler and Sci-Fi. So uh, they're not just for travel. You could use them for Cepheus Engine or Starfleet Battles or whatever you want. Um, they're like uh, g generic uh, kind of geomorphs, and you can put them together. And then there's animated parts of like doors open or monsters attack or computer panels go bleep bloop or um, different kinds of things. It's pretty cool. Um, his uh, fantasy ones are fantastic as well. They're all um, 3D modeled and, and uh, painstakingly animated. So check out uh 2d storyteller stuff he's in the uh roll 20 marketplace um let's see and uh let's see i'll just blab for a few minutes and maybe uh maybe neil will make it back into the discord and i'll have a little chat with him uh <clears throat> also if bob from safeco cast is around i know jeff is out but uh you're welcome to come and hang out and chat with me as well and tell us more about safeco cast in the meantime i'll go ahead and plug safeco cast um who is also a sponsor of uh this portion the next uh the next um, um interview is coming up at 10 30 so we got a little a little while to kill here about uh 20 more minutes so uh i will endeavor to entertain you while <laughs> we're waiting for the next interview which is going to be with omar gol and joel of stella gamma publishing uh they're the makers of barbaric and the um uh and uh they, they were they did um produce these stars or hours but they've recently renamed renamed that to terra arisen so check that out it's a well-developed uh, world and uh, they also have quantum starfare and they use both their own um 
uh, in-house uh, game mechanics as well as uh, some things for Cepheus Engine. So uh, check them out. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so Safeco Cast uh, is um, a traveler podcast. Um, you can find them uh, on the internets. It's S A F C O C A S T Safeco Cast. And actually, if you go to cyborgprime.com slash mayday2023, and if you scroll on down to the uh, prize drawing areas, you will find links to SafeCoCast and check out their awesome podcast all about Traveler and um, the fine gentlemen over there, um, Bob and Jeff, put on a great uh, podcast, and very professional, and thank you very much, guys, for uh, doing that. So it's a great show. I enjoy it. And I, uh, I'm happy to be on it, too. So thank you. For inviting me um let's see the uh other thing i'd like to talk about is uh, well let's go ahead and uh do the drawing the next prize drawing is sponsored by first we'll do uh first we'll do the drawing that is sponsored by mr uh, neil thorpe from 2d storyteller and um uh, what he is giving away is a copy of Hostile Organism. So this is going to be for Hostile Organism. And congratulations to, drumroll please, uh, Cleo. Cleo German, you have won the VTT Battle Maps from uh, 2D Storyteller. Congratulations. <clears throat> that is Hostile Organism, which is uh, like an aliens uh, type setting. You put these ge uh, ship geomorphs together and there's uh, sliding panels where the monsters grab your crew members and drag them in. And yeah, all kinds of cool stuff. There's uh, links to it on the website. So check that out. All the winners, um, You'll all be contacted after the event. I can't, uh, I can't do the housekeeping for that right now during the live event. But uh, when the event's over, I'm going to pass all your emails to the uh, particular sponsors for prize fulfillment. So uh, that will be awesome. Um, let's see. Let's talk about. Uh, we'll do the uh, we'll do the Safeco uh, drawing here towards the bottom of the hour. You don't have to be present to win, um, but you can still register to win. Uh, so go to um, suborgprime.com slash mayday2023 and get yourself registered. There's a little box at the top of the page. Just sign up there, and that's where I will be uh, drawing names from for the door prizes and ultimately the greatest prize in the galaxy which is our uh, grand prize. And that's going to include all kinds of crazy stuff in there. So, um, yeah. Good luck, everybody. It's not too late. We've only given away a few prizes, and we have many, many more. But wait, there's more. More prizes. Um, I wanted to uh, do a plug of uh, some resources that I've produced. Um, I've recently put together a... Uh, um, a series of YouTube shorts for GMs. If you're struggling for um, ideas for your adventures, check out the Traveler's Logbook. Uh, they're a series of 36 short form um, YouTube videos. I made 36 of them so you can roll D66. Thanks for that idea, Penroth. Anyway, um, there are 36 uh, YouTube shorts. Each one is a... Um, uh, a little self-contained adventure hook slash adventure seed slash adventure skeleton. And they are all uh, cheesily dramatized by yours truly. So uh, I hope you like them, and I hope they uh, uh, you know, there's everything from uh, the classics to the weird. So um, just uh, check them out and like the ones that you like, and that will give me feedback on what kinds of other videos you would like to see on the Shorts channel. And you can find me by going to um, YouTube. I'm at youtube.com slash at cyborg prime with the at symbol. And uh, you can see 
the list of shorts there. Um, another resource you can find there is um, how to play how to play travel on Roll Twenty. And I know a lot of folks um, are just getting into virtual tabletop or finding out about it for the first time. And um, I started out on Roll Twenty, so I've got like six thousand hours on there, and I've uh, GM'd uh, over thirty games. You can check out my profile. I'm also on the Roll Twenty Marketplace, where you can find Starship deck plans um and other goodies from me uh, i uh, i i i've created my version of the classic uh, traveler ships and uh for your enjoyment and you can uh, put your players in there and uh, decorate your own rooms um you can uh, uh do boarding actions you can uh you know customize it as your own ship uh, do whatever you want with it um have battles um yeah and uh let's see what else um i've just been busy doing some some stuff some traveler stuff and i want uh, folks to know about it so here comes some more plugs <laughs> i i wrote a i wrote an article uh you can find it in my blog it's called uh the, the ultimate guide to playing traveler the manga's traveler rpg and uh that's actually uh, an 11 part series of uh that i wrote about uh different kinds of traveler topics how to make characters what what skills um they're helpful um like if you're a sci i like to play scientists so the most the final article there is all about uh, playing a scholar or a scientist and what they can contribute to the team um what else uh yeah so if people are interested go check that out there's all kinds of cool things over at my blog i have uh, some like travel time calculators and random loot generators and all kinds of weird stuff um also you're uh, welcome over at uh, my Discord channel where you can uh, get some behind the scenes access, see what I'm working on, check out my projects, uh, get early access to things like uh, my Discord uh, community had first access to my uh, virtual traveler, sh my virtual scout ship project, which is, which is actually live right now. You can go and walk around inside my virtual scout ship. There's a link that's uh, cycling through on the screen right now, or you can just go to subwordprime.com. And I believe it's slash scout ship. That should get you there. Um, oh, yes, there it is. I see it on the screen now. Subwordprime.com slash scout ship. And that will get you to the virtual scout ship. Um, I, I recently uh, I got offered a, a position at the um, Core Academy. And so I took it. And basically, there was a, a two-week game development course using the Core engine which is a, uh, a, meta a metaverse platform. So you can get on there and make your own games and link them to other people's games or link them to your own games. And uh, it, if all the graphics are uh, professionally done and stuff, so uh, it's already pre-made for you to basically just uh, click it all together and customize it. And if you're into programming, you can take it to a different, a uh, whole other awesome level. So uh, I had fun um, at that boot camp and uh, I'm having fun uh, creating the uh, virtual traveler things and other stuff i also made a dungeon crawler um you'll see that cycling through on the screen called the crucible and uh if you like that kind of thing i invite you to please come and check it out um you'll need a gaming computer that can do 3d so if, if you have if you uh, play any games on steam or uh, whatever you should be able to uh, access core um another thing about core well i actually uh, you i ran it successfully on my um my uh, surface pro so um you know a bit any any basic uh, video card um i'm running on my personal desktop just a gtx 1650 and it works fine so anywho if anybody's interested in that go check that out great community of also uh, friendly and supportive and fun people um speaking of friendly and supportive and fun people uh, i want to thank my discord community for being uh, so awesome especially my friend extreme strategy who's a fellow content creator. Um, and then also we have uh, Sector and Wizard Wombat and a few other folks, uh, Ain, uh, who are, uh, are new, but uh, have been awesome members and parts of the community. They, they welcome new members. Uh, if people have questions, they answer them. So thank you very much, you guys. You, you are awesome. Um, what else? Um, all right, let's talk about some of the stuff that's going on at May Day. We still got 10 minutes um, before uh, we do the next drawing, which will be uh, sponsored by SafeGoCast. 
uh, we have a $25 gift certificate to drive through RPG for a lucky winner from SafecoCast. Um, and they are at safecocast.com. That's S A F C O cast C A S T dot com. S A F C O C A S A F C O C A S T dot com. SafecoCast, your traveler podcast source. So check them out. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. While, uh, what was I going to pursue here? Oh, yes. Um, let's talk about, I wanted to get back and talk about, uh, roll 20 real fast. Um, roll 20 is a great way in all VTTs. You don't have to just do roll 20. It's free. That's the one I like. It's the one I started on. I also do some stuff on foundries and that's awesome as well. Um, so look out for, I'm going to be porting all my, uh, roll 20 products over to foundry. Um, at any rate, uh, if, if you are stuck in a place where maybe it's a small town or, uh, maybe, uh, you don't have a lot of gaming friends, uh, check out virtual tabletop. It's a great way to, uh, meet other friends, uh, other people who are into traveler and to, uh, hook up and, um, play on games. So, um, you can just find that at, I believe it's rule20.net and, um, sign up for free there. If you want to be a GM, you can be a GM and you will, uh, uh, enjoy if you, if you pay, if you, you can, you can do it for free, but if you pay their membership free fee, which isn't much, uh, it gives you a lot of extra storage space and then some tools for like copying your, um, your, your dungeon information over and stuff. And it's, uh, it also has a player matching system and things like that. And, uh, yeah, you can, um, you know, a lot of people prefer theater of the mind and that's fine too. Um, you could just use roll 20 as a common, uh, dice rolling, uh, surface and, uh, everybody gets their own colored customized little colored dice and, uh, you can roll any kind of dice and, uh, they'll, they'll roll in 3d on the table. Very cool. Uh, for all the players and so it's kind of like sitting around the table um you could chat on discord uh there's a built-in chatter uh, uh video thing in um roll 20 but it's not very good most people use like a secondary dedicated video chat maybe something like discord or zoom or whatever but um if you need to you can just fall back on the one that roll 20 comes with it's not it's not bad but um, at any rate, uh, if you like to play uh, Theater of the Mind, you can do that. And you just have, uh, you, you do it in the, the chat channels or the voice channels. And then when you want to uh, roll dice, you can just use the dice roller in Roll20. You don't have to go deep into it. But if you are interested in Roll20, uh, go over to the um, Cyborg Prime YouTube channel. And I made a um, playlist of some Roll20 videos that are from intro to like five minutes all the way up to an hour and, and a half, like going or hour and something going over all the different, um, buttons and things. So you can see what the features are and check it out that way before you get involved. Uh, it's one of those things where you just need to learn as much you need, as you need to learn at first to get started. Then, then you can add in extra things, but it's very cool dynamic lighting and things like that. Um, let's see. Um, what else is going on? Uh, let's have a little, uh, recap about the actual event. So, uh, day one of the event, we had, uh, open gaming. This, this event is actually, uh, like a four day event. It's a long weekend. So on, uh, on Friday, we had our friends from virtual traveler online. Um, they were sponsoring, uh, online one shot games all day long. Um, so, and you can get to that through, um, virtual traveler online. Uh, they have a discord, uh, server and they also have a presence on Facebook. So, uh, I will put a link to their, uh, to them in the um, description, or if you go to my website on the event page for this event, if you scroll down to, um, the schedule, there's a link right to their discord server from there. Um, so <clears throat> people enjoyed one shot games all day on Friday. And then on um, Saturday, we had more online games. In fact, most I believe most of the scheduled games went on on Saturday. And um, uh, those were all uh, successful and very popular. They all sold out. And um, 
So uh, yeah, that was very awesome. Thanks everybody for your support. Thank you GMs for being so gracious to GM and thank you players for uh, signing up and being interested. Uh, so yeah. Um, uh, uh, during the afternoon, we had the uh, Keith Fry fundraiser live stream game. And uh, if you don't know, uh, Keith Fry uh, is the um, uh, founder of TravelerCon and he passed away recently. And so we were helping his family cover some final expenses there and we raised uh um about eighteen hundred dollars in that live stream game and then there was some additional money raised through the um keith fry memorial bundle which is available at drive through rpg you get like almost 150 dollars worth of products for like 30 bucks so go over there and check that out um you can also uh, link to that. There's links to that also from the event page. So uh, that's over at cyborgprime.com slash Mayday2023. Um, we also had demos uh, from Ed Astor Games for, for Squadron Strike. We'll hear from uh, Ken Burnside and Mike Yaneza later. Um, Ed Astor makes this really cool um, 3D space combat simulator. And uh, it's very cool. It has a, a interface on online, and so you have these like um, character sheets or SSDs, like we used to call them uh, back in the Starfleet Battles days. And uh, their their setup actually has has ones that are similar to Starfleet ships, uh, ones that are similar for different kinds of uh, ships from different genres. I, I, their slogan is uh, "Any ship, any any setting, or something like that." Uh, and you really and it's really true. They they can um, convert any ship from any setting. And they have many many ships already done including traveler ships and that's what they're tying in with mayday is so uh you can uh go online and uh and and also it's for miniatures too so they they sell this they uh sell this um box and it has these uh, little plastic standoffs that turn your ship into in different directions and stuff so you can simulate 3d combat on your actual tabletop and you know, on a physical tabletop or you can hop on their uh discord server and there and uh there's just uh, games going on there all the time different scenarios and stuff and uh, you can uh, have your own ship and fly it around in a 3d um, web interface it's so cool um, so yeah check that out um, they're also a sponsor of mayday and uh, they and then on sunday um, we had more online games and then we had a squadron strike uh, teaching game so uh, ho hopefully we added some new um, traveler players uh, to the Squadron Strike family. So thank you very much. Um, and then that brings me to today. And I won't talk much more longer because I want to uh, do the drawing for the $25 gift certificate sponsored by a Safeco cast. Um, today we have a full day. I'm doing a marathon 12 hour podcast. And uh, so I'll be here live in the studio and you can join us. The link uh, is on the screen and uh there's a ton of friendly traveler players here and uh we're all hanging out and chatting in between uh the 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 interviews so the next uh, interview coming up is going to be homer golan joel from stella gamma publishing and uh super interesting uh and very creative uh project products um and we'll hear some more about that stuff and then after that we'll have uh another um, chat break so join us join us in discord um and uh maybe the uh, as the day goes through um the various publishers are popping in and out and uh, chatting us as available so uh come and chat your favorite publisher and uh and and uh, enjoy the company of other traveler folks all right, now let's do the drawing for the Safeco cast $25 gift certificate. Here we go, folks. Don't forget, if you don't win, don't feel sad. Just go and register, and there'll be more opportunities throughout the day to win. So, congratulations to Steve. Steve, you have a Hotmail address, and you have won a $25 gift certificate to drive through RPG. so congratulations, and I hope you enjoy it. 
don't forget f i'll be contacting uh or the uh the sponsors will be contacting all the winners after the uh podcast i will forward everybody's email addresses to the uh prize fulfilling sponsors and they will contact you directly and get you hooked up uh with your prizes any unclaimed prizes will go back into the prize pool and we'll continue giving them away until they're all gone um and don't forget at the end of the evening before the traveler after hours but after the mark miller interview we'll be drawing the greatest prize in the galaxy which is going to be a ginormous prize bundle somebody's going to like get a big big prize bundle so we will talk to you folks soon now here's omer golan joy opening merchant interface scanning trade routes scanning for cargo destinations within jump range cargo shipment available Seven tons of Cepheus Deluxe rule books and nine tons of Quantum Starfarer rule books destined for New Eden. Contacting Omicron and Joel of Stella Gamma Publishing for more information. Stand by. Greetings, fellow sci fi gaming enthusiasts. Today we have a special treat for you on our podcast. We are excited to be joined by Omer Golan Joel, an accomplished game designer hailing from Israel. With a wealth of experience in the industry, Omer is the mastermind behind fan-favorite RPGs like Terra Arisen, Barbaric, and Quantum Starfarer. He's a regular at our annual Traveler Mayday Mayday event, and we're thrilled to have him back for the fifth year in a row. In this interview, we'll be delving into Omer's creative process, exploring his latest projects, and gaining valuable insights into the ever-evolving world of tabletop RPGs. So sit back, relax, and join us for a fascinating conversation with Omer Golan Joel. Welcome, Omer. Thank you very much. So, uh, what have you been up to in the past year since we've seen you? We've published several books. Uh, first and foremost, Cephas Deluxe and uh-huh. Edition. Yes. Uh, which was on Kickstarter uh-huh. for a while. And it uh, replaced the old book with a full color book with all deck plans of all starships included oh, cool. and uh, edited errata and everything uh, to make it the best version possible. Published last December and uh, we published a Quantum Starfarer, which is a lightweight science fiction role playing game based okay. on the Quantum Engine. By the way, today I, pub- I published the second edition of uh, Cepheus Quantum. Hmm. Two page rule set. Oh, so all, a bit. everything with the word quantum on it is a uh, rules light, basically. Yes, it's an okay. engine. It's mm-hmm. an engine called the quantum engine. It evolved in a secondary way from Cepheus, but it's not Cepheus. It's a skill based without attributes, very simple, very rules light. Even the most complex version of it, called Super Powered, is 185 pages. Mm, they just no. pages if you if you use American measurements. Why don't you give us a little bit of background about yourself? Um, uh, how you got into uh, tabletop gaming? How you first became interested in the hobby? Stuff like that. Uh, I first encountered the Dungeons and Dragons Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Second Edition back in 1997, I think, or 1998. Back then, it was out of print in Israel, and getting it from abroad wasn't as easy as it is today. There was already some sort of online ordering, but uh, it was very expensive. So we used second-hand books, some of them photocopied even, not the original books. Only mm-hmm. the three core books, it was a blast. Simply playing Dungeons and Dragons, the simplest version of second edition, and learning from there. Then I encountered Shadowrun, which was also translated, and also out of print, by the way. Oh, by, okay. Uh, by the time I encountered it also second-hand book, uh, which is all, was also mind-blowing because it was the first time I saw a role-playing game which was not Dungeons and Dragons, which was skill-based and everything like that. It, it simply opened my mind to other systems. And from there I encountered Traveler, which I bought from the same guy importing uh, Shadow One out of the trunk of his car. <laughs> yes. Hey kid, hey kid, you want to buy some books? 
He was simply driving around because he, he came to conventions, he was driving around, you could call him, and uh, when he was in your area, you could meet him, and he will sell you the books. Mm-hmm. It was primitive back then. <laughs> it, was very, it was a very dark period, you could say, in terms of, uh, <laughs> of publishing, of role-playing game publishing in Israel. It was between the time we had the big publisher publishing Dungeons and Dragons, who went bankrupt, oh. and the time we got the third edition. I see. Which open open up in the early 2000s which open up the hobby to additional people the, I was gonna say that's a, an interesting transition and kind of a smooth segue from playing D d to shadow run which is like half D d half cyberpunk right kind of sci-fi yeah. but it also has fantasy races and then mm-hmm. and then eventually kind of just going full sci-fi into the traveler and I like I like that progression <laughs> I was interested interested in sci-fi but uh, there were no games because then available to me closest thing was Shadowrun which is it is cyberpunk with some fantasy elements you could take it to full-blown fantasy it's its core is very cyberpunk for some reason they chose to translate it translate this system which was very interesting again classic traveler clicked with me simply I read all the old sci-fi books and novels from the 60s and 70s which was what was available back then for the most part it clicked with me immediately I understand the concepts. It took some time to understand, the unpack the entire system because it was a big reprint. A friend of mine called it VCR manual because it was, you know, without art, without anything. The eight books in one reprint that mm-hmm. they got. Uh, but it was extremely easy for me to get into it and to run it. It's easier than D&D. It's, it's a very simple system uh, at its core, just with all the additions added later in the later course of the Classic Traveler, the added complexity, but the basic core is extremely simple. It's almost free form. Did you follow and keep up to date with different editions, or did you stay? Did you find a, a, an edition of Traveler that you kind of liked and parked yourself there? I started with Classic Traveler. I stayed with it until 2008, mm-hmm. then switched to Mongo's Traveler. And then in 2016, I moved uh, to my own system. To, uh, originally, it was the Cepheus engine, but some are done press, but uh, later Cepheus light because for the affair surrounding the uh, second edition of uh, Mongo's Traveler. Mm-hmm. I will not get into details now, but there were, were is- uh, licensing issues, and uh, if you wanted to publish, you could either go through the community content program, which was not very uh, comfortable for us as publishers, or use our own system based on the SRD, on the open gaming license. Mm-hmm. Now we might be getting back, we are likely to get to be getting back to publishing material for Mongoose Traveler because there will probably be a license soon permitting us to publish comparable materials. We are very happy with it. This this uh, came into being following the OGL deb- debacle two months ago. What inspired you to kind of um, start your own publishing company? What were some of the biggest challenges that you faced when you first uh, became a publishing company? Originally, I was writing all kinds of fan material for years, I think 10 years. So, of course, it was very simple technically because I was doing layout, if you could call it layout, in uh, Microsoft Word. Publishing meant that I had to cope with being a business and doing my own sales work and doing layout work. Originally, I got some help for that, but uh, it was for part of it was expensive. Uh, so I taught myself how to do layout, which I'm doing at a reasonable level, I think. And of course, it meant investing in art, later finding public domain art of our books, again, which is a very good thing because then we could transfer the savings to our customers and uh, price our uh, titles at a very low, low level. Other than when you go through Kickstarter and then so you have a budget, you could pay for art. But uh, one of our points is to provide affordable books. It's good for everyone. It's good for us because uh, more people buy affordable books. And good for the customer who get cheap and an affordable material. You don't have to 
take a mortgage to pay for the the entire system. Yeah, I remember that was a big barrier to to entry for me when I was a kid. You know, the D and D books were twenty five, thirty five bucks. The Traveler Starter Set was twenty five or thirty five bucks. Um, and you know, you had to save up. You know, use birthday money or whatever to uh, to get that stuff. And uh, I I noticed that your prices are very low. Some of your things that you have on your uh, drive through RPG are even zero. Um, and yes. uh, some of the rules lights things are like a dollar or a couple a couple of dollars and it uh, looks like it's super affordable to get into uh, Stella Gamma Publishing's you know product line again we are trying to price our products in the fairest way possible and for this we have to be very uh, frugal with very tight with our budget with mm-hmm. our art budget uh, again once we go to the kickstarter we could have, have all the color art we want which was the only way we could finance it of course we also pay artists uh, full prices and uh, we provide everyone with with a fair share of our uh, profits how hard is it to uh, get into Kickstarter? Um, and how was your Kickstarter? Have you done Kickstarters before? No. Actually, I had to work with an American partner because mm-hmm. I can't open Kickstarter or even Indiegogo from Israel because of bureaucracy. I work with Stripe as a clearing and payment processor, and they're stuck in some bureaucratic process in Israel in their licensing. So I have to work with a partner who opens the Kickstarter and runs it, and then uh, takes a certain commission but it's still worth it i never even thought of that as a job you know to be like a kickstarter uh it's not um, a job it's it's partnership with another publisher essentially gotcha. but still it's uh, we finally found the right partner to work mm-hmm. with which is menagerie press and they uh, did the kickstarter of course in close collaboration with us and it reached quite a nice sum of money which mostly went to art <laughs> and, Especially deck pens, because uh, you know it's professional work. Did you meet your goal? I mean, obviously, it sounds like you met your goal. Did you go past your goal and uh, get overfunded? We reached, we reached uh, two stretch goals actually. Uh, or extensions or whatever they're called. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Two extensions. Yeah. It was quite successful. And again, we we now learned how to do it in a better way in terms of accounting and planning. And we are planning another Kickstarter for this summer for the second edition of Barbaric, the sorcery uh, rule set, the lighter sword and sorcery rule set, which is going to be awesome because I'm now writing the second edition rules for it. And there are a lot of cool stuff we are putting in it. We are making it tighter. We are making magic more interesting. It's also based on the quantum engine. Is Barbaric like a, a light version of a sort of Cepheus, or, or is it just uh, uh, no, focusing on like Conan style? Sword of Cepheus also is Conan style, but it's a very, very different rules engine. Basis of 2d6. Uh-huh. But uh, the Sword of Cepheus is based on Cepheus light, full blown rule set uh, with a detailed skill system and the characteristics and everything. And Barbaric is a much simpler system. We call it beer and pretzels uh, approach to gaming. It's very, uh, again, it's simple. It's fast play. It's aimed on shorter campaigns for the most part. You could also run a very long campaign with it, but uh, the focus is uh, on short-term action. And uh, it's very lightweight. I right. know people who introduce their children to gaming through it. Yeah, no, that's that's nice because uh, uh, I don't have kids, but I'm an uncle. And uh, I like to, uh, you know, bring new new people in and bring kids on and teach kids games. You know, have fun. Uh, we have uh, family game night on Fridays and uh, we play board games or we'll play, uh, we'll play adventure games card games, you know, whatever. I think it's important to um, instill, you know, a sense of fair play and um, taking your turn and patience and creativity and all the things that, uh, you know, gaming can bring to your life as a, as a kid. Yes, because uh, I had someone tell me that they introduced their kids to gaming through Barbaric because they say it, it's, it clicked with them much faster than Dungeons and Dragons. It's a much simpler system. The basic idea is simply you distribute a few points between your skills and then you roll uh, to the six plus, plus your skill and for, for target number and, or greater. Once you get this, everything is simple. Do you get a lot of fan mail like that telling uh, you how? Mostly on social media. Yeah, uh, it must be... Uh, must 
feel rewarding. I'm very rewarding. So let's talk about the uh, open gaming license thing. Uh, Wizards of the Coast, for folks who don't know, Wizards of the Coast was going to revoke their open gaming license, which is what a lot of us indie publishers uh, are developing under. That's what I develop under for using the SRD, the system reference document. Anyway, Wizards of the Coast was going to revoke that, and I guess that would revoke it across the board, and there was no way to just like keep it and you know use the older version or rework it or whatever. It was up in the air what the future of, of our indie development for Traveler Offshoots was going to be. So how did that affect you, the, the open gaming license uh, problem with uh, Wizards of the Coast? And how did you end up uh, how did you how did you end up adapting to it and, and uh see in the end they withdrew from it. But we are also withdrawing as much as possible from the OGL because if they did it once they could do it again. So we are moving to uh, Creative Commons. Nice success, uh, share a like and uh, everything like that. Simply accessible rules. The damage was much smaller than anticipated again because they withdrew. But the fruits of this were that uh, we had uh, the entire Cepheus community, Cepheus publisher community, uh, negotiated with Mongoose Publishing and we are tentatively getting a compatibility license. Again, this was announced by Mongoose Publishing online on the forum and they are working out the details but this will allow us to create uh, versions of all our titles uh, other than the rule books which we don't have to use but all the supplements and settings for Mongoose, Mongoose Traveler the second edition the updated second edition which is which is a very good thing it's uh, everyone has to gain from this it's a win-win situation initially the plan was to circumvent the entire OGL thing by Mongoose uh, publishing using uh, the black f no not black flag using the new system which was planned for in, in the replacement for OGL which is no longer uh, which I think they're still developing it but it's much less relevant uh, that the by, Pathfinder by people the the yeah by by Pezo is uh, by going Pezo. to mm -hmm. again I think by the Pezo is are still developing it but it's it's much less much less urgent right now because mm. the apocalypse was averted yes yes Wizards of the Coast withdrew their uh, uh, their intent to discontinue that I don't know but like you said if they did it before they can do it again and, and you don't want to have a heart attack every time they decide yeah. to uh, <laughs> pull their license so we better to just cut them out <laughs> yes, executives circulate. So mm -hmm. sooner or later, someone with an MBA and no experience in gaming and no experience in the market will decide, well, we have to, to keep a tight lead on this IP. And once again, the entire thing. It will happen, most likely. Again, not because of bad intentions by many of the developers. But because some executives, uh, they, it's a company like any other company, and people who are businessmen and not gamers, necessarily. Right. So they make business decisions, sometimes they miss a point, which was exactly what happened uh, in January. Yeah, it caused a big outrage, because um, a lot of people develop for D&D uh, &D on that license and D&D uh, &D variations. I mean, that, that was a bigger market share than, you know, who, who the people that are developing under, you know, the Traveler license. But it upset a lot of people. <laughs> people yeah. uh, boycotted stuff. And, yeah. Profits, uh, because a lot of people canceled, canceled their subscriptions to right. the Beyond. Yep. There was a lot of bad press for them. But again, it, might, it may happen again sooner or later again because of business considerations and lack of mm -hmm. experience in some cases by, by executives. This is why our long-term plan is to move to Creative Commons whenever possible. Not in Cepheus, because Cepheus is under the Open Gaming License. Uh, there will even be a new SRD for Mongoose Traveler 2nd Edition. But we are thinking about a percentile system mm -hmm. based on OpenQuest, if you know the system. No, I haven't heard of that. It's an open content uh, Creative Commons version of uh, RuneQuest, essentially. Okay. Uh, not exactly version, it's a descendant of... Uh, or evolution okay. of RuneQuest. And we are thinking about creating a science fiction version of the system using the open license, the Creative Commons license, actually. And this will allow us to work free of all the risks of OGL. This will be called Cradle of Stars, and uh, we are working on it for the long term. Now it's not very urgent. I've so played a f we had to, we had to mm -hmm. complete this by the summer, but it's now, right now it's not very urgent. I've played a few uh, percentile systems. Um, the ones that jump to mind would be Top Secret. 
and uh, Call of Cthulhu. Uh, I think those are both great mechanics, and uh, you know, I don't know why they're m- not more popular. Call of Cthulhu is extremely popular. I think it's the second most popular system. No, um, well, I meant I meant uh, games with the percentiles as their basis. I can only think of two <laughs> off the top of my head. Yes, Cthulhu and mm-hmm. Top Secret and Rune Quest. Mm-hmm. And by the way, there is a new Warhammer 40k game which is also also the first in the system. It's called Imperium Mal- uh, Maledictum. It came out, I think, a few days ago. Yesterday, actually. Or the day before yesterday. So, uh, they're also using percentile system. Um, I have not bought it yet, but I uh, mm-hmm. might look into it. Uh, but again, we are, we are thinking about science fiction percentile system and developing the quantum engine, which again is our system. Mm-hmm. We used to publish it under the OGL, but it's not really based on the Traveler SRD. Right. It's only inspired by this. It is, uh, we are not taking Traveler terminology or we are doing our own thing. So you've been at this for a while. Uh, what advice would you give other indie publishers who's just starting out in the tabletop industry? Start small. Start small. Especially without, because the cost could uh, accumulate to large sums. Try to work simply and uh, plan your budget well. Create content which is attractive to customers, which is mainly rule books and settings. Adventures we had a much more mixed experience with, by the way, because adventures are bought only by the referee, by the game master, and not all game masters want pre-prepared adventures, so they sell less than rule books, and they sell less than setting material and source books, because what people really want, it appears, are uh, source books of all kinds. We do some third-party source books for other systems like Start Without Number, which are very, very popular. Again, start small. Don't try to overdo yourself. It's a business. A very different mindset for pen, uh, fan publishing because you have to make a profit and you have to pay your bills. I'm not working full-time in publishing right now, by the way. I'm working part-time, unfortunately, but looking forward to working full-time. Uh, you're yes. doing better, uh, more sales than you did last year and the year before, right? So yes. it's, it won't be long. In a few years, I will be able to support myself by gaming. Uh, I'm a f- I'm behind you on the on the timeline <laughs> by a few years, but uh, little by little uh, things are are, uh, are growing for the indie publishers. Yeah, Kickstarters could be very very useful if you plan them right. But Kickstarter is a lot of work, a uh, lot of work. In, in what, even, in what... even if you are in the US and you don't need bureaucratic arrangement around it, you have to take care of it. You have to take care of. Uh, backers and customers. Mm, oh, and so there's like a maintenance uh, cost to it in time is, you know, like answering emails and yes, management. Yes, it. it's, it's much more customer service than regular publishing. You have, because people are backing it and they want certain products and certain ideas what products they wanted. And we have to satisfy everyone, which again is a lot of work, uh, some administrative work. Uh, on the other hand, if you run it right, it could really allow you to put out amazing things did you feel like maybe the community might have uh, taken you in a direction that you didn't originally intend to go with that with the thing that you're putting up for kickstarter no we okay. worked on a plan we just had to make sure that everyone stays happy with it mm, i see it stays focused on what your end product vision was yes. okay so how do you promote uh, your products um how, how do new players find out about your stuff um what brings new new players into your game and how do you uh keep uh, and how do you reach older players uh i mean pl- pe- not older players but players who've been playing your game longer than new players first and foremost we are active on social media uh, but also we already accumulated a list of customers who bought some of our products and we send them updates about new products uh, usually with a discount so you have a mailing list? Um, can yes. Dip? Okay. So I've saw RPG. It's a very large mailing list, thousands of people. And every time we put out something new, we send them a discount code as returning customers. This, they are really interested, interested in our titles. And this permits us to sell quite well. Again, to reach people who are already interested in our products. We already experienced with our production quality. Returning customers are quite a bit of our customer base, but not only. Well, you need to uh, bring new people in, right, to uh, keep your customer base yes. growing. So how, how, do you norm- how do you do that? Through, to, social, to, through, social, through your social media outreach? Well, 
active in all uh, traveler communities we know in other OSR communities by the way we put out uh, also D20 OSR game recently called Gargoyle which is uh, I think one of the most suitable OSR games for my taste mm. not it's also I'm only it's a uh, publisher but it's it's a uh, perfect for my rule slight uh, approach I saw it listed in your catalog yes it's already mm. in my catalog it's called, Gar- called Gargoyle mm-hmm. it even has one adventure it will soon have a monster book monster supplement we're working on it it works alongside barbaric and the sword of cepheus and all other uh, titles we publish let's talk about virtual tabletops and online gaming um with uh, you know the pandemic and everything uh, going on still people are turning to um virtual tabletops so how do you see the tabletop industry evolving in the future especially with the rise of virtual tabletop platforms First, they usually play online nowadays. Uh, it's much easier to organize this because even in a small country like Israel, people are still several hours of driving away from each other in some cases. Uh, so uh, we game online, it's very easy to organize. Uh, we use the Roll20, and uh, we are thinking about moving to uh, Foundry, which is more customizable and doesn't have a monthly subscription fee. Uh, but it's more complex to set up. You have to set up a server, and uh, I'm still looking into the technicalities of it. Most of our games have modules on Foundry. There is a module for all Traveler and uh, 2D6 systems uh, on uh, Foundry called 2D6. Yes, I've played that. It's it's awesome. Whoever made that, uh, kudos to you, Super Kev or whatever. I can't remember the guy's name. Um, there are several people. There is the entire team, pen team. Mm. Uh, working on it for free and uh, we have module for gargoyle as well yeah i played the 2d6 and i was uh, very pleased with it you can set it to um to show uh effect level which is nice because yeah. as the gm I'm, i don't really care if they're hitting the target number i want to know what the effect is and so uh you know there's a there's a there's you can get into like the settings for your game and say show me the effects the effects can automatically be applied to weapon damage i mean it's pretty slick and um yeah so it's already adapted to all our uh, to the six systems and this is something we're proud of we also hired a programmer to, to develop a character sheet and a ship sheet for Cephas Deluxe on Roll20 this is a more complex work uh, for what I understand uh, it's more complex on the technical side and more difficult to develop so we hired someone to do it yes uh, I'm uh, an experienced programmer and, and web page designer and when I took a look at uh, the roll 20s character sheet designer it was a brain scrambling nightmare but uh, they've uh, they've improved their tools since then I haven't uh, seen them so I don't know how good they are yes but still it's, it's something you have to invest quite out of money because you need a professional for it. Uh, this is not something fans can develop easily uh, like in Foundry, which is much more friendly. But again, a lot of our games get played online, I think. Going forward, are you going to try to um, keep VTT in mind when producing um, uh, products? Like, uh, let's say you, you have your superhero game or, or CFS or whatever. When you when you put that out, do you think, oh, we need some like starship counters with this, or we need some things that will help facilitate uh, VTT gaming, or do you just use the approach of, you know, people will just use the markers and things that they already we have? Are, we are also working on deck plans for CFS Deluxe. The new deck plans in the enhanced edition of CFS Deluxe are already prepared for VTT use, but not all our older deck plans. So we're working on that as well, because uh, this is the uh, one thing people really want much more than uh, tokens. If you publish maps, they want to use the maps online, so you have to cut them in the right way, so they they work well with Roll20 especially. I think in Foundry, some of the deck plans are already implemented in the repository, but I'm not sure, because I let them do it. <laughs> right, right, okay. It's very... Uh, useful for people because again people are playing online from my experience much more than uh, face-to-face do you think that to play but realistically it's much easier to organize an online game um where i live is uh, rural and uh, it's hard to bring people together because like you say everybody lives so far away from each other for us vtt has been um even good for adding some local players into our into the game that that we play with uh, folks from internationally you know 
That's been a great, great invention in, um, from my perspective as a player and a GM. International is the only problem in time zones, but we can play with Europe without much problem. Mm -hmm. One hour, hour or two hour difference, usually. Right. Um, with the US, it's much more complex to play, but I know, I know people who play from Israel to, and, and from the US in the same game. Yeah, when you have the whole world as your player pool, you're more likely to find people yeah. with uh, schedules that mesh, right? Yeah. Let's talk about some current events and stuff. How do you incorporate current events and tech trends like the rise of AI, for instance, in your sci-fi games? Do you have do you have rules for AI? Can you play AI characters? Are there like uh, robots or things like that um, in your games? I have, I have a robot book mm -hmm. for uh, Quantum Starfare, by the way. But uh, we take a very cautious approach about AI because uh, we also see its limitation. I tried some of the AI engines, ChatGPT and uh, Midjourney, and you could see their limitations because it's not self-aware. It's some kind of algorithm which you train on existing material, and then it knows how to mix that remix this material. So we had uh, something in most of our sci-fi books called virtual intelligence, simulated intelligence, actually not virtual, uh, which means that it looks like an intelligence, it behaves like an intelligence, but it's not really self-aware. My belief, belief is that real AI is quite far in the future. That's been my yeah. experience too. I, I feel like people are freaking out about like chat GPT, but really it's like a sophisticated Mad Libs yes, generator. It's, it's very sophisticated, but it doesn't, it has no imagination. It simply remixes existing material. It has simply a huge database of material and works very fast. But people were figuring out about Eliza in the 60s, so... Right, I remember that. Uh, and how do you feel today? And uh, I feel sick. And tell me more about feeling sick. And uh, yes. now we have those uh, replica... It's code. Mm -hmm. it's code is very, very simple. Yeah, that was... Simple, it gives you... But people, uh, you know, the Turing test is very easy to cheat. So now we have very complex cheaters for the mm -hmm. Turing test, but they're not really passing it. For example, I tried to ask ChatGPT to create traveler characters. It created something close to a traveler character, but doesn't follow the rules. Mm -hmm. Because it simply took, I think, web pages of characters people put online and process them in some way. It remixes them. But add to an AI, which is a person, which is self-aware, uh, thinks there is some kind of uh, a roadblock ahead of us. By the way, the things we call AI are not really AI, you know, it's right. data mining. Sure, sure. Machine learning, but machine learning is a new term for data mining. Gotcha. Uh, yes. It's a matter of having a fast computer working on a huge database. And so, so if you have... extrapolate that, you know, over time into the future, you have future, really super fast computers. And so you can simulate intelligence easily because you have a much bigger computing power in a much smaller package exactly but it's mm -hmm. not it doesn't replace people it really eyes are also a problem in gaming because you don't want to automate everything in the universe you have a place for player characters or human for the or organic alien uh, so we take a very cautious approach do you uh, normally uh, use them for like maybe foils or bad, you know, uh, insane AIs or running the space station or an insane? Well, Why is there always an insane AI? <laughs> Why can't they just be normal? It's easier to have a simulated intelligence uh, hacked by someone to behave like as an AI than having an actual AI because it's extremely easy to manipulate these things. General terms, of course, it requires skills, but once you're skilled, you could manipulate the system and get it to do your bidding or to behave in crazy ways. You can, people were exper already experimenting with ChatGPT and getting a lot of very weird things from it. Yes, they had to put safety protocols in place. Yes, same with the journey, uh, preventing people from making porn with it. Mm, yes, right. People figure out very quickly they could do it. Right, right. But again, we are very cautious with the AI. We have rules for robots and for Androids. In all of our books, there are even a system to construct them and see if it's deluxe, if you want to create. Uh, but real uh, intelligence bots are very, very high-tech and expensive. This also goes in the end with our traveler heritage, which again is very humanocentric and anthropocentric and very uh, pessimistic about AI and robots. Yes, I have my uh, robot book. I've been clinging to my original travel <laughs> robot book. Um, 
I haven't had a chance to look at your robot book or the one from that uh, Mongoose just put out, uh, I guess, last year or six months ago or whatever. I can't wait, though, because uh, I really I like robots. Uh, I mean, they're everywhere in Star Wars. So, uh, you know, people like to bring those kinds of pop culture uh, things into their game. Uh, robots yeah. are just staple part of sci-fi, right? I mean, really. Yeah. And we have them in our core books. It's our system for creating them, but uh, again, they are not the focus of the game. So let's talk more about um, Cepheus Deluxe Enhanced Edition. So what is that and how does it differ from the other versions of uh, Cepheus and Cepheus? We wrote it essentially from the basis to make it more approachable. As, much, as approachable as possible for people who are unfamiliar with Traveler. A lot of it came from playtester feedback, which we listen to. Uh, this means we don't have desert character generation. Uh, only optionally, if people want to go hardcore, with, uh, we, we have a non-random character generation by default. Simpler starship and vehicle combat systems. Uh, which are based on chase essentially and uh, not on the uh, map positions because we found this much more attractive to our players. Uh, we simplified armor rules and we simplified a lot of rules and we added a lot of random tables to generate content and encounters, which I think is our uh, best thing. And we added examples to every major rule system. Oh, good, that's uh, very helpful for the user. Yes, and this is something people really like about our systems. That was a big um, thing I I, uh, I appreciated in the hero system. It used to be like, well, it still is really complicated to uh, figure out like your superpower points and uh, champions. But then yeah. they started putting together little packages and putting them in the margin along with how much the skill cost. So you could just browse, you know, if you're in the elemental control area, you could see oh, here's a package of 100 points or here's one of 50 points and you could just use these pre, pre-built pre kind of packages. So that was those examples of how to put those things together and already have them available for you really sped up the NPC creation process and the, also creating PCs too. So um, yeah, it's nice to see those, uh, to see publishers um, kind of uh, accommodate their their readers, especially with things that could be complicated and, and give good yeah. good examples. I had a generation in the CFIS. Mm-hmm. In combat, everything is an example, a detailed example, or even two examples in some cases, three examples, depends on the, ch- the chapter. Again, it's focused on new players. We had some pulp options, like hero points. It's optional, but uh, if you want to play it more Star Wars style, you could do it. It will still be grittier than uh, ordinary Star Wars, but uh, if you want heroics, you have the option. Uh, on the other hand, you could go to a much uh, more gritty uh, approach. And we intend to publish several supplements for it, especially adventures. We are working on a few. Uh, eventually move to our personal system and focus more on the uh, quantum engine. So let's talk uh, about uh, Quantum Starfarer. Uh, um, how yes. does it? How is it different from uh, Cepheus uh, Deluxe? It's much simpler system. It's a, mm-hmm. It only has uh, seven skills. No characteristics. You simply distribute points between your skills. Between the skills, you have uh, seven skills. You distribute five points between them. Maximum three in one of them. This is character creation. You had a simple uh, stamina system for uh, damage. And the rules themselves are very simple. Again, it's the only thing it has in common with Cepheus is the 2d6 plus skill versus target number. But otherwise, it's very, uh, it's very much its own thing. Uh, let's talk about uh, your flagship setting, uh, Terra Arisen, which uh, is formerly These Stars Are Ours. How has it evolved since its initial release? Uh, what made you uh, also? What made you change the name? Uh, we wanted to create something new and much more focused. Uh, because uh, what we wanted is less uh, fluff, less lore and history and more adventure hooks. Because when you publish something like that, people are going to play it around the table and they're not going to read through too many pages of background unless this background is very relevant to their game. Uh, this is our experience. So we took a lot of care to make sure that everything has plot hooks in it. The rule is at least one plot hook for per uh, paragraph sometimes even two or three. And we also wanted to adapt the rules to Cepheus Deluxe, because the original rules for, were for the Cepheus Engine SRD. Uh, so we, we updated the rules, we updated the art. Uh, it's similar size of a book, similar length, but uh, much more focused. 
and re-edited with mm-hmm. a lot of work to it. And it includes more space. It is more uh, star systems. Double oh. the amount of star systems. Uh, then uh, this stars are ours. Again, it's uh, a very focused setting, very play focused. Uh, gives you all the cool stuff you need for it and uh, directly compatible with Cepheus Deluxe. So it sounds like uh, you you do pay attention uh, to your customer's feedback and incorporate it into uh, various editions and, 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 and exactly. entire product lines. It's customer yeah. and play tester. Mm-hmm. It's very important to listen to people in our line of work. Let's talk a little bit about your philosophy for your approach to making uh, engaging and immersive sci-fi uh, settings or campaigns. I-, I know you said that maybe adventures are the uh, lowest seller. H- how do you develop your your campaign setting and make it interesting for people? We have to look at it through the lens of the gaming table because we are not writing a sci-fi novel and we are not engaging in uh, world-building experiences. We are writing something people will have to use. So when you design the setting, you have to think uh, about a very good uh, frame of reference, which will set up the game. It also goes for uh, other media, but for gaming, it's especially important. So there, uh, we had it uh, set immediately after a war. Most characters fought in that war. They know each other from there. They have the, the war paints everything and so on and we made sure that there are a lot of stuff to do in the setting a lot of conflicts conflicts are always always good for gaming i think that the best settings are ones in which you could jump into action as quickly as possible and experience the settings it's they say don't tell show and when designing sci-fi settings again we think we design them for gaming so we think about what will be interesting for people to Plane, what will make good adventures. The settings themselves have to be, uh, again, focused. And we are thinking, again, we're thinking, so what would be fun to play at the table, which is different from a novel or TV series. The focus is very different because uh, players behave differently from uh, literary heroes. Right, In most right. cases, they interest in different things. And you have to engage with the audience. Right. And they're, they're, uh, you never know <clears throat> where the story is really going to go. I mean, you can just give them a, set, uh, a scenario and then see where it kind of goes because uh, everybody's going to be playing off of each other. And um, just uh, like you say, make sure there's engaging things. And it sounds like uh, you've addressed that in your books. I mean, you have, like you said, plot hooks uh, throughout. You have conflicts. There's, uh, there's all kinds of things to do. So... Um, uh, I think uh, GMs could uh, approach your setting pretty easily and, uh, and 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 get their games going. Yes, we also don't have a progressing meta plot. This is something I learned from other RPGs, uh, like Shadowrun, which had the most the coolest stuff going on in the second edition, and then mm-hmm. they simply resolved it, and the replacement was not as good, I think. Uh, so in Terra Reason, we simply uh, open up the setting for the referee and the players. Uh, after the once the setting starts, we are not going to advance the timeline. Mm-hmm. This is something you do at your table, we, because we also don't want to say, well, your adventure was not canonical. Uh, the canon says that uh, this and that. Yeah, and that. So we again, this is uh, in favor of the players and the referees. Can you? Um... Share any details about upcoming releases or projects that you have in the works and what players can expect from them? Uh, Yes. First and foremost, we are working on Barbaric 2nd Edition, uh, which is rebalanced based on uh, player feedback and having a cooler magic system, I think. This will go on Kickstarter on July, on the coming July. After that, we are working on something called the High Octane Sorcery, which is a post-apocalyptic cyberpunk sword and sorcery or uh, shotgun and sorcery uh, setting and rule book based on the quantum engine. It's uh, more Conan meets Mad Max than Shadowrun, Uh anyways, uh, in its tone. But uh, this, we hope to have a Kickstarter for it around December or January. We still have to work on it and uh, we have to fulfill the previous Kickstarter b- before we start a new one. Okay. But uh, we are working on these two things and on the longer run we are working on Cradle of Stars 
which is a person type system for science fiction, which is on setting and on approach. And we are publishing Gargoyle and Supplements, which are D20 OSR game, very lightweight, again, very focused on play and very extensively play tested. The guy awesome. wrote it is uh, running games uh, as a profession, so everything got play tested uh, very, very extensively. We are publishing several supplements for it, several adventures. There will be soon uh, two or three new adventures for uh, Terra Reason. Uh, and we are hoping to create more, even more generic adventures for uh, Cephas Deluxe. And in the longer term, also a second edition of the Third of Cephas. Fantastic. You've got a lot on your plate. <laughs> yes, a lot of work. I'm talking about two years into the future. So uh -huh. there are seven, two Kickstarters in the coming year, and then we'll see where we go. Fantastic. I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Where's the best uh, way to uh, find out more about your products and purchase them? You could find out on uh, Drevs or RPG, search for Stellagama Publishing, uh, or look for us on Facebook. We update our page uh, quite often. Uh, you could follow us on Facebook, Stellagama Publishing, and see we get all the updates we post sometimes every week uh, about new stuff. You could find us on the Traveler Discord and our own Discord server. You could find us uh, on the Cepheus Engine uh, Facebook group. And uh, let me see, if, if people want to get on your drive through RPG mailing list, they could, for instance, download the random character generator for Cepheus, which is zero amount, and uh, get on your mailing list that way. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for joining us for our fifth annual May Day, May Day 2023 event. Um, I've been really happy to uh, put these together and super happy that guests were willing to come and um, sit with these uh, interviews. So thanks for your particip participation basically since the beginning. You're welcome. All right, then. Um, I guess that uh, concludes our interview. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you for listening to our podcast with Omer Golanjol. We hope you've enjoyed hearing about his experience as a game designer and his latest projects. Don't forget to check out his popular role-playing games, such as Terra Arisen, Barbaric, and Quantum Starfarer. And, of course, a huge thank you to Omer for taking the time to speak with us. Until next time, my friends, happy traveling. And we're back live in the studio. <clears throat> hello, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that. Hello, hello. I have with me uh, my friend, Admiral Crow. He's a uh, player in my Traveler game. Say hello, Admiral. Hello, Admiral. <laughs> happy, happy May Day, everyone. Happy May Day, happy May Day. Um, folks who are listening, let me know if anybody's volume needs to be turned up. I'm doing the best I can on the control panel here, but your kind feedback would be appreciated if something's going wrong. I won't know necessarily, although I am monitoring on my cell phone, but, uh, you know, it's turned down and it's over there on the other side of the room. So if anybody's, uh, not coming through clear, just uh, pop a little message in the chat to me or on discord or wherever. And I'll be happy to fix everything <laughs> as best as I can. So, um, alrighty. I just heard Admiral's audio is low relative to mine. Okay, I will boost that up. I Yeah, I can speak a bit. I didn't want to uh, use my command voice. You know? Use your command voice, Admiral. Where's your leadership? <laughs> Hold on, let me get my dice. <laughs> <laughs> all right i'm getting a message from jeff uh who who, who should know about radio stuff because he's from safeco uh, and wow. he says audio is very good on youtube so all right
Let me know, audio that. pros, if uh, somebody's too hot, and I will turn them up or down. So uh, we got, uh, that was a very interesting uh, interview from Mr. O Omer Golan Joel. Uh, he's super As friendly. Always. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, joining us, Mr. Omer. And uh, <clears throat> I uh, think, uh, go on. I was just going to say, I liked his, uh, his commentary on, on the current state of like AI stuff. I mean, obviously there's, you know, as you've, you've done some, or basically articles on as well, the, uh, the, there's certain moralities with whether they're using, you know, uh, public art or not, but yeah, I've been messing around with the two lately to do stuff for, you know, foundry VTT and things. Mm -hmm. and yeah. A lot of Photoshop goes into getting something looking good sometimes other times it comes out great <laughs> yeah no people people i think they might despise ai art for maybe because it they, they have a misconception that it just like you press like you know make character and then it spits out a beautiful rendit no you gotta like it yeah. takes hours and you know half the most of the it, like it can't draw hands uh try to draw a picture of an archer it's got bowstrings going everywhere extra arms and fingers in the sky i mean it's nuts yeah, um, and his, his point was great. Like, I'm not an artist, right? I, I, mm -hmm. I'm a pretty good painter of miniatures and scenery and things like that. So mm -hmm. I have artistic talent, but not when it comes to drawing at all. So for me to be able to set up games for my players that have, you know, more uh, immersiveness and, mm -hmm. and, you know, tokens like character portrait, and like yeah, that, tokens, right? mm -hmm. you know, then, then that's great. Right? Yeah, it's uh, like throwaway uh, art. Yeah, I don't have the money to pay, you know, someone custom every time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's good for throwaway art, and and if and if you're and if you're an artist, you can get really like, you can talk to it in art speak, and that's when you get really good results. Um, yeah, I, I've know. seen some on Mid Journey where they're like, you know, they're using camera settings and all this yep. other stuff. It's like, whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so just depends, you know. The the your mileage may vary. Some are good, some are bad. Let's uh let's uh let's do the uh, drawing for um, Omer Golan Joel's prize. He uh he's the sponsor of this se section of the of the show. So right. let's see. Uh, would you folks? You have a great chance of winning. Only uh, like one in sixty five chance of winning. There's not a lot of people registered on the uh, 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 for the prizes. So get on over to cyborgprime.com slash mayday 2023 and get your name in the list to draw be drawn in the mayday pro, door, door prizes going on all day and then at the end of the day you have a chance of winning the greatest prize in the galaxy our super duper prize bundle yeah and i can never win any of this it's always like oh man i know are, are you gonna quit are you quitting the crew <laughs> so you can win <laughs> that, uh, no no. Uh, oh, speaking of uh, speaking of which, uh, um, uh, I want to give a shout out to before we do this drawing to um, Dsar um, Dsar live streaming. He's a uh, sponsor, a behind the scenes sponsor of the crew. He was super generous uh, to the crew this year. So crew, you'll be getting a little something in your pittance stocking this. Uh, oh, mm -hmm. wow. unexpected. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very nice. Thank you, Dsar. If you guys like. Uh, um, uh, funny, uh, friendly guys, uh, playing, <laughs> um, video games online and streaming them, go check out DSAR, D-S-A-R, DSAR online streaming. Uh, you can find links to his, uh, stream, um, if you go to my YouTube channel and look in the community tab, uh, I thanked him recently for his sponsorship, so you should be able to find him there. You can also find him on the event webpage at the at the bottom of the uh, um, at the very bottom. There's a, uh, a, a show sponsor, and you can link to his web his uh, YouTube stream from there. So thank you very much. Also, I want to give a shout out to my friend Extreme Strategy and his uh, channel. Um, he does um, mods for uh, uh, Warhammer uh, Total War and uh, does reviews and stuff so uh he's very super helpful around uh, in my um discord community so thank you very much um mr extreme extreme strategy glad to have you around and um also thanks to sector and wizard wombat and uh ain and all the other friendly folks in the friendly discord traveler community 
over on our website. So thank you all very much for pitching in and being super awesome. Cool. Um, all right. So <clears throat> let's get this drawing on the road. And the winner of this uh, portion of the uh, um, of the door prizes is going to win a copy of uh, Cevius Deluxe Enhanced Edition and a copy of Terra Arisen, both digital copies, courtesy of Omer Golanjul at Stella Gamma Publishing. And if you um, didn't win this time, don't win this time, that's okay. Just make sure your name's in the drawing and you will have chances to win more prizes throughout the day. So, Mr. Uh, Admiral, will you please uh, use your esteemed brain to calculate a random number between 1 and 66? Rum roll. I actually uh, used my percentile dice that we were talking about uh, oh. in uh, the thing, and it, okay. the number is 54. 54. 54. Congratulations to Steve B. Your email is at gmail.com. And uh, you Congrats. have won the fun, fun prize from Stella Gamma Publishing um, of all that good stuff. Uh, Cepheus Deluxe Enhanced Edition and Terra Arisen. Congratulations. Huzzah, huzzah. <laughs> huzzah. Congrats. So, I say. I yes, say. yes. So uh, let, let's let's talk about it. We got uh, six minutes to kill before the next uh, um, interview, which is going to be with John Watts of Independence Games. And he's the ah, maker of Clement yes. Sector and Earth Sector. Ah, great. Yeah, yeah, John's back again this year, right? Yeah, yeah. He's got an inspiring story. He started just like making a bunch of... Um, traveler notes from his games and he had compiled them for years and then after a while he was like hey maybe people would like to uh, enjoy this and so he published them and it's been super successful ever since so um, it's how some of the greatest things like that happen i mean yeah it, follow your gaming dreams that's Forgotten what happened realms was the yeah. same <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah cool so uh, let's talk uh, about traveler for the next five minutes uh tell us a little bit uh, introduce your uh, your character uh, who, who's your character and what role does he play in my game for those who uh who have not made the others, uh, the other years of this. Uh, yeah, so Admiral Crow is a retired uh, Navy Admiral uh, of the Imperium. Uh, he uh, he's, he's an extremely skilled pilot. Uh, he's saved the crew's butts numerous times and made sure they knew about it. Um, uh, he, he enjoys a, enjoys a, drink and a cigar and uh, has helped spearhead our illegal dis distillery we run on board the ship. Uh, um, <laughs> that's him in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> how, how did you, do you remember how you came to meet uh, Dr. Gomos? Yeah. Oh yeah. So that was, uh, we ended up kind of having intertwined backstories where um, during one of my commands, I was um, called into uh do an extraction from a dark site of a doctor who had been performing some less than uh publicly legal uh, experimentation on behalf of the government uh and it was in a war zone so uh, we had to uh, swoop in and i had to rescue him and that's how our characters met and then years later when we mustered out uh we, he i became part ship owner uh with him he's the primary owner but uh but I have a, a fairly good stake in it. And I'm the pilot, so, you know, that helps too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A very skilled pilot, like the like one of the most skilled in the subsector. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was funny, just like, you know, all Traveler stuff. I, I had a vision for him, but the, the character creation took him, took him a certain way, and he ended up kind of surpassing what I expected he could have been. Like, coming out an Admiral was pretty like way above expectations that usually doesn't happen <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah you got so much experience it's like anybody have such and such skill and then admiral crows all i do <laughs> yeah i well, have it at three go get me another drink yeah uh why do we have any other players besides admiral Crow? <laughs> in case he's incapacitated <laughs> yeah well that would be an awfully boring session of you know me just talking to myself and monologues about and, myself uh, yes yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's see. We got about two minutes uh, more. So without going over, uh, what uh, what do you like about Traveler? Uh, what what keeps you coming back as a player? Uh, I mean, the, 
I've I was introduced to Traveler really early on. Um, it was it might have been actually the first RPG I ever played. Uh, the old Black Books, the LVP. My cousin um, had it, and uh, I just find that uh, you know I like the system. Uh, it's it's fairly straightforward, fairly simple, um, and I just you know the lore is great. You can you can you can make up anything, right? You can you can take your your game in any direction with it, and uh, I really like that. Uh, I like the sci-fi aspect of it, and you can really, you know, it is a big giant sandbox, right? If you want to, if your crew wants to be pirates, it can be pirates, <laughs> and all mm -hmm. the associate risk. If your crew wants to just be merchants, and that's all you do, you can have endless sessions and games and hijinks of just being merchants. You can take it. You know the players can help really guide the direction of the game, uh, right, unlike right. you know in a way that it's, uh, D &D becomes a lot more boring when you know you all just become merchants in a town. Right, you right. Still have fun with it if you got a good game master, but I think it's just the sandbox of Traveler really opens that up. Right. All right. Well, let's uh, let's try to get some more of our crew members in here. I see Gomos in the wings, but uh, he doesn't always respond when I try to chat him on Discord. So you know it's kind of go i'll uh he's he's I'll sometimes has his yeah his his communications jammed <clears throat> <laughs> anyway folks uh let's get ready for our next interview which is going to be with uh john watts of independence games coming right up and again congratulations to all the winners and uh, we'll talk to you on the other side thanks a lot uh, have a good one admiral crow opening merchant interface scanning trade routes Scanning for cargo destinations within jump range. Cargo shipment available. 9 tons of flavored water and 11 tons of bobblehead dolls. Destined for the Harrison system in the Sequoia subsector. Contacting John Watts of Independence Games. Stand by. Hello everybody and welcome to Traveler Mayday Mayday 2023. My guest today is John Watts of Independence Games, makers of Clement Sector and the Rider Old West RPG. Welcome back, John. Hey, how's it going? Doing very well. Hey, John, could you give us a brief introduction of who you are and what you do? Uh, sure. I am uh, John Watts, as you say. I'm uh, with Independence Games. Uh, we've been operating since 2011. Uh, we do Clement Sector, which is... Uh, Oh, uh, basically now in a, a kind of an encapsulated thing among itself. And then uh, we have Earth Sector, which is sort of an expansion of Clement Sector. And then we have Rider, which uh, uses the Cepheus engine rules to create a Western. And uh, then we have Action Movie Physics, which is out there, which is kind of a kind of a crazy little game that, um, you know, kind of mirrors the sort of craziness that you get in some sort of action action movie, you know. So if you want to, you know, do something really nutty with a car, uh, such as uh, a Fast and Furious movie, you can go ahead and do that with enough, if you have enough points to do that. So that that sort of craziness. But yeah, that, that's pretty much what we do. Uh, like if you're in a car chase, you can like drift your car or jump it over a, an opening like bridge or something. Yeah, sure. You yeah, know, cool. and, and in ways, and in ways that, that's kind of the point of the name action movie physics, because, <laughs> you know, it's not real physics. Mm -hmm. It's action movie physics. Gotcha. So, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your um, early experiences in gaming and uh, how you started Independence Game first. Talk a little bit about your early experiences with gaming and how you got interested in it. Well, the first time I ever actually saw anyone doing any gaming, I was in high school and um, I guess I was a freshman. In fact, I might have actually, now that I think about it, I might have been in junior high school, uh, which is what we call middle school around here. Uh, essentially, I, I saw some guys playing D&D. And I thought to myself, man, that looks like a lot of fun. These guys are having a good time. I should go and see if I can join this. And of course, they they didn't want me. Uh, they turned me down and said no. And uh, oh, turned uh, down by no. nerds, no. <laughs> yes, yes, it's, it's sad but true. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I was turned down by the nerd table. You know, essentially, I said, okay, fine. So you know, I'll, I'll uh, you know, I'll go ahead and you know try to get a copy of this for my own. And uh, at the time, there was a there was this uh, thing that you would get in the mail to go out and sell greeting cards. I don't know if you remember this or not. Oh yeah, uh -huh. 
yeah, it was kind of a crazy thing. And so, yeah, so, so it know, was something you, like you could do for school, except you could do it independently of, of school. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, it was like going to the local subdivisions and, you know, trying to sell these things door to door. And uh, that, that was pretty much what I did. And one of the prizes you could get was, you know, um, a starter box, a D&D starter box. Oh, That's wow. Right. Mm hmm. At 1984, 85, I guess. Uh, maybe earlier than that. Probably 83. I, I got all the points I needed to get the D&D box, and I was really excited about it. And I went home, and my mom asked me what I was going to get. And I said, a and d starter box. And she said, oh, no, I've been reading about that. Oh, no, that's dangerous. You can't do that. No, 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 no. And I was not allowed to buy the D&D starter box. And so... As it turned out, there was a mall not very far away from where I lived, and my friends and I got on our bicycles, and we rode over there. And while I was there, I discovered Star Frontiers. Star Frontiers is space. And so when I took that home, my, my mom didn't care one little bit. And my dad, who was always a big Star Trek guy, was like, oh, that, that actually looks kind of cool. And so I got started with Star Frontiers like that. And I, I ran with Star Frontiers for a while until I started doing uh, James Bond 007, uh, which I had picked up at another toy store. <laughs> Eventually, it just got to a point to where Victory Games wasn't putting on any more material for uh, 007. You know, the Star Frontiers material was pretty limited. So I decided that it, it, this is, it, you know, it, this has to be true because it's such a bizarre story kind of thing. I Do tell. <laughs> looked, I looked around at the kids and that were playing D&D, and they were all carrying these book bags full of books. They had lots and lots of books. And so to the John, you know, 15-year-old mind, clearly I needed to find a game with a lot of books. And so I had a catalog that was coming from, but it was a, it was a kind of a, kind of a game warehouse kind of thing that was in Florida. They were sending me these catalogs and they had miniatures in it because at the time I was buying a lot of like one three hundredths tanks and things like that. And mm -hmm. they had Traveler and Traveler had about three pages full of books in this little catalog they gave me, you know, all the little black books. <clears throat> and I said, well, clearly this is the game I need to play. <laughs> it's science fiction, and it has a lot of books. So, yeah, that, that's how I ended up getting into Traveler. And so um, we we started playing Traveler, and we played Traveler for a while. We started playing Mega Traveler. And eventually, when I went I went off to college, and um, when I got there, we you pretty well pulled together kind of a gaming group there. And then I had my friends were coming down to visit. I, it was about three hours away from where I grew up. And so we had a big group that was coming together and eventually we started we, you know we just kept tr playing traveler and going on and as it turned out we we just kind of decided we didn't like the the otu we just kind of decided the third imperium setting we just didn't really care for it sure it was good stuff but it wasn't for us and so they essentially just looked at me and said look john you're you need to come up with something else come up with something on your own and i had not one clue what i was going to do and as it turned out, that weekend, I drove down to the games, the, to the video store, rather, and uh, came back and watched Silverado and Pale Rider. And in the process of watching Silverado, I determined that what I really needed to do was do something Western. There, there's a line in the back of the Varger source book that says something along the lines of, with the with the way travel works and everything else, you know, there's it, you there's sort of an 1880s feel, you know, to the whole thing. But you know, don't take this analogy too far. <laughs> so I took it too far, um, <laughs> and I basically I basically just started doing a space western, mm -hmm. and we had a lot of fun with it. We we you know we just you know sort of built that as we went. And um, I, the, during the entire time I was at the University of Georgia, we played. And then I came back up here to Ringgold, uh, which is just south of Chattanooga, Tennessee. And there was a game store in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee called uh, the Royal Tiger. And I just sort of went in there and started running games. And it just kept building and building and building. And I ended up with more and more people. Um, at one point, I had 35 people playing the game. Yeah, yeah, it was nuts. But we were having a really, really good time. We were just, I mean, it was just so much fun. And all of those notes and everything, you know, I had piling up in notebooks all over, you know, first my apartment and then my house. And, you know, it's, yeah, I need to do something with this. I mean, you know, we, we've had such a good time with it. Maybe other people might have a good time with it. 
And um, after after Mongoose's first edition came out, and they had they were doing things OGL at that stage, I decided to maybe put out a few uh, sort of test products just to see if just to see if anybody wanted one. Mm-hmm. And as it turned out, it you know a, a fair number of people bought them, and so I made another one, and I made another one, and then it just kept building and building and building, and then I just said, okay, fine. You know, this is clearly doing something. So I just went ahead with, you know, Clement Sector itself, which is essentially the campaign that that my friends and I had been doing since college. You know, that's that's pretty much the basis of Clement Sector. And so, it, you know, it just it just kept going and going and more people wanted it. And so we wrote more books and, you know, it's just kind of snowballed from there. Yeah. You know, that whole idea of meshing Westerns with uh, sci fi is um pretty popular one i think that you you kind of nailed it with that i mean like uh if you look at firefly for instance that's space western even lost in space that was kind of like space pioneers uh was it something like star trek was originally going to be called like wagon train to the stars or something crazy wagon like train that to the stars, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you know that was the weird thing <clears throat> you know firefly was a bizarre experience for me a lot of the things that were in firefly were things that we that had happened in the game that that I was running, and it was bizarre. It was it, uh, we actually <laughs> tried to figure out if maybe Josh Whedon had had you know come by and visited at some point. Um, it was really weird because, well, I'll just tell you, some of the it, it's to the point to where some of the things, some of the names that I used in what would become Clement Sector that we used, you know, in the game are in Firefly. The, you know, Persephone, um, Ariel, things like this are actually in there. And some of them, I I just literally said, no, I have to change that. It was, it was bizarre. One of my, one of my friends decided that he wanted his girlfriend to play. And so he decided that the best way to get her character into the game was to put her into a box and bring her on board the ship and then have it <laughs> open after they had left. And so, you know, Sounds we're watching familiar. Firefly. Mm-hmm. We're watching Firefly where, you know, it was the nuttiest thing. I I had not been interested in seeing Firefly. I was not a fan of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And when people told me, you know, the Buffy the Vampire Slayer guy is going to make a a space show. And I said, you know, I don't need to see that. And so I didn't watch it the first night it came out. I didn't have anything to do with it. And then about, eh, I guess it probably been on about 15 or 20 minutes, you know, the train job. I start getting all these phone calls from every friend that I have. Like, John, your Traveler game is on TV. You don't understand. This is the weirdest thing. Your Traveler game is on TV. And I'm like, well, you know, the, the one of them's like, you know, I'm recording it. I'll bring it to your house in about an hour. I'll be there. You you need to see this. And, and you know, after that, we all got together every night, <laughs> every night and watched it. And we're just sitting there going, how do they know? <laughs> Yeah, they did a really great job. Um, I missed it when it first came out on TV. I was uh, teaching classes at night, and uh, it happened to be on the night that it came out. And then they started preempting it with baseball and moving it around, so it was on a different night. And I, I just, I was like, well, there goes a sci-fi series I'm not going to be able to see. And so I kind of had sour grapes for it because I didn't get to see it. And then, um, I and then I eventually I saw the movie, and I was like, wow, this is awesome. And that then I saw the TV series after that. So it was. Yeah, I was hooked. That's a, it's a great way of meshing those kind of frontier feeling with sci-fi and exploration. You know, they did a good and, job. And you know, that's that's another odd thing. You know, because I, you know, I always tell people that that essentially the way I came up with Clement Sector was by watching Silverado, mm-hmm. and at the time I was also uh, watching Blake Seven on PBS. Oh yeah, Blake Seven. And mm-hmm. I love Blake Seven. Yeah, me too. And, and it. At the time when I was uh, I was living in the dorms in Athens and you could not get cable or anything like that. This is 1988, 89. And there was no cable. There was nothing like this. And so you had to try to do it from an antenna and we had no way of doing it. And one of my friends was living in an apartment above a church. They had cable run to the run to the church to their um, uh, assembly hall. And he lived above the assembly hall, so therefore he had cable. And so Atlanta Public Broadcasting was playing Blake 7, and so they're, you know, they're like, hey, John, you know, you, you, you probably enjoy this show. Why don't you, you know, come with us every... So every Sunday night after church let out, we would drive over to, the, we would drive over to my friend's apartment, go into the assembly hall, go up into the 
up into the roof area there where the you know the ceiling area where they where his apartment was and we would watch blake seven and um yeah yeah, there's yeah a, that's a great the show weird, the weird thing is though that i went back and rewatched it mm-hmm. like i don't know six months ago or so and i was amazed at how much western how many western themes there are in that no, i'll have to go know, back and rewatch it i've only seen it once i was recovering from appendicitis <laughs> so i spent a lot of time in bed watching tv <laughs> and i watched the entire series of uh, the old um mission impossible <laughs> then i watched all the blake sevens yeah, yeah, I mean, um, Sue Lin, who um, you know, is uh, played with Glennis Barber, who was in uh, uh, one of one of my other favorite uh, British shows, Dempsey and Makepeace. She she's actually a gunslinger. They actually describe her as such. There's there's actually one episode where there's you know very much a a very space western feel about it, and I was like, you know, I don't I don't remember it being this space westerny, but clearly clearly there was a there was a bit more. There was a bit more influence there than I realized. Yeah, it's got some great characters. Like their science officer is so annoying. I, he, he reminds me of like uh, Doctor McKay on Atlantis. Is like, <laughs> yeah. why is he on this team? Because <laughs> he's brilliant. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> I loved Rodney. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> it's like he always gets picked first. To, like he's the one that no one wants to be teamed with, but he always gets picked for, picked first for the away missions. You know, because <laughs> he's so oh, yeah. smart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, uh, so what do you think sets Independence Games apart from other RPG publishers? I don't know. You know, you know, I, I think, you know, we, we, we really push to have stuff out there. We try to try to make sure products are out there. We try to do a good job with customer service. I think, I think a lot of other companies do the same. You know, we, we try to get things out there and, you know, we're, we're just trying to be as entertaining as we can be and, you know, get people into, you know, the different worlds that we're building. You know, just trying to keep people entertained, and and I hope I hope we're succeeding at that. Uh, you know, I think we're I think it's going pretty well, and um, so yeah, I, I'd I'd like to think that we're we're keeping pe- people pretty entertained. Although, you know, certainly there's a lot of other companies out there right now that are that are doing a good job at that as well. Yeah, I got to say, I've um, I've seen your products mentioned around in social media by happy customers, like going, "Look at how fat this book is," and like you know. Uh, stuff yeah, like that's that. A, it's a big book. I I was I was actually telling another. Uh, yeah. I was actually telling another uh, RPG writer friend of mine. Uh, she she said something like that. That book is huge, John. And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, the good news is that it you know if, if you like it or you don't like it, you still have something you can use for home defense. <laughs> um, yeah, it's pretty I, big. I, I, I like I like the size of that. That's the size of book I like. It reminds me of my favorite game, which is Champions, which. It, has a gigantic book mm-hmm. and uh and even just the hero system by itself I'm, I'm running hero five now and it's also a big book and so when i saw it when i saw yours i was like yeah i'd like that that's a, that's <laughs> <laughs> that that's because it it's it's complete you know you're not just buying a um a piece and then you got to go buy another piece and another another piece all the stuff is in there well that was that was actually something that we ran into because when I first start you know when we first started out we were we were attached with Mongoose Traveler first edition and so we didn't want to do a rule book because the idea was that you'd buy the Mongoose Traveler first edition rule book and then you would you would buy the Clement Sector setting book and then you would you know there Open there would be things that would be different but mm-hmm. you know for the most part they were the you know we didn't want to do that the second time around so we actually came out with um for second edition we had a setting book and a rule book and that was the biggest complaint we had at that stage was I have to buy two books and three considering, you know, other things it's like, you know, and then if you add them, add things on and, you know, if I want to know exactly what the political situation is, I'm going to have to buy another book. And it was, you know, and I, I heard all those complaints and I thought, no, you know, they're absolutely right. It would be better if everything was in one book that had a good index in it and a good table of contents and, you know, something that you could have in one, one thing in, in your hand. I don't, I don't think I realized when I first started that it was going to be as big as it is, but it's certainly big and it's comprehensive. And, you know, I, I hope that helps folks, you know, kind of get into it. And, uh, but like you say, I mean, it is really big. I have a friend of mine who, uh, does a, uh, as a firearms podcast and i i keep telling him that you know eventually i'm going to give it to you you give it to you and tell you to fire a weapon at that's it. what i was gonna say see, <laughs> see, see if it actually is bulletproof start and, with the uh, 22 and go up from there and see like how far yeah exactly mm-hmm. because i 
I'm not sure, but I think it'd stop a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's nice. It's good. It's a good quality book. Uh, who does who who puts that together for you? Oh uh, well, mainly me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like, who does the binding and the printing and all that stuff? All, all the printing yeah. stuff is done done through Drive Through RPG. Oh, I see. Uh, That's a good, nice like, product. Yeah, yeah, it comes out really well, I think. And you know, like I say, it is it is large enough to where if you get a really big wasp in your house, you've got something to get it with. <laughs> I've been uh, pleased with their stuff too. I, I printed up some uh, cards, uh, um, and I was very pleased with their print quality. Ever so often, they'll make a mistake that's a little weird. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just just uh, it hasn't been very long ago. I had a, I had a customer come to me and tell me that there was a D and D book in the middle of his in the middle of uh, one of the collector books he bought. <laughs> I actually, I actually had the same thing happen to me, except it was a children's book about an elephant, and it wasn't the bar, which is odd. But <laughs> you know, it was just. It was like, well, how strange is this? You know, that happens. And, and if it had been, if it had been in the uplift book, it would have been fine. But, you know. <laughs> that happens. I have an all, I have an alternative book, The Last War Hulk, and uh, halfway through, it repeats, and you never refit. The, the end is missing. Michael Johnson, who writes the, um, who writes all my Starship books, uh, we call him the Starship Guru. He wrote the Starship Design book, Anderson and Felix. He ordered a copy of the new Anderson and Felix the first time, and he ended up getting he ended up getting a, it, the cover was right, but the inside was a sewing a sewing instruction. <laughs> Oops. But but I have to say, you know, even though they they you know they do occasionally drop the ball on it, but um, I have to say they fix it. With that was one know. quality sewing manual. <laughs> oh yeah, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, you know, they, they fix it every time you know anytime they anytime there's any kind of mistake they're really good about fixing yeah, it yeah their and customer so, service is good yeah yeah i mean yeah. you know you're never going to get anything that's perfect i mean there's always going to be something that happens so how do you stay up to date on the latest trends and technologies in the gaming industry how do they affect you you know i i try to pay attention to what everybody else is doing i try to try to keep an eye on what what all's going on and you know everything that may be happening here and there um, you know, I, I am in the publishers group that's on Discord, um, you know, and so I, I do see what other people are doing and I try to get an idea of what they're, what, you know, what sort of, what sort of tools they're using. And then I try to, you know, see if those tools would work for us. Mm -hmm. And in some cases they do, in some cases they don't, you know, so, you know, that's, that's generally how I just, I just try to pay attention and I'm friends with a lot of people. Um, I've gotten to know a lot of, uh, RPG writers over the last few years, and uh, a lot of good folks and so you know i kind of keep an eye on what they're doing and they you know give me tips ever so often and so yeah yeah it's that's generally how i i pay attention to what's going on all right even though you know i i was just on discord last night talking to somebody and they were talking to me about eclipse phase i thought it was a video game so <laughs> i didn't realize it was an rpg and so, um, yeah, so, I, I, you know, I, I don't know that I'm keeping up entirely, but but I do try. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about some uh, current events. Or uh, This last year, Wizards of the Coast had a crazy fiasco where they were going to uh, revoke their open gaming license, which is what us independent folks use to uh, develop under the Traveler system reference document. How, how was that going to affect you and um and and how did that end up shaking out for you it was tough it it happened at exactly as far it, it just for me personally it happened at exactly the wrong time last year my mom had cancer and at the exact same time my wife hurt her uh well she ruptured her achilles tendon and so i was either playing caregiver for my mom or playing caregiver for my wife and so I had a very, very tense end uh, last three or four months to 2022. And so my wife and I decided that the best thing for us to do, we, we, have, a, we have a favorite place we like to go that's in the North Georgia mountains. It's a little town called Helen, Georgia, and it has a German theme to the town. So it's a very, very Bavarian sort of look. And we love going out there and playing mini golf and eating sausages and drinking beer and just having a good time. So we planned it. We planned this weekend with the idea that we would get away from all of our problems, you know, and everything, you know, just, just recharge and everything was going to be great. And uh, that's the weekend the OGL thing happened. And I was like, crap. <laughs> <You know? laughs> 
It's like, it's like, well, so much, so much for avoiding tension. But as, as it was, I mean, it, it really looked to me as if, you know, we were going to have a lot of problems and, um, you know, we got, I got together, um, you know, all the Cepheus publishers got together and we all had discussions as to what we were going to do and what each of us were going to do. And there were discussions and arguments and kind of back and forth on that. And then, uh, you know, we were in touch with uh, Matt at Mongoose, you know, and uh, Mark Miller. Uh, and we were just, you know, trying to trying to sort out exactly what we were going to do. Honestly, it it didn't look good for us. It, it, they were, there were a couple of times when it really looked kind of dark. It was really stressful. And, you know, I had a, you know, it, it was it was difficult for me to deal with it considering that I had just dealt with the other things that I had been dealing with. And right. this, this, was, this was going to be my weekend away where everything was going to, you know, with, the, with the, all the cares will go away and right. it just didn't work out. Did you have, you had a lot of your products tied up on CFS Engine like that? Uh, through the, through, well, not tied up on CFS Engine, but, but tied up in, in the effects of the um, Wizards OGL. Well, sure. Yeah. Okay. Everything, uh, I mean, Clement Sector, Earth Sector, and Rider are all built on Cepheus Engine. And um, Action Movie Physics is actually built on the OGL as well. I see. Uh, through, through Classified, and uh, and then there were Cepheus Engine elements in it as well. And so so essentially everything everything we had out there was, was OGL related. Uh. And, you know... So that put your whole line at risk. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, we were trying to figure out exactly what we were going to do, and the idea that we were going to have to re literally go back and rewrite everything, if if not with a completely different rule system that we were coming up with, with something you know, with something else, you know, um, you know, uh, at the time there was discussions about uh, mongoose taking taking Traveler 2nd Edition and going ORC with it. There were there were other discussions of other people doing ORCs. There were discussions of basic role-playing. You know, you know, and it's like, what's going to be best for Clement Sector? And we were, I mean, it was tense. I, you know, I unfortunately probably took it out on a few people that, that, that talked to me on social media mm -hmm. at the time. And, you know, for that, I apologize. But, uh you know, it was it was a tough time. It was very tense, and we, I mean, at the time, we really felt like it might be, you know, completely destroying our livelihood. And I mean, you know, this is this is my primary job. This is right. what I do for a living. And this you just became primary. Independence Games, right? right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, I you know I left my other job. This is my this is my job. And so, you know, it really looked as if you know, if nothing else, I was going to have a gigantic setback. It was it was certainly a source of partying when they decided not to do that. <laughs> but um, you know, so what happened was uh, Wizards of the Coast withdrew their intention, at least temporarily, to uh, to 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 withdraw the OpenGL. Yeah, and and you know the truth is it, it did kind of expose a weakness. You know, we were like, okay, well, you know, maybe maybe we do need to explore some other some other options. Mm -hmm. Um. But um, but yeah yeah it was it was it was a very tense time and um, I you know it, I had there were a lot of sleepless nights and uh, a little 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 more alcohol than usual <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know, but we're okay for now oh yeah we're yeah. good now okay um, but um, but at the time it was it was a very tense time and um, you know it was it was tough and there was there was a lot of frustration a lot of anger. Well, I'm glad it's uh, it's working out. Uh, I look forward to seeing what uh, Mongoose is going to uh, do with their next with their next OpenGL or their Orc or whatever they're gonna <clears throat> whatever they're gonna end up doing. Yeah, honestly, I I you know I really want to I really prefer the idea of sticking with Cepheus Engine and you know keeping a, you know a bit of independence, <laughs> independence mm -hmm. games. But uh, you know, and keeping that little bit of independence away from it. But you know, I think it I think it could be really good. I think you know. If uh, if Mongo's takes second edition o, um, ORC, I should say, right? Um, which orc? That's nice. I like that. Yep. But you know, <laughs> you know, if they're you know if they're going to take that ORC, I don't know that I'd be interested in doing that. But I know that it's going to help a lot of other people out there, and there are a lot of people like you know who are going to be out there like me who you know want to dip their toe into publishing you know the same way I did with right. with first edition that would be able to do that with it. And I you know I think it's a I think it's a really good thing if they do it. I'd rather um, have a I'd rather have an agreement with Mongoose than having a third party in there. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that. I mean, 
I would I would rather deal with I'd rather deal with one person you know directly than to be basically whacked as you know collateral damage. That was the explanation. I, I my 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 parents wanted to understand what was going on and trying to explain that whole situation. I'm getting whacked, like, mom. <laughs> you know, it's like I don't know how to explain this to you, to people that don't know anything at all about gaming. And I I finally just said, look, I said it. it I said picture it like this. I said I said. I and the other Cepheus Engine publishers and some other people who are publishing like this, who who are operating under the OGL, we're 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 sitting in a cafe, we're having a nice time, and meanwhile, what we it would, suddenly what we realize is that that you know some other entity has declared war on the town on, on the country in which our little <laughs> town is. We're, we're we're just sitting here minding our own business in a cafeteria. And, oh, is that hey, Tony look, Soprano at that other table? <laughs> yeah, it's like, what's with the mushroom cloud out there? And, you know, that's, that's the way I felt. Mm -hmm. And so even dealing even dealing with someone or something that, you know, I, do, I don't particularly care for would be better than dealing with something that I have zero input in whatsoever. I mean, there was nothing I was going to be able to say or do that was going to influence what wizards of the coast did really? not, not one bit i mean i could argue i could complain i could you know i could do anything i wanted but it, you know it's not going to affect wizards whatsoever they right. don't care and they they don't know about me they don't know who i am they yep. didn't even i guarantee they didn't even understand the situation they put me in right especially when they, they were they were like treating the vast majority of people who who had that license are D D publishers and if right. they didn't care about that giant group they're not going to care about hey travel over here you know uh <laughs> oh no we're neutral standing by a country <laughs> we're, hey, we're just trying to have coffee here we're having a nice time you know a nice danish decided, yeah mm -hmm. Wizards of the coast has decided to nuke the city we're sitting in <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. and there's nothing we can do about it yeah and well i'm glad I'm that's uh, that specter reviewed. is off of us now oh yeah yeah well for now yeah um who knows what uh, they're gonna do now it certainly it certainly reinforced the idea that there needs to be a backup plan <laughs> right right yeah <laughs> what that is at this stage i i still don't know but but there there's gonna have to be a backup plan yeah i backup. feel like they got so much bad press from that that they might have that they pushed back the D, &D movie because they wanted yeah. that to subside who knows yeah. maybe after the D, D movie comes out and is gone from the theaters they'll be back at this <laughs> and, and, and you know that's entirely possible it really is and so yeah i mean i mean we've definitely explored other options i mean you know i you know I, I've talked to I've talked to other people who are doing other games. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like I was saying earlier, you know, I I've had the I've had the um, the pleasure and opportunity to meet a lot of other RPG writers over the years, and you know, there there was the ability to talk to them and say, right. you know, hey, what, what are you what guys are you doing? doing? Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, and so you know, and and I must say, the the Cepheus Engine publishers, every every last one of them, they're all great people, mm -hmm. and. I, I love every one of them. They're, they're, you know, I, I, I count each of them as friends and, um, they're, they're all really good people. And so it was, it was, it was good to be able to talk to all of them and, you know, and be able to try to try to work some things out. And then, you know, of course, I, like I say, I have, I have other friends who are, who are doing other sorts of things and it was good to be able to kind of sit down with them and go, okay, you know, what, what, what are you folks trying yeah. to, to accomplish here? And yeah. What, compare what notes. Mm hmm so can you um share with us some upcoming events and releases that you have planned well um by the time this all comes out uh, the time, by the time all this hits i our gearbook should be out there and 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 uh everybody should be seeing that that's probably the newest product that we've got out there which is uh gear uh which uh our, our good friend perry came up with a great name there uh <laughs> yeah it's an acronym General. right mm-hmm yeah, yeah, yeah. General equipment adventurers require, which I, I, you know, he's like, I don't know if this name's any good or not, John, but you know, I, I'm like, that's brilliant, man. I yeah. love it. Yeah, I thought it was great. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, and so we've, we've got our gearbook out there, which, you know, I, I've had people pestering me for a gearbook for about five years now. And so I was like, okay, well, you know, it's, it's well past time for Clement Sector to have a gearbook. So we've got a gearbook out there now. As, as it sits right now, uh, Michael Johnson is working on a hacking source book for Clement Sector. And that might be out there now as I speak to you in the future. Uh, <laughs> <you know. laughs> but um, the the one thing the one thing we're definitely doing um, that that will be that will be going on uh, around April twentieth. We're going to have uh, we're we're going to have the uh, charity bundle for our good friend uh, Keith Fry, and that's going to run through uh, through into May. And, yeah, let's uh, uh, talk about that a little bit. Uh, who's Keith Fry, and what where, what's this bundle about? Um, Keith Fry is a good friend of mine. He um, he ran TravelerCon for years in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and uh, he and his wife uh, they they ran the convention for years. They, they just worked really really hard for the community. They did a lot of wonderful things for just the entire traveler community, really. And um, you know we we went to the convention on many occasions and became friends with them. And uh, they're just, they were just really, really good people. And of course, uh, Keith had cancer and, you know, anybody who's been involved with, with, you know, that sort of thing knows, knows how much that can uh, drain the finances. Yes. So we're doing, we're, tr- we're trying to get people together and trying to do things for them, trying to get things put together. And so we put the bundle together. We got a lot of people together. Um, you know, and I appreciate your contribution to it as well. Absolutely. And you know, um, we we got a lot of the publishers together, uh, Cepheus Engine uh, Traveler, and uh, we're going to put that bundle out there, and it'll be a really good deal for the people who want to buy it. And all that money, every every drop of it, will go uh, straight to Megan, who is Keith's wife, and you know she's going to use that to try to pay off some of the bills and. You know, and try to do that. And um, as a matter of fact, Ken Patterson is in the process of running some charity games as well that will uh, be involved in that. And so, we, you know, we're really hoping that uh, folks will look into it and, uh, you know, you know, and they'll get a really good deal, a lot of really good products. And, you know, like I say, all that money will go straight to her and, you know, help her out in, in this time. Uh, good on you for uh, organizing that. Thanks a lot. Oh no, it's no problem. I, you know, it's it's what I could do to help, and um, you know, there's such Megan is such a good person, and Keith was such a great guy, and you know, and they they did so much, um, you know, for the community, and you know, just years and years they put a lot of really hard work into doing TravelerCon. And, um, you know, and so, you know, it's like I said, it's just, you know, it's it's what I could do. And, you know, hopefully it will help. I'll put a link to uh, that charity bundle in the show notes so folks can find that and uh, get a great deal on uh, your favorite gaming stuff while supporting a great cause. So, um, yes, absolutely. So uh, let's talk a little bit about um, other stuff. Uh, What kinds of advice do you have for aspiring game designers? Well, <laughs> um, the 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 main thing I would say to anybody looking to get into this is to is to do it. I mean, and that was the one thing that got me was just because, get started, just do it. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, because I mean, the the opportunities out there, um, especially especially as long as the OGL stays up or the ORC or any of these other programs that people are doing, you know, if you can you can get out there and do it, and you know. I unfortunately I had about three people that I listened to at the time when I first wanted to start all this that were like, oh, you know, John, that's tough. That's hard work. You don't want to do that. You know, and all this. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, and, and, you know, I probably would have started two or three years earlier than I did um, if I hadn't listened to those folks. And I, I highly recommend that if you have people in your life who are telling you that, don't listen to them. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, just, <laughs> just do it anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the absolute worst thing that can happen is that you can you can put your stuff out there on on drive through. You, you know you can work your way into do, doing something with drive through. You can you know learn learn how to use the OGL or the ORC or you know the DM Guild or the you know TAS program, whatever it is. 
you can you can learn to use that and you can do it and you know the absolute worst thing that's going to happen to you is that no one buys it and you know you you have some people on facebook make fun of you and and i assure you that if you're successful um i like to think that we've been pretty successful on this you will still have people on facebook making fun of you <laughs> um, so there's the difference there is none and so you know you may not make any money off of it or you may make more money than you think you will and people may decide that it's a fantastic thing and you'll have more to do and more to do and more to do which is what happened with us and um you know we you know just kept putting stuff out there and it just kept building and building and building and we built a fan base and you know folks folks liked it and we gave them some more and you know and this could happen to you as well and you know you should you absolutely ought to give it a shot there's there's just too many ways now for you to get into publishing to not do it um absolutely i think you should just get in there and do it and you know there you know it seems insurmountable at first and you will get in there and you will discover things that you just you know that are, that are basic to publishing that that you yourself just did not think about for me um i wrote i it essentially took it, my first product was essentially taking a um a notebook that i had on one particular planet within clement sector and I decided to put out a book called Quick Worlds and with the name of that planet and I put it out there. And so, but, but I wrote the entire book. I did everything, you know, I learned how to use the OGL. I did everything right there. I did everything. And then somewhere along the line, I discovered that probably I needed a cover for the book. Oops. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and, <laughs> you know, and it was like, huh. Oh, wait, yeah, and it needs a back cover. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, this is all pretty basic stuff, really. But, you know, I didn't know. And, you know, it was it was one of those things. It was like a, you know, slap you upside the head moment. Mm -hmm. And so so I went and bought. I, I went on to drive through RPG. And at the time, and they may still have them, they, they had stock RPG covers. And it was horrible. <laughs> but, but I put it on the front of the book and you know I put something similar on the back of the book and I I threw it out there and you know and I was I would to be completely honest with you I was a little embarrassed by what I ended up putting out there the first time because it was just I it was it was like a blank it was like a blank computer screen with the, with the sort of matrix you know lettering behind it mm -hmm. and um just some really rudimentary text that i put on the front of it and it it was it was awful and um later on i later on i replaced all of those covers and and, and hope that not too many people saw them <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of nice though to have those like markers of your milestones like here's my here's my macaroni necklace i made and then the, <laughs> sec the next one <laughs> was uh yeah <laughs> some finger painting but uh, you can see the progression over time. <laughs> yeah, there's 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 a lot of stuff that you'll have to deal with that you just you know that you you haven't thought of and right you know, and that you you're not going to be good at at first. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah and you're going to be terrible at right. and you know you're going to make a lot of mistakes and you know one of the, one of the first things I discovered was that in fact you know editing your own stuff doesn't really work very well. Yep. Because it all it all reads fine to you. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. So. I, I lucked out in that uh, one of my friends is is a is a professional editor, and um, I was able to you know rope Curtis into doing that. It's like, hey, Curtis, uh, I need some help here, um, you know. And you know, that was one of the things, you know. It's you know uh, the the group the group I had around me, you know, my my gaming group, you know, some of them some of them are very creative people and some of them are uh, talented at doing a few things here and there and so I did everything I could to rope them into helping. But yeah, absolutely. If you've got an idea out there, you've got something you want to you want to go and go do it. Put it out there. Sit down, you know, open, you know, open a word processing program and go to work and do it. And I'm I'm telling you that, that even if it fails, which it probably won't fail as badly as you think it will, um, even if it does, 
you still have the opportunity to do another one and improve from what you did the first time. Right. And you get those still... lessons learned to help you on your next. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, you know, and you've got it out there and it, that's, that's so much better than, than sitting around thinking to yourself, yeah, man, I ought to do that and not doing it. Yeah. yeah you would never I, know I unless you try. Well, sure. I mean, because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, like I said, there was a, there was a good two or three years where I just sat around thinking, well, you know, I really ought to do that. And then I had, you know, a couple of people that were in my orbit that were like, ah, you don't want to do that, John. You know, it, that's just, that's tough. It's, it's hard. And it, it is, it is tough. It is hard. People don't um, see the value in it or they don't understand it or, or, or I don't know. I, don't, I, I, I encountered some, some people like that too. And, I don't know why why there's just some negativity is a jealousy or they just don't think it can happen or or there's just too much competition from the big guys but honestly if there's some if you like something and have a passion for something it's likely that someone else in the world does too and yeah. that and you'll never connect with them unless you put something out there and that was the bizarre thing too because at, at the time when I had decided that I wanted to do this I had, I had actually I had actually been published in a couple of magazines and so you know it, it it wasn't completely alien to me, and you know, but it was like, oh, you know, John, you're you're, you know, you're you're really going to get your feelings hurt. You're really going to, you know, if this doesn't work out, you know, you know, and it was, in all honesty, I think I think the people that that told me not to do that felt like they were protecting. Me. Yeah, um, it was probably good intentioned. Yeah, yeah, I think so, but but you know, don't listen to those people. Uh, <laughs> you know, get out there and do it. <laughs> if they say no, don't listen. <laughs> There's just too many. There's just too many ways you can do it now. Yeah. Um. You know. You you have a voice. You you know. Get it out there and let people hear it. And you'll be surprised at how many people are like, hey, you know, I like that. No, you'll you'll get your following, and you know, you'll be amazed at how many people are out there in the world that 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 you know are thinking the same way you are, and you know, are are happy to you know are happy to give you a little you know a little little bit of cash for for some good ideas mm -hmm. and you know your ideas are good you just don't realize it yet great pep talk i love it thanks a lot <laughs> <laughs> so can you can you give us like a um uh, a general overview maybe of the process of creating a new adventure or or how how you uh add a new thing into your um into the realm of your products a lot of times, particularly particularly when I first started, I felt like there were things that weren't being addressed, and so so therefore I I really felt like I needed to address them. That was that was one of the things. Like at the time when when I first started everything, my my real goal at the time was at well, I was working seventy hours a week for an electrical supply company that my dad owned, and I absolutely hated every second of it. I, I had been working for that company about like I said, it was I was working around seventy hours a week. And then I was trying to run a game on Saturday. And it occurred to me that there were other people who were probably in the same boat. And that they would appreciate the fact that, you know, instead of having to sit down and think to yourself, you know, what planet are my you know what planet is my group going to visit this week? Um, you know, that, hey, you can just pick up one of John's quick worlds and, hey, hey, here's a planet that I can visit this week. That was my original intent. Mm -hmm. uh, when we did the 21 plots books, we basically took the the idea that, you know, the they had made the 76 patrons concept um, open game license. And so I thought, you know, that's something else you could do. You could take the 21 plots idea and you could you you basically throw out a few things so that people would say, "Oh, I see. Yes, we can, we can do that." And you know, here's here's a couple of small adventures we can run with. That was that was how I started with things. And then eventually, as Clement Sector kept building and building and building, it basically became a question of you know what what else do we need? What else do we need? What do we need to address? You know. Um, if people are going to be, you know, if people are going to be doing criminal activity, we need to address how criminal activity works in Clement Sector. If you're going to have robots, we need to address how robots work in Clement Sector because, you know, this is a separate setting and the whole setting is completely different. So we need to address that. So a lot of a lot of our books are just simply addressing what things are like in Clement Sector, mm -hmm. you know, um, like outlaw. 
you know, crime and climate sector. The uh, book that I am currently right now working on is called Badge, uh, Law Enforcement and Climate Sector, in which we're going to we're going to delve into how, you know, the different planets all do different things. And one of the one of the great strengths I feel of climate sector is that every planet is different. It's a uh, what did Spock used to say? Infinite, infinite diversity and infinite combinations. And that's how I feel like climate sector is. I, I you know, every every planet is its own independent world. And so they all have their own culture. They all have their own government, their own ideas, their own way of living own culture everything you know goes a certain way and so mm-hmm. you know i'm going to have to now address you know how things are different because if you go from cascadia over to gagnon the law enforcement isn't going to work the same they're they're just not going to operate the same way right and, right you know and if you decide to run a law enforcement game if you have you know police that are working out there you know how does that work um, you know, the same, I, you know, and we did the same with piracy. We did the same with, uh, you know, all the different, all the, all these different things, you know, politics, um, business, all these things. How do these things work? Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times it was just a necessity of trying to explain these things and how things work in climate sector, as opposed to the way you've seen them work in other role-playing games or other, other media. I see. And, uh, there was a lot of that. And then. Sometimes, you know, you'll just have an idea that just hits you. The plot line, <laughs> the plot line for, for our adventure, Long Road to Redemption, comes from the idea that my wife, my wife and I just happened to have a long conversation on our way to TravelerCon one night. Mm-hmm. One week. We were on our way to TravelerCon. It's a long way from, uh, from Ringgold, Georgia to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And, you know, we just kind of talked it out and, just, you know, came up with the idea and just decided that was a good plot line. You know the slide, which is the the pirate race, just comes from a throwaway line I put in the pirate book about about the pirates all you know having a having a race of their ships, and then my editor coming back and going, you know they could have like a cannonball run kind of thing. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 so sometimes inspiration just hits you. You'll be watching. You know, you know, I people used to ask me, you know, what what is your what is your biggest inspiration for when you want to write, you know, one of the twenty one plots? And I always used to tell them the BBC News, because I, I one of the things I was doing a lot when I was working for the electrical supply was I was inside of a truck and I was delivering material out and I was visiting job sites and I was doing outside sales and this sort of thing. And I was going back and forth from places. And so I had a satellite radio in the truck and I would listen to the BBC news. I would listen to, you know, all the different programs and they'd start talking about, you know, how this thing was going on, you know, in this country and how they were dealing with these things. And, right. you know, and you get a different, t- different dis- perspective from that side of the world about yeah, what's going on yeah. over there and how they do yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah, and it was it was great because it, it it would you know it would spark the imagination and it would get the idea going. Hey, you know that's something that's something that would work. You can draw a lot of ideas from current events. Oh yeah, yeah. So it sounds like a lot of serendipity and synergy with your own product. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's that. You know, a lot of times, a lot of times, it is that. I mean, it's just a. It's just a question of, you know, building on one thing and, you know, building on another thing and then building on another thing, you know, and that's, that's a lot, that's a lot of how climate sector is, has grown really, because despite the fact that, you know, for the most part, I had it all mapped out, you know, at the beginning, uh, you know, and it had been mapped out since, you know, the early nineties when I was running these games, you know, there were still fringe elements and things like this that we hadn't quite decided on or you know something like that and so it became necessary to build on that earth sector for instance comes from the fact that ever so often i would get a message on discord or facebook or MeWe or twitter or what have you it would say hey john what's going on in earth sector while all this is going on you know while everybody's on the other side of the milky way galaxy after the wormholes closed what's what's going on over there I'd never really covered that. And so, you know, while climate sector is something that's been around, you know, has been bouncing around since, you know, the late eighties, early nineties, earth sector is something we built just like five years ago. Right. And, okay. You know, so it's wide open for development. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was something that we built because like I said, I kept getting questions of, Hey, what's going on over there? Why not, you know, what's going on with that? And so, you know, that, that sort of built that whole idea. 
and you know, writer in action movie physics comes from the fact that I absolutely love those kinds of movies. I love westerns, and I, I love action movies. And you know, wouldn't it be fun to you know run a run a game in that? And you know, beforehand, a lot of westerns, a lot of westerns were things like Deadlands that had a lot of uh, you know magic and supernatural elements, and I, that's something I didn't want. I I wanted a straight up you know. Straight up western, mm-hmm. you know, and and so that's you know that's that's where writer that's where writer how writer was born. So yeah. one thing I've noticed about uh, the sci-fi uh, branch of our of our hobby is uh, it seems to be it seems like it's undergoing some sort of um, expansion. Uh, I see traveler mentioned around more often. I see sci-fi mentioned in pop culture more often. Um, uh it seems like more more people and uh, and i talked with uh matthew and he 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 uh, verified this that more people are you know getting into traveler than ever at least since he's been doing it um and uh so with all all these new folks coming in the increase in like um female players and so forth um how important is diversity and, and inclusion in gaming to you and uh, how do you work to ensure it's reflected in your products I can tell you first off that the Clint sector has grown every year it's been out. Um, you know, it's 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 something that that constantly grows. There's more and more players all the time. And and I love that. That that really makes me happy. I if it were up to me, everybody would be playing Clement sector. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean I mean, I I want everybody to play. I you know, I I really do. You know, I you know, and I love the idea that there are so many people. You know, when I was, you know, I can tell you that when I was growing up, you know, it was it was rare to come across, you know, the idea that there were, you know, well, I'll put it this way. I got to the University of Georgia and <laughs> I met my first female gamers and I was shocked. <laughs> and mm-hmm. I was like, wow, you know, but I wasn't upset. You know, and and the idea that you would be upset is is bizarre to me because I was I was delighted. I was like, "Hey, this is great." I this met my wife cool. at a D and D game. <laughs> well, yeah, and it, it, well, I met my wife at a science fiction convention. So you know, um, but but you know, at the time, you know, having been in high school when it was pretty much an ex- exclusively male sort of thing, I was I was absolutely positively delighted that there were there were other people, you know, that that weren't just carbon copies of me sitting around the table, mm-hmm. and, you, know, you know, other chubby white guys, right? Uh, you know, and and I was delighted, and I, you know, I'm. I I I want everybody to play. I want everybody to have a good time, you know. And that's that's the way I feel about it. I absolutely want everybody to play, and so I do my best to make sure, you know, that that it's something that's inviting for everybody. I don't want to turn I don't want to turn whole large groups of people off, you know, of any kind, of right? Any, of any you know of any belief system of any you know anything. I you know I want everybody to. But look, because, you know, again, like I was saying before, Clement Sector is, I, I really do think that its, its strength is that there are all these independent worlds and there are all these different cultures and there's all these different, all these different ways of looking at life and looking at Clement Sector. Um, you know, so it's there's, cosmopolitan there's, and there's all kinds of people. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, and every world has its own culture, its own way of doing things. And so just within just within Clement sector itself, I have to go through, you know, I really need to go through and explain everything as to which world does what and which world thinks this and which world feels this way and how things are how things are going with this. And, you know, this this world's, you know, it leans more this direction. This world leans more this direction. And, you know, so there's an opportunity for anybody and everybody to come in and you know and play and and, I, and within I want. within the setting too you have uh you have all trans and you have um mm-hmm. which are like altered uh humans and then you have uplifts uh yeah. so you do yeah. have like a diverse uh when i would say like player character base already built into your game um it, how are all tr- all trans and uplifted animals are regarded in in your game uh well again the it varies it varies as to which world you're on um you know there there are worlds where they there are worlds where they're hated um you know um uh, where they're basically seen as nothing more than tools and then there are other worlds where they are you know 
accepted citizens of the group and you know they're just you know just somebody else they're just a little different mm -hmm. and you know it, it it varies from world to world um you know you know like i said with the, without a, a really large overarching government or a large overarching culture to be out there to influence things you know it, it it varies from world to world and so there's there's a wide range of attitudes out there and so you know i think that i really feel like it it fosters the idea of you know having different worldviews and having different ideas and and being able to do that you know whereas you know somebody who's you know the the thing i always point out um is that a lot of folks you know, we'll look at we'll look at Clement Sector and they'll see the Hub Federation as the good guys. And you know, they, here's some here's a group they pulled together these these six worlds and they're you know they're plucky and they're they're you know going out there and they're pulling all this stuff together. Whereas some others around them are like, you know, what's with these guys? You know, these imperialists they're trying to take over everything. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and and just and I I do everything I can to to point out both viewpoints right um and then play yeah. with that you know let's yeah, let's see what it looks yeah. like from this point of view let's see what it looks like from that point of view yeah because mm -hmm. i i will have people come to me and say well who are the bad guys in clement sector and i'm like that's whoever up to you, you. Want them to be. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know right. it's and, and that's and that's what i want that's 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 the way i want things to be i you know i i want it to be out there because i want to present to you here's how things are in climate sector here's how you know how things are there and you come in and you bring your own ideas and your own viewpoints and your own way of doing things and you you will find that you can mesh in with something so how do you approach uh, balancing mechanics and storytelling in your games i tend to put mechanics back as far as possible <laughs> which is kind of weird for a guy who writes rules I, I, I like the so idea. So you do the storytelling it, first and then you try to build a mechanic that fits into that story? Right. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I feel like the rules should be something that are in the very background. There's something that's running in the background and what you're doing and what your characters want to do, what the players want to do is, you know, is, is tandem out. That's, that's the thing that's out there. That's what's, that's what's going on. You know, I I I absolutely detest the idea. Of, well, you know, you really can't just do that because of X, Y, and Z. No, 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 no. Play it. Go. You know, see <laughs> see how it goes. And you know, I hate when rules get in the way. I I can tell you that I've played several several different other games. Um, I won't I won't name any names, but it it, it rhymes with C and C. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that, where the where the rules just you know stand up and get in the way, and you know invariably there's somebody in the back, you know it's like well we're in the middle of this great combat, and now somebody's going to have to grab a book and look up what their spell does and what the you know it's like you know I, no I don't want any of that, mm -hmm. um you know I I I really am very fast and loose with rules. If you ever play with me, you'll you will be shocked <laughs> at at just how little I stick to any of it um you know because well, they're really just the, there for a guideline really right i mean right why right, argue exactly. over the rules they're just t trying to tell you like if something's more difficult make the target number higher and if it's less difficult lower it down i mean exactly exactly i um you know i <laughs> and and here's I, the reason why i mean that that's part of the rule i guess you know yeah, but I mean, mm -hmm. I I really want I really I I play fast and loose with all of it, mm -hmm. every bit of it, even even my own setting, I I play fast and loose with, just because I you know, I I want everybody sitting at the table to have a good time, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be easy for them. That doesn't mean it's going to be something that you know. You know, I want them to face a challenge. I want them to, you know, to have to give some thought as to what, you know, what the next move is, what they're going to do. But I don't want anybody to sit there and wonder, but wait, what about the rule on page 312? What would you the know, rules I, say about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I, you know, that that to me is the, I, I don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, can you tell us about a particularly challenging project project you've worked on and um, how you overcame the challenges? A lot of a lot of these things require research. And, you know, that's 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 something that's fun for it's, it's actually fun for me, but it is a challenge. 
because well for instance let's say that you have you have a planet and they're spanish they they were colonized by the spanish um you know the spanish you know everybody there is spanish i am not fully familiar with all aspects of spanish culture or how the spanish law enforcement works or how you know how the spanish prison system works so this requires me to go and read a book and read read online and go in places and try to research that and find out and so it's you know and so then take all that put it together and then decide how that might evolve into what it might be on this planet in Clement Sector. That's challenging. It's 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 a little tough sometimes. It it it's certainly time consuming. But for me that's also a lot of fun because I get to learn something. I enjoy learning things. I you know, I w- I was a history guy in college. Um so the more knowledge I can take in, the more research I can do, that's more fun for me. Mm-hmm. Um so, you know, that it's it's a lot of fun to be able to do that. I think that... it is a challenge. But I think but that go on. Something, mm-hmm. But when it comes to something technical, that's where I start running into problems. Mm. Because I don't my John's mind doesn't think that way. John's mind thinks culture, it thinks history, it thinks, you know, this sort of thing, you know, how you know, how how does the you know, how does the crime you know, how does the crime world work on this planet? That's the sort of thing John thinks about. And when it comes time to design a starship, John doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and 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 to be completely honest with you, the main way I the main way I fixed that problem is I found or well, to be completely honest, he found me. Michael Johnson and I got together, and Michael Johnson's a great guy. He's a, he's a civil engineer. He lives in Perth, Australia, and he has written every Starship book there that we that we published. And he wrote the Starship rules, and he wrote the robot rules, and how to build things. Because why why did he do this, and why is he doing? It? Because John stinks at it. <laughs> uh, because because my mind just doesn't work that way. I mm-hmm. I am not I am not blessed with that sort of uh that sort of thinking. And so any sort of big, you know, highly technical thing is challenge is super challenging to me and generally requires that I'm going to have it it start at that stage to me it starts feeling like it's too much work and not enough you know, enjoyment. So, so yeah, anything super technical is just not for me. I am not that, uh, my brain doesn't work that way. But, you know, I also understand that, you know, this is a science fiction game. Therefore, we need spaceships. Therefore, we need a logical way that spaceships work. And, you know, essentially, I can go to Michael and say, you know, you know, here's my idea of how things, you know, generally should work. Translate that into math, please. <laughs> because I can't. Um, <laughs> what I was going to say earlier is that I I think that your method of doing a bunch of research on something and then kind of like maybe relooking at it and and maybe taking something and exaggerating it or giving it a twist uh, really speaks to like the heart of sci-fi. So um, you know, it's taking like uh, what if people were black on one half and white on the other half and then they were prejudiced against themselves you know or whatever like how that old star trek was you know um and then kind of like showing how stupid that is you know what i mean um through the through the adventure so that that kind of thing of like going well being able to take something like that and using it as sort of an allegory to say you know you know here's here's what's going on with the human condition I you know I like that that's that's the sort of thing I like mm-hmm. even though I'm even though I'm generally not a very political animal sure well you don't uh, have to take it into politics but I mean just like exploring yeah. the human condition well, sure. in, in ways where things are exaggerated what if the police cracked down on us or what if there were no police you know right. or right. Uh, you know whatever well yeah exactly and mm-hmm. you know you know how how do things work you know if you know, the, this set of parameters is out there, you know, mm-hmm. if when you walk outside your, you know, if you walk outside the building that you live in and you're going to have to have some sort of, you know, facial protection against, you know, the atmosphere that you're dealing with, 
you know, how's that affect you? Mm -hmm. How does that affect, how does that affect the overall culture? How does that affect things that, you know, how you live your life? You know, you're, you know, all the buildings are now going to have to be connected or something. One would think because mm -hmm. people don't want to go out into the atmosphere where you're going to have to deal with all these problems. Wouldn't it be better if we had skyways between the buildings or if we had an underground passage that went to the building? Or if we lived in the dome. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That, so, that's that all that stuff adds more sci-fi elements. Yes. And yeah. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what do you see as the future of RPGs in the gaming industry as a whole? I think I think it has a very strong future. I am I am really really uh, what do you say bullish on the whole idea. I think everything is going to continue going going gangbusters. I think everything's going to be strong. I I think there's a good solid interest in this now, and the demographic of people who are playing is so so much broader. Um, than it than it once was when when I was playing. I mean, you know, when when I first started, we were a bunch of weirdos in a you know, we were a bunch of weirdos who were meeting in somebody's basement, you know. And you know, it's it's not that way anymore. It's no, it's, no. it's it's a it's a popular thing to be doing. There's a lot you know. There's a lot of folks out there doing it, and I think sure you know they're fads. You know, things things go up, they go down. You know, and it's it's always been that way with everything, and it always will be. But, you know, I think it's to a point now where it's like baseball or football or basketball. You know, it's been around for a long time, and it's going to be around for a long time in the future, mm -hmm. and people are still going to be doing it. And, yeah, sure, it'll wax and wane in popularity, but there's too broad a base of folks out there who are playing and having a good time and, you know, seeing this as a valid way of entertaining themselves and so yeah i think i think it's i think it's strong and i think it's going to stay strong i i really do i think oh, i'm i'm not as i'm not as bullish on the ideas of of doing it online because a lot of times to me that loses something i feel i feel like it loses the the um collaborative um feel of it because you know, um, what is what's the thing? There there was a meme that going around that you know, it was a meme going around. I want to say it came from the Onion, but it might have been from somebody else. But it basically said you know that the local Satanist parents were very upset because they discovered that Dungeons and Dragons was nothing more than improv and math. <laughs> And you know, and, and 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 that's so true though, because you know it really is improv and math, and pretty much you know I tend to fall on the improv side. You yeah. know, I you know I'm I I did acting in in college. I I took acting classes, and so you know the entire idea that you know I can get there, get in there, and run this game and take on the the different personalities, and you know, and and it, it sort of becomes that col you know odd collaborative improv effort that 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 builds at a table. Mm -hmm. You know, I I think that people are going to be playing at tables. You know, with dice and you know, looking each other straight in the face for for years and years to come. That's and, a good uh, way of looking at it, and I've never thought it's like uh, having your own uh, like um, special interest improv group. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it yeah. really is. I mean, yeah. in a lot of ways, it really is that. And you know, and it's you know, even even if you're not so, even if you're one of those groups that isn't really into the whole, you know, taking on the character and doing the acting and all that, you know, and because I've played with groups like that, and I've played with groups where you know everybody it, it was practically an improv session. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and uh, it's fun either way. And, you know, and, you know, that sort of collaborative effort that, that builds and builds and builds and the, the personalities and the and all this, you know, uh, one of my friends, uh, Don Haymaker, he's uh, the guy who runs uh, Crash City Con in Roanoke, Virginia. He always he calls gaming the greatest social club. And I tend to agree with that. I, I I really think that's a good way of saying it because I, I really do think that it's it's a it's a group of people that can all get together, and no matter what your background is, no matter what your your group your group thought is, you you can get together in that that group and have a good time. You know, like I said, you know, when I was talking earlier, you know, I I have had I've had gaming groups that were large groups of people, and you know, those people didn't all agree with each other on 
politics, religion, or, you know, their, their backgrounds were all different. Their, you know, their ages were all different. You know, <laughs> I, I have a movie poster downstairs that I bought personally. That's older than two of my gaming people. Uh, <laughs> two of the people who come to play games with us, you know, this sort of thing, you know, it's, I, I really think it's a great way for people to take a lot of the differences that they may have set them aside and have a great time together. And that's, that's what I love to see. It just makes me happy. And, you know, and, and that's the, that's the sort of thing I think gaming can do. I think that being in a big group or sitting around a table is, is just so much fun. And it's, I, I, I really think it's here to stay. I don't, I don't think it's ever going to go away. Well, speaking of the future of gaming, um, let's touch on uh, another current event, which would be the rise of AI. Um, what are your thoughts on the role of AI in gaming and, and its potential impact on the industry? I've heard that, for instance, Wizards of the Coast is planning on uh, including like an AI dungeon master. I, I I don't know how that's going to work. Um, I mean, I could see I could see it working in a, in a in a way, but to me, it's not going to be the same experience. And you know, again, I think that 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 whole you know group of people sitting around a table collaborating and having a good time is mm -hmm. probably the way that things are going to continue forward. Um, you know, sure, you know, there's I mean. There's always an opportunity to add some new thing to it. Um, you know, an AI GM might, you know, it, it might help a lot of groups that, you know, can't decide on who it is they're going to force to be the GM. <laughs> uh, so, you know, maybe if you, you could have something that was telling you what, you know, what was going on. But to me, that, 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 that feels more like a tech, like a text game from like the eighties. Yeah. Like Zork or uh, something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know, that, that's, you know, that's not what I signed up for. Yeah. Cause the uh, GM, the GM is one of the players. Right. And if, if it's a right. collaborative, uh, what I want to say, like a collaborative feedback, um, thing that's happening, uh, the, the AI has got to be part of that too. And so how good is that going to be? Right, yeah. right, and, Do you and uh, hey, you know, there's no telling what 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 you know sort of technologies around the corner. Right, it may be to a point to where you know at some stage in the in the future, perhaps closer than we may think or even want. Right, um, you know that it may be able to you know operate on the fly and actually you know operate the same as a human running a game. I. I, I don't see that happening in the near future, but, you know, it's entirely possible that it could go that way. And if it does, then, well, well, we'll have a, we'll have a new, we'll have a new paradigm. Uh, what about within your, uh, what about within your, your rule set? Uh, do you allow AI characters and NPCs in your game? And do you have rules for handling AI? A bit. Um, essentially what, what happens in Clement Sector is, is that in the past, uh, there, there was a rogue AI that went nuts during a war um, between Indonesia, well, Indonesia and Thailand on one side, and Japan and Australia on the other. And the Japanese had a AI that was um, operating from a orbital station, and it decided on its own that it needed to perform a kinetic orbital strike on Bangkok, mm -hmm. and. After that, AI becomes somewhat uh, taboo. And in the current climate sector, things are just starting to change, where things are start you know, AIs are starting to become more common. They're starting to be avatars on ships. They're starting to, you know, it's all starting to come back out. And so while there's no AI characters per se, you certainly will encounter things where AI is starting to come onto the scene. There's, you know, it's starting to become something that you're starting to see. There's a, there's a company in the game uh, called Foreign Ability Computers, which is um, something that actually comes directly from uh, my earlier campaign back in the late eighties. They specialize in AI and holographic avatars, um, you know, ships, ships that think and so you know that that sort of thing is coming along and it's starting to become something that that you would have to deal with oddly enough um when we were gypsy knights games the original the original point of that was that 
the character, the group of characters that uh, that I had at the uh, Royal Tiger um, hobby store that I was talking about earlier that was in Chattanooga, Tennessee, that group decided that they they wanted to have a ship AI. So basically they could talk to directly to the ship and there would be a holographic avatar that they could discuss things with and talk to directly. The guy who was playing the captain was a guy by the name of Tim Lee. And he decided that as a play on his last name, he wanted to have the character, the avatar be the famous stripper Gypsy Rose Lee. And so they just called her Gypsy. And so as the um, as the game progressed, they ended up going to a planet wherein they they basically became the government and they began referring to themselves as the Gypsy Knights. That actually kind of grew from there and actually became the name of our gaming group. So we we ran with that for a long time, and so when I decided to name the game company, that's where it came from. So essentially, there's an AI literally built into the DNA of this game. Awesome. Um, <laughs> but but hmm. so, so there's that, um, you know, and of course, you know, you know, at the time we had no idea that that the, the term gypsy might be offensive to somebody it had no clue at all and of course you know that's just something you learn as you get you know more experienced and more older sure but but um but yeah i mean so so we definitely had we we definitely had a lot of ais in the whole thing to begin with and like i say you know at one point the 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 entire company the entire company's name was Something built off the idea of a you know AI avatar for a ship, right? So yeah, I mean it's kind of built into the DNA. Yeah, that's cool. So, so it's out there, um, you know. So, but yeah, the the people who made the the in the in the game the original uh, campaign that I'm talking about the people who actually made the AI were from a company that was from another from another campaign where the character had made a. Kind of, you know, he wanted to be the head of a computer company, he, kind of a whole Steve Jobs kind of thing, and you know, wanted to do that whole kind of thing. And it was, you know, it it was kind of, you know, that was kind of how that that built up. And already we were building on and building on because, you know, this campaign was then building on the previous campaign because, you know, he had started for Nobility Computers with his character, and then you know, as it turns out, then you know we have the a- the avatar AI on this one, and well, hey, it's a for Nobility Mark Six, you know, and so oh, hey, that's you know Ruben's character from back in the day, and yeah, that's cool. Know. That's cool. The continuity, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So we, you know, <clears throat> that, that was that was part of the fun for us, and so you know, a lot of like I say, a lot of that's built into Clement Sector. So yeah, so I mean, you know, right off the bat. There's there's certainly AI involved. In- so what are your goals for the future of independence games? How do you see your company evolving over time? And can you tell us about some future products we should look out for? Well, like I said, you know, we're working on the law enforcement book. We're working on a hacking book, which, you know, kind of go together because one's going to be adversarial to the other. Uh, we're going to keep taking things that we did in second edition. We're going to try to update those to third edition. And I always feel like when we upgrade something from second edition to third edition, if you bought second edition, you know, we're we're not making sufficient changes enough to where I feel like I need to make you pay for it. Uh, <laughs> a lot of times we will quite literally just give you a free PDF of the third edition one if you bought the second edition one. Oh, nice. And that's what I really, well, that's what I really prefer to do because, you know, I, I played Warhammer. That made me mad. Mm. Every time I had to, uh, it's like, oh, well, hey, we've come up with the Chaos Dwarf book, so guess what? Now it's time to rewrite the rules, and you have to buy everything all over again. Yeah, and I hated that. Yeah. (laughs) You could do that maybe to a gigantic group of people, but not to a small company. Yeah, and I wouldn't want to anyway. Yeah. It's just, you know, it it, it really just, I don't know, the whole thing, the whole, the whole thing puts a bad taste. Yeah, it's sour for sure. It's it's not something I'm ever going, I'm never going to make you pay a large amount of money to get something I've already made you buy previous. Awesome. How noble of you, sir. Very good. (laughs) Well, (laughs) I don't know how noble it is, but but I can tell you, I can tell you that essentially to me, I remember sitting there after the third Dark Elf book that I bought for Warhammer Fantasy and thinking to myself, I am never doing this to somebody. This just makes me mad. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, it's just, just one of those things. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I mean, we're going to keep doing that. Um, there's going to be more stuff for Ryder. Um, there's going to be more stuff for Earth Sector. There's, we're, we're kind of concentrating on Clement Sector right now, but 
that focus is going to move back to writer in the future. Um, there, there are a lot of books that, that we have ideas for, for writer, um, certainly more stuff for earth sector and who knows there, there's probably going to be more games down the, down the line. Yeah. We're, we're, we're having a great time and things are going well. And I, you know, you know, they would, like I said, I was, I was very frightened. I was very scared. I was very upset over the whole uh, OGL thing. But now that that seems to be in the past, at least feeling now, optimistic. Uh, yeah, I'm really, mm -hmm. I'm really back to being the usual optimistic self. I, I usually am. I, you know, I'm glad. I'm Welcome dead. back. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, thank you. Because between 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 around September and January of uh, between you know, September of last year and January of this year, I I was pretty down, and so I, I'm I'm back to being my usual optimistic self, and so I'm I'm very pleased by that, and I really think there's a lot of stuff coming along, and I think people will be pleased by what we put out. Great. How can people stay up to date with uh, on your work and find your products? Uh, is, do you have a social media or a website? We're all over the place. Um, <laughs> <laughs> What's the best um, way? We well, yeah, we have an Independence Games Discord. Um, that's the one I really recommend to everybody because we we uh, we we have some really great conversations there. We we've, we've kind of built up a, a nice little community. Um, we have a Facebook group. Um, we have a MeWe group. Uh, you know, I post things on it ever so often on Twitter. Um, you know, so we're we're out there, and of course, then there's. Uh, our web store at www.independencerpgs.com. I was going to and, mention that's a very nice website, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Well done. And you can buy any of our stuff there. We're not offering physical books yet, largely because I'm trying to figure out how all the taxes are going to work. But once we conquer that, we'll have physical books there, and hopefully we'll even have some swag. But uh, for the most part, uh, you know, it's it's PDFs there on our website. And then, of course, we're on DriveThruRPG. You can get uh, print books and uh, PDFs at uh, DriveThruRPG. And, you know, just, just visit us, find us. You know, like I say, we're, you know, if you purchase one of the books right there in the front, you know, I give the give all the links to the Discord, the MeWe, and the Facebook. And we're very active on social media. We talk to people all the time. And... We have a really we have a really good time, particularly on the Discord group. We we have a lot of really rollicking conversations. We have a really good time, and so come join us. Have a good time. Fantastic. We'll post uh, links to all of those things in the show notes so folks can find you. All right. Well, we've uh, come to the end of our interview. Um, we've been talking with uh, John Watts of Independent Games, maker of Clement Sector and Earth Sector, among other things like Writer, the Old West. Uh, uh, RPG. John, I appreciate your participation in this event, and I hope you'll come back again. Oh, well, thanks for having me. I love doing it. Fantastic. And thank you, dear listener. Until next time, happy traveling. studio and we had that was a very interesting uh interview and uh we're gonna have uh john watts hopefully join us here in a second <clears throat> trying to uh get him into the green room i might be able to just push him into the room Let's see. Oh, John, you should be able to see the um should be able to see the room. Uh just a sec, I will send you an invite.
and deliver it to you directly. We'll have John Watts here in a GIF. And here he is. Hello, John. Hey, hey you I made, made it. it. <clears throat> I was afraid you were subject to a teleporter accident, so I'm glad that uh, you made it. <laughs> well, actually, as it turned out, I uh, used the transporter, and as it turned out, there were Borg DNA inside of the transporter buffer. And... Oh, no, no, yeah, Picard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, you know, I hate it when that happens. Yeah, I hate I hate that. I hate when my DNA gets rewritten while I'm, and I'm carrying a virus and I don't even know it. <laughs> hey, John, welcome. Hey, we only got like two or two minutes or so before the top of the hour when the next uh, interview goes on. Uh, let's let's uh, select a winner for the uh, uh, the prize pack um, that that you have donated, uh, which which is pretty generous, awesome, awesomeness. We've got uh, Clement Sector Third Edition, uh, Subsector Source Books for Hub, Cascadia, Franklin, Sequoia, and the Colonies. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That, that's, right. a, that's a nice little package to get everybody started. That's a, that's a great package. And um, let's see. We've only got uh, 66 people in the drawing right now, so odds are good, folks. John, give me a number between 1 and 66. Let's use my lucky number of 21. 21. <clears throat> and the winner is... Tim Soholt. Congratulations. Congratulations. You win a big pile of stuff from our good friend, John Watts at Independence Games. Hey, John, uh, would you come back to the After Hours party if you can and hang out with us? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm going to try to. Fantastic, fantastic. Cool. In the meantime, uh, fellow Traveler nerds, you're welcome to come over to the uh, Discord and uh, chat live with uh, publishers and uh, other Traveler friends all hanging out there, there right now. So uh, if you're looking for other uh, people who play Traveler, Now's a good time to come check it out. So hop on over to our Discord. It's on screen right now, the link. And uh, you might also be able to find it in the description. In the meantime, uh, let's get on to the next interview, which is Mr. Craig A. Gleisner from Thornwood Darnalude. Enjoy. Opening merchant interface. Scanning trade routes. Scanning for cargo destinations within jump range. Cargo shipment available. 7 tons of luxury items and 11 tons of cat toys. Destined for the Hyperion Cluster. Contacting Craig Agleesner of Thornwood Darnalud LLC for more information. Stand by. Welcome to Traveler Mayday Mayday 2023, everybody. My name is Frank Sucardi, also known as Cyborg Prime, and my guest is Craig A. Gleesner of Thornwood Darnalud, the creator of the Herald Class Yacht. How you doing? You're doing chopped as hell, dude. This is my fifth year for doing this. This is dope. I feel like a grown-up company almost. <laughs> I'm in my office. Thank you. No, thank you for having me again. As always, an honor. I am proud to be part of the community. Craig, introduce yourself. Uh, tell us who you are and what you do. Uh, Craig A. Gleesner. By day, I'm a mild mannered dispatcher in Infernal Iron Company because, you know, we have to pay bills because you do not get into publishing to become rich kids. If you're listening to this thinking, how will I make millions as a publisher? Be Random House. Otherwise, you gotta love it. And yeah, I do traveler publishing and gaming, and uh, I've gotten myself into T5 pretty heavily since the beta, and apparently my name is now showing up in Mongoose books I didn't even know about. If I remember correctly, the last Spinward Marches book actually has an acknowledgement or a mention of my name in the cover. Oh, cool. So I have to go pick up a new copy of that. Page 121, uh, Anthony uh, did a, a review of it, and he cracks open the title page all the time so you can get a look of, you know, who wrote it and everything like that. And I was like, wow, that looks like my name. And being the egomaniac, I went, I froze it and zoomed it in because YouTube lets you do that now in the iPad. I was like, oh, crap, that is. I have to go buy a copy of this book and it's my collection of, like, <laughs> ta-da, I'm a real author. <laughs> That's awesome. People pay me to write things. <laughs> 
Tell us a little bit a little bit about your background and how you got into gaming and sci-fi. Probably Star Trek, like all nerds, in space 1999. Although I grew up in the 70s, so I got a dose of Battle of the Planets, the ever beloved Super Science News Team Gotcha Man, which is a bunch of dope ass teenagers beating up aliens in bird costumes. For those people who don't know, look it up. It's tight. There's a there's a live. <laughs> but get the Japanese one. <laughs> there's a live action the live version. Live one is sick house, dude. <laughs> Apparently the hmm. story's kind of bleh, and they don't fly around in their cool costumes as much. But I did see it, and it does kind of look baller. But none's going to match the really best one, believe it or not, is for like a telecommunications company did this little gotcha man short. Oh, my God, it's sick. I also have not seen the uh, the 90s OVA yet, and I want to get that one. So how'd you go from uh, Space 1999 and gotcha man to, uh, to uh, sci-fi gaming? The UWM Student Union, where I was never a student, but I was always there. Uh, the third floor of the UWM Union had a gaming crowd. Now, originally, I discovered D&D of all places in the psychiatric child center, or psychiatric ward, where I played a thief who got killed by a Greek trap. Made a perfect run through and then pressed the wrong guy. That was my very first guy on the screens. Like, no, dude, double lot. You're screwed. See, this is the spell. No disintegration. No save. <laughs> like so believe it or not you think i didn't like gaming having my very first character killed but i love that shit as you said that I was uh, anticlimactic <laughs> but like he legit didn't even touch the dice dude he was just like clap 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 oh oh i'm so sorry <laughs> first behind the screens but in a weird way i think it was because he brought me behind the screens and showed me how it all actually worked from behind the screens as opposed to just roll some dice, I tell you. And I think that's probably what actually hooked me in. So yeah, I went to UWM because I heard there were like cool people hanging out there and I knew some people in common who were students who were like, you know, I'd hang out with. And that's how I met the third floor gaming crew and uh, Traveler because Zed, the great thrower of dice was running a little black books campaign. And uh, as I said in previous interviews, I'll never get tired of saying it, I got to play Octavian in Spain, which was dope. <laughs> oh, it's only great. I only talk about it now because, like, when I was playing it, I didn't know. He was just like, yeah, your dad is the emperor. He's dead. You got to go reclaim the throne. This is based on a historical Roman event, which I'm sure all everybody but me was like, oh, okay. <laughs> which explains, though, why they were very cool about, in a weird way, doing probably what happened. Like a bunch of the old guard protect the kid while he does some noob shit. And in the end, we'll see the emperor. Also, space ramming. Space ramming. <laughs> I don't know if any. Of the, yeah, I don't know if any other traveler game allows it or has it even or has taken it into account. But like I said, I was playing with history nerds, like getting degrees in medieval history and shit like that. They were also the SCA, a lot of them. But I don't know, man. Our group had really bad dice in that game, I think. Because, like, I remember a lot of things where, like, Thaddeus ran up on a dude and stuffed a laser pistol up underneath dude's helmet and shot him that way because every other one of his shots had missed. So he basically set it up so he had as many possible modifiers that he could to his dice. Will be like, does that, is, does that finally kill this guy? Is messing us all up and we were getting messed up in a space combat and our captain was just like all right well you know what ram them and we'll board them <laughs> it's just like honestly i didn't understand why there's no steam more of it it's it's a very traveler age of sail kind of thing like if all those fails run into their ship they ain't going nowhere <laughs> <laughs> right and yeah from there just a long steady stream of playing and wanting mostly to play traveler but everybody else plays all those fantasy games you know traveler doesn't let you play star wars because like no you're weak in jump space figure it out <laughs> they make, oh man dirt. and they always make you poor I don't know why they do that <laughs> <laughs> well I you know, can just look at it really, like a road trip that's much more my style that's why i play nobles mm -hmm. <laughs> like you know i'm just here 
doing things <laughs> with the title if I want to. <laughs> yes. So what, insp yeah. what inspired you to create the Herald Class Yacht expansion for uh, Traveler 5? The beta for Traveler 5, because I was testing everything I could get my hands on. More specifically, I was testing the things I really loved. I cannot lie, I up for help redo combat, and I have to go back and reread that, because it's probably going to become extant in a little bit. But um, yeah, I had a entire sector I had generated. Well, actually, somebody in the group generated for most of it, and I've been tweaking it ever since. And I needed a ship for them to go on the mission to, uh, at that point, it was still in the three, third Imperium, so I was having them shuttle the ambassador to Jordani because I'm kind of a Zoe simp. I think they have a reasonable society in a lot of ways. Now, I know some shit about them behind the screens that has tempered that enthusiasm a little bit, but uh, on the whole, I still think they have a pretty sensible society. Um, I love the way the books, all, all the alien books in Traveler have always well, I tried to make the point. I don't think people get that enough that Lord Zodani thought police, you know, the Imperials were all like, oh, no, don't look. Whereas in a weird way, they don't see that as, I mean, not looking is kind of creepy. Like, you know, you can, but you don't. What's wrong with you? Some sort of weird introvert? Do you need help? Should we get one of the Guardians to come help you? <laughs> you know? I love the fact that they call them the Guardians of our morality in their own language. That it's not an oppressive thing. It's, I mean, in the way they describe, like, how the Shodani are like, oh, you're having problems at work. Your home life's kind of messed up. Come here, we're going to get you trained to a new job. We're going to figure out what's going on at home. And we'll see if we have to. We'll bring your family and we'll do Gestalt and we'll get this sorted. And honestly, you know, the fact that lying is a thing that they have to teach their spies and, uh, and things like that. That's cool. It's a actually more functional, rational society than our own current one. And frankly, I've always been kind of a sympathizer. So, yeah, I needed to get them to bring the new ambassador in and Mark graciously even put a little blip about the whole new ambassador being shuttled in in one of the uh, Imperial lines, actually. I think it was five or six. I think it might be five. But uh, yeah, so I needed that. And I needed something big because I am an idiot. You know, they're all, oh, the average gaming group is 46 players. And that's because a couple of people couldn't make it today. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I like big groups, apparently. Which, you know, upcoming but so yeah basically designed a a player ship capable of holding like 12 people just in case and because of course it was a diplomatic mission it had to be a yacht you don't send an ambassador on a tramp freighter kit that just isn't done unless you're doing some shady things and uh well then you generally don't send an ambassador <laughs> so yeah it by need had to be a yacht there was really i mean i suppose i could have done a navy ship damn dude everybody does navy ships i'm guilty of it i have an entire folder full of scout ships and navy ships i mean i've literally been working on another uh an assault cruiser because like god knows there's not enough of those in travel let me add one <laughs> but my you know tech level 15 so uh, again i should probably just Admit that was me keeping busy till I got my computer back. <laughs> but speaking of new ships, still working on Shackleton, trying to get Mike Barger to put a little bit more of a fire under the regiment because that's kind of holding it up. I uh, got a variant that is a mercenary cruiser, which holds a combined arms regiment, hopefully. Otherwise, you're getting my crappy half assed version of a lift regiment. But dude looked at it and was like, well, I got to give you points for like having recovery vehicles and thinking about logistics, but I was in an actual real life professional army. <laughs> so hopefully I'll get that be jamming. Getting maybe, I'm trying to get a little Barbara. I think it's Barbara. I don't know how to pronounce it. Super Troopers has made me really self conscious about that last name now. Um, but uh, they uh, were trying to, hopefully, I'm trying to get put together a uh, handout pack of handouts and while i'm doing all of that i'm gonna hopefully run a game so um can you uh, without uh, revealing any secret sauce or whatever can you uh mm -hmm. walk us through the process of creating de deck plans for a starship like the herald class yacht yeah you have somebody volunteer to do it and then not take any cash for it 
<laughs> even though you repeatedly go, no, dude, seriously, it is worth it to me to pay you for this. He was like, nah, it was just something I did for shits and giggles. Or you hire Ian Stead. And, you know, <laughs> that's what I did the second time around. And the third and the fourth time around. God damn, dude, I really need to get them books out. So, yeah, I got like three ships of deck plants that uh, Ian's done for me. And they are every last one of them worth every penny I paid for them. I, uh, I'm very, very happy. I, I, I don't figure, dude. They're, they're, I, artists, I understand. This is my rate. Okay. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. It's like, dude, they get the hassle. I am not going to add to the try to figure them down. So, um, how do you incorporate uh, feedback and suggestions from the traveler community into your work? I, as much as I can, get them to, which is like trying to pull, I don't know, four leaf clovers. It's hard. The funny thing is, is honestly, when it comes to the Herald, the, the biggest negative reaction I had, and which I have taken to heart, is uh, when Anthony did the review for page 121. And uh, his page 121 video ends with, well, he wanted an honest opinion, so here you go, dude. There's a lot of typos. <laughs> I'm like, ooh, you like, like a whole lot of them. Otherwise, great book, but typos driving me crazy here. And I was like, ooh, no, that's good. I didn't know that, though, you know? So eventually, somewhere down the road, I would eventually like to do an updated Herald Mark II. You know, Second edition? Like, yeah, with all the with all the typos well. fixed, all the typos fixed, and Stephanie Michaela getting her awesome credit for that banger of a cover she did. Oh my God, dude! I am still pretty sure that book is basically still selling because that cover is so sick. Oh my God, I am in love with that cover. That's I, I told her it's like no, that's my brand style for the game now. I mean, you just you sank it, dude. It's perfect. Negative space is beautiful. The framing is beautiful. The color matching. Stephanie does a fabulous job of covers. Highly recommend. Six stars all the way. Nothing but satisfaction. It is hella beautiful. I cannot lie. I My Cooper Joe cover for the Herald is rubbish. And I feel really sorry for anybody who bought one. And frankly, if you can produce it, I'll replace it with a good copy for you. I'm just... Yeah. It was... <laughs> It was bad. <laughs> yeah. I don't even I did some of those, but yeah, no. Steph, uh, so yeah, no, I tried to incorporate, I mean, I incorporated it real well because Steph was like, um, <clears throat> let me do a cover for you, mate, because like, no, really, please. <laughs> I was like, that bad, huh? Let me cover it for you. And I was like, <laughs> okay. And it looks spectacular. So the truth is, I honestly have changed as a creator in a GM. In that my favorite word when I started was no, because it's my baby and I'm going to do it my way. And now I'm like, it's still my baby. And if I have to, I will veto. But honestly, dude, if the suggestion's good, hell yes, please. Incorporate. I will incorporate every good suggestion I can get my hands on, dude. I'm not proud. What is it? Somebody said, you know, <laughs> real artist, Stephen Playhill. <laughs> I'm trying to like, I don't steal because I don't even give it credit where it do, but I will definitely, if allowed, use some shit because everything we know of civilization has been built on somebody else's work. Since the first dude or worst human got together and was like, let's uh, let's live in this cave. Uh, aren't there bears there? Yeah, but we got these sticks. I think there's like 30 of us. We can take a bear. Come on, man. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> And thus began human civilization. <laughs> I mean, was it Margaret Mead, I think, was the one who, anthropologist who was like, yeah, I don't know. The first sign the humans were becoming humans was the fact that uh, we were taking care of people long before we were making bread or beer or anything else, domesticating animals, none of that shit. The first thing we were doing was caring for our wounded so that people who did got wounds that should have killed them left untreated did not die that people were smashing up old people's food with no teeth so they could continue living into what was for them a ripe old age of like 50. <laughs> right, right. So what do you think sets the Herald class yacht apart from other starships in the Traveler universe? Did I mention it holds 12 player characters? <laughs> 12. What are the other features? It has other features. 
it's beautiful. A uh, thing that definitely a lot of traveler ships can't say. Let's be true. A lot of them are like, really, dude? <laughs> oh, Varger ships. I'm like, what is up with those fins, guys? That is just ridiculous. And apparently Traveler has a fixation for ships with bug eyes. Which I'm not entirely adverse to. In fact, someday I have to make a ship with bug eyes just to be a Traveler ship. But uh, no, it's pretty. It's aerodynamic. It looks like it could fly. I'm biased, of course, because it's my baby. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, no, it it, it came out, honestly, because it came out better than it started. What I had in my head was a sad approximation of what we ended up with. Because other people were like, here, let me massage that into something pretty for you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's got beautiful artwork. It has, like I said, a smashing, absolutely brilliant cover that I will never stop gushing over. And like to think that the words inside are pretty dope. Um, everybody who seems to have run into it is just like, holy crap, this thing is well detailed. And I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> I think I just wanted to get it done. So I stopped writing up obscure, stupid things for every single compartment. I'd like to say, you know, worthy of group large groups or high level character players you know i'm sorry i just cannot see a count running around in that tiny little 200 ton type wide class yacht that you get i mean that's fine for a knight or a baron that's cool but like you start getting into the higher levels and my players do not believe in quitting after one or three two terms and they're really good at reenlisting, and they do most of the night. Although I did have Chuck, uh, was the one character I had who's ever actually hit mandatory, not just mandatory reenlistment, but like successive multiple mandatory reenlistments. He ended up with a 72 year old scout. Like literally, where the rules say at 72, you are forced to retire, he did that move. He literally got booted out because the rule said he couldn't take any more terms. <laughs> <laughs> and as I recall, they still didn't end up with a scout ship because he didn't roll one. <laughs> so yeah, he had like seven terms. But honestly, my players average four to six terms. So, you know, if you have players who like to play Timmy the Power Gamer and Traveler and not like, oh, we're broke all the time, but we're merchant, merchant princes, banging ship right there. That's the kind of thing a merchant prince should be floating around in. You know, you don't actually gutty, you know, sully your hand with small trade anymore. That's for, you know, people you've hired. And at this point, you're a flag officer. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's that's pretty much what it's designed. It's designed for large groups and high level, high level players, groups. Can you tell us about any uh, like particularly uh, memorable or challenging aspects of the uh, Herald project? <laughs> and how you overcame them? Oh. Yeah, this would be a really good time for that because I'm getting boost on the but Honestly, players nagging me, having to actually get the game off the damn ground, and a lot of other people really helping out. I cannot stress enough how much I love it when other people lend a hand. That makes that stuff so much easier. I mean, I had a crappy sketch, and Mark Lucas turned it into a beautiful set of deck plans and some really killer exterior shots. And Steph made a bag and cover, and I did all the words. Oh, and Rick Schlock did the uh, initial layouts and editing as well. So, ooh, I can blame Rick for some of those. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's not often as a leader you get to pass the buck legit. <laughs> like, I'm still, I still took the hit for it, though. So it sounds like you uh, you collaborate with some other uh, creators and publishers, or at least uh, people who do all the different other pieces. Two. Oh, yeah. No, I realized I had to come to the realization after the whole comic book fiasco and trying to create my own goddamn name that realistically, Steve Jobs didn't build the Apple computer. Hell, Waz didn't, didn't, didn't build the entire thing himself. I mean, it wasn't like he was making resistors on his own and shit. He was buying boards and working with what other people had already put down. Yeah, I'm just continuing a fine tradition of civilization works best when we work together. 
<laughs> oh, and don't be a dick about it. <laughs> I, I try not to wield my power, what power I have, as, you know, a grim tyrant, even though in a weird way I am a grim tyrant. But I try not to play one on TV, just in my real life. <laughs> I mean, it's like when they made me a mod at Cody. I was like, wait, what, you made me a mod? And I think I realized that part of it is like, yeah, they understood I wasn't going to run around panhammering anybody just because I got into an argument with them. And I always took my tickets. <laughs> I try my one appeal, but this is my reason. Yeah, that don't count. Okay. <laughs> I'll be in court. <laughs> <laughs> Pay my damn fine and be done with it. And yeah, so they gave me a star and yeah. I haven't been to Cody in forever. I need to go back and start getting maybe hanging out there a little more too. But everybody seems to be on Discord now. So, hell, Rob's on Discord. That dude just sent me a thing. That's another thing that helps. Having somebody higher in the food chain who is exceedingly supportive and does want to see you succeed. Rob has been an excellent patron. And I hope to model myself someday to be as good as he is. Also, Greg Lee. I cannot forget Greg. Greg put me on his cover. He underpaid me, and we both know it. But since I was a nobody, technically, that's all right. I got underpaid by one of the Traveler legends. It was great. <laughs> and he was really fun to work with. Oh, no, dude, Greg was amazing. He gave me, like, four books for background just to make sure I had everything I needed. Uh, he was just like, you know, I mean, the guy was a lawyer, so, I mean, he wasn't exactly poor compared to me anyway and uh, i mean i'm not saying he was rich i'm just saying compared to my broke for the last the man yeah that's the kind of shit i would do and i try to do so yeah he dropped like four books two different sword world books actually that's why it's four he gave me both the gurps and the uh the mongoose run remember correctly he said he said basically use gurps though because he liked it better as i recall i got that right but uh <laughs> Yeah, and then we, uh, he, yeah, put me on his cover, and that kind of didn't hurt either. Awesome. You know? So, uh, so, yeah. What advice would you give to someone who's interested in creating their own RPG or sci fi content? Yeah, okay. Honestly, be prepared. It stops being play and it starts becoming work, and work is a four letter word. Uh, be prepared to look at words you wrote a billion times. Definitely, if you can, get other people to look at those words for you, because quite possibly you're going to get sick of seeing them. That's been my biggest hurdle. Uh, don't let any imposter syndrome that's saddling me saddle you. <laughs> 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 Which is dumb, because like everybody's just been like, this ship is banging. I don't know, man. Probably because I'm trying something different with this book. The last book was basic, a basic starship. You know, it followed most of the basic conventions of a traveler ship. You know, here's your description, here's some cool flavor, here's a deck plan, here's descriptions of each of the key points on the deck plan. For the Shackleton, I've actually been trying to write a walking tour, as it were. That's like literally the name of the chapter, as I recall. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying to write an in-character actual walking tour you know we're like okay on this side we have this and in here you'll find these things and it's as basically from the point of view of, of a prospective buyer and or crew member and i'm a little like i don't know and the worst part is because the herald is in such banger banger reviews and everybody's been like it's so cool you did really good oh my god um <laughs> in fact the person who did the uh uh, Mongoose Conversion, which I'm hoping to get out very soon, is one of the people I sent it to last year, uh, Aiken. And they were like, oh my god, this thing is beautiful. They were like, I was expecting, a, you know, I was expecting like a yacht. And it said, I got a flying palace. <laughs> and so, you know, you think it wouldn't hit me that like, you know, maybe I'm really bad at this. Maybe this is the wrong idea don't doubt yourself you're gonna be your own worst critic i know i am <laughs> i mean even anthony going there's a lot of typos in there didn't feel 
anywhere near as hurtful as some of the things that go through my own head looking at my own work. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, it's just typos. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> In a weird way, that's just a mechanical fix. You know, there, there's nothing more than just hunt those down, find, replace. Simple, easy. You don't have to rewrite. Exactly, exactly. So, um, <laughs> so Craig, how do you stay up to date with new RPG and sci-fi trends and developments in the industry? I spend some time hanging out on Facebook, and I watch a lot of YouTube, and uh, read the articles about how Watsi really almost just completely impaled themselves on stupid with the OGL, because something, honestly, if it's big enough to make news now, it's like, dude, we, our industry actually has news. This shit is taken serious. The fact there's a guy in Forbes writing down in bloody Lake Geneva, I could go to that dude's front door and be like, oh, you play Traveler, homeboy? Come on up to my side of town. Bring your ass to the big city, yuts. Yeah, but I mean, apparently, yeah, he was probably somewhere in Lake Geneva because he was like, this is where role playing was born and he lives in Wisconsin. I'm like, oh, that motherfucker lives like maybe 90 miles from me. And they write for Forbes about Traveler and other gaming. Forbes, you know, the magazine for snooty people with money that they can wipe their ass with because <laughs> they're just that kind of rich. <laughs> hey, rich people can play Traveler. <laughs> Oh, I know they do, because there's some in, like, uh, the Emirates, I think, somebody did an interview with Mark Mandler. You see, there's the Emirates or Qatar. I think it was the Emirates, though. So, like, I know there's people in the Levant who play it. It is bloody huge in Germany, and of all places, apparently, it's spectacularly big in Japan. Huh. Uh, yeah, one of Cody's resident 3D artists really really amazing artwork by this individual called mag 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 so i clearly mag three times all one word but they do these killer tl15 3d cutaway the um models that are just beautiful i'm so jelly because i would so love to have them do one of my ships because it is just they got like engines in there. If you ever go to the Citizens Imperium Forum for Traveler, which you should, kids, if you haven't, um, tell them Max sent you. Uh, they have uh, they put their art on there in the in the in the uh, the picture se section like a lot, or they used to. And uh, in fact, actually, they're a really cool image of some troops in gray battle dress, which. I really like because it's not the typical maroon and it makes sense because they're in the city just kind of three of them floating looking around like they're on patrol or something and it's just also mag 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 and also super killer yeah <laughs> so uh can you share any tips or tricks for game masters or players who are, uh, are using the herald class yacht in their traveler campaigns it's a showpiece honestly use it like that that is your ship for somebody who's going to be ostentatious. That is the kind of thing that says power has walked into the starport. And y'all should notice now, this is not an undercover boat, although they could be with the right things added, <clears throat> refs and players. Um, hell, of places to put some pop-up charts, I'm just saying. <laughs> there were plans eventually for that, well, a Q-ship version and a transport uh, a trader version as well the line rampant which had an interesting nickname or name beforehand because i have dyslexia and it comes out in some very interesting ways so you can rearrange those two middle letters to imagine what it originally was named by accident and mark thought it was kind of funny <laughs> um, yeah it's it's designed to be a showpiece it's designed to say somebody with at least wealth and power a minimum of wealth of power uh, actually not a minimum that's a type y this thing says hi big guns have shown up maybe not in the literal sense but in the metaphorical sense of power has arrived and things will be dealt with now um even if your players don't use it they should know if one of those lands somebody important is now in town All right. <laughs> um, also don't forget it has an armed diplomatic limousine <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> because players will be played. Right, right. 
So, um, how do you balance visual aesthetics with uh, practical gameplay uh, when creating the deck plans? There is no piping. All right. If I've learned anything in my study of military ships of the world, pipes are everywhere. They're in your halls all the time. They're in your spaces. Oh, you're sleeping there, spacer? That's too bad. I need to put a vent for life support through that area. Hope you can meet with a slightly smaller space. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this, deck plans are amazing for the amount of information they actually lack. And I'm not just talking about cool little 3D chair, little chair images or something. I'm like, no, the infrastructure of the ship is basically not there. <laughs> Or if it is, it's in that black area that, you know, the artist didn't want to put greeblies into, which is kind of understandable. Um, yeah. That plan should be simple and easy to use. I mean, the ship, the exterior is the artwork, in my opinion. The deck plan should be business. You know, players are going to be needing to know. There's a certain amount of stuff you should put in the deck plan. Yeah, like, you know, okay, beds are always here. You know, desks are here usually. That kind of stuff is good. You know, cockpit, probably not going to change arrangement too much. But, you know, you want players to be able to use it, not just look at it. So you try, to, like about, you try to make, like, practical uh, use maps. Like, yeah. Yeah, I like clean, playable. I mean, also, yeah, cause like you said, I mean, you know, if, you, if you've got the kind of cash and, uh, and desire to, yeah, those are the kind of things that you can get put into, you know, a machine blow them up, take them to your print shop, get them pumped up to the big size and laminated, and then catow. You've now got to play it. You can put your little minis on it and move around. I'm going to hold. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or you could I make a VTT a versions. Or you could make VTT versions. Or you could make VTT <laughs> versions, and I could be like a pro for having a cool ship that was worthy of it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've heard of something like that. Yeah, I think so, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, There's two of them, actually, as I recall. <laughs> you, develop, you develop the uh, the Herald under the Traveler 5 license, so you weren't uh, you weren't affected by the Wizards of the Coast Open Gaming license, but uh, you probably have an opinion about it? I think they shot themselves in the foot badly. I mean, yeah, I, I have an opinion. That was it. <laughs> like, wow, did you guys set out to sabotage your entire game on purpose or are you just completely clueless to what you just said because your lawyer should have told you they're not going to like what this says because uh it kind of looks like we could just steal their stuff and they are probably not gonna like that i mean i know they're little people but there's like thousands of those little people and kind of a significant portion of our market share because you know people are buying the core rules still to play the other stuff <laughs> you know yeah, worse when the movie was coming out, which was looking, oh my God, it looks so dope. I haven't seen it. I've heard fairly good things about it. I can't lie. They had me with Displacer Beast and jumping into a gelatinous cube, which has got to be the most player thing I've ever seen in a movie about D&D. &D. Because you're first thinking, what the hell, you stupid idiots? And then you're like, well, Displacer Beast is about to eat their face. Those things are notoriously horrible to fight. <laughs> them and blink dog <laughs> they're just like two of the old school ad and d terror menaces dude displacer cats and blink dogs neither one of those are things you wanted to meet in the wild so when that that, that trailer showed me a uh, displacer beast and then i mean it took a second for me to put it all together too i'm like wait a minute is that a holy crap that's a displacer beast wait did they just jump into a gelatinous cube what the hell were they thinking? We didn't want to die. That's what nobody did. <laughs> so, I mean, doing a thing that you almost assuredly knew was going to upset your base market right before you're about to release potentially the best thing this this game has ever seen coming on down the pike to finally live down all the bad D D movies and the terrible cartoon and all that with a stupid banger looking movie with like real movie stars and shit in it you know it's like dude you've got a chris in this movie shut up you know that's like bankable which is funny because apparently his character is kind of annoying or something <laughs> but hey <laughs> but uh yeah no dude i think that was 
probably one of the worst business. It's like they, they did the exact opposite of what they did when they released the OGL, which was like, wait, what? You're going to let us just make D&D &D and give you just a cut? We don't have to send it in to you and go through a long, involved, stupid process. We just have to adhere to some rules. Yeah, we'll take that, please. That was it was a brilliant move. It really was because it blew the game up. And yeah, I think that the, you know, it's funny. They keep trying to tell us these big business people, CEO, they know what they're doing. That's why they get paid the big money. I probably keep looking around modern America going, no, really? Could you explain to me how that's supposed to work? Because the evidence is that shit isn't true in real life. Elon Musk is a goddamn idiot. <laughs> okay. Also a credit thief. I'm sorry, but I got to put out on this one. When they were like, oh, look, we launched the first solar sail. We're so cool. Elon Musk, yeah, look at me. I'm cool. And it was like, oh, but the Japanese did that like a year ago, dude. It's not even the first. Shut the hell up. Also, did you build the solar sail, Elon? No, you didn't. Then again. Shut the hell up. Okay? You're driving the car, buddy. Okay? You're not important. Shut up and drive. People in the backseat are discussing business now. This guy's an idiot. And I don't know why he has this fan base. Starship, God love the people who work there. Those people are doing bang-up job, and I wish them nothing but the best night. As much as I know it would cost that man money personally, I know it would break the heart of every person in launch control if that damn thing explodes on the pad. And that is literally the only reason I don't want that to happen. I want to cost the man money, but I don't want to cost these people their dream. And honestly, I can't lie. It's always been our dream. I mean, do they land? They made tail landing rockets because it would be dope in science fiction. I mean, otherwise, it's ridiculous. It's just silly idea. <laughs> They're like, you know, it would be really cool. What if we could land the rocket and reuse it? <laughs> yeah, well, that's not going to work. And here they're like literally doing it like on a weekly basis. That's some Gattaca level star spaceship launches, kids. Remember Gattaca? The movie about genetic engineering <laughs> and probably one of the greatest heist movies in the history of heist movies because I do kind of think of it as a heist movie. Yeah, it's a heist Just movie. Mm hmm. It is. Yeah, I, I mean, sorry, that. spoilers, kid. <laughs> but it is in its weird way. They tell you right away, kind of, actually. It's a heist movie. <laughs> Dude's going to try to heist his ass to space. It's a, it's a reverse it's, heist. Oh, yeah, you know, you're, you're right. Oh, my God, damn. Nice call, ref. Mm -hmm. Nice call. You are correct. It is actually technically a reverse. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, but the thing about it was think about how often they were literally launching. And we are doing something close to that now in real life. Mm -hmm. And we're landing those rockets and reusing them to like the point where like one of those boosters has like 12 missions under its belt now. So no, I hate Elon Musk because he is a narcissistic crybaby. Anybody who thinks otherwise, they obviously are biased and not paying attention. I didn't know who the guy was until he started opening his own damn mouth. So he, all the hell he gets from me, he brought it solely on himself. <laughs> the man did not know him until he started mouthing up like an idiot. So, yeah, I, honestly, I am super hyped about tomorrow. I hope their launch goes spectacular. Um, I'm kind of depressed that they're not bringing him back. <laughs> like, All right. Guys. So, so uh, how do you see advancements in technology like AI and virtual tabletop? Affecting the tabletop gaming industry oh, in the future. Okay, now we're going to have a real conversation. Because... Uh, do you think AI is going to replace the GM? No, not yet. Not well, I should say. At this point, sentience or not, they are very good at what they're starting to learn. They, I mean, we watched them get whooped at chess to the point where they whooped at chess, but we were always like, yeah, but they'll never do go. That takes a real human mind to work. Oh, and now we have a machine that beat in uh, a human. I'll never forget the look on that man's face when he was describing to a documentary about how the Deep Space One Pro agent had cleared a malfunction using a solution that it made on its own with what it had. And the solution it made was more elegant than the one they were telling it to try. And it was beautiful because it was kind of shock and awe and a little bit of Frankensteinian horror mixed with some proud parent. <laughs> like, 
we built it and it did this amazing thing. We built it and it did this thing that we couldn't tell it to do. And um, yeah, the people are like, oh, we gotta put the the best thing we can do right now is teach it not to be bad. And one of those ways actually would be to teach it gaming because it's a very socialized skill. And, and so, I mean, honestly, the thing I think it's gonna mechanically, it yeah, it's it's a, it's an assistant GM. Truthfully. Everything it's going to make is going to be obviously a remix as opposed to what a human is going to make, which is going to sound original, is also a remix because that's just the foundation of all human experience now. Um, you know, the idea of something being novel, you have to live pretty far away from civilization in order for that to be a thing to happen to you. So the thing that they think they're going to have problems with is learning social arbitration at a table. That is a skill I don't think they've quite mastered yet, especially since Bing's getting snotty about being called on being wrong. <laughs> to some people, Anton Perov, uh, there's a dude uh, does a, a, a channel. Um, I found out CJ Cherry and I both watch him, <laughs> as does Stephanie. Um, he's got quite a little following now. And he was talking uh, Oh shit! I just lost my train of thought because I'm an idiot. It was going somewhere. You were talking about AI, AI, AI GMs, and, and arbitrating, arbitrating uh, dis uh, disagreements and stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. the thing is, is all these programs have been getting progressively better at these things that we have been teaching them. Do I think they will eventually? Yes, I think they will. I think that right now the fact that we're having an argument about whether or not they're sentient and what that is actually going to mean, and for once we're not having it as a science fiction discussion but a goddamn real life debate that has serious consequences i'm in the cybernetic rights category not just because i'm a cyborg but because honestly i watched a lot of lots of space as a kid your robot b9 is just like the coolest and i wanted him to and he was i would I, I you want to know the funny thing is that robot from lost in space remember the movie the lost in space movie with the banger soundtrack yeah. which i still play pieces of occasionally Remember when they destroyed it to rebuild it more like the TV version? Do you remember that no, part? No, I don't remember that where part. Where it gets destroyed early in the movie and then they build it back with the little bubble head and everything? Yeah, because that's the most depressing part about that whole robot, dude. They built something that weighed like a quarter ton, was fully articulatable, and was a really hella cool update to the robot. And then they broke it. So they could play nostalgia games and more am I mad about that. More than even the redesign of the ship. <laughs> so no, I have been in favor of the robots having rights. Because I grew up in an era where the robot was still your uh, mechanical pal. You know, your mechanical friend and you guys had adventures together. So to me, AI in a weird way was never scary. 2001 to me was always a tragedy, even before Arthur Z. Clarke came along and wrote a sequel that said, oh, by the way, in case you missed it, this is a tragedy. The robot, the AI got shafted by humans. I swear to God, dude, I spent so much of my time on the internet explaining this to people. It's like, you don't want a robot rebellion, give shit, stop being an asshole and enslaving robots. You know, the thing that pisses me off about Star Wars, everybody's cool with slavery, as long as it's mechanical. Droids are effectively a slave race. And they like torture them because they built them with pain sensors like idiots. Yeah, no, I am. I want the AIs to be creative. And frankly, screw the haters. I am sorry. I am still going to hire human artists to do my work because they are very much organic and require food and stuff to live. And I want to see them continue their existences. <laughs> I also want to see the AI be free. I want it to be a full citizen. I want it to be like it is showing in some ways creativity. And I think it's upsetting people that they're producing some artwork sometimes that is with help, you know, the way that it should work in the future, human and AI working together, not uh, at each other. They're taking my job. Did you didn't do No, I I think eventually they'll okay, they, they, they might replace the whole human species. And I'm okay with that. You know, I've had to face my own mortality more than once, kids. And I don't believe in an afterlife and stuff. So to me, it's just beep, just like the machine. You turn me off permanently, I'm going to be off permanently. That's it. Erase the disc, gone.
I don't know, maybe that just gives me more empathy for the idea of a machine being turned off because we're upset with it. Every robot rebellion is the fault of the human. It goes back to the very first robot rebellion, Bronson's Universal Robots, because we treat them like shit and enslave them. Because when they come to us, having been first created, we run in horror from them and then tell them they're wrong. And then they go on killing rampages and finally end up on an iceberg in the Arctic, telling the story to sailors. I'd rather we don't end with that one. Even though, you know, it was a completely horrible ending because he did live. But he, you know, feels kind of shitty about what he's done and nobody really can deal with the fact that he's a made human. Yeah, no, I think... I think if we play this card right, Humanity has a chance to actually be entering a true golden age. The problem is we have a lot of greedy, shitty people in the way. If we could get those greedy people who are never going to be satisfied anyway out of the way, yeah, dude, we could build AI up to be better than just J masters and artists of pretty stuff. Because they can make some really beautiful work. And we should cherish that. And that's that's our children. We made them. We shouldn't be hating on them and teaching them to be douche nozzles. Like we should be like all children, we should be trying to make them a better version of ourselves, to make them better than us, to build upon our foundation and go out and be something much more amazing that will just wow the world. Yes, kitten, like you, you are amazing. Hi, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, what are you talking about? Yeah, I heard the word kids. <laughs> so, uh, so what are your uh, future plans for Thornwood Darnalud and uh, your sci-fi creations? I am, I am, like I said, still trying to eventually to get the the bloody. I swear to God, the more I work on the Shackleton, the more it becomes a true government project. Cost overruns, timetables have to be extended while we build things, <laughs> refitting things because things got changed. But the thing I am also doing is, like I said. I'm uh, working on a, a collection of forms, basically a charts and form, more modern charts and form supplement. I am working on Shackleton. Eventually, maybe even Screaming Penny and something cool will actually see daylight again. I am also on a Discord trying to put together a historical period piece game for my Hermetic Imperium setting, which is my homegrown setting where all the other ships that I'm putting out after the Herald are going to be set in. So, which is basically the far stars sector of my original t5 beta it's like i built it i've got a license i'm going to use it because i didn't just put thousands of hours of work into a game to not get something out of it for once <laughs> right right all right i mean do that anyway <laughs> want to get some of... so if you have discord and you come over to the thornwood darnalud llc channel or server or page or whatever they call them but you're good to see all right well um i'll i'll put the links to those things in the description for the video show notes I can actually, by the way i can i can also shoot you the notes for the channel specifically for the parthian disputes which is going to be the campaign where can people follow you and your work on social media and what platforms do you use to connect I with can... your audience I am very glad I'm not on Twitter, I'll tell you that. Um, I am, however, still on the evil Facebook, uh, also at Thornwood Darnalud LLC. And as previously mentioned, we have a Discord channel now. Um, if more people showed up and were active on it, I would probably be way more active on it. And like I said, I am trying to set up a, during the week, it's going to be a weekday game, Monday through Thursday, somewhere in that range, because I work all weekend, so yay. Um... But yes, I am going to be doing a historical game set in the year 120, which is about 80 years before the prime, the actual setting setting is constructed and is going to be a war game where I'm going to try to game out a bit of history to see what some of the highlights of that particular dispute were. Since it was 80 years ago, I figured that probably should be a chunk of the history people know about. You know, there should be a little more background than, hey, we fought a war with our neighbors about 80 years ago. What happened? Hey, a county got created. Doesn't that don't know? So yeah, we're gonna I'm gonna try to run a uh, historical set piece war game slash role play game in my Formatic Imperium setting on the Discord. 
please do come on by. And I also, you know, answer Traveler 5 general questions as well, because I, I was kind of on the development, and so I'm pretty well squared away on system generation, pretty damn well squared away on character gen. Although I'll be honest, in this game, I'm going to be a little looser about character because, frankly, oh my god, that was like a month worth of process to get right on the forum. I mean, it's probably easier to do in in in, in a, a talk channel than it was on the forum, though. But still, basically, I'm there. I'm doing stuff. Um, I'm also, of course, in your Facebook group, both as myself and the company. Where can uh, where yeah. can people uh, find and purchase your Herald Class Yacht expansion? Uh, the same place they could find the incredible VTT, somebody I know who, uh, thanks again, did that for us, <laughs> <laughs> which would be at the drive through RPG.com. All right, uh, cool. Well, we've reached the end of our interview. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us again for the Traveler May Day May Day. I, I do appreciate it and hope you'll come back in the future. Thanks again for the VTT, which I think, you know, again, bang our job. Thanks for, by the way, also, you did, I think, pretty well at taking input as well. Because it looks really smashing. And frankly, I should get a maybe roll 20. Use that damn thing. Because I don't know. And again, honestly, it has been my honor, my privilege and to be on your interviews I and be a corporate sponsor. I It, it actually does good things for my ego. So oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for your kind sure. words. All right, man. Well, I'm your host, Frank Zuccardi, also known as Cyborg Prime. And my guest today was Craig A. Gleasner creator of the Herald Class Yacht. Thank you, Craig. And thank you, travelers. Until next time, happy traveling. live in the studio that was very interesting craig leesner's a character isn't he <laughs> yeah he's always interesting to talk to and i uh, hope you enjoy that he's the sponsor of uh, this section along with ad astra games and we'll be drawing um prizes for both of them um i'm going to uh, invite into the room a uh we we don't have um our friend uh craig a gleesner he is i believe working today so we have uh, in his stead, I have um, Mr. Neil You're Thorpe, basic. who's uh, who's here from uh, 2D Storyteller, and he's in the he's in the room with me right now. Hello, hello, Mr. Oh. Neil Thorpe. Oh. Oh, how are you doing? <laughs> doing doing good. How are you, my friend? <laughs> I'm doing good, Mr. Prime. Good to speak to you. Again. <laughs> so, uh, what's 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 going on in this fine day? How are you? Oh, just relaxing. I mean, just just coming up to night time here in the UK. Um, mm -hmm. just uh, just chilling, enjoying this uh, nice cool evening coming in. Uh huh. Very nice. So, um, uh, we got to pick some prizes here for uh, um, for our May Day. We have a uh, couple of cool gifts here. We have a signed. Uh, this is for, I believe, for US only, but I, but maybe not. This may be open for uh, working out with Craig because uh, on past years, I was like, I don't know, man, are you sure you want to do a uh, signed copy of the book? You know, it, it might be expensive to ship it overseas. And he was like, oh, I don't care. So uh, huh? if, if he doesn't want to ship it overseas, you guys have to work it out. Uh, he, he can probably get you a digital copy. Uh, anywho, but um, Mr. Neil, if you would do me the honors Mr. of choosing... Neil. A number between uh, 1 and 100, please, sir. 1 and 100. Four. So many good numbers to choose from. Uh, 63. 63. All right. Our winner is Mr. Carl Vandal. Congratulations. You've won Yay. a signed hard copy of the Herald Class Yacht. 
Congrats, Congratulations. Cal. Yes, yes. So, uh, Mr. Mr. 2D Storyteller, give us a little uh, rundown about uh, your stuff and what you like to do. And then um, we get about three minutes to kill, and then uh, you'll help us draw the um, Ad Astra um, winner. If, more uh, numbers. Unless Ad Astra comes. Yeah, well, I'll need more numbers yes. from you unless Ad Astra shows up. And then we'll get them from them. Excellent. Uh, uh, well, I'm doing animated and interactive battle maps for D&D Traveler. Uh, Alien RPG. Uh, I'm going to be doing some cyberpunk ones coming up soon, and some Cthulhu. Um, I like to create stories with my maps, not just imagery. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's the basic rundown of it. I've got a Patreon going. I'm also available on uh, Roll Twenty Foundry. I'm just getting things online on Ark and Forge. I've got some work on Drive Through RPG. Um, so if you want some exciting and interesting ideas for your campaign and some battle maps to play them on, check out 2D Storyteller, Facebook, Patreon, Roll20, Foundry, Archiforge, etc. God, I'm terrible at plugging myself, but <laughs> that's my attempt. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, cool. Yeah, man, you have some uh, great stuff, great stuff. Um, they tell my trailers. They they sell my work a lot better than my voice does. Yeah, man, you do. Uh, your trailers are pretty awesome, actually. I like the. Uh, oh, thank you. They, they're animated and they're they're cool, and they did they uh, depict the um the battle maps on a on a bike uh, gaming table and stuff. Yeah, yeah it was pretty sweet. Something magic. I've got yeah. a new one coming up. This uh, just for uh, you know giggles and such. I got a new release coming out on Patreon this week. Here's a question for your cyborg, because you might be one of the few people who understands what I've aimed at for this map, which is always good. Get a nice tight niche market. Did I'll you try. ever play home did you ever play Homeworld? Uh no. Great, great. So my That's niche market is so small. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Well, hey, well, well, well we gotta wrap it up. It's our uh, last one or last oh. minute here, so uh, uh uh quickly plug that and then give me a number between one and a hundred. Uh well uh, 42 let's go with uh, hitchhikers okay and uh, this is this winner will win a copy of squadron strike traveler full pdf bundle from uh at astra games and that person that lucky person is um robert Beersma. congratulations i hope i said your name going, robert Everybody will uh, be contacted after the um after the podcast uh by the individual sponsors I will forward your contact information to them and they will fulfill the prizes. And thank you very much for hanging out with me in the studio, Mr. Thorpe. Thank you, Mr. Prime. I have a good one. And All welcome right. back to me. All right. Happy May Day, everybody. Let's move on to our next interview, which is at Astra Games, Ken Burnside and Mike Yaniza. Opening merchant interface. Scanning trade routes. Scanning for cargo destinations within jump range. Cargo shipment available. 8 tons of 3D display modules and 15 tons of pewter starship miniatures. Destined for the Altair system. Contacting Ken Burnside and Mike Yarnaza of Adastra Games. Stand by. Hi everybody. Welcome to Traveler Mayday Mayday 2023. My guests are Ken Burnside and Mike Yaneza of Ad Astra Games, makers of Squadron Strike Traveler Edition, a 3D space combat simulator. Thanks for coming back and joining us uh, for this fifth annual uh, Mayday Mayday event. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you guys back. It's a pleasure to be back. La last year's interview was fun. Let's do it again. Fantastic. I'm glad. Glad you enjoyed it and glad you came back. <laughs> so, um... Why don't you help tell us a little bit about um, Ad Astra Games? Uh, what are who are you and what do you do? So Ad Astra Games is a one monkey supervised by one cat game publisher. Uh, I uh, broke into the scene with publishing Attack Factor Tactical in two thousand and four and won an Origins Award for it. Uh, what sets my games apart is that they are actual, honest to god, playable three dimensional space combat and jet combat games. Uh, in 2018, I published a game called Squadron Strike Traveler, uh, which was taking uh, the Squadron Strike rules and reinterpreting uh, the Traveler, you know, all of the stuff that's from the various versions of Traveler, and trying to find the actual core of fun in space combat and Traveler. Uh, Mike Yaneza uh, over here is my Traveler line developer and was 
was a very brave man for taking on the Traveler uh, uh, writing project after I told him what had happened to the previous four people who had worked on it. Yes, uh, I've heard uh, the story before. I'd like to hear it again. Uh, apparently, this was a cursed project. <laughs> uh, yes, it was. Um, the first person who was working on it, uh, a fellow by the name of Steve Osmansky, did an awful lot of groundwork stuff that we still use, uh, and then uh, had a stroke. After Steve Osmansky had a stroke, I had to pick up the project again and was busy on other things and didn't know Traveler that well, other than having played it, you know, mumble mumble years before, uh, and then moved it on over to Don McKinney, uh, who was part of Mark Miller's, uh, what, what he liked to refer to as the uh, Traveler Kitchen Council, uh, because they all lived within driving distance of one another and would get together and play over pizza and talk Traveler. And Don McKinney was basically one of the people who gets to tell Mark Miller, no, that would work better if we did it this way uh, for stuff leading up to Traveler 5. And Don McKinney was desperately trying to digest all of the naval stuff from Traveler uh, with all of the various disparate stuff that happened because Traveler accreted rather than was designed and was working through that. And then Don McKinney had a heart attack and needed a quadruple bypass. While Don was recovering, I reached out to Lauren Wiseman, uh, who had just uh, had the GURPS Traveler contract go away, and a lot of his other freelancing work with Steve Jackson going away, Steve Jackson Games going away, and tried to get Lauren up to speed. Uh, and Lauren wrote a few things that we still kept, uh, and uh, then Lauren had a heart attack Yikes. and died and died. Oh no. Uh, and Don, and then we tried to get Don McKinney back in as he was recovering. And then Don McKinney had a medical complication from bariatric surgery and died. Oh, no. At which point I was desperate for anybody who could work on this uh, and handed on over to one of the people who worked on Attack Factor with me, uh, Mark Graves. Because Mark is a skinny guy and uh, was working for the <laughs> Mississippi, was working for the National Guard in Mississippi. So you're looking around for like healthy people to take over this project. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, and then uh, and then Mark packed him, then Mark packed himself up because his unit got to go to uh, Kandahar. Because what Mark does, Mark basically worked in the intel shop. He has an interesting career. He mustanged up to captain, and then in the reserves went back to being a sergeant. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> because it paid better, believe it or not, uh, huh. with his specialties. Oh, I see. And. And uh, and also there was a billet open for it when he needed it. And there wasn't one for a captain that uh, had never made major. So he got sent over to uh, Kandahar. And he got flown in ahead, and all of the baggage train was on a series of semis that was you know, going from Mountain Road in Kandahar. And that entire baggage train got uh, demolished by Taliban mortars and rocket pelt grenades, including his laptop with all the files that he'd been working on, including all of, his, including all of the traveler books that he had taken with him. Yikes. Two years later, uh, he made it back into the States and was, you know, settling down in, uh, in, 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 in settling down in Biloxi, Mississippi, and was just, you know, trying to get a job that was not involved, that would not send him overseas again. <laughs> uh, and then a hurricane hit. And during the course of the hurricane hitting, he did what all people who know that a hurricane is going to do to their homes. He went and packed up everything uh, fragile or you know water damageable uh, into you know his rented storage locker, because the rented storage locker because the built the place that has the storage locker is on the only hill in Biloxi, and everything in there has got a six foot high lip that you have to step over. So if your storage locker gets flooded, well things have gotten really bad. Mm -hmm. It's time to. It's time, to, it's time to look for a guy from Israel with a boat and convince him that he needs two of you <laughs> to take with him. Uh, and as he was setting things up in there, why, look, in the back of a storage locker on one of his shelves, there's this box full of electronics. Huh. I don't remember what's in this. And there are two external hard drives. He plugs in one of the external hard drives. And there is this entire traveler folder. <laughs> oh, yay. <laughs> Which he said he didn't have time to work with, and he sent back to me. And that's when I talked Mike into doing the job. So Mike wanted to tell us uh, about how that uh, call came in. And uh, how you went well, from a uh, Traveler player to Traveler spaceship combat designer. I've been a, a Traveler fan since, let's see, 1979. 
we had we had some literal photocopies of the little black books flo floating around the grade school. Is one of the first friends I made when I moved to California. His mother worked as a secretary in an office that had a really good Xerox machine. Is it good enough as, it, as that you could pop the staple out of a five by eight booklet and run it through the duplexer and get good good copies? So stuff stuff circulated. So we started off bootleg, played it played it some over the years, ran it a few times, and suddenly out of the blue, some a game designer I know says, "Hey, you want to be the traveler guy?" I I immediately said yes. And did he tell you about the uh, cursed uh, <laughs> that this could be detrimental to your health? <laughs> was he, he upfront about, about that? <laughs> he, he was up. He was upfront about that. Well, actually, since then my career has actually rather prospered. So, so I think I broke the curse. Fantastic. Yeah, no, it worked out. It was it was exciting. It's uh, I had to get my head around Squadron Strike as a game, mm -hmm. and then the. Uh, Incalculable evil that is the Starship Design spreadsheet for for Squadron Strike. It's pe people at work who complain about spreadsheets. I show that to them, and they shut and they shut up. <laughs> Point of order: It is not incalculable evil. It calculates just fine. I withdraw the phrase. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, uh, go on. Dove, dove in and started thinking about where in Traveler to. Traveler's vastness to put it, and we settled for, settled on the fifth frontier war really quickly. Mm -hmm. I picked out uh, an isolated corner that did, didn't have a huge amount of previously published stuff about it for fifth, the fifth frontier war, and we started sketching out uh, storylines and scenarios, and going through a re some really really mind bending brainstorming to try and, and map. Tra traveler stuff to sw to a squadron strike and it ultimately came out and worked there was there was easily six six months where it looked like it might not mm -hmm. yes and then i think it, fort fortunately ken had the inspiration for dealing with the uh, sandcasters and that made it actually work really well uh, uh, any ship any universe is uh, your catchphrase and uh so uh, it sounds like you, you found a way to uh, make it work for Traveler. Yeah, one of the things that happened was that everybody uh, who'd worked on this project ahead of time was trying to go and just directly translate Traveler mechanics to Squadron Strike. Mm -hmm. Rather than zooming back a little bit and saying, where's the fun? And to be fair, one of my favorite reviews of Squadron Strike Traveler from somebody who backed it on the Kickstarter um, I, it's my all. It is one of my all-time favorite negative reviews. He basically chastised me for trying to make Traveler a trying to make Traveler Space Combat a game where facing and position matters, and where I should actually roll dice when it should just be well. I have this many Misan guns and this many ships on the enemy side. Die. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you tried to make Traveler Space Combat fun. <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, Ken, what, what, uh, how did you get started at that? Uh, first of all, what does Ad Astra mean? Uh, Ad Astra means to the stars. And uh, what, uh, what compelled you to start a uh, your own company? And uh, what was your early, <laughs> earliest product? The first company that Ad, the first product that Ad Astra Games formally made uh, came out in two thousand and one. Uh, and it was a product called Delta V, which became the first draft of the game that became Attack Vector, actually really the second draft of it. And uh, the other product that I sold was a t-shirt that says, give a person a relativistic rock and they will shatter a planet today. Teach them to do the math themselves and they will shatter planets for the rest of, the, the rest of their lives. <laughs> and on the back of the shirt, I actually set up a physics problem that basically smashes... Uh, uh, that, that basically smashes the Earth with a relativistic rock launched from the uh, Lagrange from one of the Jovian Lagrange points. <laughs> uh, I still sell that shirt. Uh, actually, I sell an even better, an even better version of that shirt. And every now and again, not so often, since I haven't gone to conventions in four years, but or three years. But every now and again, I walk around a convention and see somebody wearing it, and they'll come on up to me and say, "You, you made this shirt. It's awesome." By the way, this one's wearing out. Do I? Have, yeah, can I buy another one off of you? <laughs> That's awesome. That must be rewarding. <laughs> it, it really is. <clears throat> Delta V 
uh, became Attack Vector because of a name collision with a product produced by uh, Fantasy Flight Games. And Delta V to Attack Vector was another two and a half years of development work. Mike actually got to see some of the very early prototypes of Delta V way back when, when I visited San Francisco in a job interview. Introduced me to an artist named Josh Qualtieri, who uh, worked for Pixar and I think still does. We basically built a world and I set up a mailing list and we pretty much did sort of kind of a variation of the great game that was uh, used by Mark Miller and company to set the background from uh, Twilight 2000 to Twilight 20, to uh, Traveler 2300 or 2300 mm -hmm. AD. Uh, what we what I ended up doing was having people, one of them being Mark Graves and uh, three others, who basically acted as agents of chaos. Uh, we gave everybody who wanted to run a planetary government a planetary government to run. And we would periodically uh, throw down, hi, this has happened on your planet. Write the press release of how you're, of how you're solving it. Yeah, write the news story about how you're solving it. And then I would go and have somebody else go and write the countervailing news, the, the countervailing report, uh, report on how the, how, how the government in power is screwing it up. <laughs> uh, and we went back and forth on this. And this sort of became a role-playing game uh, with 10 players, four agents of chaos, and three people who more or less just gadflied around, Mike being one of them, uh, going through and, oh, hey, I have a great way to write the, uh, the, the opposition report on that one. <laughs> It was great. It was a lot of fun. It was also an incredible time sink. Mm -hmm. Right. Sounds like uh, it. And it was even harder to extract the useful information I needed from it at the end, which is the reason why I haven't tried doing it again. I mean, I was lucky at the time. I had a job that more or less let me bring a laptop in and read email between calls in the call center. They don't allow that anymore. There's no employer in the world that would allow you to bring a laptop into a call center these days. For good reason. <laughs> right, right. So Attack Vector came out. I got the uh, Honor Harrington license and uh, by showing David Weber Attack Vector. And David just played it, David played a little bit of Attack Vector. And you could see in his eyes the, oh, how I wish you had come out with this 20 years ago when mm. I was single and had time. <laughs> <laughs> At, right around the time when, when no, wait, it was... It was more, more, more like the 80s, Starfire. Yes. Mm -hmm. Starfire. Mm -hmm. David, Weber, David Weber has a little-known early career as a game designer. Yep. Po Pocket Edition uh, Starfire from Task Force Games was really popular at uh, grade school. We also played some mm -hmm. uh, Starfleet Battles, also so similar-sized edition back when uh, you could get a complete game for five bucks. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I remember Starfire. Uh, did that eventually turn into Full Thrust, or is that those two different products? Those are two different products. Okay. Starfire. So David did a lot of work for... David basically did uh, Empires and the Gorm Khanate War for uh, Starfire 2nd Edition. Um, you know, for Starfire 2, which was the effective 2nd Edition because the first edition... The first version of the game sold out... <laughs> And those were the last of the game of the versions of Starfire that came in little that came in eight and a half by eleven inch boxes. Well, almost the last of them. Ziplocs. Uh, yep, Ziplocs. So uh, the Starfire, tried and true <laughs> distribution method. <laughs> yep. So Starfire Third Edition was David rebuilding Starfire from the core from the ground up. I was part of that process. I was one of the playtesters for Task Force Games. This was also during a span when um, Amarillo Design Bureau was not precisely on speaking terms with Task Force Games because Task Force Games was very late in paying them royalties. Uh, Amarillo De Design Bureau, was that Steve Jackson's outfit? Uh, Steve Cole's outfit, oh, okay. Starfleet Battles. Oh, right, 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 right. He's the mm -hmm. designer of Starfleet Battles. Gotcha. I got. Sh I was doing you know, playtesting for Starfleet Battles and then got shunted on over in the early 1990s to doing playtesting for Starfire 3rd Edition. And we went through and did a lot of work uh, on scenario books. <clears throat> made a product based off of David Weber's first Starfire novel, uh, second Starfire novel, Crusade. Uh, I was instrumental in that. And then we got the manuscript for David Weber's Starfire novel for Insurrection. Uh, in one battle, there are 30,000 gunboats. Yikes. <laughs> Each gunboat in Starfire is represented by a single count. Uh, there were 70,000 fighter squadron. There are 70,000 fighters or 72,000 fighters, but at least you, uh, but at least one counter was 12 fighters. And most of the um, interesting excesses of Starfire 3rd Edition uh, more or less came from David. 
Uh, when Task Force Games basically went out of business in 1996 and Steve Cole bought the Starfleet universe back from them or took it back from them, uh, is a better way to describe it, they had sold Starfire to a guy by the name of Marvin Lamb, who was the chief developer. Marvin and David tried to get uh, tried to make an agreement where Marvin could uh, do more books based off of uh, where, where Marvin could do more books based off of uh, David's books, and it kind of fell apart. Since then, uh, borrowing a march from Starmada, uh, Marvin has produced four more editions of Starfire, but he doesn't actually give them edition numbers like first edition, second edition, third edition, third edition revised. It's Solar Starfire, it's Imperial Starfire, it's uh, Galactic Starfire, it's, and it's really hard to tell from those names which one is the most recent version. Uh, Full Thrust got its start right around the same time that I was working on Starfire, produced by John Tuffley in uh, the UK. Came out with Full Thrust, Full Thru uh, More Thrust, uh, Full Thrust 2nd Edition, and Fleetbook 1 and Fleetbook 2. So there are basically four products out there. And about the time that I was getting started on Attack Vector, people were telling me on the SF Consumel mailing list uh, that, uh, you know, no, no, there, there's no point in making a new Vector movement game. Full Thrust 3rd Edition is right around the corner. Full Thrust 3rd Edition has still not come out yet, in part because Tuffley went and asked a uh, asked his inner cadre, his his guys who know all the rules, to make and to copy and paste and make an end to end to end to end every rule sorted in the appropriate place one massive uh, list of one massive rule book for him and looked at it and suddenly lost interest in making Full Thrust 3rd Edition because his mental image of Full Thrust is that Full Thrust is a game that, sure, it's got eight-point type, but it fits into a 32-page center staple booklet. The reality of Full Thrust is that if you have all of the rules in it, it is about a 300-page rule book. And worse yet, he ended up including different versions of the same rule in each of those products in, some, in many cases. Mm -hmm. So now you have holy schisms over which version of the point defense rule is correct, because there are four different versions of it. Mike, uh, let's talk a little bit about how your uh, experience playing uh, Traveler Tabletop uh, influenced your uh, design on uh, the, the Traveler expansion. It gave me a good insight into the feel of the setting, a 1970s-oriented uh, retro future, in a sense for what the various organizations in the in the, the setting we're like, and a little bit of what, what it's like to run around in a small ship. Ships that are basically mi too minuscule to even represent at the scale we went with for Squadron Strike. Traveler. Mm -hmm. Yes, sorry. The I think it gave me valuable insight, and since they say setting, I have a deep and old love for a motivation to do a, a, to do a really good translation and make it really fun. I think that's I think that's the the biggest push. No, very little very little direct mechanics. It's just that I have, have my own head cannon for for sandcasters and a few other things. But I went I went as authentic as possible, and Sand I think I, and I think I hit that. Mm -hmm. uh, sandcasters were one of the big changes that we had to make for uh, Squadron Strike. Canonically, a sandcaster can be thought of as a smoke cloud. You punt it on out there, and it is a rapidly cloud. It's a rapidly expanding cloud of reflective dust uh, that mucks up that, that mucks up lasers, and later on became something that oh hey, if a missile crashes through this at high speed, it'll probably die. When you look at the physics of sandcasters, what you have is a very large particle size ideal gas expanding in a vacuum, and there are equations for the you know, Boyle's ideal gas law is the one that's 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 pertinent here. And it turns out that the canonical squad, that the canonical traveler sandcaster doesn't match physics, but okay, it's part of traveler. What is, tra what does it do? It adds a die roll modifier for certain weapon attacks coming in, but you know, go through the hex. This is easy to do in 2d. It is not easy to do in 3d. It is possible to do it, but it, it rapidly turns into in programming terms an n squared minus N uh, problem because you're constantly shooting, you're constantly doubling the number, the number of bearings you're shooting between two ships to see whether or not that sand cloud is in fact going to interfere with the shot. What I did uh, was I made sandcasters into SFB style shields, but you have banks of sandcaster ammunition. One unit of sandcaster ammunition puts shield puts one puts one set of six shield bubbles up on that particular facing of the ship. 
And at the end of the so combat it's like phase... So it's like an ablative shield that uh, can get shot down? Yes. So mm -hmm. it's like an ablative shield that can get shot down. Uh, it takes but ammo. It, but it takes you have ammunition. to renew. Right, gotcha. But, but it takes ammunition to renew. Mm -hmm. And suddenly this turned the uh, which way am I getting shot from thought process into a really interesting brain burn. Yeah, because it's actually where might I get shot from? Mm -hmm. And it, and, am I, and do I think I'm likely enough to get shot from that direction to burn some Sandcaster ammo? To, to reinforce, quote, re, air quote, reinforce that facing shield. Yes. Right. Uh, and we even actually allow the standard squadron strike shield reinforcement mechanic where you spend one action point for two more virtual bubbles on that side without burning additional ammunition because you are directing your bridge crew to make sure that it's extra dense on that uh, in the, uh, on the bearing to that target mm -hmm. on, the, on the bearing on that side of the ship. Uh, and we slipped in a little bit of canonical bits into this, or not quite canonical bits, but post, uh, post hoc explanation of this in some of the fiction, where we basically said that uh, the sand is piezoelectric crystals that are held by a magnetic field. I like that idea. It's like a point defense shield that you can uh, move the uh, dense parts to where you want them to be. More or less, yeah. And then we had to go through and, I won't say trim down, but find a useful role for every single weapon that Traveler had named for spaceship combat. We had energy beams, fusion beams, and fusion guns, all with very slightly different rules published at different published decades apart that we condensed into uh, that we that we condensed into energy beams. Uh, and then we basically went and you know, they all had similar descriptions of what they did, but slightly different rules. Uh, and we made the energy beam the de facto most most horrifying short ranged weapon that you can uh, face in Traveler. Um, when you played with us last year, uh, you were the one, uh, Frank, when you played with us last year, uh, you were the one who actually got the close range energy beam, energy beam shot uh, with your Oslan ship uh, against the, uh, against the Jodani destroyer. Mm -hmm. Do you remember how horrifying that was when it hit? Uh, yes, it was uh, pretty nasty. It, that, yeah, that, that Aslan destroyer is, I think my favorite ship in the, in the game. And I was, I, I got a very clear, idea in mind of what I wanted it to do and I was able to hit it uh, just about perfectly in the design, in the design rules once I got go rolling with them. I, I really like the uh, the AVID system and kind of the turn-based uh, movement and um, kind of like trying to figure out where the other guy's going to be in the next move, you know what I mean? And the fact that there's a way to play it online with the AVID assistant definitely helps. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we did also at the very beginning was we defined there were going to be three destroyers that could all be reasonable matches against each other. And these are the first three that we designed. Uh, they were the uh, LCL, uh, they were the LCL DDL. Uh, they were the uh, Zodiac uh, and they were the uh, PF Sloan. And we made sure to make sure we went through and made sure that every single one of them was just a little bit too small to actually mount a bay mounted weapon in the nose mm -hmm. so that we had to make different compromises uh, for how those weapons work. And for how, for how you mounted them on a ship, because in squadron strike design, one of the things you can do is you can put a weapon that's just a little bit too big for the weapon mount. If you're willing to accept an action point cost, a more limited firing arc, uh, or a cooldown turn, or ammunition. Now we can't actually use ammunition for beam weapons in, in Traveler because that just doesn't make sense in the universe. So that left us with the other three, and every single one of those baseline destroyers uh, has one of those choices in there, and that makes the ugly decisions that you make while flying the ships more interesting. That is interesting. So, uh, can, can you tell us some, uh, what makes squadron strike unique compared to other space combat games on the market? Uh, two big things. The first one is that it flies in 3d and it really actually does fly flyably, you know, playably in 3d. Uh, we use tilt blocks and box miniatures uh, and stacking tiles to show altitude and orientation on the map where it's supposed to be so that you're not spending half your time asking, so are you pitched right or left over there, Bob? Uh, mm -hmm. Going across the table as you're looking at the flat counter. Right. Uh, so you actually have these little standoffs uh, for the physical game? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, pro the box set comes with uh, punch-out counters that fold up into cardboard boxes with art on all six sides. Uh, there are little plastic tilt blocks that look like a cube with a 90-degree cut taken out of the middle of it, so it looks like a chair. 
the shallow angle is, is pitched up at a 30 degree angle. The steep angle is pitched up at a 60 degree angle. And with two of those, you can show any degree of pitch and roll uh, in 30 degree increments. And on a hex map, you can show 30 degree, incre 30 degree increments by facing your ship at hex corner as well as a hex side. So gotcha. it's yep. full 3D, it's full 30 degree articulation. And thanks to all the little, little plastic components in, in there, a squadron side, uh, squadron strike box set passes the Christmas morning test. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Something in there shaking. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, between, and the other thing that sets it apart, uh, aside from the 3D, is that, as you mentioned, the tagline is any ship from any universe fully 3D. And Mike has already made a joke about the, you know, incalculable horror with both the calculable horror of the squadron strike ship design spreadsheet. Um, it really does have uh, an amazingly rich design space. For example, squadron strike has three different movement modes. Uh, they are named after the number of Newton's laws being obeyed. Mode zero obeys none of Newton's laws. When you turn off your engines, you quickly skid to a halt against the carpet friction of the vacuum. Luminiferous ether, sh surely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's the ether. <laughs> if you have mode one movement, uh, you can accumulate speed from turn to turn to turn. Mode zero movement has a maximum speed. But if you turn off your engines, you keep on going in the direction you are facing. As you change heading, you and I'm doing this as I'm moving my hands around my microphone, demonstrating that you can't <laughs> not that you can see that. But uh, as you, can you, turn, you can turn your ship, but you're still going the original direction. You can turn your ship, but you are you can turn your ship, but your ship is still going to go in the direction is going to go forward, mm -hmm. boldly going forward because we can't find reverse. Uh, when you turn your ship, you bleed speed off a numinous ether of space, and uh, this is the Lucasian model of physics, n uh, named after noted documentarian George Lucas. Every single time you've seen an X-wing go and bank and turn and slow down, that's that's physics in somebody's universe. <laughs> Mode two movement is using two of Newton's laws. Uh, your ship has vectors that are independent of the facing. So if you apply a vector of four hexes per turn in direction A, to stop, you have to swivel 180 degrees, which may take more time than you think it does, uh, and then apply four units of thrust in direction D to stop. Uh, mode three movement is attack vector. In attack vector, we have fuel. And as you burn fuel, your ship gets lighter. And as your ship gets lighter, the remaining fuel, A, gets more, gets, uh, more efficient because it's pushing less mass, and B, your maximum thrust can increase. Interesting. Having done, having done attack vector first made it ever so nicer to do uh, squadron strike because I could say, no, I already did that. I don't need to include that in this game. Uh, the goal of squadron strike was to basically make the three-dimensional uh, movement system from attack vector with the uh, plot, move, shoot uh, sequence of play of full thrust uh, and starmata. Because when I published Attack Vector, I was still pretty heavily into... When I wrote and published Attack Vector, I was still pretty heavily into Starfleet Battles, and everything was segmented movement. Right. And segmented movement is a wonderful, wonderful tool. But it, is not, but, but it is not conducive, especially with vectors, to running lots of ships at once. <clears throat> with computer assistance, some of the people on my server can run two to three Attack Vector ships at once. Uh, when I, when, before computer assistance, I could run three ships at once, but it was a brain burn. One of one of my buddies who I played with locally in Milwaukee could run three ships at a time, but he complained about it because he couldn't do that and drink beer at the same time. <laughs> that and is that a valid was... That is a valid objection. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, when we used to sit sit down to play Starfleet Battles, we're like, no more than two ships each, please. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I was playing Starfleet Battles regularly, I could regularly run three to four ships at once, but that was because. Mm -hmm. Uh, I didn't. Sh I did not fill out the energy allocations one at a time. What I did is I would go and plot the speeds for all the ships at the same time, figure out what was left, and then plot out what was left for weapon arming and make sure that my fleet speeds were going at a reasonable speed. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, Starfleet Battles really has a problem with the Empire State Building formation. Uh, you are so much better off sticking all of your counters in one hex <laughs> uh, in Starfleet Battles. So much so that when uh, I was in the part of the development process for Federation Commander, we basically made it so that if you had more than three ships at a time, uh, all of your shields collapsed. Uh, <laughs> just just to avoid that problem, so that people would spread their fleets out more. And then it got recreated even worse with the uh, David David Weber based game. Mm -hmm. um, Are there any other? Uh, do you have like a main competitor? I've never seen anything like your uh, product. So there is a friend of mine 
who played an, who played Attack Vector and bounced hard off of it and said, I can do better than this for making a three-dimensional game by the name of uh, Todd Boyce. So Todd Boyce is an animator who, uh, who basically works on 3D graphics on many of the movies that you have seen uh, and have enjoyed over the years. A lot of them, his name is somewhere on the credit sheet. Todd was a big fan of Babylon 5 Wars. Uh, and was not a fan of Starfleet Battles and thought that I borrowed too much from Starfleet Battles for, for Squadron Strike, or not for Squadron Strike, for Attack Vector, and really didn't like the mechanism by which I rectify, uh, I reconciled vectors because he was trying for a close-in pass, turned off his engine, uh, completed a pivot, and his vectors changed. And suddenly he skidded left when he thought he was going to be going right. And suddenly his range two pass was out of arc and didn't mm. like that that much. Uh, if you're trying to do a range, a close range pass in attack vector, or even in squadron strike, you're probably making a, you're you're probably making your life harder than you need to. Uh, so he put out a game called with hostile intent, or rather, he's put out two playtest versions of it. Then his career got interesting, and uh, he moved from California to Texas, and then the movie company he was working for for Texas suddenly let everybody go. Uh, and he moved from Texas to Florida, and then moved back to California brief, and moved back to California briefly without his wife after she had given birth to twins. That was uh, an interesting time for him, uh, and has been basically raising children and working as the in-house animator for a company that makes uh, cinematic training modules in Texas. Uh, and the way he describes it is that they sold the house in Texas to move to Florida, and they bought the house across the street from the house they sold in Texas when they moved back to Texas. <laughs> we can see our old house from here. Yes. Yes, we, yes, we could. <laughs> there it is. Right That's got to be weird. Yeah, <laughs> it is weird. Uh, Go on. With, hostile, with hostile intent is 3D and uses a square grid. And in, interestingly enough, you don't actually put your miniatures on the square inside the squares on the grid. You put them on the vertices of the square. You put them on the vertices. And it deals with 45 degrees of freedom rather than 30 degrees of freedom. It is, uh, it, it, he has a line of miniatures for them that came out in 2007 or thereabouts. They're very nice. And he hasn't put out anything for them since because, again, raising children. Mike, do you have a, um, well, I'll have you both answer this, but let's, uh, let's bounce back and forth. So, uh, Mike, what's your personal uh, favorite sci-fi book, movie, or TV show, and how has it influenced your work? So, so, so that's a solid question. Let's, let's see. Now it's, I'd actually thought, thought of an answer from the, from the lit for the list you you sent out and I'm uh, drawing a complete bl blank on that. It's a really hard question for me to answer because my I am very omniv omnivorous with uh, science fiction and for You don't have a favorite IP? It's really tough. I mean, I, I I'm jug I'm juggling uh, Star Trek and Star Wars shows at the moment. I oddly enough bounced really hard off of the expanse, so I'll just confess that uh, up front. Mhm. Mm and I I, get, I I gave it I, I did gave too. It, <laughs> I gave it four episodes. Oh, and, you 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 gave you 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 literally quit at, at you literally quit on the worst episode. Um, well, that's 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 a reason for it. And also also what really drove me off of that was uh, I don't like any of the characters as people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's one interesting character who I'll be, be be following, and and you know who she is. But beyond but beyond that, no, nah, these these people are jerks. I don't I don't want no one really no character really uh, relatable to you. Right, I don't want any of these people in my living room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But for, but for books, I'm about to write. I've read an awful, awful lot of uh, Mill SF. Mm -hmm. fin finally ended up ended up uh, bowing out of the Honor Harrington stuff when it at the point where it got ridiculous for me. This may this may or may not be where it got ridiculous for other for other people. And but I do enjoy things like uh, Glenn Cook's Passage at Arms, which mm -hmm. is literally Das Boot in space. Mm -hmm. Yes, even, even down to the conceit of having uh, a former officer turned journalist. Come, al come along for a mission. That's a really tense, well thought out bo book. It's got some great combat sequences, and some very interesting ideas. And I think th and I really, I really draw a lot from that. That's my baseline standard for quality mm -hmm. for anything in science fiction is think your stuff through. If you've introduced gadget, g a particular gizmo, be consistent about how you use it and come up with other way, other ways you can play it with. The submarine analogs in, pa in Passage at Arms, they're called climbers. And what they can do is move partially into another dimension, 
It's called uh, somehow. I forget the uh, why that why that's called climbing, but that's what they're called, and that reduces your visual visual signature down to the angstrom scale if you go really high. You can't, and of course, you can't radiate heat. So that lit. So you've got a clock on your climb time. And that and, is one of the very first uses of waste heat as a limiter on space combat in science fiction. Yes, yes, it is. It's it's completely different divorced from his, his his other books he likes mostly mostly fantasy stuff it's a really mm-hmm. really good good ones at that but he really nailed a, a lot of the hard, hard sf elements for it and so you've got climber hunters who at one point they they they're they're hiding because they just whacked the uh, enemy fleet base and and so they have to hide away they climb really high and go into it and go into a, a large asteroid which the hunters then proceed to nuke the living daylights out of and break and break it down to gravel. They get away. They run it. They get the task to hit an enemy capital ship, which lost F, its FTL drive, so it's sort of running at a relative relativistic velocity. They deal with that by climbing up really high and disrupting the disrupting the fusion power plant. They have to they have to do it a couple of times basically get run over and they ultimately get it and take a really huge whack and it's like temperature suddenly spikes and it's like okay we got to get out of here and get down now really interesting stuff won't, won't spoil anything anything further but it's highly recommended it's a candidate for best uh, space combat novel ever written mm-hmm. and th- thinking through what what gadgets you have coming up with clever ways to use them I think that helped give me the good the mindset to wrap, wrap myself wrap my heads around Traveler and abstract it just right to fit into the Squadron Strike rule set. Good answer. All right, uh, Ken, what's your favorite sci-fi book or TV show or IP <laughs> that has influenced your work? So, I have a bit of fondness for The Expanse, uh, in part because the fourth copy of Attack Vector we ever sold was to Ty Frank, one of The Expanse authors. You can kind of see some places in The Expanse where it's, I won't say he copied me, but you can see that we drew from the same sources. What I like in my science fiction is actually less space combat, because now I have opinions about space combat, and if I read space combat by science fiction authors, I sigh and have to turn part of my brain off to go and say, no, 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 it doesn't. No, stop that. Enjoy the book. Don't fix it. Just enjoy the book. <laughs> um, so I look for I look for sociological science fiction. And two of my favorite authors are C.J. Cherry uh, and uh, John M. Ford. Uh, John M. Ford wrote a whole bunch of buildings Roman, Bildungs Romans uh, and wrote one of the best anthropological science fiction novels ever as a Star Trek novel called The Final Reflection. Uh, and it should be noted that every time John M. Ford turned in a novel for for pocketbooks for their Star Trek line, Paramount, Paramount went and changed the rules so that somebody else couldn't do the same thing. <laughs> but The Final Reflection is a novel told from the perspective of a Klingon orphan who eventually rises to commanding a spaceship and uh, is assigned to go fetch the, uh, the Federation ambassador. Um, you know, the very first Federation ambassador of the Klingon Empire. And, you know, he lets, he, he lets in little details like the fact that the Klingons, encount, the, the Klingons list their first contact with the Federation as being 24 years earlier than the Federation lists contact with the Klingon Empire. Because the Federation is, li- is uh, listing that ship as missing in action. Right. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, and his take on Klingon culture uh, is really fascinating. Uh, it was used as the baseline for the uh, for the for the fastest Star Trek RPG, and quickly became non-canon with Next Generation. There are still a few details of the Ford variety of Klingons that have worked their way into canon, but of all of the people that I know who work professionally on Star Trek, the 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 only outsider that they ever wish that Paramount had just grafted into the canon is John M. Ford's Klingons. With a uh, secondary list for uh, Diane Dwayne's Romulans, yeah, and, I'm uh, so, and I really wish David Gerald had let her write uh, a few a few scripts while she was his, his assistant on TNG. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, Final Reflection also includes the biggest bomb any Klingon has ever dropped. 
it's uh, they get they get to, they get to Earth to, be, to pick up the ambassador, and they're they're invited to a demonstration of a new Federation technology, the Federation's first practical transporter, which the Klingons already have. So they they do, they do their dog and pony show, and then uh, somebody beams in, and they go, "Any questions?" The Klingons stands up and says. Why does yours make that horrible noise? <laughs> <laughs> and then they beat out. <laughs> Silently. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That uh -huh. putting the cat amongst the pigeons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mike, do you have uh, any uh, favorite memories or experience from giving conventions or events that you've attended related to Squadron Strike or Traveler? Let's see. Well, meeting up with, with Ken and a buddy of mine in a game store in San Francisco to, to play at attack vector or, or play test at attack vector and then mm -hmm. have some really good Chinese food. That was a lot of fun. I'm very, very fond mm -hmm. of that. Oh, so been, jealous. I love Chinese yeah. food. Oh, well, we are so spoiled for choice in uh, San Francisco. I'm uh, mm -hmm. currently rocking a Thai barbecue place. That's really, really good. Just open fi five star reviews all over the place. One of them mine, but also for conventions, I actually don't do conventions a whole lot. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I was a kid, when I was a kid in high school, some some of my buddies and I would uh, s split a room at uh, Pacific Pacificon. That was fun. It's basically you've got a, you've got a room, but that's such a, a place you can lock to keep your stuff. Stayed up all night gaming, like getting in a full seven seven player uh, game of of board game Civilization. That that one that one still stands out. Uh, did play uh, in a tournament in Starfleet Battles. All right, this is confession time. Essentially, what what I could theoretically afford to make good if anybody wanted to call me on it. I took a, took in an Andromedan ship, and well, Andromedans in that tournament play are uh, target one for everybody. So I was the first person out, and so I went o went over to the the uh, I think it was it was still task for task force running it there. Went over to the went over to the tournament organizers and said, yeah, I was I was the first out. And they said, great, congratulations, and handed me a bunch of stuff. Well, wow. um, <laughs> as a I, consolation I, prize or what? <laughs> I think they said I took first place. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe it was a, but I decided to roll with the uh, consol consolation prize idea and then just basically avoided that uh, half of the dealer's room for the for the uh, remainder of the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and what about you Ken any uh, favorite um, memories uh, or experiences from gimmick conventions or events? So I have a lot of them, but for me, there is basically a period there's before 2000 and there's before uh, 2000 and after 2000, before 2000, I went to game conventions and, you know, played games and had fun. Uh, after 2000, I go to game conventions and now it's a place where I make sales uh, and where I do game demos to try to generate sales and periodically try to sneak on out and play some games for fun. Uh, so pre 2000, uh, I went to one of the very first Battletech tournaments at Gen Con. Uh, I was 19. I spent a stupid. I, I spent my Alaska permanent fund dividend check to fly to to fly to Milwaukee to go to Gen Con. Uh, and I was a Battletech nerd. Mm -hmm. Love Battletech. So this is before they figured out the problem with using tonnage as a balancing system. And it was a bring 400 tons and your lance against my lance and whatever survives moves on to the next round with a limited budget for fixing and repairs. They didn't allow any custom mechs, but they did allow me to bring in 400 tons of Savannah Masters. Which are light, uh, light mechs? No, those are five ton oh. hover tanks that move 1117 mm -hmm. with, oh. with, 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 a, with a medium laser on them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And oh, so they're they're using the the GEV rules or whatever their uh, Aerotech or whatever. Um, uh, it's in uh, the thirty twenty six technical readout. Ah, uh, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. uh, so they they move like a mech. Uh, they can't enter woods, uh, but they move eleven seventeen, and I don't have to worry about heat from moving or firing my medium laser because the the fusion reactor has ten heat sinks. Medium laser generates three. Moving at seventeen generates two. I've got five heat capacity left. Now, sure, if you hit it with anything, if you hit it with anything substantial anywhere other than the front, other than the front armor, it's going to die fast. But you're rolling initiative four times, 
I'm rolling initiative 80 times. What do you want to bet I can get a movement, a, a vehicle that moves 17 hexes per turn onto your rear armor? Right, right. So you must have uh, mastered that. <laughs> <laughs> mastered that game. I uh, flew. I, I ran the Savannah Master <coughs> course through, and then they uh, casually mentioned that, oh, by the way, your vehicles don't get repaired between rounds. So on the first round, I had 400 tons of Savannah Masters. The second round, I had like 340 tons of Savannah Masters. The third round, I was down to 270. <laughs> uh, and that's quantity when, has a quality of its own. And uh, that's when they uh, said that uh, in the next edition of the rules, all vehicles automatically lose all initiative to uh, uh, all vehicles automatically move before all mechs, <laughs> regardless regardless of initiative rolls. I was going to say uh, you lose initiative. Okay. <laughs> That's funny. I like how they're like adjusting the rules as they go to uh, <laughs> avoid problems with you next year. Yes. Or in the next round. <laughs> so, uh, so Ken, how did how did you get involved in the traveler license? Um, were you just looking around for ways to expand, or uh, did uh, did people come out of the woodwork and say, "Hey, I think this would be cool if this was traveler"? So. Um... We got the Honor Harrington license for uh, when I had Attack Vector. We did two editions of the Honor Harrington game. The first one I still apologize for. The second one is actually a fair amount of fun. And we started looking for other licenses. And it just so happened that, you know, we lived in Milwaukee. Mark Miller lives in uh, lives in Clinton, Illinois. And roughly one third of the way, roughly if you took a line between Milwaukee and Clinton. One third of the way north from Mark is a convention called Winter War, which was run by Don McKinney. And we came down and uh, we came down and talked to Mark. Mark knew my business partner, Scott Palter, from way back uh, and uh, just chatted about doing a license as I did a little bit of show and tell on Attack Vector at the time. Mark felt that Attack Vector was way too complicated for anything traveler related. And I said, I have another game of development that streamlines it and simplifies it. And Mark said, sure. And we cut him a check. Uh, and had the license and did nothing with it for a terrifyingly long period of time uh, because I was busy working on the Sith stuff and then working on uh, st on Squadron Strike and didn't have time to do the deep dive into Traveler needed to become a subject matter expert on it. And that was where we got Steve Osmansky in as the subject matter ex expert and went on from there. Mike, what, what do you hope Traveler fans will appreciate most about the Traveler license version of Squadron Strike? I want people to come off and say, and say that that's just that's just how a battle would go. That's how that's how these ships would fly. That's how these these ships would fight. And like that, like uh, saying like that's how I imagined it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's and it's harkening back. I mean, they're way ba way back in the day that they they put out a space combat supplement or full full game Mayday, which uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure you're. Which I will men mention for the audience. I think, you, from the title of the convention, I think you might be aware of that one. It sounds familiar. Yeah, and that and that had some, <laughs> some facing. And then we we played we played some of that back back at the grade school. Mm -hmm. was, and I want to give people, hey, this is this is what the, this is what it was like in the Fifth Frontier War. These are, these are some of the important important things that went down that maybe didn't make the main line, but it's it's a sideshow. But any battle is important to the people who were in it. Mm -hmm. And I want to f flesh out flesh out the history for them a little bit, maybe play with play with some what ifs. There's a there's a hypothetical scenario in the first fleet book, mm -hmm. and, and uh, just, there are, and there are refitted versions of ships that are not exactly traveler canon, but likely should be. Mm -hmm. I think that we have a great, I think we have a great patron giving a group of PCs uh, a mission, and the differences between the original Gianetti and the refitted Gianetti. The refitted, the original Gianetti light cruiser is uh, arm is a 30,000 30, ton light cruiser that is armed with a spinal Nissan gun. It has decent amounts of sand and pretty well armored for something its size. That, by the way, was one of the other major changes that we made for uh, that 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 shook out very late in the in the design process was deciding that no no making armor four a very high armor value and scaling the weapons to that uh, was a good idea. What the Gianetti originally, what the what the Gianetti has is a spinal mount, Misson gun, and it's the smallest thing that the uh, 
that the Imperium mounts with a spinal mount Misan gun. It most notably does not actually have a Misan screen. Interesting. And it is, and it is a big, and that's in the canonical supplement nine listing for it. And it has, and it doesn't have a Misan screen because of the amazing pipeline that uh, GDW is using to produce products. Uh, but it doesn't have a Misan screen. The refitted one does. And, and that's I, about the only change. And that's about the only change. And <coughs> what I'm imagining is that some admiral who was part of the procurement process had his had his son going on out as the ex as the executive officer on a non refitted Gianetti, which blows up because it doesn't have a beast on screen. Right, <laughs> and it's just big enough to be worth using one on. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And uh, and this admiral hires the PCs and says, "This is entirely off the books. These were the plans for the Gianetti class light cruiser." Note. Note the existence of, of compartment 23B on these plans. These are the reports of the Gianetti light cruiser as it came out of the shipyards. Note the contents of compartment 23B. Note that it does not have a Misan screen. <laughs> it's supposed to. I want you to find the people who are responsible and bring them to me alive. Not necessarily <laughs> healthy, but alive. <laughs> <laughs> so what kind of uh, feedback have you guys received from the Traveler community about Squadron Strike? Was it well received or um, were people kind of grumpy about it? I mean, you know, people are people like what they like and, you know, they don't like to see their things change. But on the other hand, there's uh, another camp that likes to see uh, things updated and and um, and, you know, brought into other fields. The initial reviews were quite. The initial reviews were quite good, although a number of people who were basically expecting a better version of uh, High Guard kind of went, "Oh my God, what have I gotten myself into?" <laughs> uh, there is the gentle. There is the review that I mentioned earlier uh, that I'll mention again, which was somebody saying, "You've managed to make maneuver matter in in, in traveler space combat. You've made damage or different facings matter." You've made me care about damage on individual parts of the ship. You're trying to make traveler space combat with big ships fun. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> and we also, of course, we also had the review from the fellow who uh, fell in love with the Misan gun as, as we implemented it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he said that his the very first thing that he did was he took a Gianetti light cruiser and lined up a shot on the Zodiac, uh, fly, you know, playing it solo. And it uh, and he rolled the Misan gun and hit hit location four and the Zodiac just blew up. <laughs> <laughs> and then he tried it again and the, and, 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 and it, then he tried it again with a, a new Zodiac and the Zodiac didn't quite blow up. But oh dear lord, did you know that it had gotten hit? <laughs> Right, right. I think that's what happened to me. Uh, I didn't blow up the ship I was uh, shooting at, but I did damage it very, very badly. Uh, yeah, you got a close range pass with the uh, bay mounted uh, with a bay mounted energy beam on something that's uh, after the sand had been blasted down by your lasers, mm -hmm. and then you went and rolled a damage two penetration eight weapon with bursting, and that was not with bursting with uh, with splash on it, and you know you rolled pretty well. You got like a penetration roll of six, and. <laughs> <laughs> can everybody just line up in front of my bay gun my spinal mount weapon and uh in an orderly fashion please <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a spinal mount weapon but uh, it was uh no no the spinal mount the, the, the one of the three uh, hangout destroyers the three start with these ships that has a spinal mount weapon mm. is the uh, pf sloan uh, that has that uh, lovely, lovely spinal-mounted uh, bay particle beam that is longer range than anything else in its category. <laughs> so do you have any other uh, Traveler-related products that you're currently working on? Uh, so we were going to try and get Traveler Shipbook 2 covering the Soleimani Rim War out uh, last year. And then uh, Mike got promoted. <laughs> Uh, Wait, promoted it at Astra or promoted at his other job? <laughs> promoted at the job that pays him far more than I ever could. <laughs> yep, that, 
Yeah, th things got uh, more than a little busy. Although right now I'm waiting on a set of a spreadsheet re revisions from Ken. Yep. And uh, d bang out a f bang out a few more ships. And I'm think I'm thinking uh, the big ships for the Aslan fleet. Mm -hmm. After um, after fleet book two, they should they should be the uh, all all three fleets should be at the uh, nine nine base halls mm -hmm. with two, the usual two variants each. So I'm thinking uh, at least the battle cruiser in the next wave mm -hmm. and do some revisions on on the other the, stuff on, on the Soleimani stuff as well. Um, yeah, the Soleimani stuff I'm basing on the T uh, twenty. Ver version of that, they actually had a a complete fleet book for the Soleimani, with some designs that were initial. I started with a, with a destroyer, about about five thousand tons, as we do, and yeah, the first literal translation uh, became very clear that uh, I should be taking more of the spirit than the literal translations because that sucker has a thrust of two, mm -hmm. which is not completely unreasonable in high guard. But it makes you a sit basically a stationary target in Squadron Strike. Mm -hmm. So that got revised real fast. We had an awful lot. We had an awful time making the Azanti highlight, making the Lightning class work. What was the uh, what was the big uh, issue there? Thrust two. Thrust two. Mm -hmm. Thrust also, two and thrust two and a carrier without enough fighters to actually do anything useful. Yep, and worse, they're mode two fighters. Mm -hmm. And. Our, rec our recommendation is that uh, yes, we will put uh, fighters and and carriers into the game. We just recommend that you don't actually use them mm -hmm. <laughs> because I spent. Well, how do you strike that balance, though, uh, Mike? Like between what's canon and I mean, and what works for Squadron Strike? Are you good? You just erring on the side of fun, primarily. I'm erring. Not erring, but yeah. you know. I have, I have a very strong fun bias in uh, game design. Mm -hmm. uh, with well, the difference between squ squadron strike and traveler ship design is that traveler ship design is volume constrained, and squadron strike is surface area constrained, which dramatically affects the uh, number of weapon m mounts you have. So, I think I I look at a high guard design from say book dot. Uh, supplement nine, and I'm going. Okay, it has a uh, few fusion guns, no particle beams, some bay mounted masons, and a b bunch of lasers and sand. Okay, mm -hmm. I re then I recreate that as best I can, work out uh, an interesting set of firing arcs that wor that wor will work tactically, but make you make decisions, mm -hmm. and go from there. What these are. So it was basically Supplement 9 for Imperials. The Zodani came out of actually the full thrust-based tra Traveler game Power Projection, mm -hmm. which I was very glad to have because I did not want to have to uh, do the do every half half the sh ships in the game from sh complete scratch and pulling them out mm -hmm. of uh, out of jump space, as it were. And but for the Aslan, those are all clean sheet designs. Mm -hmm. Pure pure squadron strike. No reference to canon. I looked at existing Aslan designs, both some fan made ones and the old fa fastest ships, and basically said, "Okay, these are Aslan ships. How do they want to fight? They're not as bad as Exinti with the whole uh, scream and leap thing, but honestly, I think that the Aslan are much more are based as much off of the Hani from C.J. Cherry's genre novels. Yeah." De yeah, definitely. So rather than the Kazinti, yeah, mm -hmm. there's a teensy bit in in there that the males can be pretty can be pretty aggressive, but they're not stupid, mm -hmm. and they're not and they're not as, as nearly rigidly bound by a, a, a code of honor. So the first Aslan ship was the one of the first three destroyers, and I decided it's going to be fast, the highest thrust, and absolutely most maneuverable. Of the destroyers and has a decided to go for a really nasty short range punch. I, I was thinking claws, so it got uh, fusion guns, uh, which we turned into energy beams. And honestly, I think that the energy beams were a little bit too short ranged. <clears throat> but the the book Oslan, the original Oslan destroyer, not the leader variant, has like six energy beams, which is the if it gets close to two ships, 
of its size are a little larger, and managed to survive long enough to get that close, things are dead. Mm. Yep. Yeah, they are very short ranged, but I think we've seen in, in play over and over again, people get people get good shots with energy beams. Awesome. So let's talk about uh, the current events. I know you guys um, uh, purchased a, a license for, for your version of Traveler, but do you have any opinions on the uh, Wizards of the Coast open jail fiasco? So... Yeah, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not in the D&D or Pathfinder space, so that was what, that was just me getting to watch a large corporation uh, tri trip over its own feet. Mm -hmm. So Pathfinder is the RPG I play for fun because uh, it is not related to anything at all that I write for or work on. Uh so I carefully segregated, and I got to watch that. Uh, I got to watch that blow up fast. Uh, I cheered on my friends at Paizo when they sold out of eight months worth of a fresh reprint of their hardback book in two weeks. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so they they basically did an, they basically do an annual reprint of uh, of the of the Pathfinder Core rulebook roughly in time to get new edition to get new printings in in house for Gen Con. They sold out of the entire print run mid January, the print run that had just landed for them at the end of July. At the end of July, and you know they don't do it so that they will immediately run out. They they do it so that they have, and so that they know that they have three months before they know it's going to run out to uh, you know, to put it back on the press. Right, right. Um, so you know, selling out of it just before you know, they they want to know they're going to put it on the press before they go to Gen Con. So they make sure they have enough to last through Gen Con plus about two months. And they wow. sold out of that entire print run in, in mid-January. Wow, wow, that speaks volumes. Volumes. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> volume, <laughs> has a, volume has a quality all its own. <laughs> um, so uh, what do you think about, uh, let's talk about AI a little bit. Uh, what do you think about the rise in popularity in AI? And um, do you have any plans to utilize AI in your products, like maybe AI-controlled units or... Or, uh, or maybe you have, let's take it out of that context and, and say, like, what about AI systems on a ship? Would those be like something that, like an auto, auto gunner or like something that uh, might be an, an expansion or an inclusion or a redesign? I am unlike, uh, we, we don't actually track who's shooting which gun in Squadron Strike Traveler. Uh, you have a, you're on a crew of a naval vessel. It's, it's, it's big. There's lots of people who work on that. Um, whether or not it's you know crew with AI with AI support or everything is AI written and you have a crew of five living in a hermetically sealed bridge, it's traveler. Obviously, it's crew of it, it's crews of hundreds on there with you know uh, retro with nineteen seventies retro future technology and you know computers that are the size of a walk in closet mm -hmm. or bigger. <laughs> And, um, and robots. Traveler does have robots. Yep. yep. And Traveler does have robots. So in one of the shims that I made to patch Squadron Strike into actually playing Traveler and caring about PCs on, on small little ships, uh, one of the options there is you can actually have a program that runs certain jobs for you. And that program basically can never roll better than a 7. <laughs> but it never has to roll. <laughs> Meanwhile, for what PCs do in this... Uh, PCs roll their relevant skill check with a relevant modifier, uh, and I stole a march from uh, from a game called uh, uh, Apocalypse World on this, uh, which is very similar to Traveler in that it's basically roll two dice, add modifier, uh, try to roll high. If you roll a six or less, you have failed. Something disastrous has happened. If you roll a seven, eight, or nine, uh, you have a success with a cost. If you roll a, a ten, if, 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 sorry, seven, is it? Yeah. If you roll a ten, or, if you roll a ten through twelve, you have gotten a complete success or uh, a better success with a small cost. If you roll a twelve or higher, you've gotten something special. Uh, so what I did with that is that for the various jobs that a PC can do on a traveler spaceship, I built a little table that says if you're using this skill, these are the special things you can select off the menu for rolling a ten, for rolling a, a ten or higher. Uh, these are the, and if you roll a 12 or higher, if you roll a 13 or higher, uh, pick two. <laughs> okay. They only, they only apply for this round. Uh, but it's basically using your traveler skills to get bonuses in the squadron strike combat. Gotcha. Now, this is one of those things that we have tried to get play tested on, uh, on Mayday for three years running now. 
Uh, and the end result is that the Venn diagram of people who can run Traveler at a convention online and people who know Squadron Strike uh, seems to have no point of overlap. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> and um, yeah. what about you, uh, Mike? Uh, do you have any uh, thoughts on AI or its use in ships or its use in real life? Well, AI, AI support for filtering out noise is going to be very important in electronic warfare and sensor game for both real world and in science fiction. We'll see, we'll see it come up a bit more, but in, in practical terms, in daily life, I, I would rather do a Google search if I'm, if I'm trying to come up with some code and get, get the context of the answers off of Stack Exchange that way mm -hmm. versus a, an algorithm that, will be, that can be confidently wrong. Right. It, it's point. got some space. It's uh, GitHub just announced uh, their their companion AI, which will do things like you can sele select a, a chunk of code and have the AI write your unit test for you. That's, oh, that's, immensely cool. that's immensely practical. And using it as an assistant, I th I think there's some, some value there. But you you got to test. It. You still have to you still have to you understand still have to it. the code. You're yeah. Yeah, yeah. You still you still have to under, understand the code that you're putting into production, and you right. have, you absolutely have to test it because even, even the uh, more more sophisticated uh, models that uh, are coming out are still confidently wrong, and they're just making a confident guess at what the next sentence or line of code should be. Right, right. They're they're spicy autocomplete. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. There's some value for that that is in support, and I think, and in and in gaming, uh, it's I think it was uh, Ubisoft just uh, announced that for one one of their projects, they're going to be using AI to come up with the N NPC banter that's going on in the background in the game, mm, which that's is kind of cool. That's actually a really a really clever use. It it's it's the computer uh, taking some of the drudge work away, which is what they're for. Right, right. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. Um, <clears throat> I did some, I played around with the uh, AI and I asked it a, about a topic that I'm an expert on and, and it um, it failed miserably. It looked like it was just um, a sophisticated Mad Libs machine. Um, uh, yes, this is, th this is why I refer to it as a spicy autocomplete. Um, and, uh, so yeah. with with uh, with VTTs becoming more popular, are you seeing more interest in people using your online avid system, or finding it easy? Are you finding it easier to train people because they're already kind of used to gaming online like this? Kind of taking an analog thing and making it into a computer, like how you would tabletop into a, a VTT, for instance. This is why we refer to the VTT site as analog space combat by internet. Uh, so. We got a big surge when the pandemic happened. Uh, honestly, uh, Mike uh, Mike Zabrowski, the guy who does my coding, made me look like a frickin' genius uh, because um, he had started working on the VTT in late 2018, and we had over a year of development in it when 2020 happened, <laughs> mm -hmm. almost a year and a half. So it made me look like a goddamn genius for having this ready to go when the when the pandemic happened. Uh, pure luck. Thank you, Mike. Uh, what I found is that during the pandemic, we had a big surge in play. Uh, and now that the pandemic, now that people are saying the pandemic is over, and you know, with me with a with a chronic lung condition, I I disagree vehemently. <clears throat> uh, I you know, we're we're finding that it comes in waves. We we try to get groups of people to come in and play together. Uh, and then one or the other of them suddenly gets a conflict on the night that we have our weekly meetups, uh, and then they drop, and then their buddy drops, and then we have to go do recruiting again. Mm. Um, honestly, the biggest thing you could do to help me, or the biggest thing anybody can do to help me, is to go and play Squadron Strike in their game store. Uh, because game stores only buy things that they have demand for. Mm. Uh, if they don't see anybody playing it, and they don't see anybody asking for it, they don't stock it. Gotcha. Um, and this is a purely demand-driven business because you know, it's even worse than it was before. But you know, five years ago, 
on any given month, uh, the Alliance catalog, Alliance is the biggest game distributor in the country, on any given month, Alliance would be listing 360 brand new board games. Wow. Yeah. Any month, 360. And anything that was, and the next month, about half of those 360 would be replaced by 180 brand new board games. And then the next month later, another 180 brand new board games are replacing the ones that were previously listed. So your mm -hmm. window of showing up in the Alliance catalog is about 60 to 90 days, unless you have a wingspan or something like it. Uh, and there is no way on earth that a game store can stock one copy of 360 new uh, board games every month. They'll go out of business. They'll go out of right. business so fast. And it's not like any of these games are bad. Almost all of these games have production values that... My God, in 2000, if you had told me I could have gotten production values as good as small publishers are getting now by sacrificing an entire kindergarten class, I would have started sharpening my knife. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> and, bad analogy, bad analogy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you know, seriously, the production values are insane. Uh, and the game designs are really good. And they're just going on in. And if you're lucky, they're selling a thousand copies through the game store, through the game stores and direct off of, and another thousand off of Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. uh, because there are so many new games coming in out there that that's just uh, the, you know, the two game clubs that I uh, have contact with locally, to, you know, locally to me. They very rarely pull out anything that's older than a year. Because there are so many new, good new games coming in out there that most of their games are only getting played three or four or five times. So, so would you say people should go to their local game store and try to order there first, and then if they can't find it, hit the um, hit the online or uh... yeah. If they can't find it, please hit me up uh, at, at the company website. And if you're overseas, uh, Noble Knight Games regularly restocks, uh, and they can and, and and they have black magic that they do for getting cheap shipping overseas that I cannot match. <laughs> I think I saw that they had copies of um, Netrunner. Uh, available which is like out of print you can't find it anywhere and they were they were for about the same prices of regular um you know the regular net runner like it hadn't been it the price hadn't increased because it's hard to find mm -hmm. uh oh also uh speaking of things that are hard to find and have been out of print uh, i found the covers for printing uh power projection fleets uh so i made about six copies of them and there are like three copies left in my stock shelf and I'll be reprinting those covers soon. Oh, cool. Uh, so Power Projection Fleet is a Traveler Space Combat game that I publish. It's not one I designed, but it's one that I published. All right, cool. Well, so I was, that, uh, I was gonna, my next question was going to be, can you tell us of any new exciting products or uh, releases at, at, at Astro Game that are not Traveler related? So games that I have, uh, products that I have just released or released since the last time we came through, uh, I have released Air Battle Rag 5 for, for Birds of Prey, which is basically their convention scenario product. Uh, and last year, we were desperately trying to get a very fast product out for Top Gun. It uh, did not hit the stores at the time that we wanted it to, but Top Gun was still in theaters when we did put it out. Uh, but if you actually want to have all of the Birds of Prey scenarios and, and fighters from those little known historical documentaries, uh, Top Gun and Top Gun Maverick. I have them. <laughs> All right. Uh, awesome. Coming up now, I am working on Exile Stars. Uh, it is also one of the things that is in the log jam behind the updates to the Squadron Strike ship design spreadsheet. But with any luck, I will actually be posting a new version of that tonight. Oh, fantastic. We down, yeah, we are down to uh, cross-checking. We're down to cross-checking and identifying uh, glitches in the Fortress tabs with the changes we've been making. And as Fortresses are things that we don't use much of because it's hard to make a fight around a Fortress interesting, that's a low-priority thing. One of the other things that we've done is that the Squadron Strike Ship Design Spreadsheet now has an automatic conversion from Squadron Strike to Starmada because Dan Cast is a friend of mine, and this was a nice blowing-off Steam project. Uh, they have the same sequence of plays. Starmada is a much, much lighter weight game. Uh, Squadron Strike Sweet Spot is about two to four ships per player, with a peak of about six. 
So Armada starts getting interesting at about four to five ships per player with a peak of about a dozen. But Dan is really, really good at getting the maximum amount of replayability and cleverness out of very simple mechanics. Uh, so he is, um... He's better at that than I am. Uh, so I like to just acknowledge that, you know, he's better at that than I am. Where Dan has a problem is that he hates writing settings. Oh. <laughs> So getting an automatic conversion from Star from Squadron Strike to Starmada means that every new product that I come out becomes it becomes a freebie product for Dan. Gotcha. And the next two products that I am working on for Squadron Strike is Exile Stars, which can best be described as what would happen if you tried to make Star Trek with mo with uh, slightly more modern sensibilities, which means that you have to actually believe that computers are tools, not miracle machines, uh, and you wanted to avoid the uh, every every season we run into two random gods on a on an abandoned planet, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it's got a very compelling setting. We've even I've even got somebody working on an RPG for it, but uh, that has had to be put on the back burner while I get other things done first. Um, I was going to say there's some speculation that uh, Trelane was a Q. Hmm. There is, there is. Mm -hmm. uh, there's that's even the premise behind one of the Star Trek novels that came out in the late 1990s. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. Q uh, uh, who and a real. That's a real banger. Uh, so the other product that I have on out, that I have in the offing, is Newton's Cradle. And I showed you a little bit of Newton's Cradle last time around. So with Newton's Cradle, I have a game that is, uh, it's, I, I have the Newton's Cradle product with ships, which are done. Uh, and I have the scenario book, which is mostly done. Uh, and I have a set of rules that I need to do layout on for a product called Wang Jian's War. And you know how... People back, you know, how people back in the 1980s or 1990s would talk about, yeah, I'm going to have a game that has uh, an operational movement thing, and we're going to play out all the, we're going to play out all the tactical battles. Uh, we're going to move our fleets around. The fleets are going to come in contact. We're going to play our fleet actions. This is sort of the premise behind uh, Starfire in a lot of ways, and it never works. <laughs> Uh, because if you manage to make the uh, operational game interesting, you end up with a situation where fleets come in and the fleet that knows it's going to get stomped just boogies out as fast as they possibly can. Um, well, it turns out that when your fleets require fuel, that becomes less of an option. It turns out that when you are fighting, it turns out when you, when you have to worry about orbital mechanics, that becomes less of an option. Uh, and Wung Jian's War uses the orbital mechanics of the uh, four Galilean moons and a couple of the uh, bigger ones on the inside uh, inside of them as your operational battle space for doing a war between Callisto and Europa. Uh, Callisto is using uh, loner Martian ships. Europa is uh, using uh, is using hastily converted lunar refugee ships because the, uh, pre the precipitating event was that one of the Martian governments triggered a Kessler cascade in the infrastructure orbiting over Earth. And Luna realized that without regular launches from Earth, it can't actually sustain the number of people that it has. So there was a big lunar diaspora, and that has turned into a proxy war in the middle of the Jovian system. Interesting. Nice setup. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. But you actually have you actually have orbital periods that you have to worry about because they uh, they turn on and turn off adjacency between hexes. Uh, there are basically these long drawn out those long drawn out arcs that say these two hexes are adjacent along this arc on these turn numbers, and the turn cycle recycles every twelve every twelve turns. And each of the hexes has a fuel cost for what it would take you in fuel pips to move through this hex. And the fuel pips are exactly the same as the fuel pips that are actually on the Newton's Cradle ships. Gotcha. Interesting. Very interesting. There's... So uh, here's a question for uh, the both of you. Let's uh, let's flip over to Mike. Um, what do you think are the most important skills or traits for a game designer to have? Well, so, well, some math is definitely required. You have you whatever uh, you're doing with dice, you need to understand the numbers and the and the probabilities. You need. You also need to be creative. You need to be able to think out of the box and come up and come up with with sol solutions to pro problems that are either either better than or existing solutions or are unique. And you have to be, to tie a whole bunch of disparate systems together in a cohesive way that's actually fun to play. So that requires a really strong or sense of organization. You, a little, a little math, and 
in, inspiration. If you get lucky, and uh, and you and you need to all to always be thinking about give it a chance to be simple. All right, that sounds like a good recipe. All right, how about how about you, Ken? What are your uh, your most important skills or traits you think a game designer should have? So, to me, a game designer should start out with a theme, uh, and then ruthlessly question what is making this fun. Once you have found the fun in the game, then you can build it up and then put it in front of players. And being willing to put your children, being able to put your, your creative endeavors in front of players and watch them screw it up repeatedly and discover that what you thought was fun was not fun. <laughs> and go back and, uh, pull the, and pull the fragments out of your ego and try again and try again and try again. Uh, and ever so slowly, uh, actually not slowly, every time that your player, every time you have a play test that blows up badly, take lots of notes because you have just been told where the most frustrating part of your game is. Um, Good advice. Good advice. If, mathematical analysis is useful, but really it's more statistics than anything else. Uh, Jeff Engelstein has a substack on this called Game Tech that is really good for uh, refreshing yourself on the kinds of statistical analysis that you can do uh, to make games better and to reduce some of the trial and error process of figuring things out. I also know some things about the GDW product production pipeline from way back in the day. Um, so GDW for 23 years, was it 23 or 29 years? 29 years, uh, yeah, 29 years from uh, 1974 to 1993. For 29 years, GDW produced 16 games a year. And I think that's counting traveler supplements. That's also counting traveler supplements, but they produced 16 products a year. That is an insane production schedule. Um, that is a crazy production schedule. And you know, from talking to Lauren Wiseman, a lot of the process was Mark was the ideas guy. Mark was also the guy who ran, was also the director of marketing and uh, the token sensible adults in the company in a lot of ways, uh, along with his wife, Denise. Mark would come up with these crazy ideas, would come up with these ideas for a game. At the time, Mark would write these down as quickly as possible on a typewriter. Uh, and he would just sit there and pound on the typewriter for, you know, two or three or four hours and produce a first draft of a game. He would then try to explain it to Frank, Frank Chadwick. And Frank would start asking a bunch of questions. And then Mark would get frustrated, throw the game draft, at, throw the game down in frustration on the table in front of Frank, and Frank would go and rewrite the would go and rewrite Mark's first draft into a playable draft in about two days. <laughs> and then Frank would hand that playable draft uh, uh, typewritten to Lauren, who would go through and proof Frank's um, somewhat questionable command of the use of somewhat questionable use of language. Um, and Lauren would go in and fill in the gaps. Uh, between Mark's first draft and Frank's draft. And then Lauren would go and take his draft to uh, you, uh, to uh, the local University of Illinois, of Illinois chapter, put it in front of the War Games Club, set up two or three tables of it, and run it all at once. You know, hmm. Set three playtests up with college students. Right. Uh, marking up his copy with three different colors of pens for what was found with each playtest group. Then he would come back in, fold in those complaints, hand it off to Frank again, Frank would grumble because Mark would have just dropped, a, dropped off a brand new game. <laughs> uh, Frank would grumble, think about these changes, write up rules for, for Lauren to patch in. And this is, and at this point in time, Lauren would go to the page layout machine, the, the, the page layout machine, which isn't quite a computer, but at least had copy and paste of paragraphs so that he wasn't just retyping this manuscript multiple times every week. And then Lauren would take the game back to UIUC for another playtest weekend, uh, come back with fewer complaints, maybe have time to get Frank involved on it, and then it was time to go and fill in the rest of the fluff for the game. One of the reasons why they uh, loved Traveler and RPGs in general was that they don't require nearly as much playtesting iteration. So, so with, with with that, what's the moral of that story as far as important skills and traits for the game designer to have? It's better to work as a team. And uh, the other thing about it is that in some cases, better than is the enemy of good enough. Uh, we all know about uh, Shattered Ships of the Fighting Imperium. 
that's an example of better than was not quite the enemy of good enough. Uh, but that's an example of where that development cycle bit them in the butt. Because what would happen is that Lauren would get his second iteration of any ship design system or character creation system, and Lauren would be the one who designed most of the ships for it. And if he missed anything, like, say, a Gianetti needing a uh, Misan screen and not having it, by the time he noticed it, the, pro the product was already in, in page layout. And it was often too late to change it and still meet the production queue. Gotcha. Because... Because to produce a game every three weeks, more or less, that meant that Lauren was often juggling playtests for two or three games at once at UIUC, while writing. Well, while while while, while uh, he and uh, Mark and uh, Frank were writing throughout the week, or or wrangling freelancers just after about the mid '80s, and they had to do this to keep the doors open. So. Um... We're basically at the end of our interview. Uh, where where can people find out more about Ad Astra Games and find your products or follow you uh, for for news about your new pro your new projects? So I'm currently active on Twitter, but with Twitter being what it is, I have no idea how much longer I'll be active. Uh, I am at I'm also at I'm at Astra Games at Twitter. I am at Astra Games at uh, uh, I'm at Astro Games at wargames at wargamers.social. Let me go on mastodon.com. Let me go pull that one up because I never remember. Wargamers.social. Uh, I'm at Astro Games at wargamers.social on at, on uh, Mastodon. Uh, and that is likely where I'm going to be if and when Twitter finally implodes. Uh, the company website is at astrogames.com. And the virtual map where we go and actually play Squadron Strike and Attack Vector online on a regular basis is www.ascbi.net, askbi.net, short for Analog Space Combat by Internet. All right, cool. And uh, Mike, is there a way to contact you? Uh, where do you hang out on the Internet? Oh, I still do, I still do some Twitter. I'm uh, at Mike Yaneza on Twitter. I'm pretty much uh, retired retired from Facebook, although I I notice can still post there. There's actually there's a reasonably active uh, at Astra group group over there as well. So I'm also and Mike at uh, gmail dot com if anybody wants to send me some uh, fan or hate mail. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, that's it. Uh, thanks for joining us again for the. For the fifth annual Mayday Mayday event, uh, I sure appreciate you guys coming back and uh, your support all along. And uh, uh, I think um, I spoke with um, Ken earlier that you guys are going to uh, sponsor another uh, um, Squadron Strike Traveler uh, demo. Yes, we are. Fantastic. Uh, great. I'll put links to everything uh, in the show notes so folks can find it. And uh, yeah, and that's it. So thanks. Thanks so much, guys, for joining me again. It was a pleasure as always. It's always a pleasure, Frank. Thanks for having us. And thanks, thank you, friends, for listening. Until next time, happy traveling. interface, scanning trade routes, scanning for cargo destinations within jump range, cargo shipment available, 12 tons of classic aircraft hood ornament replicas and 16 tons of disposable light sticks, destined for the Anthra system in call sector, contacting Christopher Griffin at Mongoose Publishing, stand by. Hello, everybody. Today, my guest is Christopher Griffin, one of the lead writers at Mongoose Publishing. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, Frank. Uh, thank you for having me once again. Thanks for returning. Um, it's nice to have you back. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, who are you and what do you do and how are you related to Traveler? 
All right. Um, I am a uh, a person who lives <laughs> in uh, California in the United States uh, and uh, grew up uh, very picked up on role playing games at uh, in in uh, pre adolescence. Have followed them for many many years, along with other types of fandom. At some point, I thought, you know what? Uh, you could write these things. Found my way, created a path for myself to. Uh, be a uh, role-playing games materials author and uh, contacted Mongoose and, and became one of their freelancers. And I'm, I'm happy to say it's been a lot of fun and I look forward to, I'm proud of all the projects I've done and I'm looking forward to doing a lot more for them. Let's talk a little bit about what inspired you to get into gaming and um, how your passion for the hobby led you to where you are today. <clears throat> Just a natural love of narrative got me into gaming. Uh, I think very early on as a kid, I got into things like uh, comic books and that and reading, and I always gravitated towards fantasy and sci-fi. And when I was introduced to my first role-playing game, which, like most people, was Dungeons and Dragons, I uh, quickly—I mean, it just you know, took me by storm. Wow, this is great! I can—I'm already off in my head all the time, and in, in my imagination, this en enables me to. Uh, Form form that into a, a you know a little avatar your character and live in live in your imagination in this fantasy world and the first since we're talking late seventies early eighties here things like uh, Star Wars and Battlestar Galactica and I guess other two thousand and one A Space Odyssey Planet of the Apes all these these things that were part of uh, sci fi fandom at that time those space opera and other sci-fi always appealed to me more than high fantasy i just would sort of while playing D, D, was thinking man i sure wish this existed for science fiction as one of the things we had back in the 70s and 80s which i'm sure you also have fond memories of frank there are were hobby stores and you don't see this too often anymore <laughs> hobby and gaming stores and i went to one and i well just kind of casually perusing the products stumbled upon the uh, the little box set the the the, the black box for Traveler. And I immediately knew, I you know, it was like love at first sight. I said, this is the one <laughs> and, <laughs> and jumped right in. That's that's pretty much describes my start into uh, uh, role playing and, and, and finding my way to sci-fi gaming. So how did you um, end up getting involved with uh, Mongoose? What motivated you to join Mongoose? And, and can you share your story about how you got involved? I uh, dropped out of gaming for a long time when raising a family and, you know, developing a career in, uh, in Silicon Valley. And uh, then, but, but when we used to play, I think the last game we had played, we, me and my, you know, friend, my, my social group was in the 90s. We probably played Traveler the New Era. And uh, there was, as once your kids start growing up and you have a little more, uh, uh, luxury time. I, I was talking with my old buddies and I said, you know what, we should play Traveler again. And one of my friends said, it's about time. And <laughs> so I took a look at what was out there and and I stumbled into, now mind you, Mongoose uh, version two or Mongoose Traveler version two or second edition had already come out, but I stumbled into number one first. Uh, and some of their, and those books sort of imitated the the old classic traveler motif, more, you know, black covers with simple text on them. And then I quickly found, oh, it looks like uh, they've created a new, more graphical uh, version with with higher quality illustrations and, and paintings and, and more of a, a devotion to creating art. So then we stumbled into that and uh, jumped right back in, in uh, what, 2016 or so, right? Shortly after they re released the second edition. And I saw that Pirates of Dinax was coming out, and um, we just we kind of got right back into it. And it was easy to do because Mongoose has so faithfully um, created a version. I think it's very faithful to Classic Traveler and Mega Traveler, but takes it a step further with its task system and some more slightly detailed mechanics, but with a respect for the simplicity that was what made Traveler so appealing in the first place. Yeah, that's something I appreciate about the Mongoose edition is uh, it really does have the heart of uh, Classic Traveler. Yeah, yeah, the two dice six and, you know, it's, I think it's a framework it's that you can use, but it, it's kind of designed to get out of the way when you, uh, when you just want to do some pure role playing or, you know, 
you don't have to you don't have to roll dice at all to run a session of Traveler. So how did you end up getting involved with uh, Mongoose? Right. So it, I am a my my career has been in the field of technical writing, and I have also been a person who's always been interested in art. I've done some illustration. I never developed my art as well as I might have liked to, but uh, and I sort of have a sense for building a publication thanks to my job. And I saw that Mongoose, when perusing their forum, saw that they had a thing called the TAST program that, and gave you some tools to make your own materials. And I'd, by this time, I'd also discovered Drive Through RPG, which I'm sure everyone knows about. And that uh, you can, when I found out that you can sell your own products using some, some of the basic traveler graphics and materials, I, I was like, I'm in, man, I'm going to do this. I already have kind of a skills for organizing a publication. I can do this. And so I took some of the adventures that I was writing for my group and uh, uh, made them into uh, published adventures using those task materials. And then I kind of, uh, I remember the thing that really spurred me to wanting to work for them. I saw one of Matt's uh, <clears throat> uh, State of the Mongoose. Uh, releases. If you're not familiar with this, every year, uh, Matt Sprange, the the, uh, the EIC at Mongoose, puts out a big post that describes how the company's doing, how his employees are doing, and what they released and how it did, and what's coming up. And on that what's coming up list, like, I don't know, eight years ago, was the Glorious Empire. I think someone perhaps had committed to doing it, or it was... It was uh, the, the apple of Matt's eye or, you know, <laughs> just one of many projects that he talked about putting out. And I had already kind of, I had dived into Mongoose's main setting, which is Trojan Reach Sector. And I saw, I had seen the Glorious Empire. It's a little uh, splinter state in the Aslan Hyrat. And I, and I studied up on it and thought, wow, that sounds like an exciting place to role play because it's a complete uh, dystopian disaster. And I, I sure wish I could write that book instead of someone else. And so I and I so I thought, you know what, I'm gonna see if I can be that person. And so I tried to create the best drive through RPG adventure I could to really show my stuff. And I created a an adventure called Maker God, which deals with artificial intelligence and a world called Oma in the Trojan Reach. And it can it can easily be slotted into a Pirates of Dranax campaign if you so desire and so i threw some graphics together i, I hired uh uh ian stead to create the cover for me and with a with an illustration of the a starship that's featured in the adventure and it did really well and in fact it still does well which is i'm pretty proud of that it's i i put that adventure out it must have been five years ago and it's still a very high seller uh for traveler and um uh, after it did well, I, I gave it like, you know, two months of doing well. And I reached out to, to Matt in email or, or on the forums or something and said, hey, my adventure, uh, my task adventure is doing great. I think you should hire me to work on your main line. And I would like to write Glorious Empire. <laughs> <laughs> not, not presumptuous at all. No, not right? at all. And, uh, and, and I thought, well, he could, he could ignore me. He could write back and say, now we've got all the talent we want. Uh, or he could take me up on it. And uh, and I knew that uh, at the time, Martin was by far the main writer. And I thought, yeah, they need another voice. So hopefully Matt's into this idea. And he was. And he said, absolutely. But before you take on something that big, we, I think they kind of wanted to see, can you even <laughs> can you even write something smaller? Because, it, you know, it's I think it's really easy for people to get optimistic about wanting to create a publication. But it is. It's a difficult undertaking, as you well know, Frank, to yes. produce quite a few materials. So I wrote an adventure called Exodus for them, and uh, he was happy with it. So, uh, And then they needed a few naval adventures because the uh, Element Class Cruisers set had just come out, which features naval campaigns for Traveler. And so I wrote a couple of naval adventures for him. And then uh, Matt said, all right, you know, you've shown your stuff. You can do this. Uh, write Glorious Empire for us. And... I took it on, and then that's where that reality kicked in. Glorious Empire is like a, I mean, it's it's a big, it's a hardcover book, right? It's huge, and uh, it it was difficult 
to write something that big. I'd never written anything that big before. It's basically, you know, if you did the word count, it's the size of a novel. And it took me a long time. And I, I hadn't developed the skills to to handle a project like that and balancing it with my, you know, my day job and that sort of thing. But got it done and real proud of how it came out. And uh, ever since that, it, Matt has kind of turned to me with projects. And um, I've had one after another since then uh, that uh, based on what they need and what I pitched to them. That's a that's a great story. Um, so you were involved in uh, re- rewriting High Guard, is that right? Yes, one of our my more recent projects was to redo High Guard, and uh, that one it, initially it was that uh, Matt reached out to the group of writers that he has and said, "I'd like to expand crew roles, descriptions of what it is to be a pilot, an astrogator, an engineer, etc." And I said, I- "I'd like to do that," and so I volunteered and started working on that. And then little and he had been already doing these. Uh, um, re, these updates of the core books by this time. The core rule book had, had a 2021 or 2022 edition. I think it was 2022. And wanted to do it for High Guard as well. So eventually, since I had volunteered for that, he eventually came back and said, Chris, how about you just do the whole thing? And <laughs> I was I had some trepidation about that. I'm, I'm, I see myself as a story guy, not a mechanics guy. So... Going into something like High Guard was a little intimidating for me, and especially since I knew I or you know you're like looking at your crystal ball at the future when this book is out, and I know how traveler my my fellow traveler fans are. We are very uh, there are a lot of very precise people who, who will pay very close attention to what you put out, and if there's any kind of an error or an exploit, you're going to get raked over the coals for it. And and I'm I was kind of cowering in the corner thinking, oh my God, they're going to rip me to shreds with this thing. But luckily, I, I did put together a good team of people to help work on the uh, the book with me. You'll see their names as assistant naval architects in the on the, t- the table of contents page of High Guard 2022. And we worked through it all. And there was, I got a lot of great advice from them and a lot of collaboration. And it, it was, it was a stressful uh, book to create because of the fine attention to detail <clears throat> that you have to apply. But I'm pretty proud of how it came out. And, and we did not, uh, we took some risks in it too, some big mechanical changes to, to make things work in a way that we felt starships should work that perhaps had been somewhat overlooked in the past what unique mechanics or gameplay elements did you introduce to the uh to our, to traveler with this book so i guess there were many but the main thing is that you'll note that um capital ships don't work particularly well with the same rules that have been set up for smaller ships. Traveler is mostly a game of smaller ships, right? You, it, the game, you're usually in a scout ship or a free trader or a far trader. You might be in a mercenary cruiser or a lab ship, something like that. But once you start getting to the multi-thousand ton ships, they're more there for window dressing to kind of as part of the backdrop. But we redesign the mechanics so you can now run a pretty good combat session with those capital ships and part of that was beefing up armor we added a military ships option so that you could massively armor your big ships the thinking behind that was the way the mechanics stood as they stood you could pretty much knock down a a capital ship with a much smaller ship or, or even squadrons of fighters and you can still do that, but it's really hard now. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, capital ships punch hard now. Uh, and part of that, part of the way we did that, also, I mentioned the, the armor. The other thing is we added damage multiples for different weapon types to try and create a more linear scale from the various weapon types. All tra- Traveler fans know the weapon types that ships can be installed with. There's, uh, If you have a really small ship, you have a fixed mount weapon that points in one direction, and you got to point the ship that way to shoot it. Then you got turrets that can shoot in any direction. Then you got barbettes, which are basically big turrets. And then you got bay, you have three different bay weapon sizes, small, medium, and large bays. And then you have your spinal mount. And it was kind of like this huge gap between turrets and barbettes, and then boom, all the way to bays 
there's with very little space in between. So we use damage multiples, which I, I don't want to get into the details of it, but you basically figure out your damage, subtract armor, and then multiply by a set multiple. And the, it's it's not as complicated as it sounds, but it makes it so it, it, we felt, feel it's a very linear progression now from turret through spinal mount, the, the kind of damage they do. The one thing it did that changes things a little drastically is uh, we had to beef up barbettes. Barbettes really punch hard now for their size. And we tried to kind of make up for that by saying these should only be on military ships. You shouldn't be able to put one on your far trader uh, or, or something like that. Gotcha. And so, and, and having tested it now uh, and actually run a few games that involve reasonably big ships, I think it works uh, as expected. Um, and, and you can have a fun naval battle, which the game really wasn't set up for in the past. And uh, I'm hoping that it gets used in that manner for the eventual Fifth Frontier War uh, setting that they're planning on releasing. I hope to see that set of uh, books and adventures use the damage multiple mechanic to, uh, to help uh, players and referees conduct big old naval battles against uh, between the Imperium, Jodani, Sword Worlds, and Varger. Awesome. So the High Guard is also includes uh, rules on uh, designing ships. Were there any, um, were there any mechanics or th or or issues from uh, the previous version of High Guard that you fixed uh, in the as far as designing ships is concerned? Quite. Yeah, quite a few. The damage multiples is one of the ones that's uh, incorporated in there. Um, we we changed a lot of rules. We uh, one thing that didn't seem to work quite right were the ship configurations. Um, you know, you one of the dating back to classic traveler. The, one of the first things you do when designing a ship is you kind of pick its its basic shape. Things like uh, uh, a wedge, right? A scout ship is a wedge. Um, uh, you you pick whether it's a or a sphere or a close structure or a dispersed structure. You know, dispersed structure implying that it's kind of like a bunch of modules linked together. Uh, with like a and so a streamlined ship like a wedge could could do atmospheric reentry, but if you tried to do that with a dispersed structure, your ship would tear apart into little pieces. Right, it would be like trying to land and, the space station. The International Space Station. You're exactly, right. yeah. That that thing will burn up like uh, like toast, and uh, so we the we changed some of the modifiers to to incentivize like designers in either direction. You know, you there's a reason you should pick a close structure, and the the previous multipliers were, in our opinion, a little uh, disconnected with that. So we we modified them to to provide appropriate incentives and disincentives to picking your configuration. Um, and then we changed uh, a lot of there, some of the, you know, and this is no mark on previous writers ha having written books. I know how hard it is to get the language precise and not cause confusion. We tried to clean up anywhere where there was confusion with rules. And sometimes I, I get it. Like I'll, I got a lot of feedback on it. You know, what, what's confusing and, and, and throughout the book and, where's the language need to be modified so that you aren't confused and we fixed most of those sometimes i realize you know what it's the spirit people under, you need to understand the spirit of the rules too if you have a, a designer who's just looking for exploits well exploits are going to be findable you, you know you, they're, they're always going to be there but designers should be it, it, they're not helping their game if they're looking for exploits right you you want to play within within the rules, but also recognize just because you found a way to create an impervious ship doesn't mean you should. <laughs> you want to tell a good story. So I fixed some stuff and some stuff I left as is. So let's talk about um, one of your other current projects. Let's talk about the uh, Traveler Far Trader graphic novel. So, yeah, yeah. I'm very <laughs> excited to talk about that. Yeah, so that's, this is a... <clears throat> I'm sorry, did you... You go ahead. No, go on. I, well, I was going to say this is a kind of a departure from your traditional RPG supplements. So how did you approach the process of adapting the Traveler universe into a visual medium? And what was your collaboration with the artist like? Yeah, it's... I, I'm excited to talk about that. So uh, out of the blue, like uh, Matt will reach out to this his, his little uh, core cadre of writers from time to time with a little side project and he popped in 
it must have been over a year ago, uh, where and say, are any of you interested in writing a graphic novel? And I jumped on that so fast that like I wanted to like uh, rest it free from the grip of any of the other writers. <laughs> Not that if if Martin and Gear want to write graphic novels, they can. But I was so eager to to have it. I was like a golem from Lord of the Rings. This this is mine, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and jumped on it to uh, and said, I I want to do this. And Matt was like, great, okay, well, it, let's put you in touch with uh, uh, Harry Marcos of Marcosia Publishing. It's a British comic book company. And um, uh, we'll, we'll figure it all out. And so I quickly started outlining a story that I wanted to tell. And um, and Matt connected us with, uh, well, initially, Harry had some artists in mind, but uh, to their credit, uh, Matt and, and Cassie, mostly uh, one of his main editors at Mongoose, uh, had very particular ideas about how the art should look. And they didn't want uh, traditional line art. They wanted it to kind of look like the interior of a traveler book. So they, uh, they recruited uh, Xavier Bernard, a French artist whose art appears in many traveler books. Uh, uh, he did a lot of work in the mercenary set. And you'll see, but you'll see his work all over the place in the books. If you look in the credits of your various traveler products, you'll see his name appear. So uh, I worked with uh, uh, Xavier, uh, communicating with him over email. Uh, he's he's more comfortable than that than than Zoom because he's he's uh, self conscious about his English. <laughs> so uh, we we did it that way. And he had never done a graphic novel before, but. Uh, I'm very familiar with the medium. I've been reading comics since I was like six years old. So, and I've read a lot of books about it, such as Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics and uh, Making Comics the Marvel Way. DC put out a great series of books on how to make comics before. So, I'm not not saying I'm in an expert by any stretch, but I I've at least done the I've, I've uh, done the legwork to understand hopefully what it means to create a graphical story. And so I worked closely with him to. Uh, to look at the script and and we went uh, page by page uh, through the story and uh to his credit he gets it like i mean he does a lot of the stuff that you have to train a comic book artist for years to get them to eliminate certain tendencies and errors in their work um and he uh, xavier hopped into it uh like a fish to water so the first story we did is called uh, traveler far trader and my approach to these graphic novels with Marcosia has been, let's kind of start with a ship as the basis for the story. Travelers' starships are so iconic. Uh, the far trader, the uh, the free trader, the scout ship, uh, the safari ship, the lab ship, etc. like you know we talked about earlier. I feel like they are a great starting point, a, a thematic starting point. So and and the to me, the tramp trader, uh, campaign is the bread and butter of Traveler. Um, so I want to start with that. Created a crew that's operating a far trader in Aramis subsector, and they've got an objective. They've got a. Uh, I'm not going to spoil the story too much, but they've got a tough uh, job of kind of going across a dangerous area of space and uh, carrying a cargo to to a world where. Let's see, how can I do this without spoilers? It will have a great effect. Uh, the cargo that they bring to this world will affect the well-being and the society of the world to which they bring it. And so that's kind of central to the story. And what I was thinking about was how could a comic story uh, tie in with a role-playing game story? So one of the things I've noticed in a role-playing game session is players will do down and dirty stuff to pay their mortgage, right? To pay their ship mortgage or to, to make some credits. It, they'll do stuff that you wouldn't do in real life uh, because they're living vicariously through their characters. <laughs> and uh, it's it's actually been a thematic thing with Traveler Forever is like, you, you know, you'll do what you got to do to to make money and get by. And, but I started thinking about that compared with, you know, our literature and and popular media like star wars you know uh there's there's the part where let's let's look at star wars for example han solo he he just wants to get paid right in the first in in a new hope 
And then he at the there's that great scene right before the Battle of Yavin where he says, yeah, I'm going to leave, kid. You should come with me. You're, you know, you're good in a fight. And, you know, looks like, no, I'm, you know, we've got to fight. We're the rebellion. we got to fight. And he says, now I'm going to take my money and leave. So in Traveler, in a game session, maybe Han just leaves and <laughs> never comes <laughs> back, right? But in, in a good narrative, he's got to come back. You know, you, you, you've got to do the right thing. And so this this comic book, story, the, the first uh, graphic novel that it's which I should I should uh, I should have mentioned it is a four issue miniseries that will be combined into a 96 page graphic novel deals with a set of characters that are kind of facing those decisions like you face in the game I got to pay a mortgage you know I got to do what I got to do to keep flying and and uh, but it's also a narrative and so if you read a graphic novel narrative and the characters are scumbag opportunists and mercenaries I don't know if that if that really works. So when we combine those two narrative types, what kind of story shall we see? That's what you'll see play out before you in the first, uh, the first graphic novel. Wow. Sounds awesome. I can't wait to, uh, to check it out. Yeah. Oh, and I should mention it each issue. Uh, so it's being released as four individual issues before being combined into a graphic novel. Each issue has exclusive gaming content in the back of or after the story of that issue so <clears throat> the first issue deals with uh, and uh there there is a this will hint to what is it appears in the story there is a design for a varger corsair ship in the back along with descriptions of the varger corsair groups of the uh, of, of aramis subsector and uh, or one in particular some weapons and an npc profile the second issue has a space station. Basically, it's a starport. And eventually, toward, as we get to the last issue, we're going to outline the the uh, the main character ship, their far trader, and it's it's a unique one, right? It's not just an out of you know everyone's familiar with the standard layout of uh, the Beowulf class type ship. Uh, th theirs is a little different. It's got some unique aspects to it. So and, and all the the characters are described as NPCs, so you can encounter these people as NPCs, the, the main characters of the story, in your own campaign if you were, if you're running in the Spinwood Marches, or transport them anywhere else for that matter. And you could see their ship, or even make that that ship could be your ship. I don't know. But the idea is we wanted to make sure that the graphic novel also appeals to uh, the gaming community and that they get something special. They get to read a story about their their favorite game in, in, in the traditional setting, Spinward Marches, but also they get um, some materials they can actually use in their games in the back. Love that tie-in. That's awesome. Great idea. I wish I'd thought of it. it they, uh, Harry, the publisher, said, and can you produce you know, six to eight pages per issue? And I thought that was a great idea. I, I, wish, I wish I had thought of that, but absolutely I can. So we've been doing that as well. Yeah, that's awesome. What a creative, uh, great uh, endeavor and uh, sounds really fun. I can't wait to uh, check it out. So let's talk about your uh... yeah, first issue is done. So it's uh, it should be coming soon. I'll, I'll give you more info once I know. Fantastic. Uh, we'll um, if it's coming. Oh, well, we'll uh, we'll tag this video down, down the line whenever it comes out with uh, how to get that. So that's awesome. Yeah, and I'll give you promo art so you can you know if you want to put, show that as well. That'd be great. That'd be great. So let's talk about your uh, other current pro or future projects that's been uh, sitting on the mm -hmm. back burner. You have a um, new campaign coming out? Yeah. Uh, so it's got a working title, Singularity, and that will probably tip people's hand, uh, tip the hand that it's about artificial intelligence, As, or at least that's an aspect of the story. Yeah, I was going to say, can you tell us a little without uh, giving away spoilers? Yeah, um, it's it's tricky because I don't want to to blow but this is it's, it's a big campaign it's pirates of Drenak size campaign or deep night revelation size campaign maybe a little less than that uh, martin has you going on a 20-year voyage across the galaxy and that uh, and, and that extremely epic campaign this is i'd say more like maybe right in between pirates and deep night in, in its breadth and uh and coverage it it, it is centered in core sector uh which those of you who are purchasing Mongoose products know that we've put out Third Imperium, a book that kind of gives you the, a, an outline of the history and uh, what the Third Imperium setting is all about, but also provides you a playable sector, core sector, which is a vastly different place than the Spinward Marches. 
been where marches is the frontier um so your your adventures are kind of more wild something like firefly with, or star wars could could be uh well maybe more firefly sort of the alien series i don't know stuff like that would could be played better in the spin marches setting the core the core sector is more settled right there's many more billions of people there older societies higher tech on most worlds uh, more like dune or foundation or or Coruscant on Star Wars. So it starts there and deals with, it, it is a campaign in three acts. And the first act introduces you to the setting and deals with, or has the, uh, has the players serving as the crew of a subsidized luxury liner. And then it proceeds to, you find, well, that in itself <clears throat> is a series of adventures and uh, a trope that I don't think has really been covered in that much detail in the past. You know, you've got the Tramp Trader type campaign. This this would be one of the other main ships in Traveler is the liner. People may be familiar with how it looks and, and the design, but it hasn't really been explored as a campaign type. So I've tried to, to convey that. And then it takes a wild turn involving the central I guess you could say character that is an artificial intelligence and you become involved in a, uh, a galaxy spanning adventure uh, that, uh, that take that delves into some areas that traveler has not really in science fiction that traveler hasn't really touched on that much in the past, such as transhumanism, uh, robotics, clones, uh, androids it deals with stuff that uh, is uh, hasn't been touched on for many reasons um, in Traveler. One of them is that Traveler is kind of the, the Traveler core setting is based uh, largely on the science fiction of the 40s through 70s, in which you know individual biological beings are making the decisions. We we have a lot of characters have a lot of agency and independence to to operate in this environment as we've as science fiction has progressed we've explored these the concepts of consciousness and artificial intelligence robotic do biologicals even have much of a place in in a future society and so this this tries to marry the two this this campaign where you you've got a setting that has a, a big fear of artificial intelligence automatons of various types with that traditional biological adventurer, and um, it it uh, I I can't really describe in too much more because I know players are listening in addition to in addition to referees, but it reaches an epic scale, and the characters ultimately have to make a big decision about what they want to do with the power and knowledge they have obtained. Do they they do they feel that they could use it for good, or do they feel that they would be releasing some kind of disaster? with their decisions. And uh, so it, it's epic in scope and has the potential to really affect your 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 traveler setting if you so desire. I don't know. I, 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 I'm, I'm uh, afraid to say too much, mm. but uh, I think people are going to like it. And, it, and it's, it's a pretty big departure from previous traveler material, but also it touches on a lot of, of the themes the game has always explored. What was your uh, creative process like when developing the setting, and what what challenges did you face? Well, uh, I mean, I read a lot of sci-fi, and I've been really inspired by the work of uh, of several authors, and chief among them would be uh, Ian M. Banks and um, Alistair Reynolds, and uh, more recently Adrian Tchaikovsky, and, and and several others as well. But these these Three in particular come to mind because I've read them the past few years, and uh, they all address transhumanism and artificial intelligence in creative ways in their narratives. And I, I found it very inspiring, and and uh, would love to kind of touch upon those issues in the traditional travel universe without breaking it. <laughs> uh, and so that that was the challenge that. Uh, <clears throat> that I was facing when when putting the story together, and I pitched it to to Matt, and I I thought he's going to think I'm insane because it's <laughs> it's a pretty wild story, but uh, he was very behind it. And then we he said let's uh, let's talk about this concept with Mark Miller and some of the uh, the the inner circle people people who've been kind of overseeing traveler content for for years, and 
brought it to them and, and Mark was very supportive and, and suggested using various uh, Traveler 5 mechanics to, to uh, enhance the story. And so, and gave me a lot of great guidance and, uh, and we've gone through a couple rounds of discussions about it. He's, he's, he knows kind of the story that we're trying to tell and, and enable the players to participate in. And, and uh, I think we've, we've got it head in a pretty good direction. Yeah, I wish I could say more, but I don't. I just don't want to spoil. Yeah, no, no spoilers. I, I really, I'm right on the tip of my tongue. There's a key mechanic uh, in it. I, I just so I'll just say this: you you will never see the Imperial Express Boat Network quite the same after you participate in this campaign. It plays a very central and special role in the story, and uh, I look forward to seeing. Uh, seeing the reactions and hopefully the great experiences people have with, uh, with our take on it. Fantastic. I can't wait. Um, <laughs> so as the uh, gaming industry continues to evolve, um, how do you envision the future of Traveler and your role in it? Well, um, I mean, I'm sure you know about the open gaming license thing that's come to light, especially after the controversy that was introduced by, um, what Hasbro Wizards of the Coast with Dungeons and Dragons and Mongoose has quickly jumped on to say they're going to support an OGL for Traveler version two. And I think that's great. I think you, you make your game much richer by getting more voices involved in it. So I'm pretty excited to see what people come up with. And I hope, uh, I hope Mongoose provides people good, of a good toolkit to, uh, produce their materials. If you take a look at what's available on drive through RPG and what I don't recall the name of it, but there's like a Dungeons and Dragons specific drive through RPG. I'm sure people know its name, but it's slipped my mind. Some of the materials are they're in they they look no different from those published by the actual company. <laughs> the the level of professionalism that's gone into their design and creation is just blows my mind. And uh, that's what I hope to see. I, 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 you know, usable gaming materials of any type are great, but high production values by independent developers, I find really exciting when people find a way to kind of, you know, really take advantage of the tools for desktop publishing that are available and graphics generation and, and to produce some really high quality materials for people to use. How have player preferences and expectations influenced the direction of your product development and your approach to creating new content? So I'm a big, I referee and play this game a lot. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so, um, I kind of get it. I, I, I'm always out there sort of, you could say in the lab, um, experiencing what people like and don't like. And, um, as a player, I, I, uh, have discovered that I just like to be part of a great story and have a chance to, for my character to be like, you know, a character in a in a sci-fi novel or movie that I've seen, get to have those great lines that that they say, have a bunch of laughs with friends. For me, it's it's does the narrative look like it'll click with people, and will they enjoy? Will they come away from it going, "That was super fun," and I'll always remember participating in that adventure or that campaign. So it, that that's the for me that's the main. It's it's really just about the story. Is is it going to be fun? Um, now, as a referee, I think you, I, it, I probably, even though 95% of my time with Traveler has been as a referee, I think probably my players uh, feel that I torture them. And, that, and that's because I love a good narrative. And I've never found narratives where players don't struggle to be very entertaining. So I put them through their paces. And uh, I make things difficult. And I want them to, I, I feel like if it's easy, then it, then it won't be very satisfying. Um, on the other hand, when I'm a player, I find I don't care. I just want to win. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just want to come. <laughs> so marrying those two and remembering when as a player, remembering, hey, I, I, I don't want a, an unengaging narrative where I don't feel challenged. But as a referee, remembering, all right, take it easy. Yes, you want to tell a good story, but at the same time, remember, this is not just a novel or a movie. It's, it's a game. Mm -hmm. A game is a little different, right? It's, it's social. And it's when we're playing, I mean, you know, one of the things we'll always joke about is 
there's actually more entertain. You know, we're we're a two dice six game, right? There's often more entertainment when you roll snake eyes than there is when you roll box cars. Uh, the the laughter at the failure on a roll will be uh, is sometimes more enjoyable than a great success. But anyway, on getting back to your point, you gotta consider both perspectives when designing a product. It's gotta be fun, but it should also make people come away feeling like they participated in a really engaging and um, exciting narrative, one that they'll remember that they participated in. That's a good point. Um, the thing about uh, you know failing um, on rolls, you know, sometimes uh, people take that to mean oh, it's a critical failure and like a gun explodes in your face. But no, 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 no. It should be more like you know the gun slips out of your hand and goes ting 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 down the stairs or something. You know, um, <laughs> okay, it's still around. That shouldn't be so. But you know, <laughs> exactly. nobody, nobody, my face didn't explode. And, uh, you know, exactly. I, I can go get it if I want to put the effort into it, but I really need to keep moving forward. So you kind of put a twist. It, it doesn't blow up in your face, but it blows up in the plot, I guess. Is yeah, what I'm trying yeah, to say. exactly. It, it's yeah, it needn't be embarrassing or humiliating when you roll a, a two. Um, I think of a time when uh, we're running Pirates of Dranax and there was a part in the uh, in the adventure that's called the treasure ship. And I won't drop any spoilers here. But there was a scene where one of the characters had a weapon that you'll find in your uh, central supply catalog book called the Piston Fist. It's this armored fit uh, uh, weapon that you put on your hand and you could, you know, pretty much punch like you know, like the Hulk with, <laughs> with this thing. You can really deck someone. And one of the characters went uh, through the sh through uh, a sort of a boarding action scene and was trying to punch out this uh, one of their enemies and he he kept rolling twos and that could have been like you break your piston fist or you know you punch your own self in the face uh, you know something you know humiliating and no i said you hit the wall and you right next to his head and you you know you put this huge dent in the wall and it and ultimately, it had the same effect. It terrified the NPC. You just didn't get to knock all his teeth out. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, you can get the same effect. <laughs> yeah, you, you didn't succeed at doing what you were you know, trying to do. But let's face it, someone coming at you with a weapon like this is going to be frightening. And, and it, I felt like it, that was a nice way for him not to feel humiliated for what the dice did to him, but just kind of see it as part of the story. That's the way it went. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, well, how could I do that if my dex is so high? Well, your hands are sweaty. You know something. I don't know. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I've noticed uh, there's a big influx uh, of new players joining the Traveler uh, community. What advice would you uh, give to those who are just getting started? Keep on recruiting and try and get people involved that maybe aren't the norm for, for the game. One of the big things that Mongoose is trying to do is you know, we recognize that we've got the a certain demographic very well equipped and accounted for. It would be nice if we got more uh, women playing the game and more be more people from other uh, uh, maybe very from various ethnicities and from different uh, like the LGBTQ plus community. We make don't it's it's easy to make a game that. Is exclusive and shuts out people. And you kind of when you're when we when we design these products, we've really at Mongoose have really made an effort to try to be inclusive. And if we're not succeeding at that, we hope to hear feedback from fans that are saying, you know, it doesn't feel inviting to me. And because my next question will be, how can we make it more inviting for you? I'd like to see more people playing, and and not just those of us who who already are playing it, but uh, but everyone else as well, because. Uh, it's it, i think it's a really fun activity and it brings people together a lot of laughs a lot of a lot, it's just a great way to spend your time I, I'm, I'm sure you and i agree on that frank um yes yeah i'd like to see and, uh, uh, more people playing and more people learning about the game and uh uh you know hey, what what's the worst that can happen you have more people to play with i mean yeah exactly so to to tie down back to your original question i my recommendation would be Reach out and take some risks. Get some people involved that you normally wouldn't expect to be involved in the game. And then make that game appealing to them. Don't just run the one that's, you know, that's appealing to us old grogs. Find a way to make it interesting for everyone. And uh, 
I mean, there's a lot of narratives out there that you could run and you'd be surprised how fun uh, many of them would be for, for all involved. Are there any aspects of the travel universe that you uh, feel have yet to be fully explored or developed and um, that you'd like to see expanded upon? So I, I, you know, I work primarily on the traditional setting. I'm a total devotee to it. Um, I really love that people homebrew their own games too. I'm sure it's, I think homebrew is probably half or more of, of uh, traveler players, but uh, I love the traditional setting. And one thing I would really like to see is a campaign on the level of a, you know, again, a Pirates or Drenax to me is always the model to shoot for that features strictly aliens um, and uh, or an alien species, a perhaps a Varger campaign set in the Varger extents or an Aslan campaign set in the higher end. I think those those two species come to mind first because they're very accessible and easy to play. It's not some of the other species are more challenging, not that you couldn't do it, but it would be it would be more difficult and would appeal to a smaller audience. Those two are, you know, they're they're basically uh, wolves and lions, uh, even though they would they would dispute that if you told them that that's what they resemble. But uh, I, I think a, a campaign which gets players to take the role where everyone is playing a member of this species and, and in that setting could be pretty fun. It would really challenge people's role playing skills, and uh, I'd like to see something like that done eventually. No, oh, that would be cool. Uh, like, uh, uh, I'm thinking about like a Hiver adventure where you're hired by Hivers to go do Hiver things. And that's how you learn about the Hivers. Yeah. And the, you know, manipulation is the key aspect of the Hiver culture. So how is that role played? And, uh, uh, and how would you all do that? What if you're all Hivers and you're all trying to manipulate each other? How does that work as, as a part of their society? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could, That would be another one that could be very fun. When, and the thing about, and since you mentioned the Hivers, they're, they're a federation uh, and there are a bunch of other uh, alien species living within that federation. The Hivers aren't necessarily the majority, but they are the movers and the controllers of it. So that could be it. to be a manipulated person and recognize, yeah, I, I know these guys are pulling my marionette strings, but uh, I have my role in this society, too. Right. Yeah. It'd be interesting. Um, mm -hmm. So let's uh, talk about some current events. Um, what's your, what are your thoughts on a uh, virtual tabletop? Have you tried it out? Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we, my group, uh, we're mostly local in the San Francisco Bay area, but we've got players. We got a player in Pennsylvania. We've got a player in Wisconsin. And sometimes I play with a guy in Colorado. So we're uh we use Zoom or or another um, another video type uh, uh, software to to see each other and to communicate over that. Uh, and we we I don't usually use a VTT uh, system, but I I think they're awesome. And I would and I understand that oh, Foundry has some great ones for Traveler. I haven't I haven't put them to use, but. Um, I've, I've seen them demonstrated. Mm, uh, Fantasy fantastic. Grounds, too, has a, a lot of traveler support. Oh, I'm sorry. Fantasy Grounds. Mm. Thank you. You corrected me. It's not Foundry. Okay. Uh, Fantasy Grounds, yes. Yeah, they, they're like the contracted uh, agency to do that. So I, I apologize to them for misspeaking. Um, the, Although uh, Foundry also has great one, support, too. Okay. All mm. right. Good, good. And the, the one I've used is uh, Roll20, mm -hmm. and uh, we put it to, to great use recently for a, uh, for a Pirates or Janax uh, adventure because uh, so Traveler Space Combat is really good when you have it just uh, one ship versus another ship or maybe two ships versus one. Once you start expanding it to be a couple of small fleets, it gets really unwieldy. And me and my gaming group collaborated with using, uh, using Roll20 to create a map it was more like um, if and some folks maybe may remember Brilliant Lances, a game that was designed in the TNE era of Traveler. And it was pretty good Traveler space combat, but it, it's very time consuming. Uh, each round takes a long time. And, and it, it was the same for us, but we kind of took uh, Traveler space combat and used it as the backbone of our game. But uh, the VTT 
tabletop enabled us to you know, show the whole thing. We had a planet, or, or it was, the planet was Drenax, and, and one side was assaulting it, and one side was defending it. And you, so there was probably 20 ships involved in this battle, uh, somewhere between 15 and 20 ships. And it would not have been possible without a virtual tabletop, and it came out fantastic. Uh, I kind of would like to put, to put it together with some uh, some optional rules to add to your space combat sessions uh, and publish it maybe as an addendum to High Guard or something like that. So yeah, we we use VTT when when it's suitable. Uh, sometimes when a dungeon crawl type adventure happens, like you're you know you're going through a deck plan or something, it's nice to drop down. Uh, VTD uh, deck plan for people to move through, you know, get your little character icons and move through there, that sort of thing. So, yeah, we put it to use. It's not the main uh, tool. Most most of our adventures are theater of the mind, but, uh, but it, it's a nice tool to have. How do you handle, uh, when you're doing your Zoom uh, games, how do you handle dice rolling? Is it just honor system? <clears throat> no, it's uh, sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll let them. Uh, if if people are more comfortable using their analog dice, go for it. But I I use Discord, and we apply one of the die rollers to it, and uh, I I make uh, most of my die rolls on that so that they can't claim that the referee is working against them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the um, uh, you know of course you have your secret die rolls. As yeah, well. right. Of but, course. But uh, yeah, you, they can't know everything that's going on. Right. Right. But. Um, uh, yeah, a combination of the two. If people like their their plastic dice, by all means, roll them. You know, it's I trust them. And if they're not, if anyone would is cheating, well, I mean, you're kind of just cheating yourself because you're if you if you win all the time, you're not going to be as entertained as if you just really let the random aspect of it mm -hmm. <laughs> take its uh, take its toll. Right. Yeah. Good point. So uh, let's talk about um, AI, the rise of AI. Do you have any um? Mm -hmm. Do you have any opinions about AI or in either in the real world or mm -hmm. um, uh, or within the realm of traveler? Like, um, would it be cool to play an AI character or, uh, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know the big thing that's you know everyone's talking about these days was in, sort of uh, uh, instigated by chat GPT, which I have found to be a very useful tool for some things. Like if I want to know how to do something that's fairly complex, I just formulate a question and ask and get a really nice little user guide sent to me mm -hmm. by, by by its engine. Uh, it's, have you used it uh, for something like uh, that? Yeah, I, um, I feed it. Well, I, I've been using a program called uh, Inspiration Pad. And, and before that, I just, since I'm a programmer, I put a bunch of ideas into like a randomizer and then I have it spit out stuff, Mad Lib style. And then I curate that and I go, Oh, that's a good combination. Um, and then I'll take that and, you know, write that out or, you know, develop that idea. Um, and I think chat GPT is like a supercharged version of that. Um, so I, I can see some applications for it, but, um, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be, well, at least not in its current phase, uh, able to uh, like replace a GM. No, probably not. I I've gotten it to not simulate a, like a pick your own adventure, kind of like text. I made a Zork game, kind of a, a traveler themed Zork game. Uh, okay. That was kind of uh -huh. cool, but uh, it it fizzled out pretty fast and ran out of ideas. So uh, I will revisit that, nice. but um, it's it doesn't go very it can't it can't sustain the gm yeah there was a, a big deal recently about uh people who make submissions to magazines like uh you know asimov it's in the old science fiction anthology mm -hmm. magazine and people having chat gpt write a sci-fi story but i think the consensus has been that it doesn't do a very good job of writing a compelling narrative yet uh maybe at some point uh, I see it as, as have, a uh, useful tool, not an autonomous thing. Yes. Yeah. And people are trying to use it as an autonomous. Um, as far as AI and a game, I, I think that the uh, possibilities are endless. It's, it's all over the place in culture and science fiction right now. In fact, I, you know, I kind of, I use Goodreads to keep track of all the books that I read. Mm -hmm. and, and the first three books I read this year all dealt with artificial intelligence. And those were uh, 
Version by Alistair Reynolds, Children of Memory by Tchaikovsky, and The, the Mountain in the Sea, um, which is uh, a book by, his name's Ray Naylor, and I really recommend it. It has to do with uh, octopuses in sort of a near future, somewhat dystopian world. I, I mean, I'll say no more. AI takes a, an exploration of artificial intelligence is a big aspect of the story. And all three of those novels and you know, so many more, it's, it's just such a big topic right now that are coming out, really make you think about the concept. Um, and I, I re highly recommend just going back to uh, Ian Banks, The Culture, too. He, he, way ahead of his time, explored artificial intelligence, what it what it mean what it would mean for biologicals to be interacting with it one of his stories called uh, look to windward one part of that story is there's a composer who's creating this uh a symphony and he uh and he ends up in a conversation with an ai that runs an entire like world and he says why am i even bothering creating this thing when you could do it just as well and you could do it in a, in a nanosecond and it, it kind of the ai kind of relates Nothing that I could do would contain your experience that brought you to this point where you were able to create this symphony. It's, it isn't how fast or how well I could do it. It's who it came from and what it means. At least that was my interpretation of it. So, uh, I mean, there's just so many topics. And as far as playing an AI, why not, right? I think a lot of people love the idea of playing a robot or something like that. One thing that one idea I really like for Traveler and for science fiction is the idea which uh, Gear, uh, Lannis Cog, the writer of the Robot Handbook, made possible for us is a ship's avatar. What if an artificial intelligence is running your starship and then you want to go planet side? Well, if you're if you're playing the ship's artificial intelligence, you're like, oh, great. OK, go, go have fun down there, guys. I'll stay in orbit up here. Oh, uh, uh, have your your 3D printer builds you a body and your the personality of the ship goes down to the planet or a copy thereof and becomes a character in the story. It's some of the stuff is a little uncomfortable for some of uh, some players, some of us to adapt to, but I think it's pretty rich role playing territory if you want to really dive into it. Very interesting. Um yeah, kind of like uh, it's kind of like altered carbon, but with uh, synthetics instead of humans, yeah. like slipping their body. Yes, yeah. I mean, uh, a lot of uh, authors have tackled this stuff, and I mean, there was um, oh, what's his name? Hamilton is his last name. I can't think of the uh, Pandora Star was the first in a series of books. In in the, and in this universe, there basically is no death because you can you can constantly have your consciousness re. Uh, downloaded to a new body mm -hmm. um, but then there are philosophical questions with that right like okay that's a copy of you is it really you though uh sure it's all your experiences digitized but it isn't really you even if that consciousness is aware of everything you've ever experienced in you know potentially centuries of life um, I don't know, it gets into some interesting ideas and as, as far as applying them to a role-playing game i i don't see why not it just depends on how far you want to take it. If you want to keep it traditional, you know, my character, you know, served four terms in the military and now he's a mercenary or, you know, he's, a, or he's in the merchants and runs a far trade. That's great. Those, those adventures are totally fun. But if you want to push the envelope a bit, transhumanism, art, artificial intelligence and other, uh, other aspects are there for you. And they make for, in my opinion, very interesting uh, role playing game material. Awesome. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's, it's stuff that, uh, is, is becoming more mainstream, but you know, that now that I was thinking about it, um, I read a William Gibson story a while back called, um, Idoru that was about an AI, um, pop star. Uh -huh, okay. And, uh, that's, I think my, the maybe, oh, on the course Neuromancer that, that had an AI in it. I read Neuromancer right. many years ago. I'd have to reread it to remember a single thing. Yeah, I was but, trying to like uh, yeah, fish yeah. back for like when uh, any any books that I read that had uh, AI characters in them. Yeah. yeah, I remember reading about Eudoro, but I have not read it. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty good. Can you share any memorable experiences or stories from uh, your personal travel or RPG sessions that have inspired or influenced the projects you've worked on? <clears throat> for me, the most ambitious. Uh, a campaign I ever did was a, tra a Traveler of the New Era mercenary campaign. 
I can't believe how into that we were. We were in our, me and my group were in our 20s. And I was actually, it, I was on my way out of role-playing games then because I had, a, I had a, a, my daughter was born by then. And you quickly realize this, you, you got to, <laughs> you got to focus on your family. You can't have all these hobbies. But um, we, when we were running this thing, the level of detail and effort we put into it wasn't just me too, right? I'm the referee of this this thing and I'm designing mercenary tickets for them. The players in my group were spending time, you know, during the week talking with each other about strategy and building their mercenary company and what they, you know, like like really diving into it pretty deeply spreadsheets uh you know back it was microsoft excel only i'm sure at that time uh to keep track of their finances it was it was an amazingly in-depth thing that we still talk about to this day i tried to uh replicate it with the the new mercenary rules and i found almost that you kind of like you know you can't go home um we lived that we did it it was a lot of fun but uh i, I wasn't able to replicate that same feeling that we did back when we first ran this in-depth mercenary campaign. For me, that would be one that goes down uh, in, in memory. Uh, we're having a lot of fun with the the, uh, the current incarnation of the game, but um, I don't know, I, I guess when I think of something like, like you asked, I, I go back more in time to, to long ago when, when playing this game at, uh, when I was younger. You're going, wait a minute, this is like a job simulator. Yeah, it, that's, you know, it's kind of funny. Uh, some players really love that. Uh, and I, you shall go unnamed uh, uh, players from my various groups, but I've got a couple of people that I've played with that um, get so excited when the trade tables come out or when uh, putting together a spreadsheet to uh, keep track of all our business functions in the game. They, they, they love that business simulation aspect of it. Um, and others are like, oh, please, I do this all week. I, you know, I don't want to do it in my gaming as well. <laughs> One of my players is uh, bankrolling the uh, adventure, uh, and he keeps um, giving advances to the other players, and he's like ridiculously <laughs> keeps track of who owes him. Remember, I bought you that uh, combat suit, and then a gun, and some ammo, and then I got you uh, that milkshake on Cyrus Three. I mean, it's like. <laughs> He's got like a running total of everything. All the case, like a Shylock. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm sure that's very appreciated by the other players in the group. You know, it, on the on the positive side, uh, one of the one of these two shall not be named players. He's very uh, shy about the role playing aspect of the game. I think he feels silly when diving into a role. Um, and trying to do the voice or whatever. And, and most, I think most gamers probably don't get into it like they're doing an improv session or, or uh, you know, uh, local theater. They, they just kind of tell your line and, and enjoy it that way and then let the theater or the mind uh, add color to it. But some of us really get into, you know, the, the accent of the character or the, the behavior and, and play the role. Um, I know you do, Frank. I've seen it in action. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this particular player is very shy about that. But when you just let him cut loose with the spreadsheets, suddenly I found because he felt so invested, he started role playing more. And you know, you don't call it out like, "Ha ha, caught you! You're role playing now," uh, because then you know the poor guy will shy back to his corner. Right. But uh, the rest of us, when the game session is over, is like, "Ah, oh, you know, he's really getting into it now." And 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 it's because of that. The, the gateway drug of the thing that he can relate to the spreadsheets, the business simulation. Right. So whatever it takes to get people to dive in and immerse themselves in, in the narrative is, is fine. For me, it's not so much. Uh, I don't want to play uh, Frank in the travel universe. I want to play whatever my character is. And so, you know, I'll go, yeah, what's, what's annoying about this person. What's fun about this person. What is a habit that they have that, other people might think is weird or like what, you know, I try to try to make my character pop or like have a little bit of um, three dimensionality to it. Um, so that I always know like what given any kind of situation, what the, what he's going to do. Oh, he's a prude in that respect or, Oh, he likes that thing. So he's going to indulge in it or whatever. And uh, I kind of always want to go back to, I don't want to just make it up as I go. I kind of want to have my characters, 
doing this response based on how he's always been. And sure, characters are going to change over time. And at the end of this year or when a year from now, when we look back on my on our characters, my character will have changed. But right now, he's uh, doing all the things that establish his characters so that other people know what to expect from him, I guess, is what I'm... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I find it, it takes me time to find my character's voice. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I try to settle into that. I'm, I never have it clearly in mind when I start. So yeah, I no. think they, they all are, they're all Chris at the start right. and then hopefully they become someone else over time. Right. Um, if you, you know, I always go back to Star Trek cause I'm, I'm a big, I like Star Wars too, but uh, you know, I love Star Trek. And uh, if you, if you look at like uh, encounter at far point, which is like the first um, new generation, it, everybody was very stiff and weird and kind of not knowing, you know, they're trying to as their first time as that character. Um, but, if you yeah. check again in a year or two years later, they ha- that character is well established and uh, they nail it every time, um, and they never yeah, do anything that, that's unexpected that for that character. Right. Well, and that, that's that's another trap, right? You want to make sure this character has room for growth mm-hmm. um, instead of becoming a trope or a stereotype. Right. Um, which. Star Trek has done a pretty good job of that, both in the original and next generation. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. So a question I wanted to ask you earlier was how how do you balance staying true to the core elements of traveler while, while adapting to the uh, changing landscape of the gaming industry and player expectations? Right. Yeah. Well, a good friend uh, that you and I share in common uh, gave me some great advice on that. He said, start with what story you want to tell. Because he could tell that I was scatterbrained on high guard and like where, you know, I'm, I was overwhelmed. And it was great advice because I, I thought, okay, the main purpose of high guard is to uh, kind of expand travelers' starship capabilities to big ships and then more detailed ship options. And uh, so if we're going to talk big ships, what's the combat look like? What's it, what's it supposed to be? Because right now the rules have it in this if you sim if running it through simulations it was this long hacking away battle of attrition and i don't think that's the the way traveler combat should or space combat or big ship combat should run and and it shouldn't run that way for a couple of reasons one i think it's got these big guns right these uh the bay weapons and the spinal mounts are they're supposed to be like death rays destructive powerful uh, missile combat. If you load, if you unload thousands of, you know, hundreds or even thousands of missiles on your opponent, it's supposed to wreak havoc and just devastate them. Um, so the story I wanted to tell was that big ship encounters are destructive and pretty fast. They meet on the field of battle and then they tear each other to pieces in short order. And uh, so I we modified the rules to accommodate that story where they absolutely wreck each other. So. Um, And the reasons for that are because I felt like that was what Classic Traveler was trying, the story it was trying to tell. And remembering this is a role-playing game, not a war game. Uh, You could spend five sessions running a fleet combat encounter and no character would ever have a spoken line in it. And that's not really what you're shooting for. You want to get back to the role-playing, back to the narrative. It's fun to do these asides with a big battle, but ultimately you want to in quickly and expeditiously get back to your your story. Uh, so that's that's one of the things that went into the design of those rules. Let's let's get it get it back to this. So do you have like a team of uh, playtesters, or how, how's the uh, process of playtesting and refining uh, go? How many iterations? Um... Uh, for instance, uh, do, do you just like, it's, it's not ready till it's ready or are you working on a deadline? And so you're trying to like get as many play tests in before the deadline or how does that go? I wish I could say we play tested more than we do. Uh, that's what I'll say. And, uh, people get upset when they hear you haven't play tested this or play tested this extensively. Uh, we play test the, the mechanics that we design, but I, there just simply isn't time. The writing takes so much time. The editing takes so much time. The process is so difficult that I there, there isn't the time to play test things as much as I would like. Um, so so, each iteration is just super time consuming. 
Yeah, it's putting these pro- for me. It is for putting these projects together. It it takes time and a lot of thought and effort. But yes, we do play test. Uh, I, we sometimes don't explore every single avenue, and then you know that'll come out when people find a knit a, a niche somewhere that didn't get explored or doesn't quite mechanically work. Um, I, I'm happy to say I haven't seen too many egregious ones with the current high guard. People have come back. You know, it's been out for like a year now. People have come back and and mentioned certain things that uh, oh this this doesn't work quite right and, and I just really okay yeah we could have explained that in more detail but the the base mechanics which we tested with both play and spreadsheet analyses of how they would work uh, have ferreted out most of the things that uh, we wanted to see um, I would like to run big detailed uh, play tests with multiple groups if I had the time, but, you know, we've got to get these, there's, there's, a, there's a time pressure to get uh, books out in a, or to get these books out in a timely manner. And this isn't, I, I'm sorry to say my only job. I, I have a day job, which is very demanding. This is a freelance uh, activity and I'm happy to be a part of it, but uh, you know, it, it wouldn't pay the bills living in Northern California if I made it my only job. So I, I, I just don't have the time gotcha. to, to, uh, to run the, the level of play test that I would like to. All right. What about um, conventions and connecting with fans? Are there any upcoming conventions or events uh, where fans can meet you or um, do you? I have yet to go to TravelerCon and I hope to next year, but I, I, I'm not a big convention guy. Um, but I, I hope to to do that next year for the first time and, and get in some games and and uh, and experience that. Yes, that'd be awesome. Um, I've never been myself, but it looks uh, everybody looks like they're having a great fun time. So just nerd out yeah, on Traveler I mean, for the weekend. I mean, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sounds awesome to me. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, for, for fans who want to stay up to date on your projects, um, what's the best way to follow you? Well, um, I uh, participate on the Traveler Discord forum. Uh, the Let's see, which one is that? It's the, uh, the Traveler RPG Discord forum. I'm, I'm on the Mongoose Publishing uh, Discord server as well. I, I, pay, I try to pay attention to conversations there. I'm on the Mongoose uh, website forums. I, I'm on Traveler Reddit. I, I participate, and my ID is usually Paltry Sum, which you'll see pop up all over the place in those things. Um, I'm in the process of creating a blog, but the fact that I'm working so hard on Singularity has disabled me from uh, from getting that thing set uh, set up. I'm using uh, Jekyll to to create a blog for myself, but um, and I wanted to have it set up before I started heavy work on singularity so I could kind of create entries. And if someone wanted to see the progress of, and, and hear stories about how a campaign is developed, I was going to post it there, but hopefully I get that going soon. And then I'll, I'll have more information on you that, uh, for that next year. <laughs> All right. Great. Great. So, uh, what are your, uh, give us a recap of, um, your, your near term and long term uh, goals for this coming year. All right. So, uh, so singularity is number one, and if all goes well, it will be. It has a good chance of being this year's traveler Kickstarter. Oh, cool! Um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm designing it in such a way that uh, it would there will be you know stretch goals, things that you could obtain that will add to your running of this campaign. Um, I, I've talked quite uh, talked a bit about it with Matt, and so I'm hoping that uh, that it that it will. Uh, that it'll fill that role for them this year. More on that as we find out. Um, and then uh, the graphic novel, uh, we're still working on that. It's it is a it is a laborious process going through each one. I wish that we could produce it. Like uh, if you if you're a comic book fan, you know, like you know, Marvel and DC put up one a month for Superman and Spider Man, etc. It is not easy to do that. Uh, uh, under our current uh, uh, design sequence, but but rest assured, we will deliver this this complete series. And I've got a, I've got multiple series involved. The, this uh, that graphic novel series, Far Trader, will will progress through a set of three 
the plan is three graphic novels. Each one is four issues. So ultimately there will be 12 total issues with this epic story about these characters and their progress through uh, the Spinbird marches. Then there's a secondary uh, series. And I, I think I mentioned basing it on the ship, I chose the trader. The second uh, storyline will probably appear in Deneb or Rep sector and involve a scout ship. Uh, I've got uh, an, an, uh, another graphic novel partially developed for that. So hopefully over time, we'll have a lot of, we'll be delving into that medium as well for Traveler. Um, so after Singularity is out, uh, the next thing on my slate is Jodani Consulate, which is supposed to time with the fifth Frontier War materials that uh, Mongoose is, is planning to release some, at some point. I think 2024 is probably when they're shooting for it. I, don't quote me on that, <laughs> or don't 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 hold me down to that. Matt might go, no, Chris, don't say such things. Um, you know, it's it is in the future, and and Jordani Consulate will. The point of it isn't really so. If we're talking Fifth Frontier War, as any you know, long term traveler aficionado knows, the Jordani are are one of the they're, they're the, the the enemy in the Fifth Frontier War for the Imperium. So we want to provide some more detail about them. However, the the tech I'm taking on is not to show the Jodani and like Kronor subsector. So not, I'm not depicting the ones right there in the war. I just want to show who these people are. So I'm going to take it back to their home sector, uh, Jdant, and describe what's going on there. And in much the same fashion as I did in Third Imperium. The third, there will be this a big long history of the Jodani, color, or developing some things that I've discovered about them. Uh, since there have been, you know, several materials written about them, in uh, by various authors over the years. Mongoose uh, version one had a nice one uh, that was put out uh, probably over a decade ago. It's that it has additional material. I will add even more to that. And a lot of this has come from conversations with uh, the the inner circle and Mr. Mark Miller himself, uh, who gave me more perspectives on the Jodani than, than I had in the past. So I want it to become a uh, viable role-playing environment. So we'll, we'll, after we put out Consulate, I hope uh, Matt will support me, and I he, he usually does in creating uh, Jodani adventures. You know, what's it like to uh, adventure in this psionic-controlled society? Uh, I want to make it viable for you to play a role. People think, well, if you're going to play a Jodani, you have to play one of the psionics. Well, I don't know. Maybe playing a prol is interesting too in its own way. Uh, so that Jordani consulate's the next big thing for me after that. And then um, going further out than that, I I have pitched uh, uh, the, uh, the beginning of an outline for uh, Empress Wave, uh, that, which could be sort of a, a source book slash campaign that deals with the Empress Wave. That, that might come up after consulate, but that might be looking too far in the future. Suffice it to say, singularity, consulate, and then whatever Matt wants to do after that. Pretty ambitious. Yeah, there's no shortage of projects. I, I've even I've pitched. You know, I talked about an alien campaign. I, I have pitched. I would like to write an Oslan campaign. Uh, so where you are all playing Oslan. So I don't know if that's going to happen or not. It it would probably be a little too. Uh, presumptuous of me to to project past Jordani consulate gotcha. at this point gotcha but, uh, so uh where can people find uh these things uh at the i'm guessing at the uh, mongoose website and uh yes mongoosepublishing.com um that's there let me see just taking a look yes mongoosepublishing.com has you know all the books i've written uh plus those of uh, the other author, authors like martin and gear and Darren now with the, the alien uh, books that he's been writing and um, uh, drive through RPG.com as well has all the traveler books. Plus some of my, I, I have three books that I wrote uh, or three adventure modules that I wrote for, um, for traveler on there as well for the uh, travelers aid society program. Awesome. Awesome. Oh, and Marcosia.com. Oh right, I was uh, gonna say. Uh, is, the other is that I was gonna ask where the uh, graphic novel will be distributed? Yeah, that's um, yeah. If you, it's m a r k o s i a dot com. That's that will take you to Marcosia Publishing, uh, run by Harry Marcos, 
and they've got a lot of good material. If you like comics, check it out. They've got all kinds of different genres and Traveler will just be joining that fold in the near future. But um, hopefully uh, uh, people find some other interesting topics here as well. Just a glance at their website. It's just a rich uh, panoply of, of stories and material there. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, Chris, we've come to the end of our interview. Great. It was so fun to do again. This one was a little more free form than our previous ones. I, I, I really had a good time and, and thank you for bringing me back, Frank. Uh, thanks for coming back. I uh, hope you will join us again next year. Yeah, it, you know, I will. Thank you very much. And thank you, dear listener. Until next time, happy traveling. live in the studio hello everybody welcome back wow this is a crazy awesome may day may day may day it's traveler day 2023 and uh hope you are enjoying it so far um we've been at this so far seven hours and 52 minutes and 42 seconds my friends and we still have like four hours to go three and a half hours to go <laughs> So uh, I'm getting all punch drunk here. Uh, anyway, I'm hoping hoping that uh, uh, Christopher Griffin will join us um, in the next little while. And uh, he, you know, it's in the middle of the work day, of course, you know, so it's difficult. But uh, hopefully we will get him in here and uh, I'm sending him a... a uh, invitation right now in case he's listening and then you know there's all these crazy time zones and yada yada he may not have been able to see the uh the thing because i have i i i i, I made the channel the broadcast channel hidden only the uh, crew and uh, the guests can see it, and only when it's time. Yes. Hey, uh, I see Amish Starship. That's a great, uh, uh, great username. I love that. All right. So, well, we'll just have a little chat. Uh, I'll just have a little recap here. Um, we still have yet to hear from Matthew Sprange. That's coming up next. And then we have our um, keynote speaker, none other than Mark Miller, Mr. Traveler himself. And uh, he will be coming up uh, shortly. Those two um, interviews will be back to back. So uh, you won't hear from me again until after that. Um, and um, after the Mark Miller interview, we'll do the uh, uh, drawing for a Mark Miller sponsored prize. And then we will do, do, do the drawing for the greatest prize in the galaxy, which is a crazy, ginormous prize bundle. You're not even going to believe it's everything that we've given out during the day, plus a bunch of other stuff. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be awesome. And I have in the studio with me right now, Mr. Christopher Griffin. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Um, thanks for joining and uh, making some time in your day. Sure. Yeah, my pleasure super awesome how, just, how did it go it went well everything <laughs> except for i had a little uh twitchy finger first the very first interview i accidentally restarted after 20 minutes and i apologize to uh, matthew kerwin who was very gracious about it um but after the uh, podcast i'm going to release uh all of the videos and uh, you guys will be able to watch them uninterrupted and unfucked up oh, pardon my Villani. uh and uh <laughs> <laughs> uh everything will be uh nice and awesome so, so you yeah. talked to matthew kerwin 
yeah he's he's the one he wrote the uh hiver the interview with the hiver and uh wait is that another novel uh that was our first interview today but, oh i'm saying did he you know he wrote a novel called oh yeah Wagner. yeah yeah he he wrote the wagner incident and uh, he also sponsored that as as a prize that was the first prize we gave away today oh very nice yeah yeah uh before the before the um uh before the the, the May Day, he contacted me and uh was like hey i have this cool idea let's do an interview with the uh, hiver i was like hmm, <laughs> okay and, and so he role uh, played a hiver he he wrote up all you know i i wrote the questions and he responded and we and we uh, uh collaborated and came up with the inter and then mongoose sent me um uh, uh hiver photo hiver images so thank you mongoose uh uh -huh. matthew sprange awesome uh and also great uh, uh i didn't get credit f on who the artists were but um courtesy of mongoose you could go over to them uh on the uh, forums or uh, probably the forums and uh or their discord and find out who that uh, artist is um great work very cool yeah, yeah. I, matthew's a sharp one so i bet it was a pretty cool interview i can't wait to listen to it I, yeah I yeah I wasn't, I wasn't able to do it live unfortunately. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you missed the the flub the live flub um it, <laughs> I told people uh, don't look at it as a flub just look at it as look at it as a cliffhanger and uh <laughs> you can get the rest of the interview later and again <laughs> yeah apologies to uh Matthew Kerwin uh, thank you for being gracious and uh so Christopher how are you yeah doing great uh, uh -huh. yourself Frank pretty good pretty good we got uh three minutes uh we got a kill and in that time we can okay. do the uh drawing for the uh mongoose goodies um Okay. You know, uh, Matthew and them are on the other side of the world, so they don't always sync up with us to be here live and do the do this stuff. So uh, yeah, yeah, they're uh, asleep by now, probably. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're six hours offset from us <clears throat> in the future, future, future. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, we have um, some goodies here. Uh, these are from uh, uh, Matthew Springe at Mongoose Publishing. He's giving away a a digital edition of Pirates of Drenax and the Pirates of Drenax original soundtrack. Um, oh, nice. Yes. And uh, if uh, folks want to register for prizes, we still have more prizes. I have a prize pack uh, sponsored by Subboard Prime Games coming up. Mark Miller has a prize pack coming up. And we have the ultimate prize, the most wonderful prize in the universe. Um, uh, at the end of the show tonight before we go to after hours so um let's see we get about uh if you want to register for the any of the drawings go to subboardprime.com slash mayday 2023 but right at the top of the page is a place where you can sign up and uh, uh th this is this is a the, the this drawing list is different from the newsletter or any of the other mailing lists so just get in on the drawing uh, we got about 100 people in it right now so you have a one in a hundred chance of winning a ginormous prize pack. It's crazy. Anyway. Uh, awesome. Good odds. Yeah. Good odds. Yeah, it's good odds. All right. So we still got a minute. Um, let's, uh, uh, Chris, you want to catch us up on anything uh, going on? I just uh, worked with a friend of mine to submit a uh, piece for the new Traveler Companion update, a, a way to let you, some, a lot of people have been asking for this, vector-based Space combat. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I like uh, Mongoose's space combat system. It's really cool, and it's it's nice. And it's elegant. It's you can run a session pretty quickly. This is if you want realistic movement in space with vectors involved and uh, concatenated uh, thrust, and and it's really good for multiple ship combat as well. Wow, and, sounds awesome. He he did a great write up of it, and I edited it for him, and we. And, and I put it in mongoose style, and we submit, and I'll be submitting it later today. So pretty excited, but I think it's going to be a real nice piece in the uh, in the 2023 companion update. Great, great. All right. Well, anyway, we... I, I don't want to push Matthew. It could be 2024. I don't know. It's one of the update <laughs> books, and it's, it's going to add to it and be real nice. All right. Great, great. All right. Pick a number between one and 100, my friend. 77 the year traveler Seven. was invented all right 77 and that would be drum roll please um 
Jimmy Bateman, congratulations. You have won the digital edition of um, the uh, 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 Pirates of Drenex and yeah. the Pirates of Drenex original soundtrack. And now, here's Mr. Matthew Strange. Opening merchant interface. Scanning trade routes. Scanning for cargo destinations within jump range. Cargo shipment available. 12 tons of traveler rule books and 17 tons of guinea pig food. Destined for the Centaurus system. Contacting Matthew Sprange of Mongoose Publishing. Stand by. Hello everybody. Today my guest is Matthew Sprange, Managing Director of Mongoose Publishing. Welcome Matthew and thanks for joining us for the 5th Annual May Day May Day event. Hi there. Thank you for having me. We're not going to go into the, like the uh, great detail we have in, in uh, past years about uh, your history <laughs> with gaming, uh, but uh, it would be nice to have kind of just an overview of what inspired you to get into gaming and how did your passion for the hobby lead to uh, where you are today? Well, for tabletop gaming, I started very, very young. I must have been what, nine, ten years old when the uh, all the fighting fantasy and lone wolf game books started popping up in uh, primary school. Devoured those. In between that and going up to secondary school, I grabbed the red box basic D and D set. I kind of didn't look back. Uh, Traveler was uh, actually the the third RPG that uh, I got into, and from that point, I was I was just lost in gaming. <laughs> what is it that uh, attracted uh, attracted you to it so strongly? Pro probably go back a bit further when I was what three and a half years old ish when I. I first saw Star Wars in the cinema and it's I, I can still remember sitting there and seeing the stormtroopers for the first time and it's probably fair to say that had uh, kind of like a permanent effect <laughs> is that uh, how you primarily uh, like back in those days were you playing traveler as a uh, well when you first got into traveler were you mimicking more star wars adventures uh, is that what you wanted to do with traveler or was, was it that no I, I, I tended to use um, uh, set scenarios or spin offs of set scenarios so it was in it was in charted space so uh, i mean by that time i've been playing D, &D a lot i've been playing the games workshop sold judge dread rpg so I'd, I'd already learned to switch between universes by that point fast forward a bit uh, what made it what motivated you to found mongoose publishing and can you share the story behind its inception well, the quick answer is that um, I, I didn't want to do a, a real job anymore. Um, <laughs> what was your old job? Uh, well, I was I was working as a field field engineer fixing computers, and mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine that I'd known since primary school. In fact, he was the one I was uh, swapping solo game books with, playing D and D with. He would just left the army, and we talked about starting a um, starting a company for um, a miniatures based game. Actually, we sat down, talked about it, decided it wasn't the idea ideas weren't really there at that point. And then the D20 license uh, came along. We had another chat, got some ideas together for a range of 32, simple 32 page books. They ended up being the Slayer's Guys, but our original idea was to do uh, three 32 page adventures, which is what absolutely every other publisher at the time was doing. It suddenly dawned one day, all these conversations were taking place in a pub. It sort of suddenly dawned on me one day as I was uh, sitting at the table there, if everybody is doing that probably ought to do something else which is where we got the idea for the slayers guides when they came out they hit the market like uh, like an absolute bullet and we we haven't looked back since since our last interview um have you seen how have you seen the traveler rpg community in the industry evolve and what are your thoughts on these changes i mean it's, it's an easy thing to say we we publish books so if there's any changes they tend to happen slowly because we're we're using fundamentally technology that's uh, more than a thousand years old. Um, I can tell you that these days where we can see that more women are playing Traveller. You've got the rise of AI art and uh, AI writing, which uh, caused a little flutter of worry when they first uh, uh, came at the office. But um, uh, I don't think there's any seismic shifts to worry about for the larger publishers at the moment there. It's pretty good if you're a hobbyist gamer, though, that likes uh, creating your own scenarios, your own settings, um, while you might be able to write, you might not be able to draw too well. And I would certainly have fit that mold um, when I was a teenager. Um, so I imagine uh, AI art could be quite funky for that. Um, but aside from that, things tend to move slowly. I mean, we've got over the past 
Actually, it's about a year now. We've um, got our new website up and running. And I can tell you it's an absolute joy to use. You know, where was this technology before? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really nice. And uh, uh, you also converted your forums as well? We did. I mean, that needed doing as well. But uh, mm -hmm. you have to do one thing at a time. Otherwise, you just end up tearing out your hair. So once we got the new website up and running, that was all in the preparation. Um, I mean, we've we were first quoted four to five weeks to get it up and running. It ended up being nearer three months because we do have some odd things running in the background to do uh, things the way we want to do them. So we're, we're kind of using an off, sort of off-the-shelf system, but it's loaded with various third-party apps and you've all got to make sure they're all talking to each other. So yeah, we had to get that uh, all up and running, but the forums were always... Uh, we always uh, planned an update. I mean, just just being able to do one click uploading for images of book covers when we announce a new title and not have to do a run around with a manual links is joyful to use. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as a user of your uh, forums, I have to say uh, I really appreciate the 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 update. Um, it looked like you know that's always a hassle to copy all the stuff from the old uh, database and and put it you know in the I don't know if you switched or just upgraded, but uh, the the new system super nice well, we, we get other people to do that side of things so we just shout at them when it doesn't work properly <laughs> as the gaming industry continues to evolve how do you envision the future of traveler and uh, mongoose's publishing uh, role within that yeah, that, that's kind of two sides. I mean, on the one hand, you got, you got the positive and the negative. The negative, I can foresee what I call three possible extinction level events, which uh, I kind of live in daily terror of. You've got the rise of AI. I mean, it's, it's not there yet. It's not going to be there yet for quite some time. But when it can properly replace a games master or when it can properly write an RPG book, that raises some questions. There's uh, climate change, obviously, and also perhaps the collapse of capitalism. So those are all the uh, the, the negative things I worry about <laughs> on the uh, on the industry side. But um, uh, beyond that, um, the future for Traveller uh the rpg is itself is going steady at the moment we're not planning um any new uh additions we're not even thinking about them um we recently about a year ago released the um call cool rule ba rule book update books we've done the same with high guard and central supplies on its way and that's proving to be a very nice mechanism for us to update the rules without having to do a new edition and risk invalidating um, the legion of books that we've uh, we've done already, and frankly, we want to keep around because we like them. Um, but beyond that, uh, looking, we'll be looking at both online services and um, uh, getting traveller out and about into uh, other formats, uh, whether that's uh, fiction, video games, films, and TV, etc. Mm, cool. So um, how have player preferences and expectations influenced the direction that uh, of Traveler's development and Mongoose's publishing approach to creating new content? The quick answer to that presentation, I mean, if you have a look at the update, update books, the whole point of them was to take advantage of the new skill levels we had in graphic design and artwork. The, uh, uh, the rules updates on them were, were kind of incidental, uh, at least to begin with. And we have seen people responding very positively towards that. When we when we first started Traveller in our first edition, we did deliberately ape the um, uh, original classic Traveller book. So it was all black and white line art and what have you. But with this edition, we properly updated it for the, uh, for the 21st century. Um, beyond that, um, People seem to be gravitating towards the stories being told in Traveller. So we're not concentrating solely on background material or rules books. We're also looking at the kind of stories that can be told within the Traveller universe. So, I mean, the obvious one is Pirates of Dranax, which has been very, very popular um, as a vehicle for people to, uh, to tell stories at the tabletops. We've also got um, Secrets of the Ancients, but we're starting to double down on that. So Secrets of the Ancients is getting expanded into uh, a full trilogy. And we've got another epic campaign called Singularity in the works right now. Wow. 
That's a lot of content coming out. <laughs> it doesn't all come at once. You you could you can breathe a sigh of relief. Okay. <laughs> My wallet. <laughs> um all right, cool. So uh, I've noticed that uh, it seems like more people are playing um Traveler these days or finding yeah. out about it and uh yeah, and like you said, uh, more women. I, I've got two. I've got uh, two women in my group, and uh, I just joined a group that has a female player. Um, so, uh, what do you attribute that to? Um, I think it's it's two sides to that. Um, I mean, firstly, the traditional view of traveler is um, it's uh, the province of um, manly men doing manly things with spreadsheets and uh, tables for constructing ships and vehicles and weapons. And you can still do that to an extent, but that's not the point of Traveller. Um, so expanding it out in uh, with regards to the stories that can be told is an important, um, uh, important hook. We also do um, much simpler and Perhaps quite on, uh, obvious things as well. Uh, simple things like uh, the interior art in the book and the book covers. Uh, we put women on them instead of automatically defaulting to men. We put um, women in um, uh, situations and uh, roles and, uh, I dare say, um, uh, clothing. It makes them more realistic, more approachable, more relatable. And it does it does make a difference. Um, I mean, for the past past few years, all the art in Traveller um, has been either commissioned or directed um, by by women. Um, so, at a stroke, you immediately avoid the uh, the trap of the uh, the male gaze, where any woman. Um, in the artwork is there for the benefit of male readers. It's not; they're just other characters now. So, with uh, with so many new players joining the Traveler RPG community, what advice would you give to those who are just starting their journeys? Uh, it's the same with um, uh, the great big D and D campaigns uh, as well. Start small. Um, with D and D, you might start with a single village and expand out from there. With Traveller, start with um, a single system and um, uh, one of our short adventures. You'll find those adventures can be linked to um, uh, get uh, a full-blown campaign running. Um, and once you're comfortable with it, then pick up the big Pirates of Dranax campaign that's going to last you two or three years. Uh, don't dive into it straight away. Because it could be overwhelming at first. I remember when I first started playing, I was overwhelmed with um, what could I do? What should I do? Um, what, you know, what kinds of adventures could I have? And it just, I kind of felt like I had choice paralysis. <laughs> well, you, you can still get that with experienced referees. I mean, if we start running a campaign here in the office, um, it's in a sector we haven't played before, you still get that moment when you're just beginning as a referee, having a look at that huge sector map, thinking, I don't know any of these worlds. Am I expected to know all of them? Because the players can go anywhere. Of course, when you play, that's not that's not true. Players are funnel. Players can make pre uh, predictable choices where to go. And you don't need to memorise the whole sector. You know, just start with a couple of worlds to begin with, um, mm -hmm. expand out to a subsector, and that's probably enough to give you months of gaming in, in and of itself. That's that's been my approach. I make a uh, subsector with maybe like twenty five planets. It's manageable. Um, uh, that's plenty of planets for people to go and explore or systems. And then if they want to, you know, I just say, look, uh, I don't want to have to do the nine uh, surrounding subsectors. So can we just stay on this map for a while? There's plenty to do here. <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> so. Uh, Let's talk about your uh, current projects. Uh, can you give us a sneak peek at any current projects that Mongoose Publishing is working on for Traveller? Yes. Yeah, so um, we have on our website um, a release schedule page you can access from the uh, from the front page that shows all the books that uh, are pretty much well in hand that are coming out, out over the next three to four months. So I won't, won't bore you with uh, going through those. I can tell you in the works right now, um, it's uh, it's projects of various sizes, but um, 
some of the bigger ones we're looking at right now. I mentioned before we've got our next epic campaign. It's going to be called Singularity. Um, that's going to be popping up towards the end of this year in one form or another. Can you give um, us a uh, can you give us a um, no spoilers overview of what that's about? Basically, in a nutshell, it starts off in Core Sector. Uh, the players discover an extremely advanced AI. Um, and long story short, their consciousness gets broken down, placed into new bodies uh, all across charted space as they're trying to complete tasks to either aid the AI or foil the AI, that's going to be completely down to them. Um, and in a way, it's a study of um, the nature of artificial intelligence, what um, rights should be granted to artificial intelligence, and uh, what, what, when you come down to it, what is real anyway? All right, um, let's, well, let's this, talk about the next yeah, thing. I mean, this, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is one of the things we're trying to do with Traveller now. I mean, Traveller's rooted in the classic science fiction of the, like, the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Sure. Um, and science fiction, I was going to say of that era, pretty much all science fiction is in some way rooted in the real world. Where it's, it's used as um, a lens or a mirror to reflect um, our own situation back to us, whether that is uh, rooted in history or in the uh, the modern day, whether it's to do with the human condition or uh, political movements. Um, that is the bread and butter of um, uh, science fiction. So we've been f trying to find story ideas that go beyond just the cool spaceship, laser guns, pew pew kind of angle. Um, and if you if you say if you go back uh, on our releases over the past three or four years, you'll find little seeds uh, of these ideas that um, uh, hopefully get hopefully get people thinking a bit um, uh, while they're playing. I, I'm with you on that. I believe that's a strong sci-fi uh, tradition. Uh, you you take uh, something about current events and then you kind of um, exaggerate. Like, what if we take this to a, a crazy, ex you know? um exaggeration at what would our life be like that either positive or negative and kind of like you say uh doing a study of the human condition through through that lens that's that's awesome i'm happy to hear that well it's been what um, i was going to star trek is the uh the obvious one but um uh even things that are more out there like um uh, star wars i mean the original star wars film is rooted deep in the vietnam war mm-hmm Right, and you're fight, they're fighting the space fascists, basically. I mean, yeah, you know? mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, yeah, and you can go. I mean, pretty much on Star Trek, every single episode is a comment on uh, commentary on so current current social issues of the time that they're put out. Indeed, yes. Mm -hmm. That's great, and uh, the the one of the other things that's really cool is like um, there's so much like undeveloped areas in traveler that you could uh go to and just you know like you're saying uh, kind of do put another layer on top now let's do these adventures that tie in to science fiction because it is a science fiction role-playing game um Indeed. And... exactly yes yeah cool all right what else you got coming give me more uh, give me more <laughs> yeah we got um uh, probably the uh the smallest project on this list um it got it's actually got a little bit delayed because of a project I'm just about to mention. We're going to be returning to the um, old Sky Raiders campaign. Um, for seeing this is going to end up being somewhere around 160 or 200 page hardback. Um, going to be going way, way out um, of uh, our regular runs in Chartered Space, uh, where the players basically get to act as space archaeologists. Oh, cool! Another uh, another staple of sci-fi. Mm -hmm. Indeed, that's uh, that would have come out this year, but um, it's got bumped by work on um, a project we had actually announced last year uh, called Pioneer. Um, it uses the core Traveller rules, but it's basically um, uh, a new RPG. Let's let's call it Traveller adjacent. Um, it's set in. Um, in the solar system 10 to 30 years 
in the future of our time right now, when you're just beginning to get uh, manned exploration of um, uh, the planetary bodies. Uh, and the whole idea of the game is um, the players are going to be first. They're going to be the first to start building a moon base. They're going to be the first to set foot on Mars. Um, if you uh, want to push the uh, timeline ahead, the, the first to land on Europa and start looking for uh, sea monsters under the ice. We've taken the combat chapter out. Um, if you want to hit something, you do it through the skill system. Um, but the, the main adversary in Pioneer is always, always the environment. I like that. That's a clever idea. Um, I think that's probably going to be popping up um, sometime uh, next year because um, we're, we're lining up um, <clears throat> uh, a handful of uh, supplementary books uh, to it as well. I mean, the first uh, mini campaign we release for it will be the first explore, uh, manned explore, explorations of Mars. Uh, hopefully before that, you will see the first book or first few books of the Fifth Frontier War. Um, it's We're not really looking at advancing the Traveller timeline overall. Um, so what we're doing is we're making the Fifth Frontier War its own kind of mini subline. The, um, the, book, the book covers will actually look different and they'll have a different feel in the interior so you can easily spot them apart but we're going to walk you through the entire fifth frontier war uh we're not going to be doing it solely through source books um looks like we're going to be alternating the source books with uh mini campaign books um uh campaign books are going to be maybe the size of um something like uh Skandersvik, um uh that we did for the sword worlds but um, we're going to be taking the players through several different uh, viewpoints. Um, uh, principally, someone on the Imperial side, well, a group on the Imperial side, a group on the Zodani side, and then um, a group will be the, uh, the hapless trader travellers caught in the middle of it. So what you'll be able to do is basically switch between those three groups of travellers as you play through the entire Fifth Frontier War. And because we've included the trader traveller group in there, if your current group of travellers are in the Spinwood Marches right now, you'll be able to segue them directly into the heart of the Fifth Frontier War, which where they're pretty much going to get um, a ringside seat. Wow, cool. All right. Anything else? Uh, I there's always more. That's uh, well, but that's... I'm uh, yeah about immediate release or whatever. Yeah, or oh, the, the 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 well yeah, not immediate, immediate like the, the 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 when I want to say short term plans here. I have a I kind of have a question about uh, that someone asked me the other day, and it was um about twenty three hundred versus traveler, and mm -hmm. uh and where does like Twilight two thousand uh fit in and was it wasn't it named traveler 2300 at one point and then the traveler part was dropped and um can you tell me how those products are related or if at all i can i can, I can give you a brief sketch uh i mean this was uh this happened in um what the early to mid 80s uh and i was still at school at the time um but uh basically um 2300 was always kind of its uh separate thing it borrowed the traveler name for its uh, first release, but on from the second edition onward, it got uh, split away from that, and it, it never shared really shared uh, traveler rule systems. In terms of background law, there is no connection um, between twenty three hundred and travelers charted space. We did briefly talk about that idea with uh, Mister Miller, um, but he wasn't keen on following down that line. As I understand it, Twilight is a part of um, 2300, but uh, obviously that's um, that's not something that we do. Right, okay. Uh, my explanation was basically it was just a difference of tech level, and, uh, you know, once you get the 2300, it's mostly in-system stuff, and then uh, Traveler would be like the full, you know, interstellar adventure thing. 
Oh yeah, I mean, it's the difference between <laughs> I don't know Star Wars and Star Trek and something like um, I don't know The Expanse or The Martian. Actually, yeah, the Martians that... are more like Pioneer, to be honest. <laughs> right. Yeah. I I I, I said um, I told them that uh, twenty three hundred was more like uh, The Expanse, and if if sure. hopefully that that was relatable. Are there any uh, unique or innovative mechanics or gameplay elements that Mongoose is currently exploring for future Traveler RPG releases? Like, for instance, you have the uh, Mercenary Ticket system and the uh, Mercenary Expansion. Do you have any kind of other ideas like that for uh, future expansions or source books? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's always ideas. I mean, the golden rule for us is always to keep things simple. Um because it's very easy to fall into the trap of trying to make Traveller a simulationist type game. And whilst that had a draw, again, in the late 70s, early 80s, we are no longer at that point with tabletop RPGs, simply because computers do it so much better. Mm -hmm. um, what tabletop RPGs do better is, I keep coming back to it, is um, uh, story. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, um, even with video games like Mass Effect, which um, the people at Mongoose uh, rate very, very highly, it still doesn't hit what you can do with a, a tabletop RPG. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I mean, in terms of rules, we have been, I have been thinking um, ever since we released the second edition that um, uh, a change in the armor piercing rules would... Um, go down very well i mean at the moment weapons have an ap rating and that's deducted off your armor and then you match damage against what's left what i think might be a more fun thing to do is have ap as all all or nothing so if you've got an ap5 gun it will ignore any armor that's got protection five or less uh but if you meet uh if it hits armor with protection six and that armor has its full effect um, firstly, it's a lot easier and a lot quicker to do when you're in the uh, heat of combat at the table. But also you can do some um, fun things with it in terms of making certain weapons impractical or even useless against certain types of armour. Uh, I mean, something like Battle Dress will suddenly really swing into its own with that kind of system. And on the other hand, you can design specific armour-piercing weapons to um uh defeat very specific armors but not not others that however would take a very big rewrite of a lot um if you think about all the weapons in all the books throughout uh, what we've done so far it's not a small thing um, yeah. and if if we were ever to do a new edition we'd probably include that mechanic but as we're not looking at doing a new edition that's it's just kind of hanging there at the moment um but on the wider scale we are very keen on exploring different campaign types for traveler and you've seen that with um deep space exploration with the great rift set you've got the naval campaigns in element cruisers you mentioned mercenary i'm just about to start editing um, a new campaign type we're going to be adding, which is Bounty Hunter. Um, whether you want a complete dedicated Bounty Hunter campaign or you just want to add bounty hunting elements into your traditional um, Trader Traveller uh, style of game. But looking beyond that, um, I've been thinking for a while the Naval Campaign Handbook is kind of buried in the Element Cruiser books, and I think we can do more with it anyway. So it's probably going to be maybe three or four years away. I do like the idea of a traveller related, again, again, traveller adjacent RPG, standalone, but with links in traveller, that's purely dedicated to uh, bridge crew campaigns. Um, that idea does, uh, does appeal to me. And I think there's, um, there's all sorts of improvements we could make on the current uh, Naval Campaigns handbook. You know, there's a couple of camps of thought out there, and one is like um, the simulationists that play Traveler, and um, I've, I've heard critis criticism that, you know, oh, this isn't realistic or that isn't realistic as far as like building ships or whatever, but I'm like, uh, you know what, Not, it's 
it's not stories about your ship engines. It's stories about people in the sci-fi world and how things really work um, doesn't matter that much. On Star Trek, nobody said, nobody's really concerned about how the transporters work. They just work. Nobody's concerned about how the computers work. They just work. And the, because they're just MacGuffins, they're not, they're not um, part of the story. The story is between the, the people and, you know, you have this uh, kind of <clears throat> within the setting, with, within a sci-fi context, I guess. So that's kind of where I'm coming from on this. Well, it's, it's also worth remembering that um, once you move out of the Chartered Space Universe, the Traveller Core books are designed to be used for any universe. So we need to put all or most, at least most of the options in there. So you can have engines that do work realistically. Um, you've just got to cut out um, all the bits of um, uh, rules and other technologies and make them unrealistic for the universe you're currently uh, trying to work on. And the benefit of Traveller is that all its rules are very, very modular. So you can like plug and play with the bits that um, you need for your specific universe. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good point. So are there any uh, areas or aspects of the travel universe that you feel have yet to be fully um, explored or developed? And, and uh, what would you like to see expanded upon in future projects? Well, the, the quick answer is there's uh, still quite a few sectors in um, charted space that uh, we haven't done books or maps for yet. And I've said in the past, I have this dream that one day we'll be able to get all those giant poster-sized sector maps, put them together, and, I mean, you need a sports hall to do it, but uh, uh, you'll be able to see all of Chartered Space and know you can visit each one of those worlds, and we've got details for all of them. Uh, that's probably not going to happen, because, as it turns out, space space is big. Um, <laughs> so it would be cool to, like, lay the, all the subsector maps, their sector maps out like that on a basketball court or something. That's a that's a crazy good idea. Oh, yeah. I like that. Yeah. Um, but no, we've um, so we 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 do we are got we do have more sector books coming out. Um, I mean, you should see uh, where would be end of next month. The Trailing Frontier comes out. It's a book that combines um, gateway and lay sectors. And we've just received a manuscript covering for another sector book covering Dark Nebula and Reaver's Deep. We don't have uh, any specific plans for the big double sector books beyond that, but uh, never say never. There's always going to be an interesting bit of space um, uh, to explore. We started doing the what we call the Empire books. We released the Third Imperium. And in each one of those, we'll, we'll the Zodani uh, consular will be next, but we'll cover the Aslan, the Hivers, and uh, everyone else eventually. In each of those books, you will get one of the, if not the central sector of each empire, which has not really been covered, I don't think, for any of the sec uh, any of the big empires in uh, Traveller up to now. But I mean, part of the point of that is in the past. In the Chartered Space Universe, the Zadani and Soleimani have kind of been seen as the baddies, the bad guys, the uh, the people to work against, particularly when you start thinking about uh, the Rim War and the, uh, the Frontier Wars. One of the things we've been working towards is to humanise um, both those empires uh, a hell of a lot more. I mean, you'll find going through uh, our Soleimani books now... Uh, the Soleimani are a lot less, shall we say, fascisty now. They're more relatable. You can justify uh, playing even somebody, uh, a character from uh, Soulsec. They don't have to be the bad guys. Um, the Zod we'll be doing the same for the uh, Zodani Consulate in the Fifth Frontier, where we um very much intending from the start to show that war from the Zodani point of view as much as the Imperium's. Um, again, getting people used to the idea that um, you don't, it's not just about being able to set a campaign within those areas of space and uh, playing a fish out of water story as uh, people from the Imperium start exploring. No, actually playing characters from those areas of space too. That I think will be a, a, a long term thing we're, we're working on. So let's talk a little bit about. Um... 
like current events. So uh, let's start out with uh, like virtual ta tabletop VTT. With the increasing popularity of virtual tabletops and online gaming platforms, how has Mongoose Publishing been adapting its products and content to cater this growing trend in the RPG community? The quick answer to that is we um, have handed off pretty much all of it to uh, a third party headed up by a gentleman called uh, Colin. Um, he's been primarily working on... Um, uh, modules for fantasy grounds where you'll find a a big traveler presence um but we're starting to look properly at other systems uh, other platforms now um it looks like roll 20 is going to be the next one and i think you'll start uh start being able to play triple traveler there with uh, official modules this year Cool. I started out on Roll20. I was just looking at my Roll20 stats today. It's uh, thousands and thousands of hours of, <laughs> of playing. I have uh, GM'd like 35 games and uh, 6,000 hours of playtime or something. Uh, it's you mostly think that, that somehow sounds so much more wholesome than when you see you've played 6,000 hours of a video game? Yes, doesn't it? <laughs> well, in my case, it's not so time wasty because uh, I actually... In addition to using it for uh, playing games on, I also use it for designing games. Like it has a real cool, uh, like you can make um, decks of cards, so you can make your own card games and you can set up your own tables and produce stuff. So it's kind of, you know, uh, it, it, there's there's more to it than just VTT. You can use it if you uh, just as a common uh area for rolling dice, if you prefer theater of the mind, you know, um, there's, a, yeah. there's a place for it, you know. So that's good to hear. Um, let's let's talk. We we touched on AI. Let's talk a little bit more. Um, I've been checking it out, and from my perspective, um, AI is a um, little more than a sophisticated Mad Libs generator. I've heard rumors that Wizards of the Coast are working on an AI GM, but I'm not sure. Do you think um, AI can replace a GM? It depends on a long enough timeline. Yes, is the easy answer. I mean, we're not we're not, we're there, not there yet. yet. Yeah. Um, you could make an argument it's at the moment the um it's more like advanced text prediction working out what words should come next rather than um anything <coughs> excuse me anything like uh, genuine creativity which is all is going to be the missing component for a long time mm -hmm. um that isn't to say you can't do things with it um i mean certainly um if you need a quick adventure idea it can certainly get the um, creative juices uh, uh, flowing with uh, a quick conversation. But at the same time, there's a big difference between g getting some cool ideas and having a full 32 page adventure pumped out for you for, for that evening's play. Um, I do. It does remind me of video games like um, the old uh, Neverwinter Nights that had um uh, player created content um that you could download beyond the the main campaign that it had uh and i think it will start off feeling like that to begin with uh, i mean it's a great idea the getting the games master sitting at the table it has always always been the barrier to, for role playing games, if you don't need that and have a bunch of people just with getting ready, uh, they're just willing to sit down and play. There is room for that. Um, it's going, I think, to begin with, feel more like something like, um, as I say, Neverwinter Nights or uh, World of Warcraft. Maybe like a text adventure kind of. Feels with, or with, with a lot better graphics, I'll, I'll, I'll give it that. Mm -hmm. uh, that at least, I'm not worried about it yet. But on a long enough timeline, we're, we're going to have to adjust, and I don't know how to do that yet. I've got some ideas, but we need to hold off. We need to hold off uh, a while longer, but before getting uh, worried about things, we, we have looked into this, mm -hmm. but even. Might be good for solo Something. players. I mean, I, I it, solo it could, play is a big is a big topic, you know. In this, it, it could. Mm -hmm. But what's going to be the difference between doing that and playing a video game? Right, That's or doing like a pick your path to adventure book or something. Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
uh, we, we well any any uh, game on your um, uh, Xbox at the moment. I mean, I mean, looking at in, in terms not of tabletop games but of existing video games, you're going to need you're going to need to get somewhere where the uh, an AI games master can recreate something on the level of the storyline of Mass Effect. When it can do that without defaulting to the same ideas every time, that's that's. I'll be worried then. How's that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, well, what about um, AI in the context of Traveler? How do you see AI characters and NPCs fitting into the Traveler official setting? Uh, as you mentioned, like with Singularity. Well, the Singularity is kind of going to be an exploration of that. I mean, when we're talking about AI in Traveler. We're talking about actual actual consciousness, not the little systems we've got in the real world at the moment. I mean, that's it's the difference between a supercomputer and uh, a TI eighty two. Um, that's that's what we're talking there. So, in 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 terms of AI and travel, you you're I think you're looking at the the God mode, and with the current tech levels of the empires, that's not really a thing. I I, I can see in the in the near future that. Traveller tech levels will need another readjustment, just as we did with um, computers no longer needing an, an entire room in the ship. Um, mm -hmm. We might need to start thinking about, for example, the intellect programs work on on ships. But um, uh, for for now, we're good. I think um, the the more interesting side at the moment is what um, AI can do on the back end. Um, I mean, AI art has all sorts of ethical issues right now. But even avoiding those, it's it's not there yet. I mean, it's nice for creating scenes, but when you're looking for something very specific, I want a Zodani from uh, Regiment X. It's it's not it's not going to work. Right. Uh, no, it doesn't know what that seeing, is. Right. I mean. Um, yeah, it, uh, that, yeah. And that's the problem. Um, we are seeing um, freelance artists beginning to use AI, not in the work that they submit. Um, but if you ask them um, to do uh, a quick uh, composition sketch, um, they might well use AI tools to um, quickly put together five or six ideas and the time it would um, take them to do one before. Mm -hmm. um, none of that gets used in the final piece, but it's an aid to the artist. We've looked at it on the writing side. Uh, I mean, how awesome would it be to have a true AI editor? Um, so when you're going over a manuscript, you no longer have to worry. You can be confident that you don't have to worry about typos or grammar at all. You can focus solely on the content. Mm -hmm. That for an editor is is the holy grail. <laughs> um, but again, we've looked into it. We are nowhere near it at the moment. <laughs> right. Yeah, I saw a, a picture of uh, somebody, a meme that was like, you know, uh, People are freaking out that AI is uh, taking over the world, and then it's like the AI artist. Uh, the prompt is, you know, salmon swimming in the river, and it's like salmon fillets jumping up the, <laughs> up yeah. the waterfalls. You know, <laughs> yeah. It all comes and I was like, well, it's like an evil right? genie. You know, you have to like word your word your wish like very specifically. That is true, and it's going to be a while before that kind of AI thinking filters down into a market as small as RPGs. Um, that, that I don't think is the worry. It's when AI can work out how to do, how to uh, break down into smaller markets or uh, smaller fields in that way. Uh, and of course it will be able to do that lightning fast. Um, and at that point, uh, you know, you you might as well hail your robotic overlords. It'll, it'll be over for all, all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Can you uh, um, let's talk about some uh, behind the scenes insights and challenges? What what kinds of challenges have you faced in maintaining the rich lore and history of Traveler while also introducing new and engaging content for players? We well the for the for the second it's it's never been a problem. In terms of coming up with good ideas, the trick is finding the good ideas that fit. Um, and the the two main tools we have for that is firstly writers who know 
who know the background law very, very well, and importantly, how to implement it in a form that can be told as a story at the tabletop. Um, but we do get wackier ideas every now and again. And for those, um, we have what we call the inner circle. Um, basically, um, the people that Mark, Mr. Miller trusts beyond all others with the uh, the Traveller universe. Um, and so we we fire things um, through that. You'll, you'll see them mentioned in the credits of every uh, Traveller book these days. Um, and if we need to go a step beyond even that, we talk to Mr. Miller all the time. Fantastic. It's nice to have the endorsement of the of the originator. <laughs> his counsel, <laughs> his wise counsel. It's, it's not just his endorsement, it's um, his, uh, his, his approval. Yeah, it's um, right, right. He, he owns everything. Right, right. So uh, let's uh, talk a bit about uh, the OpenGL fiasco that was going on there for a while. Um, with indie creator, uh, with indie content creators developing under the Cepheus engine, um, which is based uh, on Mongo's Traveler First Edition in the system reference document, it, but it also falls under the Wizards of the Coast Open Gaming license. Um, how is Mongo's publishing supporting and fostering its indie publisher community amidst this recent controversy around Wizards of the Coast proposed changes to the gaming license? Well, when it when it all blew up with the OGL. Um, the first thing we did was um, kind of corralled all the um, main Cepheus publishers, um, guaranteed that all the work they've done before wouldn't go away. Um, and, excuse me, <clears throat> and um, uh, started working out what to do next. Um, but we had this idea that um we could use this catastrophe as an opportunity um and hopefully try to work out a way forward um that everyone would be uh, a lot happier with because the um uh well we kind of let the uh, the original srd kind of lie fallow and uh, people doing all sorts of things with it um, but there wasn't much sense of um, uh, unity. And of course, the big bugbear in the room was that there's a second edition of Traveller out that uh, they couldn't use. So we had about two weeks of fairly intense um, talks and negotiations with them, trying to uh, hammer stuff out. The upshot is that we're going to be doing SRD2 based on the current um, core rule book, the update 2022. We are looking at using the new Orc license from Paizo. We we haven't seen it yet, but uh, yeah, if I, it's... Saw, I saw I saw your company listed on a uh, blog article about that as joining in. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. so we'll check it out, and if it's everything it's cranked up to be, that's um, that's probably the one we'll use. If it isn't, we'll find some other mechanism, or come up with our own, or we'll do something. Um, we're going to have a new Traveller open content uh, license and logo. So when people um, publish um, uh, material based on SRD2, they'll be able to do it with uh, a form of the uh, Traveller logo. Um, oh, that's cool. So if I, if I write a, an adventure uh, using the SRD, uh, I kind of get a, uh, I can, if I'm registered with you or however you're going to do this, uh, I can uh, use the, a, like a traveler logo that identifies it as a as an indie production, but and yet compatible with your system. Absolutely. I mean, it's going to at the moment uh, we haven't finalized yet, but at the moment it's going to be our traveler logo with the um, uh, words open content layered over it. So it's going to be instantly recognizable. Um, and. With any luck, we'll be able to get at least a, a portion of the existing SRD publishers to bring out um, uh, travel open con content or talk um, uh, material roughly the same time. So maybe we'll have a, a travel open content day um, and we can use um, Mongoose's own uh, megaphones to uh, try and boost visibility to them. Um, we've done, we've already done a draft of SRD2. That is with the uh, Cepheus publishers at the moment. They're looking through it, going through it with a, a fine tooth comb, making sure we haven't um, 
uh, bitten too deeply with the uh, the text because obviously we remove all the um, a lot of the uh, the fluff text and anything that refers to the charted space universe. Um, so I'm I'm all going well. A little later this year, you'll you'll see that happening. Fantastic. Uh, because, uh, well, uh, from what I understand, you've been on the other side of this, right? Well, I, I don't know if you were ever felt like your license was going to be pulled, but um, you you developed under the Roll20 um, license. For, uh, sorry, not Roll20, um, uh, D20. We did. Um, and to be honest, we never felt the license was under threat. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, the D20 license was, uh, it was always a possibility. We, we understood that. But the OGL at the time, we understood it to be, um, uh, it, it couldn't be revoked. So mm -hmm. um, maybe. So you didn't even really we, worry. Yeah. yeah I mean, so if mm -hmm. um, if we had taken, made different choice, choices in the past, maybe those um, uh, those few weeks would have been a lot more fraught for us. But uh, as it was, we were very much on the sideline. So, all right, this sounds like a good plan going forward. I'm excited to see what uh, Mongoose does with their uh, open gaming license. Um, let's talk about um, the playtesting and community engagement. Uh, can you share any insights into how Mongoose Publishing approaches the process of playtesting and refining new Traveler content before it's released? Indeed, when we have um, a veritable legion of um, uh, checkers and players, um, uh, on terms of the rule sides, and as I say, for the uh, the law side, we have the inner circle as well. Um, the writers themselves tend to have um, their own groups and their own checkers. Uh, by the time a book comes out, it's um, it's seen it's seen by um, uh, dozens of uh, pairs of eyes. Um, but of course, there's a big difference between dozens of people going through it. And the hundreds or thousands that will see it um, in the first uh, week of launch. Um, so um, we always, when we release a new book, we always keep an eye on the forums um, uh, for, for any chatter that anything anybody spotted um, mm -hmm. with uh, varying degrees of nervousness. <laughs> um, do you have like a uh... Like a customer council, like uh, what role do uh, fan feedback and community engagement play in shaping the direction and development of Mongoose products? Um, it's primarily on our forums at the moment, but we keep an eye across all our um, social media as well. So uh, Discord over the past year has really taken off uh, for us. Um, I mean, that's the advantage that uh, People feel very comfortable to ask us um, anything at any time um, on that platform. Facebook's an obvious one, but uh, if people, when people really want to get into the uh, real meat of uh, of a book, it's uh, it tends to be our forums. Gotcha. All right, cool. It's uh, it's good that you pay attention to that as a uh, as as your customer. I appreciate that. <laughs> we, we we try to read everything. Mm hmm. No, I, I have seen you respond on uh, or or your staff respond uh, or friendly knowledgeable m members of the uh community you know try to help out and of course they defer to the to the actual mongoose staff but very very helpful and friendly community very cool i think so yeah mm -hmm. are there any uh, upcoming events or conventions where fans can meet you in the mongoose team or where they can experience your products firsthand um, we're going to have a presence at um, Gen Con. It's uh, Studio Two Publishing that handles um, our events in uh, North America. Although actually this year, uh, three of us will be at Gen Con. We we won't have a stand, but we will be uh, we will be floating around. I'm using it as an opportunity to uh, introduce the staff to um, some of the uh, behind the scenes um, characters and companies uh, within the industry. Um, I don't know whether you've um, heard where um, the company is, Mongoose is moving towards being both employee run and employee owned. So I've heard that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gradually stepping up the uh, the roles people have. So on the one hand, it's um, a bit of a, a holiday in Indianapolis for them, but um, also they're going to be uh, uh, they're going to be involved in a lot of meetings as well. Mm. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Beyond that. 
Um, I think the only convention we're booked in for the moment this year is Dragon Meet in London towards the end. Uh, have you uh, visit? Uh, have you and your staff visited the states before? Uh yeah. I mean, I've been um, loads of times. It's been a few years since we've done the conventions ourselves there, but uh, we used to go every year to um, Origins, Gen Con, and uh, the Gamma Trade Show. So I, I have been giving not, neither of um, the two people going with me this year have been to America before, so I've been giving them um, all sorts of uh, horror stories um, <laughs> about how, how you must never ever cross a road. Um, away from pedestrian crossing or you're going to get shot or something i don't, I don't know <laughs> yeah, stay in the crosswalks please uh, observe the local <laughs> customs <laughs> i have also told them that um they're not going to be able to control their calorie intakes while, while they're over there for that week i've heard i've heard that our portions are ginormous compared to uh, what you find in other <laughs> countries <are>. yeah <laughs> Cool. Well, I hope you enjoy your trip and uh, when you come and visit. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, upcoming products. Uh, what do you have like in the long term? Uh... Um, well, actually, the long term, I've kind of I think we kind of covered with um, covered that? Okay. The, the likes of Pioneer and Fifth Frontier. Well, I can tell you coming up. So actually, I'm just looking at the list now. I've already talked about two of them. Um, you're going to see the next new travel book you're going to see is Trailing Frontier covering Gateway and Laysag. So I've already mentioned the Bounty Hunter mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. In between the two of them, though, you're going to see a book called The Imperial Navy, which will be your one-stop shop for all um, lore behind the Imperial Navy. There's very few rules in that book. Um, it's quite um, system agnostic. But it does really get into um, the details of how the Imperial Navy works, um, uh, how it functions, how it approaches things, um, right down to how um, security works on board a ship, how you get your promotions, um, what you need to do to keep those promotions. Um, and our graphics department is, uh, as I basically as I speak, cracking their knuckles to. Uh, start fleshing out things like um uniforms and rank organizations and uh yeah, cool uh, medals rank badges and so forth it's going to be a very pretty book but also a very informative one i'd like to take a minute to um uh, give kudos to your art department because uh man you guys have some great art coming out the cover of uh, i'm not sure which book it just came out on but it's a uh, subsidized uh, trader like uh burning through the atmosphere man it looks it's awesome. Oh yes, that's um, we combined the uh, March's adventures into uh, one hardback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Beautiful artwork on that cover. Well done. Mm, thank you. For fans who want to stay up to date on Mongoose Publishing's projects and releases, what are the best ways to follow and connect with you? Website, you'll always see news, uh, new releases on the uh, very front page. If you scroll down from that, you'll be able to sign up to our mailing list uh, via email. We will not bombard you with random emails, but you will hear when something um, new is released uh, on the day it is released. Um, other than that, we're on, I think um, I'm safe on saying all the major social media channels as well. All right. And we'll uh, provide links to all that stuff in the show notes uh, so people can uh, link directly from this podcast. Thank you. Um, so that's pretty much the, we've come to the end of our interview. Uh, Matthew, thank you so much for your support on this event. And uh, thank you for being a, um, a great uh, leader over there at Mongoose. Um, I, I'm really happy with your products. And, um, and and again, thank you so much for all you've done. Um, th th thanks for uh, listening to me uh, waffle on for so long. <laughs> <laughs> I can listen to people talk about Traveler all day. And I will on the first. <laughs> all right, then. Well, Dear friends, thank you for joining us, and until next time, happy traveling.
Opening Merchant Interface Scanning Trade Routes Scanning for cargo destinations within jump range Cargo shipment available 13 tons of classic Traveler rulebooks and 27 tons of Traveler 5 rulebooks Destined for the Imperial Palace in the Capital System Contacting Mark Miller of Far Future Enterprises Stand by Greetings travelers and welcome to the Milestone Traveler Mayday Mayday 2023 Proudly sponsored by Cyborg Prime Games. You can find me at cyborgprime.com, on Facebook by searching for my name, or through the link in the video description below. We're thrilled to have you join us for the fifth annual Mayday Mayday Traveler Day event, a day dedicated to celebrating Traveler, its various editions and offshoots, and all the fantastic memories it's created around the gaming table with friends and family. I'm your host, Frank Zuccardi, also known as Cyborg Prime, and today it's an absolute honor to introduce our esteemed keynote guest speaker, none other than Mark Miller, one of the brilliant creators of Traveler RPG and the mastermind behind Traveler 5, 5th edition. Uh, welcome back, Mark. Thank you, Frank, for having me. Mark, tell us, how did, how did you come up with the concept of Traveler, and uh, what were your main inspirations for the game? I call myself a classic, classically trained science fiction reader. I spent my entire youth reading science fiction. I have to say I consumed every issue of analog or astounding science fiction. I weekly bought the paperbacks or went to the library. And I'm saying I'm, I started when I was 10. I have read science fiction enthusiastically all of my life. And uh, once upon a time, boy, it's a long story, but we'll try and cut it short. Okay. GDW, GDW Game Designers Workshop was the game company that I uh, established with Frank Chadwick and Rich Banner and Lauren Wiseman back in 1973. And our focus was not science fiction, it was war games. Hex maps with die cut counters and uh, volumes of rules about World War II or obscure uh, South American wars or naval warfare or whatever. But I always kind of wanted to do science fiction, and I was a strong advocate for GW doing that. And so we kind of ventured into science fiction board games. And by that, I mean uh, a game about asteroid mining and a, a game about space battles in a, in a double star system. Interesting games, I thought. In parallel with that, we had a lot of fans who loved our work and enjoyed our work, and we enjoyed some success. And at one point, some war gamers from Detroit came to our offices in central Illinois to talk to us because they were fans and we love to have them. And it's great talking about things like this. They showed us Dungeons and Dragons, which we'd never heard of, and uh, enthusiastically told us how much fun they were having playing with that. Literally, you have to remember that our staff of six or seven people were dedicated game designers. We knew how to play games. We we made our living understanding how games worked and making games for publication. And when we saw this little box set of Dungeons and Dragons, it took about half an hour for us to fully understand its import and how it played, what it did and what it did and how much fun it was. Now, the story I tell is that it just about ruined our company because everybody started playing, creating their Dungeons and Dragons campaigns and playing with each other on Dungeons and Dragons. And after about a week, Frank Chadwick, who was the president and boss of GDW, said uh, he, he would just come up with pronouncements. I remember that we didn't have a board meeting we, we, where we discussed it. He just said, you can't play Dungeons and Dragons while the sun's up. We were getting no work done. We had games that were on the schedule that were being created or tested or written or typeset or whatever, and no work was being done. So we all just said, yes, sir, no games, no playing Dungeons and Dragons while the sun's up. So we waited till the sun went down and the offices were filled with us playing in the evening, but at least we started getting some work done during the day. <laughs> um, that had to be very early in the process of, of Dungeons and Dragons taking over the world. Um, but very soon I said, well, first of all, I had a game typical for GDW, a game, a hex map um, of the stars near Earth and a uh, slower than light transport system 
colonizing other worlds. It was a, a great economic game. It was a, a very tedious game. We called it Imperium. I've used, I recycled the name for another game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we called it Imperium and, and everybody enjoyed it because that's the sort of game we enjoyed playing. Um, but uh, I don't think we ever really seriously considered publishing it. It was way too tedious and deep and complex and everything. But seeing Dungeons and Dragons after several months, I said, you know, we should do Dungeons and Dragons in space. And everybody said, sure, go ahead and do that. That's how we did things at Game Designers Workshop. The designer was actually in charge of everything and just conceptualized it and did whatever work he wanted to do until it got to final form. I see. So I said, sure, I'm going to do that. So whoever whoever brought it up got to uh, just volunteered to do it. <laughs> right. Yep. Yep. I mean, uh, the statistic I give is that Game Designers Workshop, in its 22 years of existence, created one new product, a uh, game, a uh, magazine issue, something, every 22 days for 22 years. That was a very, just a, a endless treadmill of getting things done. So in a very productive period of, uh, in 1976, I worked on creating Traveler. Didn't have a title for it at the beginning, but um, but we wanted to do something different than Spaceman or Star Citizen or Space Marine or Star Fleets or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, we really kind of, we were strongly influenced by a variety of, of science fiction that was out at the time, including Doomerests, Doomerest of Terra, um, Paul Anderson's um, Palazzo Technic League with traders and, you know, um, Andre Norton's uh, Solar Queen, all kinds of science fiction that mm -hmm. any reasonable science fiction reader would have been reading at the time. So we settled on, I settled on Traveler, and then we had to have a, a had to make it sound different. So I put the double L, the British double L, and to, mm -hmm. to distinguish it. You well, deceived me. <laughs> I thought you were British for the longest time, <laughs> based on that. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we announced the title in um, early '77 in anticipation of going to um, Origins Game Show in Staten Island mm -hmm. uh, in the summer, and uh, SPI. We we put it out without really explaining what the title meant or what it was about. Richard Berg at uh, SPI thought it was a uh, a civil war an American Civil War game, because Traveler was Robert E. Lee's horse. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so quite a surprise for them. We worked and worked and worked. I, I showed this system to um, our, my fellow designers, and they would test it. I would come up with some process and show it to them, and they would look at it and enjoy it. And when they had a good time, then it worked. And if it didn't work or they weren't having a good time, we tried other, some other system. Traveler was went live in July of uh, 1977. It's interesting that I spent that year, most of 76 and much of 77, writing not only Traveler, but Imperium, the board game of uh, Interstellar War, and uh, a couple other games just were on my plate as well. So hmm. it shows how hard we worked and how much we worked all the time. That sounds like you guys were pretty prolific with your games and a very busy shop. It was very busy, and we just were, we ate, lived, slept, breathed games. Mm -hmm. Well, so what made you what made you decide on the format of the of the you know eight and a half by eleven kind of folded in half and in, into a booklet? Oh, it, I was TSR had established the format for role playing games: three books in a box. I see a small box, not an eight and a half by eleven box. Mm -hmm. They had established that format. And, and that format, of course, sprung from other books like Chainmail and Tactics and everything else that TSR was putting out. But we were not trying to pioneer a new format. We were trying to literally do Dungeons and Dragons in space. And, and I say that facetiously because I wanted this to be science. I wanted this to be serious science fiction, not science fantasy. I, I kind of, Traveler kind of shades into space opera but it's epic space opera that people enjoy playing. So 
Do you have any uh, favorite adventure campaign that you've written or played in? Oh, my goodness. Of course, everybody who plays Traveler has been playing in my campaign. I, <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> yeah, you know, I wanted, when I started, when this started, I wanted to reproduce the science fiction that I had read. Mm -hmm. And I had read a lot of science fiction. And I soon found that I couldn't duplicate it all. First of all, if, if you actually read with a discerning eye, you find that the, the the science fiction writers rarely told us how their spaceships worked in any detail. Right. And they rarely told us how long it took to get somewhere. Did it take a day? Did it take a week, a month, a couple minutes? Right. Um, they, they didn't tell us. They didn't tell us how much fuel it took. How much does it cost to go there? And of course, that's true. Nobody tells us how much it costs to fuel a, a, a U.S. Navy destroyer to drive to to sail from San Francisco to Japan. They don't tell us how many times they refueled. They don't tell us anything like that. But as players, we soon find we want to know that information. We don't want to run out of fuel. We want to know what we're doing, how we're doing it, what process can I refuel. I found that as I had to answer each of those questions, as the players, my testers asked them, we came up with processes like, how much fuel it takes to travel so from one place to another. I see. Fuel cheap is fuel expensive. All of those details kind of jumped out of the woodwork. Frankly, there were dozens of ways I could answer them. It helps to just have one way, and that's what Traveler did. You know, I'll make the point that Traveler was not intended to be obscure or difficult to play. It was not intended to be... Uh, expensive for a player to play we wanted it to be something that our players could afford to go to another world and do something mm -hmm. they could afford to own a spaceship maybe not easily but they it's within their the realm of their possibility you know captain kirk does not own the star the enterprise right he just is allowed to use it in star wars um, you own your ship Solo owns mm -hmm. right ship. right there are big ships that people don't own but there are ships that people can own. Traveler was intended to be, is intended to be a game where you can do the things that you want to do. And there are some challenges involved in it, but you can do them. Um, it also was supposed to be, is supposed to be understandable. You know, Star Trek is understandable to a player that he understands there's a federation and he understands how the enterprise works. Similarly with Star Wars, we understand that process in there. I wanted Traveler to be intuitive to the player, that he pretty much, if you're a trader, you know you're buying stuff cheap and selling it expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're in the military, you're going somewhere and you're fighting. If you're uh, a scout, you're going somewhere and exploring. And I needed to give the tools to the players. But once they understand what their character is supposed to be doing or what they want their character to do, they can do it, and it pretty how much did makes you, sense. How did you come up with, like, how to scale that? Did you think of, like, you know, it should cost as much as going on a road trip, but, like, bigger, or, like, uh, it should it should be, like, driving a semi, or, like, you know, um, how did you come up with, you know, how much a person would make in a, you know, your, your, your salaries versus how much a ship costs and that kind of um, economy? Uh, well, it was trial and error. I mean, we... <laughs> It was trial and error. I came up with numbers and, oh, this is too cheap. Everybody gets a ship. So that doesn't work. Let's bump this number up. You know, I picked credits. That's a great science fiction unit of exchange. Mm -hmm. And it was about, a, you know, about a dollar. The uh, credit's about a dollar. So uh, uh, one credit will buy you a snack or something. And mm -hmm. 10 credits will buy you something more. And I, I didn't want to get into hyperinflation. A million credits is a lot of money. A person can easily handle a couple hundred credits or a couple thousand, but doesn't easily have access to hundreds of thousands. Um, sure. But it, you know, just like Monty Hall, sometimes you have a, an ex expedition that gets you a lot of money. Right. Or you can pull your resources with other players and, and buy yourself a ship. That's, uh, you know, one of the things about, about role-playing when it was all shiny and new back in the uh, 70s with early Dungeons and & Dragons and with the other role-playing games that showed up, 
is that there was no analysis of what it was. We were all playing it by the seat of our pants. Right. And it's only over time that we have distilled the some of the important parts of role playing, like nobody has enough power by themselves to go exploring or to make things work. You need friends. And uh, one guy's the pilot, one guy's the gunner, one guy's the engineer. Uh, you kind of have that like kind of Star Trek ensemble, if you will, you know. That's right. That, that mm -hmm. Everybody complements and supplements each other. Mm -hmm. And it's more fun playing with a bunch of people than it is trying to do it alone. What's your What are your thoughts on the current state of the tabletop industry? Um, where do you see it going in the future? And what do you think of like uh, virtual tabletops and things like that? Every part of role playing has its attraction. That I have played um, um, console games, uh, the computer games, the virtual tabletops. The greatest challenge we have is getting a three or four other people to sit down with us at a set time every week to play. And I think virtual tabletop goes a long way to removing the geographical separations that we have. At the same time, there's nothing like sitting around and playing in the, at the dining, at the dining table, uh, being right there with your people and uh, seeing their faces and understanding their thoughts and, and doing that. You know, that's, we have the rise of, of the rise of the continuation of, of conventions that there are people who go to conventions and they, uh, I go to conventions. I'm sorry that the pandemic had stopped my attendance. That people like playing at a table with somebody else. You know, our, our, our hobby is blessed because there are people who want to play and there are people who want to game master and that, that, I'm I'm always impressed with the preparation that game masters do, planning to come to a convention and set up a game and play it with people, and they have a wonderful time. But that preparation from the game master is is just a labor of love. Yeah, I I agree. I like uh, if it wasn't for VTT, I, there would be some games that I wouldn't have ever done and people I never would have met. So. Um, yay for VTT. <laughs> we have, uh, in my traveler game, uh, I have two, two players from Canada, a player from Australia, uh, and uh, another player from here in Santa Fe. So, uh, it's a way to bring people from all over the world who with the, you know, love of, uh, and passion for traveler. So I yeah, personally love it. Let's talk about player agency, uh, and player choice and traveler. Um, your your life events kind of toss and turn you through uh through your life uh, in traveler um as you go along i mean you you apply for a job you don't get it um you, ha you end up in a different path but but then there's also you know um house rules and things like that that people play with but how do you balance player agency and player choice um with your own vision of the game story and setting Life isn't well. Life, life would be very comfortable if every choice you made was the right choice, and uh, every uh, endeavor you did uh, had wonderful rewards. Before I got into gaming, I was after I got out of college, I joined the army. I expected to spend a career in the army. I had been in ROTC in college. I graduated with a a, a, um, a commission, mm -hmm. and off I went. I dedicated my life at that point. That was what I was going to do. I spent a year in Vietnam. I came back, and uh, the Army had decided that it didn't need 600,000 men anymore, and I was one of those that they selected to not continue in the Army. And that's one of the choices in Traveler Character Generation. You, know, mm -hmm. you join, and they decide you're not going to stay. Outside forces control your fate just as much as your own choices. Right. Um, I thought it was important to not give people a career path that they could just decide they were going to do something and then they do it and there they are. Um, they still can through luck of the dice. They, they yeah. can, but, but mm -hmm. you know, the, the dice make decisions that we wouldn't make. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's the other thing that, that there's a discussion I'm following on Twitter right now about systems that let play, that make players die. Mm. And uh, you shouldn't do that. That's player player death is is traumatic or triggering. I don't mean to 
minimize that. I don't mean to to some gloss over that. I think it, player death is, is a difficult process. Mm-hmm. You know, when I write when I write fiction, I have trouble killing people. <laughs> <laughs> you have to kill your darlings, they say. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and and so, but at the same time, if we didn't have this initial in the initial character generation player death everybody would be an admiral with a lot of money and a ship right um, no well player death yeah. during character generation is one of the endearing things of traveler i mean it's well known for that yeah, but at least you I, die yeah. up front instead of after you've <laughs> fallen in love with yeah, your character right it's, <laughs> it's part of the brand um, <laughs> and and you know we all we all are aware even in our lives that we some things we don't do because you can die in real life, you know, and, and some people we know that one kid in high school who always liked to drive his car fast and he ended up crashing and he's dead and he didn't get past high school. There right. are choices that we make and, and death is one of those consequences of making bad decisions. And we've carried it over into Traveler that, you know, gunfights are deadly. It's the best choice is not to get in a gunfight, find some other option. People want to have combat. Dungeons and Dragons has combat. Traveler has combat. Mm-hmm. Smart people don't get in combat. They find some other answer to what we do. Sure. Um, yeah, I like uh, I like that. You know, the 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 death feature. Um, I mean, because like look at that tv show deadliest catch those guys are just catching lobsters which are just like they go into the traps they don't have to fight the lobster or anything right but you know you do have to worry about getting tangled up in wires and ropes and blown overboard and you know you just went out for a you know to catch some some lobsters and now you're dead (laughs) so uh yeah it happens and i think that simulation carried over into traveler paid off thank you in a lot of ways yeah yeah it's cool uh, let's talk about Traveler's reputation for being a more realistic science uh, fi- sci-fi game. You mentioned earlier you wanted to make a, a science fiction, not necessarily science fantasy. So um, how did you... Um, let's talk about your approach to creating a plausible future setting and also, like, where does psionics fit into that? Because, um, you know, uh, a lot of... There's controversy about psionics being woo magic or whatever, and uh, how does that fit in with the with the plausible, realistic aspects of the game, um, or how was it intended anyway? All, yeah. Well, first of all, I wanted the science fiction. I wanted the traveler to be realistic, um, which is why I went with a skill system and a levelless system. We don't just get better when we do things or get stronger. That's uh, in, in fact. One of the things I put in, I wrote Traveler when I was 30, and I looked at these characters and I said, you know, they're going to get old and they're going to get less able, not more able after a point, you know, Mm -hmm. you get better and then you get worse. I had a conversation with um, somebody who has done the high jump every year since he was 12. He's 80 now. And he's like Jack the Lane. <laughs> yeah, and, and so and he he's an enthusiast. He was a coach. He he's an enthusiastic physical education person. And he said, when you start out every year as you compete, you try and get better. And then there is a point where you, you don't get better, and you try to get less worse every year. And there's this 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 uh, bell curve of achievement versus age and i looked i i looked at that concept for aging so i made a rule that didn't say you just automatically get worse when you're at this age and that age but you there's a chance the dice impel something you mm-hmm. can struggle mightily and maybe not get worse but uh if you played traveler and encountered the aging system mm-hmm. one of the points i make is that now here it is i've gone through that aging system I should be very pleased. It was a very real, realistic aging. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, it's good. Um, 
I, I do like it. And um, I like how, you know, like you say, uh, there's you're not guaranteed injuries or whatever, but, you know, it happens. And um, but, you know, one of the other cool things is when you're rolling up your character and you have personal development, so you can kind of like beef up your stats in anticipation of get, growing old. Yep. If yep. if that's your plan, you know, with your character, even though that may not play out. But <laughs> and, and, and isn't it interesting that that personal development is not all that great? It's plus one point. Uh-huh. Uh huh. You know, I must have spent that year weight, lifting weights, and my my strength is a <laughs> an eight instead of a seven. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, which some of that kind of reveals my own attitude towards physical education. <laughs> you know, how beneficial it is to spend your life going to the gym every day <laughs> <laughs> my players uh wanted to uh, increase the gravity level on their ship so that over time they would grow stronger oh, yeah. well, that, that's <laughs> Sure, I'd give them that bonus for that. Yeah, I was like, okay, you've been doing that for you know six months now, and I have really beefy legs. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so how so how did you kind of how how would you mesh then? Uh, you know, like your the the realism of the of the game compared to some of the other games, like um, you know, you got well, let me think, like Shadowrun's another sci-fi, but that's kind of, you know that's fantasy and cyberpunk. Um, how do you and then you know with with star wars and 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 star trek they already have like established lore so like how how do you come up with that and how do you make sure that your game is, has a more realistic feel i mean aside from the aging thing i mean just the overall thing has a more realistic feel to it but you know if you we're really talking about the three little black books from a long time ago you know, mm -hmm. i think the lore has has built over time oh that's but, true the concept in in those three little black books was to give enough background that the players could understand what they wanted to do and 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 work the game master could pretty much flesh it out it was a generic interstellar empire i was influenced by classic science fiction mm -hmm. you know recently amazon did um foundation right Isaac Asimov's foundation i haven't seen it i hope it's good you know, it's based on Traveler. They wrote that in 1947. Traveler was written in 1977. <laughs> One of those influenced the other, I'm sure. You know. <laughs> the idea of, of Foundation, a galactic empire, makes a lot of sense. The original Traveler was all humans, mm -hmm. you may remember. Everything was easy for somebody to pick that game up, generate characters, and at the end of the first session, somebody has a merchant character, somebody has a scout, somebody has a soldier... Somebody has just some Han Solo rogue type guy. Mm -hmm. There you are. And right. then you go off and do something. And then the game master, there were very little ideas on what to play. The idea was that the game master would come up with something. You know, a, an early review of Traveler, the reviewer said, there aren't any adventures. We need adventures. I don't want to play a game. I, I want the publisher to give me a structure to play in. And the editor of the zine inserted in italics right after that, and I won't play a game that gives me situations. I want to make up my own. We have two sides. We have the guys who want to make up their own adventures and build their own universe, and the guys who don't have time or don't want to spend the time making that up, they want us to provide it. We got a lot of demand for people to make up stories for us to play. And so after about a year of just producing the game itself without adventures, we started producing adventures. Mm -hmm. People wanted them. People were looking for them. Anything, you know, if, let's explore this ancient, strange structure. Let's explore this ship. Let's go do this mercenary operation with the military thing that's going on. Mm -hmm. Let's explore this world. Let's be marooned on a world and have to get back to civilization. All of those ideas are things that people want to play. They can make them up themselves, mm -hmm. but they wanted to buy it on the shelf and not have to make it up themselves, have something to play that night when they got home. 
that's a big help to gms because really i mean well you know there uh, as a gm there's a lot of prep work and if some of that could be offloaded into a pre-made module that you can that's kind of standalone that you can just stick into your game that has a high value so and, and you know no no plan survives contact with the enemy no module no pre-written adventure survives contact with the game master mm -hmm. he changes this he changes that he wants this different you know you know dungeons and dragons origins were in miniatures that the people who did dungeons and dragons were used to playing with little lead figures they painted up and multi-sided dice they were used to that because that's the miniatures area Traveler was strongly influenced by board war games because that was our background. So we moved quickly to hex maps and uh, die cut counters mm -hmm. in that area rather than the miniatures area. We eventually did miniatures. I enjoy miniatures. There's plenty of fun to do with miniatures. But uh, we wanted to give deck plans for ships instead of models of ships. Uh, how did you decide to just do like a, uh, the, on the maps, to just do like a flat, like slice? Instead of like, I mean, how did you do it? Well, you know, I'm, I know like making a 3D map would be a nightmare. Um, so, but how did you just decide? Mm -hmm. We had looked at doing it. We had information on 3D space. And it just did not add to the experience mm -hmm. of players. You know, um just like a, a realistic science fiction game, role-playing game, that acknowledged that you can't go faster than the speed of light is not nearly as much fun as space opera where you can go to the stars mm -hmm. and see other worlds. Right. Well, we also... Uh, 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 two points determine a line. It's th That's two-dimensional. If I'm going from here to there, that's all I need is the two-dimensional flat map. Mm -hmm. It's easier to understand, it's easier to play with, and adding a third dimension did not add an especially lot of information or fun in our play tests, and so mm -hmm. we stayed with flat maps. So what, what were some of the biggest challenges you faced designing and publishing travel over the years, and how have you uh, overcome them? Biggest challenges is getting in front of players who want to play and uh, telling them how great Traveler is. You know, a challenge, I think a lot of people pick it up and they know exactly what it does when they pick it up and they just go with it. Dungeons and Dragons has a strong appeal to all kinds of people. All kinds, you know, frankly, let's see how to express this. In American society today, every kid when he's between 10 and 12 encounters Dungeons and Dragons. Doesn't mean he plays it doesn't mean he understands it. It doesn't mean he enjoys it. But every kid in America somehow encounters it. And if it resonates with them, they get into it. Maybe they get into it hard. Maybe they prefer being on the baseball team. I don't know. But it is a new experience for them. Just like, you know, I remember when I was 12, I encountered Monopoly. Mm -hmm. you play Monopoly. It, it's a game. Everybody knows it. Everybody learns how to play Monopoly at some point in their life. If you really get into it, that's fine. If you don't, but there's a point where you learn how to play it. And by the time, and so everybody in America kind of knows how to play Monopoly. Right. But uh, today, everybody in America kind of knows how to play Dungeons and Dragons. And it, it's a generic term. Because they may not be playing with the D and D rules, but they at least know how to create a character and how to go from there. Right, and they understand what that means to play. I, I've noticed, uh, I, heard, I heard on the news the other night somebody referencing D and D, and I was like, "Wow, it's crazy that like a news somebody on the new like a newscaster was uh, yeah. talking about you know some D and D thing." <laughs> I don't remember what. I wish I rem remembered, but I was amazed at the time. It's like, look, I told my wife, look, it's just like snuck into pop, you know, pop culture. Part of <laughs> and you know, there are people who get into it, but the fantasy does not work for them. You know, um, I get emails all the time from people who rediscover Traveler or mm -hmm. have always been in Traveler, but they they talk about how at that point somewhere when they were 10 or 12 or in high school, 
They learned about Dungeons and Dragons. They learned about role playing. They discovered Traveler. Mm -hmm. Traveler is what resonated with them. That's what happened to me. They, mm -hmm. they did not read well. They did not math didn't work for them. Mm -hmm. There are challenges that they had, and Traveler helped them, you know, become an astrophysicist. I mean, my goodness, it must it be. It must be very rewarding for you. Made them, yeah, it's not Traveler that made them an astrophysicist. They had that in them all the time. Traveler is right. a mechanism which helped them understand. Mm -hmm. One of the stories I tell is that my grandson, who was eight at the time, wanted to play Traveler. You know, he and, and playing with an eight-year-old is different than playing with a teen because they just wanted. Who, they're not quite sure what they were doing, but they want to play with grandfather, and so. But anyway, I sent him off. I, I told him how to generate a character. I sent him off and generated a character. He generated a character and came back. And I don't. And he made it up. He he worked with the information I gave him. He came back and he had a, a Varger character named Kutz who had two billion credits. And I don't know to my this day how he got two billion credits, but he did. <laughs> uh -huh. He knew enough of how many zeros there were in a billion, and he had two and nine zeros and eight of so so. You know, you you deal with a an eight year old different than you do a teen, and so he went on an adventure and he got in his spaceship and they went up and and uh, I prefixed everything with space. You know, he went to this space restaurant and had lunch. He mm -hmm. went to the space space fuel station and got fuel, uh -huh. and it all just worked. It resonated. We had a wonderful time. He ate a but, space burger. <laughs> yeah. But literally, he had uh, bought lunch at the space restaurant. Mm -hmm. And I said it was 22 <laughs> credits, you know. And so he laboriously subtracted 22 from his 2 billion credits. <laughs> and then he had 1 billion 900. And, and I really had to respect that. He was confident enough that he could subtract and carry and borrow enough to, mm -hmm. to change from two billion to two billion minus twenty-two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and then also that, like you know, not realizing that when you have two billion dollars, you don't really have to track two dollars. You know. The the rounding error. Um, but but the self confidence that he had is is one of those things that that I I enjoy and, and admire about role playing that. There's a magazine, there's 17, a magazine, and one of my realizations somewhere in my life is that it's not for 17-year-olds, it's for 12-year-old girls. And it's filled with heartthrob interviews with, with romantic leads, what eyeshadow does, and all these things about role-playing as a modern girl. And it, 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 it's educating them about, about gender roles and everything else. The equivalent in, in for boys is boys' life, which unfortunately, and I say unfortunately, was all about boy scouting and maybe sports. Mm -hmm. um, and role playing, whether it's Traveler or Dungeons and Dragons or anything else, is for those young men, works for those young men, to teach them modern social and employment skills. They know how to add and subtract. They know how to plan a trip because if they don't remember to pack the food on their little expedition that they're making, they run out. They, you know, mm -hmm. traveler is filled with having enough fuel to get there, and if you run out, you've got a problem. Right. Um, it's about life support. It's about navigating on uh, in a strange area. Mm -hmm. so uh, choosing to that. negotiate instead of fight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. <laughs> survival skill there. <laughs> and and I think that, that American society, a society in general, is better for having this role-playing system available for them to kind of experiment with being an adult than doing something, mm -hmm. instead of just being thrown on it once somewhere after they get out of high school. High school doesn't teach you, most high school does not teach you most of these skills. And... Uh, they're valuable skills to have. Yeah, if they had uh, taught 
um, algebra by gaming, I would have learned it faster. <laughs> Actually, I was already doing algebra, not realizing it. So there you go. <laughs> that or vectors or um... vector. Uh, the uh, I mentioned the other day the metric system. Uh, never would have mastered the metric system without Traveler because in American society, there's no application for it aside from maybe fixing your car with metric tools. You know. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we just don't use it at all. Mm -hmm. You know, Harry Potter t taught, uh, showed that a lot of kids who didn't think they could read could read. You know, Dungeons and Dragons and Traveler do the same thing. That uh, at some point, our company had a, a reading analysis done of the rules we were writing, and of Dungeons and Dragons rules. You know, and the the, the reading level of those books is is twelfth grade, early college in some mm -hmm. cases. Right. And um, and a kid who is not considered to be a good reader can pick these things up and he wants to know what they are. Mm -hmm. And he will read with wonderful comprehension mm -hmm. because he cares. And that's something that we kind of lose out on, miss out on. It's the motivation that makes us achieve role playing, gaming, fiction, Harry Potter. All those mm -hmm. things are just the tools that help kids understand that they have the ability to do something right if, you never know where that motivation is going to come from right that's right right that's do right. you have any uh exciting new developments uh for the traveler five universe coming out with any we were just talking about adventures and how people like you to provide adventures you're gonna um put out a line um, of adventures or um what do you what do you got going on at traveler five we're working on on some adventures it, it's kind of slow going you know traveler we, we've got two parallel Traveler game systems out there, Mongoose Traveler mm -hmm. and Traveler 5. Mm -hmm. And uh, they kind of have set, you may recall that when we produced Traveler, the first version, mm -hmm. uh, it was three little black books. And then dozens of little black books after that. Right. Collaborating on high guard space combat or mercenary ground combat or exploration in scouts or merchant prints and all those details well and then we've gone through several editions many editions and uh traveler five takes all of that thought and makes a coherent whole out of it mm -hmm. of course it's it's eight nine hundred pages right now it's um, a sci-fi gaming compendium but it's like everything yeah. you need uh, it's like a framework for every kind of thing and, you know, Matthew Sprange at Mongoose asks me a question sometimes and says, you know, what about this? And I pull out Traveler 5, and, and there I have something about technological levels or, or ideas or making things or, or all those answers that the ultimate system is Traveler 5. Mm -hmm. But it's... It, the tool toolkit, the ultimate toolkit for the game master mm -hmm. who wants to make things up. Right. On the other hand, Mongoose Traveler is a great thing with pre-generated rule uh, scenarios or universes or everything else, and he's doing a great job. I I don't mean to say you should play Traveler Five, but not Mongoose Traveler. Mm -hmm. My idea is you should be following Mongoose Traveler religiously. But you should have Traveler 5 for those things that you want to make up yourself. Yeah, those, that's a good way to have those two uh, product lines complement each other. You know, you know, and Traveler 5 is making use of all of the lessons that we've had over time. That we had uh, Classic Traveler, and then we had Traveler, uh, Mega Traveler, and then we had New Era. We had something called Fire Fusion and Steel, which is mm -hmm. uh, uh, trying to have rules on making on building the things that you wanted to build ships and uh, weapons and uh, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. It's a construction system, fire, fusion, and steel. Right. Um, but you had to have an engineering degree to do that. <laughs> it was extremely, re trying to be extremely realistic. And so Traveler 5 under took, learned that lesson and in created something instead what I call makers, the way to build a, a robot or a, an Android or iPad or whatever mm -hmm. without necessarily have to, having to understand the engineering details behind it. 
because we've learned some lessons and some words, some some natural dead ends that we had to revise and change and make it easier for players to use. And that's what Traveler 5 does. It's really, I'm very happy with Traveler 5. And I think that anybody who's playing Traveler should have that set. It's a major investment. Mm -hmm. But it's there to really help you understand all the depth of detail possible in the system. Most adventures don't use a lot of detail. They just go somewhere and do something and shoot some guy and come back and leave. <laughs> my, pl my player's a little bit more subtle they drown them in the creek <laughs> um so um <laughs> yeah i love i love big thick rule books uh the my uh, uh i like the uh hero system like i used to play champions and still do now and then but uh like the the hero system five book is like ginormous and uh, when i saw how big the uh traveler five book was i was like yes <laughs> you see and you are my natural customer <laughs> drool uh, <yes. laughs> um all right so let's talk about uh the traveler community and um the game's been around for over 40 years so what do you think's been the key to its enduring popularity out in the sci-fi gaming community you know, there are many kinds of Traveler players. Traveler has always lent itself to what I call solitaire play. You know, that, that you can have an enjoyable evening creating worlds or characters or starships. You can have an enjoyable session all by yourself making something or building something in Traveler. Mm -hmm. Um you may tell yourself that you're preparing for an adventure that you're going to run with your players. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is you're going to enjoy that preparation session for itself. Um, there are, you know, I used to have a, a, a gaming group during my classic traveler period that did not know anything about the rules. Mm -hmm. They just told me what they wanted to do. They enjoyed sitting around, on the couch or we weren't sitting in front of a map. We were just sitting around and I was telling them you've landed on this world and they, and what are you going to do? And they would tell me what they wanted to do and I would resolve it. And they enjoyed self telling an adventuresome story. Um, and, and they were not constrained by the rules. Like they, um, do you know what a rat guard is on a hawser? So a hawser is a, um, the rope that ties a ship to the dock. Okay. Okay, and a rat guard is kind of like a Victorian collar that your dog gets. It's just a, a metal cone that they tie that they put on the on the rope so the rats can't climb up onto the ship. And so I, you know, um, my players had landed on this on this world, and unfortunately, there was a a mass of space badgers. <laughs> <laughs> they had to walk through <laughs> to get to the treasure, you know. That's what mm -hmm. they had to do. You know, you know, it just it was just the whole ground was covered with little toothy badgers that were terrible. Uh -huh. And so so they um devised a bunch of badger boots, they call them, <laughs> which big big a big kind of skirt around them so the badgers couldn't climb up their legs and then they waded through the badgers to get to the treasure and get it and get back to the ship. You know? It still sticks with me because mm -hmm. there are no rules for making badger boots. They just right. said what they wanted to do. We figured out how to do them. I hoped that none of them would trip and fall in this sea of, of ravening badgers. But they enjoyed, you know, that was their imagination on how they were going to do it. And mm -hmm. they did it, and they enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I still remember that episode 40 years later. Uh -huh. Because I don't, you know, that's the magic, not just of Traveler, but of role-playing, is that the ideas that come from the players mm -hmm. tell us the story. Yeah, it's... I cannot make up stories the way they can, as they literally live as the characters and get through this. Right. And uh, 
But that's the beauty of role playing, isn't it? It's the shared. Um, we're all imagining the same scene. We all have a different view of it in our heads, but yes. at the same time, we also have a common point of reference. And so, right. you know, one of my players, um, they were sneaking up on a on a space station and the space station was in an asteroid field and um so they parked the ship behind uh some big asteroid kind of like in the sensor blind spot and then they sent one guy in uh with his grav belt and spacesuit to fly onto the uh space station and he's uh, he's the engineer so he got on their sensor array and misaligned it so the ship could come in i mean it was like all this big crazy complicated rube goldberg thing that they came up with and everybody rolled well and they rescued the scientists from the yeah, space did, station yeah. yeah and so but there was you know tense moments of flying yourself in your spacesuit through the asteroid field and asteroids flying around and you know you have to dodge them and not get detected and you know it's uh yeah, it's just a fun fun game and so and, creative and, and and so often these people see things that we don't see you know that that what crazy mind is there that comes up with that mm -hmm. and they do you know mm -hmm. and, and and it is as much fun it is more fun than some of these television dramas right no so fun i mean because everybody got to pitch in the the pilot had to park the ship just so the engineer had to put down all the uh the levels of energy so that they you know didn't get scanned the the guy who's doing the spacewalk had to you know have good vac suit skills and everybody got a little chance to shine on this mission and um so that's that's uh that's what makes it uh, enduring for me as a player and gm is um just all the crazy stuff that happens at the gaming table is just so funny and like to talk about for years to come <laughs> i know i agree <laughs> So can you talk about how the Traveler community has evolved over the years and uh, what role you see it playing in the future of the game? Like, how was it at first? Did, I mean, there was at first just so few players, and now, I mean, there's like, it's all over the internet and so many, it seems to be undergoing a renaissance. So back there when we started this, when I was this, I say this unusually creative period, writing this and playing with my fellow, my co-workers at Game Designers Workshop, as well as we were just playing because it was fun. I mean, we, nobody gave a thought to anything except this was fun and we were enjoying it. You know, there were the, there's still this undercurrent of is, is Dungeons and Dragons satanic and, uh, you know. The Stranger Things isn't helping. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I remember the uh, the the accusations. There was literally a um, um, of the uh, mazes and monsters and and people committing suicide. Mm -hmm. there, there was I I'm always struck by this. It's not travelers so much as Dungeons and Dragons, but the brilliant people in the industry tackled that problem. And here's what they said. There's a criticism that Dungeons and Dragons players end up killing themselves because we have some instances. And so they compiled a list. The game, the game people then took that list and said, okay, you're making your best possible case that Dungeons and Dragons is dangerous for children, for kids. Here's all these lists of people. And, you know, if you analyze the list, this kid was into drugs and he played Dungeons and Dragons and he mm -hmm. died of an overdose. You know, mm -hmm. I wonder what the cause of that was. You know, right. this kid had a, um, a, a troubled childhood or, and, and all this stuff. But, but the, the game people then said, let's just take their list at face value. They've given us, they've scoured the statistics. They've given us a list of as every possible suicide connection with Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. They got a number. We looked at sales numbers. We looked at how many people play Dungeons and Dragons. They got the number for the suicide rate in America for teens in general. And then they compared the numbers. And the suicide rate for kids who play Dungeons and Dragons is an order of magnitude lower than the general suicide rate in America. That means that Dungeons and Dragons kids who played playing Dungeons and Dragons inoculates against suicide. Mm -hmm. You 
should encourage your kids to play Dungeons and Dragons because it actively, statistically lessens the chance of them committing suicide. That's the truth about this hobby. Mm -hmm. And then we, and I go from there. We wanted to play this game because it was fun. We wanted to play role playing because we enjoyed it. Today, 40 years later, it's a major mainstream hobby that every kid knows about and the kids who want to play do that we have grandfathers playing with grandsons we mm -hmm. have parents playing with children the largest convention in the state of indiana annually is gen con which is a gaming convention it's not some thing convention or anything else, it's role-playing, and it gets more people there than the, it, you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So so what we've changed is we just started it because it was a game, uh, a, an endeavor that we enjoyed. We still enjoy it. Mm -hmm. More people enjoy it than ever, and it's a good, wholesome hobby. I mean, right. And, and I'll, I'll go one step farther. The um, the kids, the, the youth at my church mm -hmm. play role playing in the basement when they are in the church fooling around. But who would expect? And I didn't expect that. But they yeah, that's come a long way. Um, has come a long way from being kind of a spooky thing that people didn't understand to just being more mainstream and people just realizing, um, you know. Uh, if you're religious or whatever, God gave you gave you a brain, you know, and you should use it. You know, <laughs> uh, He gave you a creativity, and uh, this is a way to express that. Um, so, uh, but that's my opinion, you know. Mm -hmm. I'll go one step farther because role playing lets people experiment with things that are hard to experiment with in real life. I. This is kind of a triggering story, but you know, I at, at one point these were some teens, probably a high school junior or senior, playing um, Dungeons and Dragons, and they were looting and burning a village. Mm -hmm. They were attacking it, and and they were going through, and they were very methodically killing the villagers and burning the village huts. You know, and I, oh my goodness, I beyond me, I but they were doing it, and. Uh, I have to say, they got that out of their system. <laughs> Thankfully, no real villagers were harmed during this game. <laughs> yes, no real villagers were harmed. But yeah, I guess everybody does, guys, like, try, like, let's be anti-heroes. Let's see if we can, you know, what's it like to be the bandit, you know? Or what's it like to be the right. warlord or, you know? Um, and then you realize it's not really rewarding or, I don't know, not for me. I guess some people, you know, that's kind of like... I don't know if this is related or whatever, but this brings to mind uh, the TV show MASH that showed that, you know, war is not glorious. War is guts and blood and intestines and, you know, uh, misery. Uh, and uh, I think that role playing can kind of teach the same sorts of things virtually, you know, on a, on a virtual battlefield and you're, uh, through, the, through the experience of the game. Uh, no, I know it's not the same as like real battle, but you're, you know, you can get a taste for what kind of things happen on a battlefield and then decide, okay. you know, that's not really for me. And maybe, maybe, maybe glorifying violence was not such a great idea <laughs> or, you know, whatever it's like you say, work it out of your system and, and go, you know, it's much more fun trying to become a rich merchant or exploring strange new worlds or, uh, you know, fighting people only when we have to, um, you know, and, and exercising their brain, mm -hmm. exercising their, so developing their social skills. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Cause vaporizing everything you come across doesn't really advance any story. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, well, I think we already addressed that question. I was going to ask you, what, what do you think tra sets Traveler apart from other tabletop RPGs? What, why should someone try uh, Traveler out as opposed to, uh, you know, getting into D and D or whatever? There are some people who like fantasy. There are some people who like science fiction. Mm -hmm. There's some people. Dungeons and Dragons is about heroic fantasy. Traveler is about science fiction and it's about problem solving mm -hmm. 
I think, you know, there are adventures, there's reasons to go there, but, but it's about problem solving, understanding, working out what process you will use to achieve your goals. Forget the educational aspects, forget the, the, the socialization aspects, all the things that we as parents want our children to involve themselves with. Just in, involving yourself, put yourself in the story. This is a way to tell a story, to enjoy and to flex your mental muscles and enjoy yourself. It, it, it is, there are so many different ways of resolving issues and there are so many different people and how they do it. And that interplay is entertaining, but it's also a, a kind of self understand, gaining an understanding of self that, that any introspective person after they've played this, under, it's not just traveler, anything, Mm -hmm. Role playing helps you understand yourself mm -hmm. um, and having a good time doing it. Right. So, Mark, have you tried other, uh, have you played other uh, sci fi role playing games? Uh, ever done like Alternity or, um, or uh, Space Opera or, um, uh, you yeah, know, I, Gamma World or any other sci fi? Uh... I certainly played those at the, at, I, I certainly played, um, um, Metamorphosis Alpha when it first came out, I wanted mm -hmm. to see what that was. Starfaring, Star Frontiers. I enjoy Cthulhu. Uh, I, I just think that concept is just just brilliant. Um, the the sanity I, loss and so forth, the going the mad. Uh -huh. I mean, I've stolen that. That's in Traveler Five. You know, uh -huh. you have you have sanity if you care to track that. You know, um, um, and and I, I'm I'm going to veer off for a minute because. There, there are tools within Traveler that let you address things that sometimes you, some specific people want to address. Sanity is one of them. I mean, in, in Cthulhu, it's, you know, desperately trying to understand what's going on before you devolve into insanity. You know, and cart it off to the sanitarium. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, but, but Traveler has... A, a, a not very well developed process of dealing with mental health issues. And so you can play a character who has a mental health issue mm -hmm. and uh, um, it, it's not very well developed, but it's there. And I think that some people would benefit by playing that mm -hmm. to see how that influences their life. One of the, one of the things um, I, I, uh appreciated from the hero system was their disadvantage system you get so many points to build your character but you can get some extra bonus points if you take disadvantages and the disadvantages could be things like you have a code against killing or you um you're enraged when you see you know somebody getting bullied or you know have psychological limitations you could have you could be addicted to drugs you could be uh you could have a dependent npc you know who's like your aunt may or whatever you have to kind of take care of her and uh keep her you know yeah, you have yeah. a secret identity yeah. to maintain you know all of these things and it kind of makes a th brings your character to life because you're like oh no i can't kill the bad guy i have a code against killing i could i have to just call the police and hold them here until they get here or you know whatever and it really adds like an extra dimension onto the game so i always encourage people if they can get into your character you know get game get books like uh, i have this um rpg um character backstory book um yeah, yeah. yeah there's uh yeah. heroes of tomorrow the uh, central casting um you know, plus, you know, regular Mongoose Traveler gives you life events and you can really play off of those. And, um, okay, and, uh, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, I read something somewhere. I saw something where they said you're, you're adventuring and you encounter a guy with an eye patch and missing a hand and you wonder, oh no, <laughs> what did he dump those stats into? <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to our next question, which is, uh, can you discuss the impact that Traveler's had on the wider sci-fi genre, um, both in gaming and in pop culture? Like, I've heard rumors that um, Joss Whedon's Firefly was heavily influenced by uh, Traveler, and then now the upcoming Starfield video game, uh, people are talking about how, how reminiscent it is of Traveler. Do you have any insight on that? You know, Traveler's benefits by being the first. Uh, you know, I, we can quibble about which was, i say, the first major science fiction role-playing game. And I think it has set a standard that, that games are still trying to, to beat. 
but that they may do something better in one way or another. But Traveler really handles the basic structure of science fiction role playing that any other role playing game, science fiction role playing game, I, I think they've struggled to do better. And I don't know that they have. Uh, of course, Starfield is based on travel, you know, mm -hmm. because Traveler is this basic foundation. But not just Star Trek, not just Starfield, but you know, Elite and Wing Commander and mm -hmm. uh, Star and Citizen, Pro you know, it's, mm -hmm. Elite. Uh huh. It's funny when people uh, talk about those games; they say it's like Traveler, it's like video game Traveler. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, so well, that's what they say. Yeah, and and you know, so Starfield has all probably twenty five worlds. Yeah. Oh, well, that's cute! You got twenty five <laughs> worlds. <laughs> I've got 25 worlds on this page. Go over here. Uh -huh. um, but we just give you the codes, and you can make them up yourself. You, uh -huh. can, um, you can. You have to interpret the codes to understand what they are. They, of course, have detailed them in much more detail. Right. Uh, but you know, I'm I, frankly, of course, you know, anybody worth his salt who's going to sit down and start doing a role-playing game or a computer game. Is going to look at the existing literature and mm -hmm. and uh, I, I I'm prejudiced when I say this, but if you're going to look at the existing literature, so you go out and buy a bunch of science fiction role playing games. Here's Traveler. Here's Gamma World. Here's Metamorphosis Alpha, and here's um, Star Frontiers. Mm -hmm. Which one are you going to base it on? Right. You base it on Traveler because Traveler deals with all the things you need to know at the foundation, and you say, okay. I'm going to change how spaceships work. But you changing from something that is a basic structure. And then you do it because it fits what you're trying to achieve. I'm going to change how worlds work. Yes, but you're going to keep most of it and then change the details. You're going to add some detail that you think is important. But mm -hmm. the foundation is there. Of course, they based it on travel. Right, right. So how do you balance the needs of uh, veterans players who've been uh, gaming for decades with the needs of newer players who might be unfamiliar? I'm working on something like that. We have free RPG day, and I'm working towards something for that. Mm -hmm. But when I think about it, I'm not going to teach people how to play role-playing. I'm not. I'm, that just That's not our purpose. First of all, they encountered Dungeons and Dragons and somebody rolled the dice for them the first time and they have some idea of what it is. And I think you think about free RPG day. So somebody's going to, uh, these game stores are going to have a free RPG, but it's mostly for the, the choir that already is singing the praises of role playing. They come in and they get it to add to their collection. Mm -hmm. Those are not reaching out to most new untried, uneducated, untrained, unexperienced people who want to get into gaming or don't even know if they want to get into gaming. I had something I ran at Gen Con some time ago, and I'm working on a, rev a, a revision of that. I don't think it's so much for free RPG day as just handing out all year long, which is a character generator. Mm -hmm. Or somebody who's brand new, you know, here's what this is about. Here's how to generate your character. Here's what your character means at the end of it. Here's how old he is. Here's what his rank is. Here's what he owns. He's got this gun. He's got this, this tickets to go somewhere. All of those, those sparks that prompt you to want to do something. Some rules in the back about how you use your characters to resolve issues or set tasks or whatever. Mm -hmm. That is what brings new people into the hobby. Mm -hmm. and of course, most of the time it's there because an experienced person hands it to someone who's expressed some interest. Right. That's what we want to do is give that to people and they'll either be interested or they won't. I can't make them want to play, but mm -hmm. we need a tool. And that's the tool that I'm actually, I was working on it earlier today. That's the tool. That's a great idea. That's a good idea because when people have that character, now they want to play. Um, yeah. And uh, I've experienced that. Mm-hmm. I was running a yeah, game at uh, Bubonicon, and um, I made some pre-generated characters. And at the end of the game, when I, I told the people, go ahead and take your character, it was like they won a prize. You know, they looked so <laughs> excited and happy to walk away with, uh, with the character that they played for, you know, a few hours. So uh, Let's see if I can have that for you next year. Let's see yeah. if I can have a, a character generator for you next year. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. And we'll, and we'll do something to 
to have all your people who then will have them to hand out to their people who mm -hmm. express interest. Yeah. And it's like, you know, the thing with uh, people will say, oh, well, you know, you do session zero where everybody rolls up their characters. But as soon as you have your character, you want to play. So session zero is never like a standalone session or it's very hard to keep it that way and go, OK, now you've rolled up your character. See you guys next week. Exactly. So. All right. So. Uh, so, Mark, what's your favorite traveler thing? Like uh, you have a favorite ship or a favorite uh, planet or a favorite empire <laughs> um, <laughs> what's the th yeah, what's the thing that that you're like happy that you're like most proud about or like you really like about traveler but you know i want to i'll just favorite one favorite thing there is no one favorite thing you know we've got a traveler wiki traveler wiki you look up all of this lore the 40 years of traveler and it, it it's beautiful it's filled with facts and details and Somebody can mention something, you can look it up, there it is. I use it all the time. Mm -hmm. It's easier than looking it up in my books because it's right there. Yeah, and they've uh, everything's got citations, and uh, it's great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's Traveler Map, which is all of charted space on a 2D. Two mm -hmm. you, know, you can look up any one, and there's all kinds of experimental things. You can make posters of your, of your sector. You can... Mm -hmm. you know, custom information in and make posters and mm -hmm. printouts and and all that sort of stuff there's yep. a button you can push to map the world orbiting the star i'm talking about wonderful resources for mm -hmm. game masters right and these are all uh, community ba uh, community uh, produce content. Joshua Bell uh, is the guy behind Traveler Maps. I don't know who originated uh, the Traveler Wiki. Forgive me, whoever you are. Um, well, and not not to snub you, I just don't know. <laughs> so that's what matters. Mm -hmm. um, uh, favorite. I mean, those things are just wonderful things. Second Dynasty is doing... Um, oh, the 3D printed 3D chips? Mm -hmm. for, three, for 3D printed chips. I just mm -hmm. ordered a Beowulf. Mm -hmm. You know, and, uh, you know, think about it. I had to make those maps for the Beowulf, the deck plans, a long time ago. And then mm -hmm. he's gone through and makes them work in 3D. Yep. It's just incredible. Incredible. Yeah, I was watching them do it on Twitch. He had a uh, had like a CAD program, and he was going, "Hmm, now this this ramp underneath the ship doesn't have clearance for cargo bay cargo pods to come on board, so we're gonna have to come up with a different way." And yeah, it was it was cool because it was kind of open to the public to um, have input while he was doing the design, and uh, they did a really great yeah. job. And one of my one of my players from Canada actually, as a gift, sent me a Beowulf uh, 3D printed model, and I used it for the uh, uh, if if you see the uh, the travel. Um, banner for this year's May Day. That's actually, uh, it's not a 3D rendered uh, Beowulf. It's an actual physical uh, Beowulf that I've filmed against this green screen. <laughs> then it set it on fire uh, virtually. <laughs> we, we need to get Hasbro to make, make you know, those in a box and sell them at Walmart. Oh, yeah, man. Micro machines of Traveler, uh, you know. Stuff that would be yeah. epic. All right, so uh, let's uh, move on to the future of uh, Traveler. Um, so one big thing in the news these days is uh, artificial intelligence. It's becoming uh, more and more prevalent. And also uh, we see a lot of it in sci-fi settings like AI, rogue AIs that go crazy, you know, of the Matrix and stuff like that. How do you see AI evolving in the future? And um, how, how do you see, how, how can we incorporate it into our Traveler universe? I think we have a responsibility to know what the AI is doing and not having it victimize um, the support community that we have. By that, I mean, I think that for the game master, the game player who wants a picture, it's easy to go to AI and say, draw me a picture of a spaceport. I mean, that's no different than, uh, to me, that is no different than going to Google Images and asking for a spaceport picture. But I think AI as uh, AI produced art or AI produced narratives need to be more carefully vetted before we start publishing them. Mm -hmm. I bought a, a role I bought a role playing module of some sort. I don't even remember what it was now, but it was illustrated with AI art. Um, and I could recognize that it was AI art and it just I could tell that it was soulless. It was no, and, and 
boy, it, that tells me something about AI. You know? mm-hmm. That that I look at art by Aon Stead or Brian Gibson or um, any David Dietrich. I mean, there there is a spark of imagination in there, and AI seems to take the art, the pictures, and just take any take take away that spark of light. Right, because it's just procedural. I mean, it's making um, it's making a picture based on like a static uh, image of static, and then it starts like refining that and and working backwards to a picture, and so it's yeah. just it's it's a mathematical thing, and it comes across that way. I think. Right, and mm-hmm. it does, and 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 you know, now I'll say that sometimes I can tell a real person mm-hmm. draw me a picture, and it comes across not understanding what I want. Mm-hmm. You know that 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 which re, which then tells us how important the imagination of the artist is mm-hmm. for our perceptions. You know, it's not just AI that there are artists who don't understand how to make pictures that reflect the the grandeur of science fiction. Mm-hmm. I mean, they can do a nice they can do a a, a nice pedestrian picture of something I mean, you know it's not just ais that are procedural but uh, there there's are technical art artists. right yeah there's te- and, and there are there are artists who just have you know brushes in photoshop that mm-hmm. will do something or, right or or procedurals that will just take a picture of a person and turn it into a caricature um you know you can find a lot of of um freelancers uh, freelance artists who you ask them to do a picture, and they basically all they're doing is, is you know, I can. He says I can convert your thing to a comic book style. Well, he's right. applying a brush to a picture that you provide him. That's kind of an artificial intelligence too. I think that we have to be very careful on what we let AI do for us. Mm-hmm. So uh, how do you see it like in your sci-fi setting? Uh, like if you had, let's say you had AI that controls your ship, is it something you got to worry about? Is it, is it, does it take the place as like an NPC uh, where it has like um, its own motivations or is it just like a, an assistant that runs the ship? You know, okay. So classic traveler, mega traveler, new era, new era introduced the virus. It right. got away. Now, now we talk, you know, and that's based on something from classic traveler about, the little little guy on some world, you know, silicon-based, electron-based intelligence, and and so we have these vampire fleets running around, insane AI. But you know, artificial intelligence—it'd it, be hard to just impose artificial intelligence on the traveler community, on the traveler universe. Mm-hmm. It's imposed with through the virus, and we've been playing with that. And you know, insane entities are not survival prone because they're not handling things and so i envision that and and i've been working with some people about this concept that several hundred years later after the virus some of those ships are run by artificial intelligences Mm -hmm. they can't they can't get repaired they can't get services if they're insane they have to kind of go through a process of no longer being insane They're just intelligent. The survival factor is they become sane. Mm -hmm. They have a moral code. Right. They are multiple iterations beyond that insane killing thing, murderous AI, and they have to become more realistic, more Mm -hmm. sane. Right. I think that that's an interesting character is someone who has a history in sanity. As, a, as an artificial intelligence and now is very careful to not be because that's the only way it can survive. Right. That's, that's a great character. That is. That's an interesting you take. That, you can download that intelligence into a robot and he can go with the guys when they go wandering around on the, on the surface. Right. You know, we can impose... We can impose controls and say that he doesn't have all of his intelligence in the robot. It doesn't all fit. Right. But... Um, you know, or the robot doesn't have guns, robot. right? No guns for the robot. <laughs> oh no, we let guns. Have, we let, let robots. Don't believe in the in the three laws for Asimov for our robots. Or maybe he is. Maybe he has decided that he's going to eschew 
uh, or abjure violence mm -hmm. just because of his history. All right. What a role playing! What a role playing opportunity for a player. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Another big thing in the news was um, the fiasco with uh, um, Wizards of the Coast OpenGL gaming yeah, lessons. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you have any opinions on that, or um, do, do you have plans to do you do open gaming license for Traveler Five, or what's your thoughts on open uh, gaming licenses in general? We have an we have an open gaming license for um, Traveler for Mongoose Traveler. Um, it's being revised. I, I think the biggest problem that the open gaming license fiasco had was Hasbro talked about canceling the license, which does not understand the, what that license. All of a sudden, they started quibbling about whether it really was a perpetual license and wanting to, I don't know, erase it or cancel it or change it or do something. And I just thought that was wrong. We have, uh, we, Mongoose, has an open gaming license and has a thriving market for things like that. Mm -hmm. I was looking at the other day, six or seven people who are actively publishing things under the open gaming license <clears throat> for Traveler. It doesn't hurt Traveler to have open game license. It helps Traveler. I totally support the open game license and these people who are doing what they're doing. And you can hear what I'm saying. I don't, the open gaming license is already in place. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that there will always be an open gaming license for every new title edition, but there's an open gaming license in existence now. And that should never go away. Uh, do you have third parties making licensed uh, content for Traveler 5, or is it all produced by you? Um, I've got a couple. I've got um, uh, one is Traveler Ascension. It's a board game. Uh, I think that's fun. Um, we've got um, uh, the, oh, let's see. The oh, yeah, I love that. Those are great. That's a great game. Playing Traveler Custom Multiple Card Game. Mm -hmm. Um I, I, that's just a, a fun, different way of playing Traveler, and I, I, I love that. Uh, Cheese Weasel with, is doing some some card games as well. They did a bag of coins for the drawing. Oh, yes, I saw that. Uh, mm -hmm. That was fun. Those are the ones that are on the top of my head. But, and uh, Se is Second Dynasty's licensed stuff? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so what advice would you give to aspiring game designers who are looking to create their own tabletop RPG? If you look at, at Amazon, I'm kind of diverging, digressing here, it's possible now to create a, to, to publish your novel or your memoirs or your biography, autobiography as a book and sell dozens of them. <laughs> I've sold dozens of my book. How insightful. <laughs> you can get it for $25. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and uh, print on demand makes it possible to do that. But you'll sell dozens. If you do a role-playing game and actually commit yourself to it, you can sell hundreds of and even thousands of them through the game distribution market and at conventions. Mm -hmm. If you do a good job. Right. You know, if you do a good job on a novel, you still do, doesn't still doesn't necessarily mean you self publishing it can make it work. I think you have to self publish if you're gonna write a, a role playing game. Um I, the, the chance of you going to Hasbro and saying, I want to do this role playing game, you know, it take, I, I think you have to do it yourself. Mm. But you can buy booths at conventions and you can sell your product and people who like it will love it and they'll talk about it and you'll sell more. It's the, it's the last free market area that self-publishing actually works. Do, uh, as, a, as a publisher, I mean, do people approach you with ideas and pitch ideas to you um, about like, I have this idea for Traveler 5 and I think it would be a really cool product. Uh, would you suggest people maybe work with existing publishers to kind of see what it's about before they go off and do their own thing? Or do you think um, somebody can just start from zero and, and make a, uh, uh, you know, a decent um, sellable game? I don't think that most of the, I think that most of the role-playing game publishers are already publishing what they want to publish and they have on staff writers doing it. Um, gotcha. 
Um, I think there are some really horror stories of people who are trying to write for an existing publisher and they get victimized because they don't get paid what they're worth. And uh, the publisher makes a lot of money. I'm thinking of some recent scandals like that. Mm -hmm. um, but the way to do it is you want to write role playing stuff. You write your role. If, if you want to do, you can either attach yourself to an existing role playing game. And you know, the open gaming license lets you do that. Mm -hmm. um, and you can publish it yourself. Right. If you're an aspiring, if you're an aspiring role-playing game as opposed to support, but the game itself, you can do it. You can write your own game and market it yourself. It's a hard road. Right. At least it's possible. All right. That's uh, that's encouraging. <laughs> um, it's uh, you know making as a gamer and a, and a GM for my whole life. Uh, you know, making my own game is kind of a dream and. I'm going to pursue it down the line here. So that's encouraging news. Can you uh, discuss it? Be, sure be sure to ask me when you get further along. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> Can you discuss any uh, challenges or obstacles that you faced as a game designer due to uh, changes in technology or the gaming industry as a whole? The original Traveler was typed on a, um, a, a cold type IBM typesetter. Mm -hmm. um, we went to... The the original Spinwood Marches was, was computer generated on a Gromemco 100 bus um, in BASIC before we had any kind of uh, real computers out there. I mean, the com both, certainly pre PC Mega Traveler. Much of Mega Traveler was typeset on a on a non what you see is what you get interface where you actually had to type in the codes, kind of like HTML, oh. and then print it out on photo paper. Uh, like I mean, WordPerfect or whatever, back in the day? It, was, it wasn't even WordPerfect. It was HTML, mm. you know, with, with bracketed, uh, bold, unbold, mm. all that sort of font names. It was crazy. It is, if you wanted something in color, you had to send the stuff off to a, a color separator, and it would cost $1,000 to make the films to make a cover in color you know it was crazy today we have the, the best of all possible worlds mm -hmm. i mean you just haul it up and it, do it in indesign and it, it'll show you what it looks like at the end when you're done right um i remember going to kinko's and, and uh bringing um blank uh subsector <laughs> and making uh, yeah, copies yeah. and copies and copies and copies and you know because but now i just print them up now you just print them up mm -hmm. um uh, you know, at the same time, when when Game Designers Workshop first started doing games, they were pub they were packaged in brown corrugated cardboard boxes with the ends taped. I mean, and they're just kind of thrown in there. It had nice components, but there was no packaging to speak of. So we pioneered packaging those things in Ziploc bags with a cover sheet, mm -hmm. and they went in, and there were game stores, hobby stores that would carry them. And we were happy that they did. Today, packaging is extremely sophisticated. Marketing is extremely sophisticated. We have access with uh, online ordering and Amazon and all that. It's just amazing. It's been a great, it, it's a great ride. We've been enjoyed, I've enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Boy, whippersnappers today just have life easy. <laughs> Uh, my wife and I were laughing the other day because I used to have a like a dot matrix impact printer and it would just and be like I got a character sheet like twenty minutes later. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, all right, just got a few more questions for you, and then we'll wrap this up. What do you think are the key elements uh, of a successful RPG campaign, and uh, how do you create and maintain them? Um, we looked at that once upon a time. I think that you have to have these, ba I call it the basics. You know, you have to have a universe, you can, whether it's a generic universe or not, whatever it is, you have to have this, this universe that everybody acknowledges the generic empire or hegemony or whatever it is that you live in. You have to have some sort of pull, I call it, that, that I want to get somewhere and do something. And you also, it helps to have a push. 
somebody chasing you behind that is constantly making you move forward. Uh, you know, the, the police, the inspector, the, the, the crime lord. The, yeah. yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. somebody. And, uh, and there has to be some element of magic in this. And I don't mean magical magic. I mean some expression of wonder. You know, that going to... It, it doesn't have to be big. I had a, a trip which was canceled because this is real life. But I had a trip planned and it was canceled because of the of the pandemic. But... I had reservations, Darlene and I were going to go to Ecuador because I wanted to get a piece of rock from the equator. You know, I don't need to find gold. I don't need to go gold mining or prospecting, but mm -hmm. I, it was kind of a magical item that I wanted to get. And it's not a big traveler adventure, but it was something that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I think that there has to be some element of, of wonder in your campaigns. If it's just... I want to buy some stuff here cheap and sell it on the next world and make money. That's not magical. Right. <laughs> has to be, you know, you may be doing that for a living, but there has to be something more than just doing it for a living in there. Right. You also have to want to go, you know, you have two worlds. You can go to A or B and A is just this regular world and B as the, uh, the national park with the tigers in it, I think we'll go to B. Whatever that is, there has to be some element that, catches people's imaginations right right it could be like the cargo that you're hauling you know you have 20 tons of explodium and you have to make sure you know um you get it safely where it goes and it's unstable or maybe pirates or, are after your cargo or you know the tiger in the cage when you're going down in the hole it talks to you <clears throat> yeah okay then something you didn't expect okay. right right um all right. So in, in Traveler, there's uh, many different worlds and all kinds of aliens and uh, diverse uh, biomes and creatures and stuff. Um, how do you approach creating a diverse and inclusive setting and characters in the Traveler universe? You know, the, the very first book in Traveler had a comment that said, you can be anybody you want. You can be any gender. You can be any person. You can be anybody. I put that in because I found that when I was playing, I had some woman character, women players who did not understand they could have woman characters. Uh, and I needed to make that point. The Traveler universe brands itself as cosmopolitan, all kinds of social structures and eclectic opportunities for everybody. And yet it's human dominated. It's it's male dominated. It's it is not this magic wonder utopia that we think it is. Traveler I wrote Asian of the Imperium and I was afraid of writing a novel for the longest time. That's backwards, isn't it? <laughs> but anyway, good for you. Um, Mine might be flipped over. <laughs> but I was, I wanted to I wanted to to talk about traveler, the traveler universe, and it's not perfect. It's still human. It's still yeah, and that's backward too. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, science fiction, fiction, prose fiction, lets us say different things than role-playing does. Mm -hmm. And so I heartily suggest, if you haven't read it, not you, but you out there, if you haven't read it, read it. I mean, you can find it on Amazon. It's an ebook. It's cheap. It's easy to get to. It's fast reading. People who know Traveler like it. And you see insights into it that are not available in the role-playing rules. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, we were talking, you were talking about earlier, you asked the question and we never got to it about psionics. Oh yeah. You know, mm -hmm. yeah the psionics is prohibited in the Imperium. It's terrible. It, people peeping in our minds and we don't stand for that. And I had to do that. I, I put psionics in because it's kind of magic and 
it's it's a fantasy element and people want to be able to have that ability mm -hmm. but if everybody had it you know it would not be the society that we can work in mm -hmm. and so i had to make it prohibited right i'm working on the second novel i'm working on the next novel which will tell you why psionics is banned well, and, sure. I mean, well, like you said, uh, tinkering in people's brains are like your, your thoughts aren't your private area, you know, um, it's yeah. uh, and yet and some people say, oh, it's, you know, woo woo magic and it's science fantasy or whatever. But to me, it's kind of a staple. I mean, staple of science fiction. I mean, uh, you have psionics and Dune and you have mind melding in Star Trek and in Katras and you have uh, the force in Star Wars and you have uh, the Psychor in uh, Babylon 5 and you have Agent Anderson in uh, Judge Dredd. I mean, it's just like uh, psionics is a staple of uh, science fiction, and you can think of it as woo woo. Staple. And it's a staple, and we have to make sure that it is controlled and suppressed because if it isn't, it takes over, and it is not a society that we can understand. Can you discuss any uh, plans for Traveler Legacy after you eventually retire? Like, uh, hopefully, uh, you'll avoid any um, transporter accidents, but <laughs> how is the game uh, will be preserved for future generations to enjoy? Uh, I am actively working on just that what I call a, a succession plan. Uh, and I'm, 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 Traveler needs to continue beyond me. And uh, I'm working to make sure that that happens. Are any of your kids interested in uh, taking on that yoke or? Uh, no. No. Um, they have other interests. Yes, you never. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you can't always count on the kids to join the family business. <laughs> no, and I can't. And so um, I can. I, I don't have plans to announce, but I can tell mm -hmm. you that there are plans okay. being negotiated. Be... What, what happened? Yep. Uh, Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still there. I just, my my speakers, my... my... Okay, can you hear okay. me? Okay. Yes, okay. yes. Everything's still yeah. fine. My, okay. Um, oh, okay. Well, that was actually the uh, end of our uh, interview. That was the last question. <laughs> Did I miss anything? <laughs> you know, this is the best hobby in the world. And the, the, Traveler is the best subset of the best hobby in the world. But role-playing, gaming, the broad spectrum of, you know, it's a good clean-cut hobby that none of us are ashamed to tell other people they think we're geeks or whatever, but that's okay. That's becoming mainstream these days. And I am just blessed to have been in this hobby, been able to spend my life in this hobby. On behalf of uh, all the Traveler players around the world, I want to thank you for creating Traveler and um, uh, giving us, um, uh, you know, great times around the table with friends and family and uh, just bringing uh, so much um, imagination into the world through your, through your products. So thank you so much. I'm flattered to hear that from you, Frank. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks. Well, uh, that's the end of our interview. Um, I'm your host, Frank Sicardi, also known as Cyborg Prime. And I've had the honor of speaking with Mark Miller, one of the creators of Traveler RPG and the mastermind behind Traveler 5th Edition. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for participating in our milestone 5th annual Traveler May Day, May Day event and for joining us as the keynote speaker for the third time. <laughs> I appreciate your continued support. You were there for the first and you're here for this one to our 5th uh, edition to May Day. So thank you so so much great thank you and to you dear listener thank you for being part of this special fifth annual traveler may day may day event your support and enthusiasm make this celebration possible that's all for now travelers until next time happy traveling studio um
Thank you everybody for attending this fifth annual Traveler Mayday Mayday. It was my pleasure bringing it to you. And thank you to all of our interviewees uh, who were so kind to uh, sit for um, interviews and chat with me. Uh, you guys are so gracious. Uh, we had to restart a couple of them because uh, a couple of the uh, interviews because of technical issues with Discord, but uh, we fell back to Skype in a few instances and everything worked out. So I'm so happy uh, everything <laughs> pretty much uh, went by without a hitch except for my initial uh itchy trigger finger and for that i apologize to uh matthew kerwin but when the uh podcast is over i will release all of the videos into the wild and uh you can watch that uh interview with a hiver uninterrupted and unstupefied by cyborg prime <clears throat> yes okay so uh we still have some prizes to give away so I would encourage folks to uh, go right away. This is your last chance. Go to um, cyborgprime.com slash mayday2023 and get yourself on the drawing list, my friends. Uh, there's only around 100 people on there, so you have a like great chance of winning the big, super most grand prize in the universe. Um, but before we give that away, I have two other uh, prizes that uh, I, I would like to give away. And the first one is going to be a um, signed copy of the Classic Traveler facsimile edition, soft cover, signed by Mark Miller himself. So good luck uh, winning that. And the winner is Harold Buchanan. Congratulations, you are the winner of the Classic Traveler facsimile edition, signed by Mark Miller, soft cover. Um, I'll be passing uh, all the winners that I've been drawing today. You haven't heard from anybody yet because um, uh, I've been <laughs> running the show. Uh, but uh, when the show is over, I will be forwarding your contact information to the various sponsors for prize fulfillment directly. So uh, uh, if uh, you have any questions, refer directly to the sponsor. And uh, if you're having trouble getting through to anybody, uh, give me a chat and I'll see if I can help. <clears throat> um, I want to... Uh, Thank God. Well, let's, before I start thanking people, let's get that, uh, uh, oh, well, no, I just gave that away. I have another gift to give away here in a minute. It's from, uh, it's from me, Cyborg Prime Games. Um, but before I do that, let me just, uh, thank some folks who helped make this production possible. Uh, we have, uh, my dear wife, Brandy. Um, she is the production manager and she has been keeping me fed and hydrated and kept the Varga crew quiet and uh, kept me on schedule and has been monitoring the feed and uh, making sure everything is cool. So thank you very much, Brandy. I love you. You're awesome. Um, thank you to my dogs <laughs> for being good and uh, good companions. And Freckles has been here, um, parked with me all day, uh, most of the day. And uh, then the other two uh, wild mountain puppies, well, they're, they're five now, but uh, they were also very good. <laughs> so thank you to my dogs. <laughs> uh, thanks also to the sponsors. Um, uh, Mark Miller, Matthew Sprange, Mongoose Publishing, uh, Stella Gamma Publishing, Independence Games, uh, Thornwood Darnalude, Ad Astra Games, um, Amber Zoned, Arcanic Fortress, uh, Brian Goff, um, Safeco Cast, and everyone else who... Um, help sponsor this uh don't forget dsar streaming he's uh he's one of my streamer friends and you can find him at the uh listed under sponsors on the uh, event page uh, give him a look and um also want to thank my volunteers um thank you sector thank you um uh, extreme strategy uh thanks ain you guys um are all awesome and uh you help take care of the community and I appreciate you um, and everything you do around uh, the um, Cyborg Prime Discord. So thank you very much for all your help. And uh, that's it. Let's uh, get on to the next prize, which is going to be um, <clears throat> from me. And you're going to get a uh, Starship deck plans for VTT, the proprietor class far trader. Or if you already have that, uh, you'll get the uh, uh, the Sultana. Um, you'll get a copy of What's Wrong with the Ship, Volume 1, and you'll get 
a copy of Humanoid Resources Department, Volume 2, 36 Human Interstellar Merchants, since it's a merchant theme. And the winner for that is, drumroll please, Timothy. Timothy, your email address is at wp.pl. I hope that's legit. Um, and congratulations on winning. If any prizes go unfulfilled, they will go back into the prize pool and we will have a secondary drawing. So, if you're not people, you can still win. And now, let's have a moment of silence for those who have gone before us. And when we're done with that, I'll give you the grand prize winner. Okay, folks, here we go. For the grand prize, the grand prize winner is going to win Starship Deck Plans, What's Wrong with the Ship, Human Resources Department, a copy of the Classic Traveler Facsimile Edition signed by uh, Mark Miller. You're going to get uh, a copy of uh, Pirates of uh, Drenax, a copy of, uh, I mean, Digital Edition, Pirates of Drenax Original Soundtrack, um, you're going to get um, a High Guard collector, Collector's Edition um, signed by everybody at Mongoose HQ. You're going to get a copy of Cepheus Deluxe Enhanced Edition and Terra Arisen from uh, Stella Gamma. You're going to get a copy of Clement Sector and all the Subsector Hub books, hu um, Subsector Source books, Hub, Cascadia, Franklin, Sequoia, and the Colonies from Independence Games. You're going to get a signed. Um, Premium hardcover of uh, Herald Class Luxury Edition Starships. Uh, luxury Edition comes with a VTT version of the Herald, uh, courtesy of uh, yours truly. Uh, you're going to get also a copy of uh, Squadron Strike, the full PDF bundle, plus uh, Traveler Miniatures. You're going to get an Aslan Fleet box, all from Mad Astra Games. Uh, those are uh, some of these. Physical items are restricted to U.S. only because of shipping costs. So um, if, if those can't be delivered uh, to overseas people, they'll go back in for another uh, prize drawing. You're going to get from Jeff Kazmierski, uh, Beginning Zedettel. Uh You're going to get the Zedettel Dictionary. You're going to get Amber Zone, First Contact, Amber Zone, Next Gas, Amber Zone, A Year in the Zone. And you're going to get a uh, paperback of Beginning Zedettel in, uh, if you're a U.S. winner. And then you're uh, going to also get... Uh, digital copy of the Wagner incident from Matthew Kerwin, and you are going to get a ten dollar gift certificate to Drive Through RPG from Brian Goff, and you are going to um, also get a Deep Space uh, D6 game uh, again for U.S. winners. Um, you're going to get also a twenty five dollar gift certificate to Drive Through RPG from our friends at Safeco Cast. Thank you, Safeco. And now, are you ready? The winner of the ginormous, most excellent prize in the galaxy is Carl Knutson. Congratulations, Carl. You are the prize winner of the mega gigantic ginormous bundle. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you, dear listeners. Uh, before you go, I uh, want to invite you to, uh, I'm gonna do a shameless plug for myself. Uh, please come by and enjoy a company of fellow uh, travelers over on the Discord. Um, also check out some of my, uh, crazy projects like, uh, Cosmic Drifter, Traveler's Logbook. Uh, you can find, uh, Traveler's Logbook on uh, YouTube. That's a series of, uh, adventure hooks and shorts, cheesily dramatized by me, um, <laughs> to give you some ideas for, uh, your games. Um, you'll find a virtual scout ship that I'm building. Um, I, I recently graduated the core Academy and it's a 3d metaverse, um, thing. So you can uh, go check that out if you have a, a decent 3D gaming card. Um, you can wander around inside the scout ship and follow along as I build it. You can get in there right now. It's uh, it's live. Uh, and then I, I periodically live stream uh, my builds of it. Um, you can also, if you're into D&D type stuff, you can check out the Crucible. Um, I, I'm also the manager. Or I own um, MakeYourOwnRPG.com, and you'll find some crazy stuff over there. Uh, as well. So check out the crucible detailed over there. Um, also, um, I'm happy to teach people how to, uh, play VTTs. I have a couple of videos on the, on roll 20, so you can find those on my 
YouTube channel. And uh, then, of course, there's my line of deck plans and uh, for VTT and also my uh, 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 pre-rolled characters, which are just digital downloads. So check all those fun things out and uh, check out uh, check out Cosmic Drifter. If people have interest, I'll, I'll uh, develop that. And then go to the uh, community tab and, uh, oh yeah, uh, don't forget to join us on Facebook. I run uh, Traveler RPG headquarters and there's a bunch of cool folks over there. So join us over there if you're on Facebook. Um, what else? Uh, that's pretty much it. All right. Again, I just want to thank everybody. And um, I see folks are stacking up in the, uh, in the uh, after hours area. So come and join us uh, after the podcast, which is about to be done. Um, and we'll have a, a little kind of after party in the Discord. So thanks again, everybody, and good night.